Arthur Godfrey, who usually comes around with his talent scouts at this time on Monday, has just about finished his summer holiday. Godfrey will be back with us two weeks from tonight on August 28th. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. It's the shrieking edge of a numb universe that lies in the shadows and licks its wounds. And it's wasteland, a tinseled wasteland that wears the motley, wears the scarlet of neon, the harsh gold of a trumpet scream, the kaleidoscope of color a tear makes when it's held up to the light. There's the color of the desolate wind that sighs through Broadway, nameless and cold. The wind that drifts, touches everything, seeps in through windows and under doors, and lends its quality to whatever room in which it dies. Like the room where I was standing. Mrs. Branch's rooming house. Cretan drapes. Dusty. Beaded lamp. Dusty. Wash basin. Rust stained. The bed pulled down from the wall. The crumpled sheets. And the dead woman. And Mrs. Branch not believing a bit of it. Oh, I know it. I know it. I know it. What, Mrs. Branch? Someone's going to come along and pinch me and I'm going to wake up and this whole thing will be a dream. Won't it, Mr. Clover? No. Who is this girl? I'm going to tell you because it doesn't matter, because it's a dream. Her name's Mary Dimming. How long has she lived here? Four years. Five. One morning she rang my doorbell. She had a black suitcase in her hand. I liked her. She liked me. Yes, she stayed. Always paid her rent. Now... Oh, I don't believe it. Now she's dead, Mrs. Bryant. She's been stabbed to death. You've got to convince yourself of that and help. Who were her friends? Oh, she was very popular. Whenever the doorbell rang or the phone, it was for Mary. I often wondered why she didn't marry with so many friends. Tell me how you found her. Well, I brought Mary her coffee this morning. She didn't smile when she saw me. Something was wrong, I told myself. I shook her, and then I saw the knife. And then I said to myself, someone's going to come along and pinch me in this whole thing. But you called the police, anyhow. I pride myself on presence of mind in any circumstances. Did she have any visitors last night? I wouldn't know. I wasn't home. Oh, that book. What about it? Mary loved it so. It was her dearest possession. A yearbook from high school, you know. She loved to look at it before she went to sleep. I suppose that's why it's on the bed beside her. Here, let me show you. What? You see. You see. Mary's picture in a yearbook. Uh Uh-huh. Mary Deming. Voted by the class of 1937. Is the girl most likely to succeed, Mr. Clover? Isn't that nice? Fingers of sunlight reached through the windows hung with the torn, soot-stained cretonne, reached out for the woman lying there, touched her face, her throat, her shoulders. For an instant, youth flowed over the dead woman's body. The youth her dead hand held in the shape of a high school yearbook. For an instant, a girl lay there in sleep, sun warm in the power that is a girl's. Then the instant was gone. A little while they came, the servicemen of death, the technical men, the photographers, the coroner, Mugovan. I gave Mugovan the notes I'd made, the yearbook, told him what I needed, sent him on his way. A little while after it was done, the men in the white jackets brought up the wicker basket and the joke to fit the occasion. At headquarters, a man stood at my desk, a bald man, eating a big red apple, enjoying it. It was Sergeant Gino Tartaglian. Danny, I was saving this for you for my lunch, but it took you such a long time, I couldn't save it no longer. (laughs) I know, Gino. Did Mugovan... Yeah, yeah, he gave me a message, Danny, and I got all the dope right here in my pocket. Well, let's take it out and look at it, shall we? Huh? Oh, oh, sure, sure. I can tell you what's in the dope without you looking if you want. Okay, I want. 
The girl, lately deceased, Mary Deeming. She had a police record. Oh. Not that serious the way you said, oh, Danny. A record that is not unordinary among certain type people. Reckless driving, driving while under the influence, bashing a cop in the eye because he stopped her while she was doing 90 on a Sunday afternoon, disturbances of the peace on occasion, shoplifting, little ordinary things like that. Uh, anything else? Uh, not from me, Danny. You, Muggerman? Yeah, Danny. I checked and cross-checked the high school yearbook like you told me. Mary Deming against everybody else in the book. Something? Maybe. Anyway, I came up with the names of four students that the Deming girls seemed to be most intimate with during the high school years. Now, who were they? Yeah, I made up a list, Danny, here. I traced their addresses, their occupations. Three of them, anyhow. Fourth is going to take more time. Thanks, Muggerman. Wasn't too easy, Danny. Cross-checking all that stuff. The sororities, the uh, San Susi French Language Club, the Letterman, the Acapella Choir, the Proms, the National Thespians. All that high school stuff wasn't easy. <laughs> Tell Gino about it, Muggerman. He'll save you a big red apple. So it began, a woman dead in a boarding house, and her last identification with life, a high school yearbook. A woman, anonymous except for that. Somewhere, if Muggerman's checking was correct, four people had intruded upon her life, tempered it, perhaps shaped her dying. Only perhaps, a policeman has to make sure. Call on number one, George Ferris, football player, who made all state back in 1937. Now department store floor walker. Wade through the ladies' wear department, through the bookstore, down the escalator, and seek out the man who quarterbacked the bargain basement. Impose a name for him. Uh, Mary Deming, you said. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what about her? Uh, Mary Deming. Mr. Ferris, will you okay this charge, too? Uh-huh. There we are. Thank you, Mr. Ferris. Now, uh, now then, about Mary Deming. She's dead. Well, now. Well, well. Uh, I guess we're all getting old, Mr. Clover. Just last week, I met old Polyakov. You know, Ferris to Polyakov. What a combination we were. I flipped him, he caught him. Ferris to Polyakov. Polyakov said we were all getting old. Yeah, rackety racks and a locomotive for us. So Mary's dead. We found her this morning with a knife in her back. You know, she had to end that way. Why? Human nature. It's in the books, Mr. Clover. Mary Deming was wild for her age. Wild? What do you mean? Boys. Lots of them. That included you? I was a star quarterback. She wore my sweater for a week. Then one Monday afternoon, I saw her in the drugstore with a left tackle. Uh, Mary Deming was a wild kid. I liked her. For the week, I knew her. Have you seen her since high school? Yeah, about a year ago, when I was in ladies' lingerie, a woman with a shopping bag was stealing one of our 498 items. Mary Deming. Did you have her arrested? Well. Well? Yes, I did. After all, I work for this store. Sure. That's the last time I saw her. Mary Deming. Well, well. The next on the list Muggerman had compiled from the yearbook was a woman. Lillian Hess. Address New Rochelle. Occupation? Unmarried. Her picture came to mind. A girl with a plain face with gentle eyes. A sweet smile. Her dark hair cut in a page boy. The woman who opened the door was the same girl, the same plain face, the same gentle eyes, the same sweet smile, the same cut of hair. Time had only touched the corners of her mouth, had drawn the lips back and down, had brushed her cheeks delicately with shadow, hollowed them slightly. That was all. Even her voice was a girl's voice. What is it? What do you want? I'm uh, Danny Clover of the police. I want to talk to you about Mary Deming. Oh, of course you do. I'm practically the only girlfriend Mary has. Please come in. Let's go into the den. I call it a den. I suppose a man would call it that. You said you were pra practically Mary's only girlfriend? I'm proud of it. I like Mary. I like her a lot. No matter what the other girls say about her, there's more to Mary than they... Well, they just don't understand her, that's all. Miss Hess, Mary Deming is, uh... What I want to say is that she's... You want to tell me that Mary is dead. I know that, Mr. Clover. I saw the afternoon paper. Here we are. This is my den. I, I was just playing some music and reading. I love that song, don't you, Mr. Clover? I, I play it over and over. Please sit down next to me on the couch. Thank you. 
Mary Deming was murdered. They were jealous of her. That's why they killed her. Who? Oh, almost all the girls. Some of the boys, too. All jealous of Mary, for their own reasons. You know, Mr. Clover, Mary once came to my room and cried because she knew how they felt about her. She never showed it, but it hurt her. That's why she went on those reckless, dangerous drives at night. She told me so. Still, she was voted most likely to succeed. They voted her that out of meanness. They didn't mean it the way it sounds. They they didn't say out loud what she was going to succeed at. When was the last time you saw her, Miss Hess? Mary? It was in the afternoon, just before... She congratulated me. She kissed me and said she wanted all the happiness in the world for me. In the afternoon before what did she do that, Miss Hess? Before the graduation dance. In June? It's always in June, Mr. Clover. You see, Paul and I were going to announce our engagement formally at the dance. But Paul died. That evening he died. Oh? Yes. I went to his house just before dinner to ask him... Well, to ask him did he really love me... He ran down the stairs to answer me and fell and died just like that, without any reason. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. It's all here in my diary, Mr. Clover. The last time I saw Paul, the last time I saw Mary. My last entry, June 12, 1937. It tells all about Paul and me and... I'm sorry, Mr. Clover. Will you stay to tea, please? I did. Tea poured by delicate hands into delicate china. Smiles and chit-chat and small, fragilely iced cakes. Yesterday's time recaptured and held briefly until time changed and it was suddenly evening. The fingers on my arm when she showed me to the door... Number three on the list, Ona Webster, cheerleader, class of 37, the yearbook had said. Now, Ona March, married five years before to a Keith March. Address, 8020 Andrews Avenue in the Bronx. You got here. You finally got here. What? You are the police, aren't you? I called. I'm looking for Mrs. Ona She's March. She's in there, in the bedroom. I told you she would be. Come on. Look, I... I just came home, went out for a walk. There have been prowlers. Maybe I should... Wait a minute. I don't know what you're talking about. Who are you? Ona's husband. I told the policeman on the phone about my wife. What's the matter with her? She's in there, on the bed. She's been stabbed to death. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. An old friend of yours comes back tomorrow night, Luigi Basco. And once more, you can live that wonderful life with Luigi. So join us on CBS this Tuesday night for Life with Luigi on most of the same CBS stations. There's a special hour on Broadway, the hour between twilight and darkness, dinner time. It's the time of the swarming into the earth because home is at the end of a long tunnel and walk three blocks. Or it's the time of the fast look at the translux, the run out into the streets and say, cooled off, huh? Coffee, hot dogs, cream soda, and the nickel tip. And Broadway tries to gulp its dinner the way it's seen ordinary people gulp their dinner. Wipes up the gravy with a second piece of bread and compares boyfriends, girlfriends, and recurring dreams... But my dinner time wasn't like that, because it didn't happen, because it was being preempted by something else, by a woman with a dime store knife pushed deep into her, by a man with a fright of death goading him, taunting him into screaming at me. Do something! Don't just stand there! Take her away, whatever it is. To... That's why I called you, police, because I thought you knew how to... Please, please do something, please. Take it easy, Mr. March, easy. We'll do what needs to be done. I'm, I'm sorry. Just that I... That's my my wife lying there. I understand, Mr. March. Here, sit down. Here, come on. Yes. Thank you. Would you like some water? Anything? No. No, thank you. Do... Do they always look like that? Huh? When people die, do they always look like that? 
Who'd want your wife dead, Mr. March? What a strange way to say it. But then I suppose whoever killed her wanted her dead, or he wouldn't have have done that to Ona. Who? I don't know. I told you I thought a prowler, a thief, maybe. But nothing's been disturbed, has it? I, I don't maybe know. Maybe you, Mr. March? No, no. But you understand, Mr. March, that you'll be treated as a suspect until we... Yes, of course, of course. I understand. Good. Now, there's some questions I want to ask you. Did your wife know a woman named Mary Deming? Once she did. They were classmates in high school. And you? I knew Mary. She was one of my students. Oh? I'm a high school teacher, science. Only I recall that Mary Deming was in my class when we read about her murder. You think Ona and Mary Deming... You think the reason... You fell in love with your wife when she was in high school, Mr. March? I used to watch her at the football games. She was a cheerleader. She was young, exciting... You, you know how a girl can be. You fell in love with her then? I suppose so. But I didn't know it until five years ago. We met again by chance in a theater. After a while, we got married. Your wife and Mary Deming, were they friendly? Did they go around together, have the same boyfriends, things like that? I honestly don't know. Only and I almost forgot we'd known each other in high school. We hardly ever talked about it. Mr. March... How well did you know Mary Deming? What? How well did I know her? Huh? Only as a student. You never saw or talked to her after she left high school? No. And Mrs. March, did she ever see or talk to Mary Deming? Well, if she did, she never told me. What? What's that? I'll see. It's the police you called for, Mr. March. I'll let them in. Danny? Oh, Gino. Come in. I brought you what to eat, Danny. A box lunch for supper. <laughs> Thanks. Put it down. I'll eat it later. Okay. I already peeked in mine, Danny. I got an apple. How about you? Mm, probably an apple. Box lunches never change. Oh, I don't know. Once I found a dollar bill in mine. Gino, I... Once I found an Easterling sterling silver spoon with which to eat my potato salad. Gino, I... I guess I'm born lucky. Gino, please, I'm tired. I've had a tough day. Two people have been killed, and I'm no closer now to the answer than I was I'm when I'm you... sorry. Do you have anything to tell me, Gino, about Mary Deming or Ona March? No, Danny. I'm sorry. Danny? Yeah? What is it, Mugovan? I found what we were looking for. And what was that? Fourth name on the list, the one I couldn't trace down, Milliken Polk. Hey, that Milliken Polk. I was looking through that yearbook. That guy was the genius of the class. Got through high school in two years, the type I admire most highly. Where is he, Margovan? In the penitentiary, Sing Sing, a three-time loser, for selling oil wells to visiting movie stars and poor Texans. Don't stare at me, Danny. So his education turned him into a con man. So kill me. How come you had such a hard time finding him? Polk had eight aliases. I tracked down one, he'd suddenly dissolve into another man. Thank you, gentlemen. Hey, Danny, it's too late to drive up to Sing Sing tonight. You haven't eaten your supper. Don't worry about it. Mugman. Oh, yeah, Danny. Call Sing Sing. Tell him I'll be up in the morning and tell him to throw a guard around the cell for Millican Polk so he won't dissolve into another man. right where you are, sir? Huh? Nothing personal, sir. It's just that the slightest movement, the slightest distraction upsets the delicately balanced mental processes of my student here. Doesn't it, Jerome? Uh, yeah, it does do that, Professor. Uh, just what you said it does. Shall we show the policeman what we've learned today, Jerome? You are a policeman, aren't you, sir? I am, Millican. Oh, goody. Yeah, let's show the policeman what we learned today, huh, Professor? Go right ahead, Jerome. <clears throat> uh, today we have learned that... Uh, Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. That's excellent, Jerome. Excellent. Isn't it, sir? Excellent. And now will you tell me about the Pythagorean theory? Uh, please, Professor. Even the slough said I was excellent. Later, Jerome. First, we must find out what the slough wants with us. What is it you want with us, sir? Only you, Millican. Thank you, sir. You may take a recess, Jerome. But the Pythagorean... Take a recess, Jerome. Mm. And now, sir, we are in effect alone. What can I do for you? You went to high school with Mary Deming. My congratulations, sir. However did you track me down to this, my private lair? 
I thought I'd successfully wiped out that puerile phase of my life. Not quite, Professor. Now that you've found me, I suppose you want all I can give you on Mary Deming and, uh, let me see, Ona March, Neona Webster. Am I right, sir? How did you... I keep up with things, newspapers, magazines. I'm the uh, institution's librarian. I assumed it was only a matter of time before one of you would appear asking me what you're asking me. You assumed right. So? I don't suppose you would arrange for this favor a little time off, say, a furlough, so to speak? Uh Uh-uh. I thought not, sir. About Mary, most delicious girl, provocative, stimulating, quite an experience to a youth who had the intelligence to appreciate her qualities as I did. You knew her well. Let's put it this way, sir. When I was in high school, I'd put my brain against any football letter on the campus. Mary was quite interested in me till I tired of her, threw her to the athletes. What about Ono Webster? A bore, always turning cartwheels, screaming through a megaphone. Ah, Mary, Mary. You really like Mary, huh, Professor? There were so many things about Mary too, like... Like the way she could wriggle out of trouble. All these years, in trouble, out of trouble, like putting on and taking off a nightgown. Always somebody to take care of Mary. You have any theories, Millican, as to who might want the girl's dad? I haven't wasted my brains on it, sir. For the past five years, I've been occupied with Jerome here. Now, Professor, now you're going to tell me about the Pythagorean theory? Now, Jerome. I'm sorry, sir, I'm calling my class to order. Goodbye, sir. And the things Millican Polk had told me had their own place with the fragments I'd gathered up about two women... Ona March, cheerleader. Mary Deming, most likely to succeed. Classmates of the year 1937. Ona, the respectable wife of a respectable man who lived in a respectable house. Mary, a woman whose youth fled in a hurry because Mary was in a hurry. Too much of one. Back at headquarters, I went over a police record again. Reckless driving, 1937. License revoked. Drunk driving, 1939, fined $100. One night spent in jail, then released, fine paid. Drunk and disorderly, 1941, fined $50 in 30 days. Sentence suspended, fine paid. Went like that, fine paid, fine paid. Then a felony a year ago, shoplifting. But a lenient judge changed it to read petty theft. Fine $500 in probation, fine paid. The fine was always paid. Go back again and start all over. In 1939, the money for the fine was furnished by Joe Sage, bail bondsman. And in 1940, by Joe Sage, all of them, every one of them. Maybe Joe Sage had a fragment to hand me, too. Yeah, what is it? Oh, hello, Danny. I didn't recognize you. Well, I don't hear. <laughs> Maybe it's because you haven't been in here so long. I need some help, Joe. For you, the house. Thanks. About a client of hey, yours. Except about clients. Ah, oh, Danny, you know in this bail bonding profession we ain't required to give information about clients. Like a doctor, like a lawyer, Danny. Look, you're talking to me, Joe. You know as well as I we can subpoena your books. Sure you could. With a good reason. Try murder. Which of my clients do you wish to ask me about, Danny? Mary Deming. Like the back of my hand. I know her that well. Good. You know, tell me all about it. Sure. Here is a dame who used to get herself into trouble peck after peck. Drunk driving, disturbing, heisting underwear, little things, but you could count on her. And her fines got paid every time. I'm just trying to find out how Mary could afford to pay you back. You know I went her fines, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Because I had a standing order. About ten years ago, a man came to me and he said, This girl, Mary Deming, ever gets into trouble, help her. This man said he would personally guarantee I would be paid back. What man? Professor. High school teacher, he wrote after the word business on my client's card. Named Keith March? Name Keith March. Why do you ask me questions when you know the answers? Oh, Mr. Clover, please come in. Thanks. I will. I was expecting you sooner. I came back to check something with you. Yes? You said you hardly knew Mary Deming. You only knew her as a student. Would you like to add to that, Mr. March? No. Why should I? You were in love with her, weren't you? 
You're being ridiculous. It wasn't Ona you watched in school. It was Mary, because you were in love with her. What are you talking about? She was a child. Your wife's age. How old are you now, Mr. March? Thirty-nine. Thirteen years ago, you were 26, just starting out as a teacher. A man 26 can fall in love with a 17-year-old girl. There's nothing unusual in that. But I still don't Every see... time Mary got in trouble with the police, you got her off. Got her fines paid. We have records that you helped Mary. Why should you do that? Mary... Mary... Mary's the kind of a girl who never looks twice at a man like me. You'd have to take my word for that. I helped her. Why? Because the times I helped, paid money to help her. She would thank me, let me do other things for her. There's, there's this, Mr. Clover. What? I did love Mary. Then why do you accuse me of killing her? You didn't, did you? No. I told you I loved her. Sometimes I hated myself for it. But I loved her. But you know who killed her, don't you? So do you. Your wife? She hated Mary. Hated her for what she could do to me. I never kept it a secret from Ona. That's why Ona killed her. That's why you killed Ona. From my point of view, that was the only thing to do. Ona had killed the thing I loved. After Mary was dead, nothing had any value. Not even taking another life. You understand that, don't you? Let's go. It's not going to be that easy. <laughs> Keep open that desk. I'm going to kill you, Mr. Clover. <laughs> you're, a, you're a fool, Mr. Clover. You you did just just what I wanted wanted you to do. I wanted to die. That's all I wanted. You fell into my trap. I didn't have the nerve to do away with myself. So I used you. Sergeant Tartaglia speaking. Danny, Gino, get an ambulance up to 8020 Andrews Street in the Bronx. Roger, we'll call. Anything serious? Just a shoulder wound. Nothing serious. Who, Danny? Not you? Not me, Gino. The man who lived to go on trial for murder. It's the gathering place of all the sleepless nights, this Broadway, and all the unwept tears. The place to come to, erase what's happened, start all over, make a memory. The street is lettered with odds and ends. Fit them together in any design you want. Only nothing slips into place. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway... My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Jay Novello, Hi Aberbeck, Peggy Weber, Sammy Hill, Lou Merrill, and Jack Crucian. There's always plenty of fun on hand when you hear Columbia's Monday night program, Too Many Cooks. The hilarious adventures of a father, mother, and their ten children. Stay tuned now for Too Many Cooks, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, where you live life with Luigi on Tuesday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. (laughs) 
Broadway, where darkness drains through the scarlet of neon before it's called night. And the crowd gathers, the people of twilight till dawn. The crowd that coils upon itself then lashes out into the furious streets. You move with it, afraid to look back over your shoulder because the sound drifting by you. Was it a laugh or a cry? There's nothing in between. It's Broadway, my beat. The message was handed to me at my desk at headquarters, and the message was specific. The courtyard of the Marbury Apartments in Greenwich Village. And the message had a code number to make the matter more easily classified. Murder, translated into two digits. It was my department, so I went there. The courtyard, surrounded by slabs of building. Nothing except the cascade of a fountain tossing the filtered yellow lights from apartment windows. That and a girl lying there, her fingers trailing in the water. And a woman standing beside her being angry about the whole thing. Well, well, I see you finally got here. I finally did. Who are you? Now it starts. Who am I? What am I doing here? What's this all about? How much of this is going to be in the papers? Probably all of it. You call the questions, answer them. Viola Walker, owner-manager of the Marbury Apartments. Look it up. Age, none of your business. And the girl lying there is a tenant, Hope Anderson. She's dead. Now, what about the newspapers? That bothers you? Why? Look, listen to me. I've got an apartment house here, respectable, for girls only. Sure, they can have men callers at certain hours. Who am I to warp young women by no men callers? But respectable. Understand that, mister. The newspapers... The girl. Hope Anderson. I told you that. She's dead. I told you that, too. Yeah, you did. And I believed you. Now try me on how come you're here. This way. I was on the balcony of my apartment. That one up there. I was sniffing the moonlight. I looked down on the fountain because it goes with the moonlight. Hope Anderson lying there didn't go with anything at all. Go on. I came down, saw what happened. Then I posted a notice on the bulletin board. No one allowed in the courtyard tonight. Then I called headquarters. Look, mister, don't you want to look at that? The gun lying there? I saw it. How come you didn't see it? Yeah. Equipped with a silencer. More about the girl, Miss Walker. How do I know? She roomed in apartment six with... with... Let me see. Jackie Logan. And... Jackie Logan. Tell me about her. Sure. She roomed in apartment six with Hope Anderson. And she's been out all night. Now, listen to me. If the newspapers get this, it'll give my apartment house a bad reputation. Death by violence creates its own after patterns of behavior. For some, the pattern is desolation, the paths of shock, then anguish, then emptiness. For Viola Walker, it was none of these. An animal had crawled into her backyard and died. For her, it was simply a matter of removal. But a policeman... A policeman has no choice. For him, the pattern is known, laid out, to be followed. So I followed it. The body of a girl who was once Hope Anderson was taken away. The gun that had killed her was turned over to the experts of death, the men in technical. And the policeman... The policeman went back to the Marbury Apartments to talk to the good friend of a dead girl. Yeah... Yeah, Mr. Clover, I was Hope's friend. Girls like Hope and me, we don't have a friend in the world, so we nail on to each other. That makes it bearable. And now that Hope's dead, how will it be, Jackie? Unbearable. For a while. Maybe for a long time. Want me to brew you some instant coffee under the hot water faucet? Sometimes it comes out good. Thanks, I'd like some. You'll have it in an instant. What I always say is what I always like about this town is you can always get hot water. This can get to be something desired, something hoped for. Here you are, Mr. Clover. Thanks. Oh, well, that's good. I missed mine this morning. Yeah, me too. Tell me about Hope, Jackie. Hope was a girl like me, only more attractive, more sought after, as the saying goes. And she did have other friends. Well, yeah. All right, let's start with them. I'd say there were two. That's right, two. And they were? Like in a novel, Mr. Clover. An older man and a young man. The young man with a fire inside him that could burn him up, the older man with a fire that was dying out. Rivals for the favors of Hope Anderson. I phrase it this way because I read novels in my leisure time. They're so lifelike. And their names? 
care for another cup of instant coffee? Only their names, Jackie. There's something else you should know about Hope. And me, Mr. Clover. We never discuss names. Men is education, how they treat little animals, bank accounts, but never names. Sure you don't want any more coffee? No. But do something else for me, Jackie. Keep thinking about the names. And when you remember them, maybe it'll be better all round if you come to me at headquarters. <laughs> Danny? Danny? Yeah? Hi. Oh, hello, Tataglia. Hi. Okay, okay. What about it? What did technical turn up with? Facts. You'll tell me, huh? Technical report to it. The gun found at the scene at the fountain was a Luger of the type much sought after as souvenirs from the last and costliest war. It had been recently cleaned and had been fired only once. And you know what? Do it gently, Dodeglia. What? It was only fired only once because there had been only one bullet in the clip. Said bullet was found post-mortemly to be the one that killed Hope Anderson. Now comes the good part. I'm clutching onto the desk. There were fingerprints on the gun. Fingerprints that can be and were identified. Last night we sent the prints and code to Washington. This morning they came back with a name and address. And it's who? Alan Harper, late of the U.S. Naval, where he served well and honorable. Address 8950 Madison Avenue. How did I do, man, Lieutenant? Dandy, Tertaglia. Just Jim Dandy. Yes? What is it? The doorman told me to ask at this apartment. I'm looking for Alan Harper. Alan is not here. Didn't the doorman tell you that, too? He did, but I need to find out for myself. I'm from... If you're a friend of Alan's, believe me when I tell you that he's not here. If you're not a friend, it would be rudeness to prolong this, wouldn't it? You didn't let me finish. I'm from the police. Oh. Alan's in trouble, then. I didn't say that. Let's talk inside, shall we, Mr... Philip Warren. I'm Alan's stepfather. Inside, Mr. Warren? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Alan's mother is my wife. Perhaps if you told me what you want with Alan... You could make it easier for her? Exactly. Why do you think you need to do that, Mr. Warren? What frightens you about my wanting Alan Harper? Why? Why, only that when a policeman comes to one's door, one assumes there has been violence in some greater or lesser degree. Violence? Did I hear violence, Philip? I... Oh. This gentleman is from the police, Vera, Mr... Uh, Danny Clover. Mr. Danny Clover, my wife, Mrs. Vera Warren. The police? It's about Alan, Vera. Mr. Clover came to the door and said he was looking for Alan. I tried to find out why, because I wanted to spare you. Spare me from what, Philip? I'm sure Alan never in his life did anything his mother could be ashamed of. What do you want with Alan, Mr. Clover? Is he here, Mrs. Warren? No. You may look for yourself if you find it compulsory not to believe me. Where is he? I don't know. That can't surprise you, Mr. Clover. Alan is a man. Vera. Let Mr. Clover speak himself, Philip. He hasn't finished. You were saying, Mr. Clover? I was saying, where would Alan hide if he were wanted for murder? You see, I knew. I felt it. I felt it was something that... What could you have felt about Alan, Philip? Alan is my son. I only meant... Nothing, Vera. Nothing. You said murder, Mr. Clover. Whose murder? Hope Anderson's. Oh, yes. I, I read about it in the papers. And you think Alan murdered that girl, th this Miss Anderson? His fingerprints were on the gun that killed her. Nothing. Nothing will make me believe my boy is a murderer. And I don't know where he's hiding. Hiding, that's your word. May Alan forgive me for using it. Vera. Show Mr. Clover to the door, Philip. I'm sure we have nothing else to say. Yes, Vera. Come, Mr. Clover. Please, please. Mrs. Warren, if you know anything... Show me the door, Warren. One moment, Mr. Clover. Yes? Vera knows where Alan is. So do I. Why are you telling me, Mr. Warren? Because I believe it will go better with Alan if you find him. The life of a fugitive is not a savory one, Mr. Clover. The boy should have given himself up. The boy must have been... Where is he? He has a cabin on the beach at Montauk. He called Vera and told her he was there. Vera told me and I am... Where in Montauk? It's rather remote, hard to find. I have it. I'll draw you a map. And he did, in a neat hand with landmarks and compass headings so that it would be impossible to miss the place. I stopped at a lunch counter for spudnuts and coffee until the Long Island train was ready to leave. 
At Montauk, there was no cab waiting, so I had to walk. The beach was narrow and pebbled, hugging the slow curve of the ocean. And to the left, the high sand dunes, here and there flecked with the remains of an early season's bonfire. It was warm for early spring, and no movement but the pound and heave of surf and the spray. There was a speck down the beach. In a while, it became a cabin, and a figure standing there before it, a man dressed in flannel shirt and dungarees, no shoes. I walked up to him. Hello. Hello. Beautiful day, huh? Fine day for walking. Yeah, it is. You're Alan Harper? All right. Yeah, my name's Harper. Police? Uh Uh-huh. You shouldn't have run, Harper. Whatever your story is, now it's a bad story. It's bad from the beginning. What happened? You and the girl, Hope Anderson. What reason did you have for killing her? None. That's why I didn't kill her. That's why my story's bad. I'll listen to it. She had just told me she was in love with me. Just then, at that moment, she made up her mind, and she was sure of it. And just then, at that moment, she died. How? Shot. I guess it was a funny popping noise. Hope fell, then something clattered at my feet. A gun, a luger, somebody threw it there. I picked it up and tried to fire at someone who was running away. Nothing. No more bullets. There's someone. Did you see... Oh! Alan! Uh picture held for an instant, the boy clawing at his chest and the life spilling from him, and the pain, sharp and precise and focused, that pinched up my shoulder and flared out, and it wavered, dissolved, and I thought, lying there looking at the single pebble that somehow was in my outstretched hand, how red it was, how orange, how, how it spun like a million spinning lights, and there was nothing, nothing at all. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The cream of the fun and songs on Arthur Godfrey's daytime shows are now brought to you in a half-hour special Godfrey Digest every Saturday night on CBS. So if a date with the dentist, the hairdresser, with a traffic ticket in court kept you from hearing one of the daytime shows this week... Or if you want a fast half hour of Godfrey humor and songs by Jeanette Davis, Bill Lawrence, and the Mariners, listen in every Saturday night to the Godfrey Digest on most of these same CBS stations. Broadway is a carnival of shadows that walk the neon midway and scream when they've been cheated of an attraction. They bought it, they paid for it, it belongs to them, to the ravenous shadows. They told me Broadway felt that way about me. It made Broadway's front pages, they told me, how a kid found me on the beach at Montauk lying under a web of seaweed. How the body of Alan Harper was torn out of the fingers of the hungry tide. They told me how I'd been taken to a small hospital overlooking the sea. And Broadway was wounded because a spectacle like that should have been played in Broadway's own gutter. Then a quiet voice told me I had a visitor, Sergeant Gino Tortaglia. Danny? Danny, speak to me. (laughs) Good morning, Sergeant Tortaglia. Good morning, good morning, Lieutenant Clover. I hope you are in the mood for a visitor from the beyond. From the beyond? Yeah, from all the way beyond Manhattan. All my life I lived in New York. I never realized such a place like this existed in the outskirts. You can speak up to Taglia. I'm not dead. Anyhow, can I tell you how glad I am to hear that from your own lips? I've been visiting here for two days now. This is the first time they let me see you. There ought to be a law. What do you got in the package, Tartaglia? Oh, a get-well confection from Mrs. Tartaglia. Last night, she went to the mix master and beat up an old Italian recipe that makes people get well. Uh, here, here, Danny. It's for you. <laughs> Thank Mrs. Tartaglia for me. We'll call. Uh, you feel up to official business, Danny, in the physical wreck you are in? I'm up to it. The question is, are you? Oh, sure, Danny, sure. I'm in the pink. Well, let's get down to official business. You need not think, Danny, that we have been lax at the department during your regrettable absence. We have been on the ball. 
congratulations. Thank you. We have found, for example, that the footprints leading to the dune from which your assailant shot at you and the deceased Alan Harper said footprints have been obliterated beyond recognition by the sands of time. That's a big ball. What else? The bullets extracted from you and the said deceased Mr. Harper have no similarity to any bullets, living or dead, that have been used in the commission of any previous murders or attacks. Jolly. Anything else? No, no, nothing, Danny, except that the funeral of the deceased Mr. Harper is taking place this afternoon at 2 o'clock in the Orwell Cemetery. Oh? Go tell the nurse I want my clothes to tag there. Danny, you got it in your mind to leave here? You can't do that. You are pale and wan and weak. I get my clothes to Taglia. I have to go to a funeral. Outside of Montauk, it began to rain. A misty drizzle that seemed suspended, melting the houses and movement and sky into a sodden blur. And it held. Later, when we'd gotten back into the city and Tartaglia let me off at Orwell Cemetery, the rain seemed to have let up some. But it was still there. The wet, the chill, the grayness. At the gate, a man answered my question by pointing to a small group of people gathered about a mound of newly turned earth. I waited. Then, when they moved away, when there was only one figure standing there, a woman, then I walked up to her. A woman with eyes closed against the shape of her son's final identity with the world. Mrs. Warren. Mrs. Warren, I didn't have a chance to tell you how sorry I am. You're... I'm Danny Clover, Mrs. Warren. We've met. I was at your home. Yes. Yes, I know you, Mr. Clover. You want to talk to me, don't you? There's no hurry. Consider it this way, Mr. Clover. Grief isn't a simple thing. It's made up of so much. The lost times and memories. So many. Later. And there's this, all mixed up with it. The only thing in my heart that I know the words for. Find out who killed my son. We'll do that. We'll do that, Mrs. Warren. You see, when he came home... When Alan came home from the Navy, he found Philip there. Philip, my husband. I had married again. I I didn't tell Alan. That's why Alan moved up to that cabin in Montauk? I tried to get Alan to like Philip. Philip understood. Did everything to make... Well, it, it was difficult. And Alan's friends, this is the thing we have to know. Somewhere, someplace, your son... Your son touched another person and because of the... He was killed. I don't know. After Alan met Philip, it seemed he didn't trust me. His friends were his secret. How about Hope Anderson? She was his friend. Your son told me that. His good friend, Mrs. Warren. He was with her when she died. I don't know. I didn't know her. Listen to me. It, it could have happened like this. Whoever shot Hope Anderson had meant to shoot Alan. Whoever that was missed the first time. Killed Hope instead. Maybe. Maybe. We'd better go now, Mrs. Warren. It's starting to rain harder. You go. I'll be all right. Somehow the rain... Well, it doesn't matter. I'll be all right, Mr. Clover. Hold still, Danny. I don't want the knot in your tie should look sloppy. Yeah. Well, Danny, if I do say so myself, I feel much better now you are arrayed in dry clothes. Yeah, thanks for helping me change the taglia. My arm in a what sling... What am I going to do with you, Danny? You rise out of a sick bed without permission, you go to a funeral, stand in the wet rain, get wet. Any one of these things could have waited. I wonder if she's still there, Tataglia. I tried to take her home, but she wouldn't let me. Uh, who, Danny? This is Warren. It's still raining, Tataglia. Exactly. And you are to stay out of sane. You hear me, Danny? Okay, okay. Good. Now I will bring you in a visitor who has been waiting to see you. Who? A dame, uh, uh, a lady, by the name Viola Walker. Why didn't you tell me she was here? I thought it was more imperative you should get in the dry... <sighs> okay, okay, I said I'd bring her in. You, go right in. It's positively outrageous the way a citizen is treated around here. How long do you think you can keep a citizen waiting? After all, you're only a public servant. You could write a letter to a newspaper, Miss Walker. You see? You see how you treat us? The innocent victims of injustice, the downtrodden... I plead for you, Miss Walker. Who could have done you an injustice? Give it a name. Jackie Logan. That's the name. That's the thing that did it to me. Jackie, what did she do? 
When you were at the Marbury Apartments, the apartments I preside over, I told you they were nothing if not respectable. Remember that? I remember. I remember a girl was murdered there, too. Hope Anderson, wasn't it? I'm like a mother to those girls. They have no secrets from me. I keep none from them. You're hurt because Jackie kept a secret from you? She's no good, that one. She's rotten and ungrateful. She knows more about Hope's murder than you'll ever find out. I wanted you to tell me about it, to talk it over like mother to daughter, so that we could both share it with, with you, please. Thanks. And do you know what the snip did to me? She moved out, bag and baggage. And when I pleaded with her to come back, do you know what she did to me? You'll tell me anyway, won't you, Miss Walker? She slapped me and scratched my face. See? See? Look at this horrible scar. You've got to arrest her. Where is she? I made a point of finding that out. She's at the Carney Hotel in the Bowery. A dirty, pest-ridden flea bag. Imagine. She left my elegant apartments for that. All right, Miss Walker. You can go now. But I'm not finished. I said you could go. Get out of my sight, Miss Walker. Jackie, Jackie Logan, open up. It's Danny Clover. Jackie, come in. Yeah. The place was a mess, like a big wind had ripped him through there and died, like that, and as if somebody had tried desperately hard to destroy everything he could lift or turn over. The bed had been slammed up into a corner and the headboard wrenched off so that the edge of the mattress touched the floor. And on it, a girl, Jackie Logan, staring with unbelieving eyes. Thin lines of blood crisscrossed her face like some abstract design of horror. And over all of it, the pink and blue that stuttered through the window from a sign that read, Carney Hotel, your home away from home. Jackie, Jackie, what happened? He'll die. I swear it, he'll die. Tell me, tell me, Jackie, who was it? I... Oh. I'll get you some water. Oh. Uh. Uh. Here, drink this. Oh, I can't. I can't. We'll get you to a doctor. Now don't touch me. Later, then. Tell me about it. I'm nothing. I fell down. Look, someone tried to kill you. I fell down. Why didn't he kill you? Hope Anderson's dead and Alan Harper. Why didn't he kill you, Jackie? He, he thought I was dead. He beat me. He thought I was dead. Who? Tell me who. That's going to be my way. Because he thinks I'm dead, i got a good thing. Jackie, look, I can arrest you. <sighs> even with you like this, for withholding evidence. Don't you know that, Jackie? I'm delirious. I don't know what I said. Nothing happened. He beat you. Because you know something about him. Because you know he killed Hope Anderson. And why? Is that why you were blackmailing him, Jackie? I fell down. Don't you want to get back at whoever did this? I done that. Ask her. Ask Mrs. Warren. She... Oh, get me a doctor, Mr. Clover. The police ambulance came and took her away, and its siren was loud to cover the sound of her screaming. Then I went to the Warren apartment. The doorman told me that they weren't at home, that they'd gone somewhere to Montauk, he thought. So I went there. This time it was night and rain, and the sounds of desolation that only the wind and the sea can shape. Finally, the cabin with its feeble yellow light washing against the darkness. Mr. Clover. Stand where you are, Mr. Clover. I came at the right time, didn't I? Mrs. Warren, maybe you'd better give me that gun. No. No, I was just showing it to my husband. See it, Philip. This is a souvenir of war Alan brought back. A Japanese revolver. It's clean and loaded. Alan was always a good boy. Neat. A good boy. Talk to her. Take it away from her. She doesn't know what she's doing. Don't try, Mr. Clover. Why don't you go over there and dry yourself by the fire? Mrs. Warren, I... I was just telling Philip that my son... My son built that fireplace with his own hands. Stone by stone. I've been showing Philip things that were a part of my son's life. Mrs. Warren, I've just left a girl who said she told you something over the phone. Jackie Logan. What did she tell you? She sounded very ill. As if she were in great pain. She was. She'd been beaten so hard that whoever did it thought she was dead. No. Oh, no. What did she tell you, Mrs. Warren? Was it that she was blackmailing your husband? What are you talking about? Are you out of your mind? You think us all out of our minds, don't you, Philip? Mr. Clover? Me? How did you know that, Mr. Clover? I didn't, but it fits. A Viola Walker came to me. Told me to arrest Jackie because Jackie'd slapped her face and left her board in bed. When I saw Jackie, I knew it was more than that. Viola wanted in on something. Blackmail. Maybe she should have seen what blackmailing did to Jackie. But Philip saw, didn't you, Philip? 
Oh, there are so many things to kill you for, Philip. For wanting a girl my son loves. You didn't mean to kill Hope Anderson, did you, Warren? Of course he didn't, Mr. Clover. Not the girl, but my son. And finally he murdered Alan. Tried to kill you. And that poor girl, Jackie. I... Oh, Alan. Alan. Watch her, Mr. Clover. This gun, Philip. Aaron's gun, I'm going to kill you with Mrs. it. Mrs. Warren. Mrs. Warren, give it to me. Don't. Don't stop me. Not that way. Give it to me. He's getting away. I said I'd kill him and he's getting away. The gun. Warren, stop. Don't be a fool, Warren. All right, Mrs. Warren. It's only a leg wound. Mr. Clover. Uh Uh-huh. Mr. Clover, you should have let me kill you. Broadway, where the buildings of the night lean against the darkness in crazy, tilted angles. And walk carefully, kid, or you'll upset their balance. It's a street where you walk the high wire, or else you gotta play it safe in a cage. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The cast tonight included Francis Cheney, Jody Gilbert, Don Oreck, Ida Reese Merrin, and Herb Butterfield. No one has ever devised a satisfactory get-rich-quick plan. But your government has a plan whereby you can save money automatically and get a good return on your savings. It's the payroll savings plan for the purchase of United States savings bonds. By means of this plan, your employer will set aside a small amount of money from your paycheck for the purchase of bonds. If there is no payroll savings plan where you work, or if you are self-employed, you can sign up with the bond a month plan at your bank. Under this arrangement, the bank buys a bond a month for you and charges it to your checking account. You'll find United States savings bonds are a profitable investment. And they're as safe as your government. Start buying United States savings bonds today. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you dance to the music of Vaughn Monroe Saturday nights. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There's a time on Broadway when the fury dies. The revelers give up and the street is an empty corner of a faraway world. It's four o'clock in the morning. 
The time of yesterday's newspaper drifting with the night wind. The time of the tired shadow and furtive sounds dimly heard. And you walk it because you're a policeman and your day's just over. You turn a corner because it's the way home. And some of the shadows melt into a man and you're glad because it's a man you know. Hi, Danny. John. How are you? Fine, you. Good. You got your transfer, huh? Yeah, and I like it. I guess I'll always be pounding a beat and shaking doors. But I like doing it better here. What's new, Danny? I don't know, John. The same, I guess. Hey. From down the street, help probably me. just... Help me! Help me! Come on. Some... Right over there. Someone's in a hurry to leave. That car, no light. Here's what they left. This man's been badly beaten up. Call box down the street. I'll get an ambulance. Wait. No need. Dead? Yeah. Go over him, John. See who he is. Okay. Did you notice that truck in the alley, Danny? Yeah, I'll take a look. Can I find anything? Uh-uh. No wallet. Looks like he was beaten for it. You? The truck's a bakery truck. The Felder Bakery. It's not far from here. On First Avenue near 39th. It's on the beat. Yeah, this man in white shirt and white pants could be a delivery uniform. Sure, they're open 24 hours a day. Call it in, John, then stick with it. I'll get over to the bakery. Maybe those people can tell me something. Yeah, they told me a man wanted to see me. You the man? Yes, Mr. Felder? Uh Uh-huh, Louis Felder. Uh, look, friend, I'm sorry I can't help you. I got all the men I need to handle what I got. I suggest you try the Baker's Union. Uh, they uh, try the union. I'm from the police, Mr. Felder. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No disrespect intended. It, it just that so many men come in asking me for work. If there's been a complaint, our product, one of my employees... Truck 12. Who drives it? 12? You mean tonight? Tonight. Yeah, I'll find out. Hey! Who was on 12 tonight? Uh, what do you want? Who drove 12 tonight? 12? Just a minute. Morris had it tonight. Oh, of course. Morris Bernstein. Good man. Certainly Morris has... He's dead. He was killed. Morris? In an accident? His truck was torn apart. He was beaten to death. Oh, I've been afraid, afraid. Of what, Mr. Felder? Something like this would happen. One night they would beat a man until he died. Who? Hoodlums, rat pack, we don't know. Happened to another one of my boys last week. They turned over his truck, threw the bread into the gutter, attacked him. I'd like to talk to him. Yeah, naturally. Sid? Sid Norman? Still here? Yeah, yes, okay, okay. Want me, Mr. Felder? Yeah. A little bit later, I should be out in the route. This man is from the police, Sid. Morris was killed tonight. Beaten up? Why did you say that, Sid? Well, because it follows. It happened to me last week, but... Yeah, I was lucky. I ran away from him. Morris probably stopped to reason with him. He was that kind of a man. Could you recognize any of them, Sid? No, they jumped me when my back was turned. I was gathering up loaves of bread, sweet rolls, things like that, and something hit me in the back of the head. I didn't stop to say hello. I just ran. How many were there? Could you tell me that? Oh, four or five, maybe. Punks, just kids. I could tell by their voices. Gee, the kids nowadays. They gather in rat packs and, and kill... Mr. Felder, any reason this should happen to your trucks, your men? I, I don't know. Maybe it's because my men are out alone at four o'clock in the morning. I don't remember ever doing anything wrong. Hey, excuse me, please. Stop the machines! Stop the ovens! Don't work anymore today. Go home. The Dan men didn't look happy. They looked worried. It was as if suddenly the scene were taking place in slow motion. The tentative movements, the glances, one man detaching himself from the rest, walking over to Louis Felder, then the rest forming a questioning circle around him. But Mr. Felder just shook his head and walked through the door. It was 4.30, and I went home. At 10 o'clock, I was back at headquarters. There was a man waiting for me in my office, just as I knew he would be. The fates had fashioned it that way. They'd grinned and put their heads together and conspired that Sergeant Tataglia should always be waiting in my office when I closed the door behind me. Here we are, Danny. We are indeed. 
I understand you had a pretty rough night of it. <laughs> You're going to brighten up what otherwise might be a drab day, is that it? My utter best, Danny. Thanks. What do you got? This baseball cap found some 50 feet from the scene of the beating up in the gutter. It might or might not have something to do with what happened. The last is my own comment upon matters. Let's see it. Yeah, Danny, here. If you will notice, on the inside there's a sweatband, and on the sweatband is printed in ink a name and address. Uh My middle boy, Rufio Tataglia, did the same to his three propini. Gabe Kirby, it says. 1412 West 18th. Uh, that's pretty far from where Morris Bernstein was killed, Danny. So, like I said, this cap might or might not have something uh, to do... Let me find out, Hutter Taglia. The address printed neatly in the baseball cap was a cold-water tenement, a scar, an open wound fashioned of peeling brownstone, of litter, of something that scurried under your feet, then darted into a hole. It watched you with bloodshot eyes as you walked up the stairs. Then at the landing, you heard it come out again. You knocked at a door, and a woman, haggard, resigned, told you her son Gabe was at school, the 16th Street Vocational School. And at the school, a man sighed, shrugged, walked away from you, came back with Gabe Kirby, and said you could use his office. He was used to it. Then he left you alone with Gabe. The principal pulled me away from something very interesting. The secret life of a drain pipe. Plumbing two-way. Why did he do that? Sit down, Gabe. Oh, the courteous approach. I've been making a catalog how you guys approach us guys. Yours is a courtesy type. Glad to add it to my collection. You've been in trouble before, Gabe. Uh, lots of times, huh? I wouldn't say lots. I'm only 18 years old. My share, though. Yeah, I had my share. Yeah. This baseball cap belong to you? Hey, you're a blue ribbon retriever. I've been missing that cap for a month now. How about that? I never dreamed I'd see that cap again. Gabe. I'm sorry, pal. I can't offer you a reward, but I'll even it up for you. Someday when conditions are better. Gabe. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for bringing back my cap. It's a good luck charm. My bat and average... Sit down, Gabe. I said sit down. Okay, okay. The approach changes. Huh, Mr. Policeman? Where were you last night, Gabe? Somebody broke into a grocery store last night? Where were you? I slept on an iron cot. All night. Not at home, Gabe. Your mother told me you went home last night. Oh, the old lady told you that. Thank her for me. Where were you? In a room over a garage. We call it a club room. I belong to a club. The Titans. Last night I slept there. We take time sleeping there, we boys. To watch over a lot of things we wish we had. You were there all night? All night. From 8 o'clock on. You can check with Richie. Richie? Who's he? You don't know Richie? Mr. Richard Peel? An important man. He's the athletic director of the Titans. Volunteered for the job. He sets us boys a good example. The other Titans, where were they? Who knows? I was sleepy, so I went to sleep. Check with Mr. Peel. Gabe, your cap was found 50 feet from where a man was killed. Beaten up and killed by a gang. A man named Morris Bernstein. Morris Bernstein. And my cap was there, huh? Well, how about that? Check with Mr. Peel, Mr. Policeman. Over the Conway Garage on 20th. And now I hear Plumbing Two-Way calling me. Uh, you'll excuse me? Hey. Hey, you. You looking for someone? Yeah, I am. Who are you looking for, mister? Uh, Richard Peel. You found him. You from the employment agency? No. Oh, I thought you were from the agency. Police. I thought you were from the agency. There's no phone here. They said they'd send a man over if anything turned up for me. What do you do here, Mr. Peel? What do you mean? Well, this place, uh, over a garage, empty. Not empty, Mr. Uh... Clover. Not empty, Mr. Clover. Look around. We've got some equipment. Barbells, wall exercises. Enough for now. This is where the Titans meet, huh? That's right. We'll get it fixed up. I still don't understand. What do you do here? I thought you'd know by now. The boys need a direction. I try to give them that. Get them off the street. Organize teams, you know. You like doing that. A man has an obligation to kids. Haven't you ever told yourself that, Mr. Clover? Especially about kids who come up here without roots, broken homes, drunken fathers and working mothers, or worse. It's my obligation. Yeah, I suppose more people should feel the way you do. Somebody has to. (laughs) What am I telling you for? You'd know. Ever read any statistics on juvenile delinquency? Uh Uh-huh. Then you'd be the one to know. These kids need something. To let them know their heritage, rights, 
things like that. Give them direction. They don't find that on the street. There's a reason I came up here, Mr. Peel. I know. Not many adults come up here. They're just not interested. It's about Gabe Kirby. Well, something's bothering you, I can tell. Just what about Gabe? He said he was here last night, all night. I know why he said that. Because he was. Well, seems to me... I know just what you're going to say. And it seems to you a boy 18 years shouldn't stay out all night. All right, suppose Gabe went home. What would be there for him? The drunken father I told you about. You'd swear he was here all night. On that cot over there. And I slept on the other one. I assure you, Mr. Clover, if some young man got into trouble last night, it wasn't Gabe Kirby. You have my 100% word on that. Mr. Peel found my hand, shook it, looked me straight in the eye 100% and invited me to address a meeting of the Titans. The boys would appreciate friendly advice from a friendly policeman, he assured me. I mumbled something and got out. At headquarters, the routine of tracing down the murderers of Morris Bernstein gnawed at the day until there was nothing left but the nighttime. I gave it up and went home to sleep. That didn't work either, so I went back to headquarters. The files on rat packs, from a social point of view, from a criminal point of view, from a statistical point of view, educational, but no help in the murder of Morris Bernstein. So I thought I'd try to sleep again. At two in the morning, it should come. It didn't. On the street, back to it, a friend stopped me. Officer Rucker. How you, Danny? Long day, huh? Yeah. How's it been for you? Quiet, Danny. Not a peep. Nothing? Nobody? I've been keeping a close eye on every person, every car. If they don't look right, I question them. So far, nothing. You'll keep on it, huh, John? You told me to do that. It won't change. Hey, good night, John. Get some sleep, Danny. It'll do you good. Danny! Danny, watch out! Danny. Danny, you all right? Yeah. It just knocked me down. License? No light. No license, Danny. I was blind. Didn't they see me? They saw you all right. You're lucky, Danny, because whoever it was, they tried to kill you. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Every Saturday evening, two top music makers bring CBS listeners an hour of great entertainment. Vaughn Monroe is on hand with his famous band playing the five top tunes of the week as chosen by Variety. Gene Autry then comes along with a half hour of ranch ballads and roundup comedy. The Vaughn Monroe Caravan and the Gene Autry Show are regular Saturday evening features on most of these same CBS stations. Hear them both this Saturday. Night slips out of Broadway's fingers. Broadway is left alone, empty-handed and bewildered. The long, long day, 100% pure, 100% unadulterated, now walks the street and invites. So what's to do, kid? Well, there's the guy at the newsstand to the comic books and the hot tips. No. Well, there's the pinball machines and the flea circus. Uh-uh. Well, there's the trash baskets with the morning papers. Try that. Hmm. Day-old murder of a bakery driver warmed over for this morning's commuters. Nothing. A policeman run down by an unidentified car. Better. And at police headquarters, you try to readjust the adhesive on your ribs when the door bursts open. Danny, what do you think you're doing? Leave the bandage alone. Oh, don't get upset, Dr. Sinsky. I was just trying to ease it a little. Take your hands away from it. Here, here let me look. It's uh, all right, isn't it? Who did this job on you? The boys in the police emergency hospital. Oh, medical students, amateurs, college boys. That bad. As a matter of fact, it excites a certain envy in me, Danny. This is a very progressive way to apply a bandage to a cracked rib. Hmm. <laughs> what are you doing? Hurts, huh? That's good. Serves you right. You couldn't call your old friend Dr. Sinsky no matter what time of night. You don't approve of Sinsky's oh, methods. It's not that. I, uh, Next time someone tries to kill you, Danny, please call on me. Do that for an old friend, please. <laughs> you made a deal. Hmm. Contusions, uh, abrasions. Well, this will leave a small scar to make you interesting. Otherwise, you'll live. Thank you, Doctor. I can button up my shirt now. What's the matter? 
I uh, called on you for another reason, too, Danny. Yeah? Uh, here, let me help you with the buttoning. Uh, yeah, Danny, we uh, we completed the examination of the body of Morris Bernstein. And? I won't bore you with medical terminology, but the man was beaten in such a way. A new way for hoodlums, methodically, systematically, beaten af- even after he sank into unconsciousness. Whoever attacked him, Danny, made sure Morris Bernstein would die. Doctor, that uh, slip of paper on my desk that I tell you just brought in. Oh, of course. There's an address. Uh-huh. Uh, 2650 Riverside Drive. Who's Danny? Morris Bernstein's. I'm going to find out why somebody wanted him dead. I beg your pardon, are you... The, the... Whatever you want me to be, that's what I am. In this place... Oh, pardon me. Russell speaking. Again. Look, Mrs. Braverman, just tell Mr. Braverman to pull down the blinds. That's my only advice to you. How do you like that? Somebody wanted to look at Mr. Braverman. Now, what is your complaint? My name's Clover, from the police. Here are my wrists. Slip the handcuffs on them. Take me far away. A rain solitaire. <laughs> you don't look like a criminal, Mr. Russell. You've been working here long? Uh, I'm a new boy. I'm just breaking in one month. Did you know Morris Bernstein? I read about him in the papers, about hoodlums beating him up. I'm trying to find out something about well, it. I can tell you this. He lived in apartment six, a four-room apartment shared by four other gentlemen who had exclusive rights to use kitchen number 2A. Otherwise, it was just it's a nice day. Yes, isn't it? Between Mr. Bernstein and me. Anyone up there in his apartment now? Any of the four gentlemen? I curtsied them all out on their way to work this morning. I'll uh, want to talk to them later. About seven o'clock, I think. That's when they'll all be home from the world. Another pardon, please? Russell speaking. Yes, Mr. Scar and the mail is in. And how do I know whether you've got anything? I haven't put it up yet. Well, all right, then. We'll wait for me, Mr. It's a rebel, Mr. Clover. <clears throat> he wants me to see if he has any mail before I put it in his box. I'll so. wait. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, Giordano, Westfall, Valentine. Uh, uh, look, Mr. Clover. What? A letter for Morris Bernstein. Uh, let me have it. Uh, sure. I can tell you who it's from. The girl whose name and address is on the upper left-hand corner. Well, I can see that. Yes, but this girl, she's Morris's girlfriend. They write letters to each other, even though they could phone... This has been going on since the girl moved away from here. Oh? When did that happen? Oh, just before I came to work here. Someone told me. Let me see. Maybe Morris. Uh, Mr. Scarn? Were you clicking? No mail, Mr. Scarn. There was no more mail for Mr. Scarn, and sorry. No more information about Morris Bernstein. Very sorry. Try the girl, Leah Golden, on the return address. Maybe she could help. Maybe Leah could. I tried it. At a rooming house on West 76, a woman shook a mop out a window and told me Leah Golden had moved to another rooming house on West 90th, 2346 West 90th. It took 10 minutes. No Leah Golden moved to a furnished room in a flat on 116th Street. A kid told me Miss Golden was a nice lady. Gave him bubble gum, but was gone now. Moved. Don't ask nobody where, mister, because nobody knows. At headquarters, I put out an all-points bulletin on Leah Golden. Find her, I said. What does she look like, they asked me. I added it up for them. All the scraps of description I'd salvaged in darkened hallways on the screaming street. Find her, I said. And at one in the morning... Danny? Danny, you're asleep? No, Dr. Sinsky. There's no time, Danny. They found Leah Golden. What? The call came to my office. Routine. Then she's... No, Danny. Just hurt. How bad? I don't know. Where? In a vacant lot on Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, the man who found her said she was beaten up. The ambulance is waiting. I told Let's me. go. From somewhere out of the alleys, detaching themselves from the shadowed streets, from the unlit doorways, breaking away from the night whispering, they'd come. The seekers after someone else's pain... They stood in a circle, silent, hungry for the spectacle. Stood on tiptoe, strained for a look at the girl lying broken in a patch of weeds. The policemen held them back and they murmured their seething protest. And in the building standing at the edge of the lot, windows had been flung open, heads poked out of them, and the gallery seats were filled. Dr. Sinsky pushed a way open for us and they retreated from his fury. Then he kneeled at the girl's side. Uh, In my case, Danny, a a bottle, give it to me. 
This one? Hey, yeah, yeah, quickly. Oh, so much blood. Miss Golden. Not now, Danny, not now. I'm sorry. I thought... In the morning you can question her. In the morning, maybe. What's all the excitement? A garbage man will move her. Who was that? You up there in that building. Who was that? Danny, I need help with the girl. But gently, very gently. I nodded another officer into the building to look out for who had yelled down to us. To bring him to me, I'd be at headquarters. And I helped Dr. Sinsky. Back at headquarters, I waited. The officer came in, reported no one in the building knew who it was that yelled. Then later, a couple of hours later, word came down from Dr. Sinsky that I could talk to the girl. Miss Golden? You are Mr. Clover. The nurse told me. Before you sit down... Yeah? Will you crank up this bed so I can sit up so we can talk better? Oh, sure. All right. Oh. oh. Pull it down. Oh, my back. I, I didn't realize. That's better. I can come back later, Miss Golden. No. All right. But if it's too much to talk Please. now... Please. Who beat you up? I don't know. Boys, young men... I'd never seen them before. No faces you'd recognize? No faces, but... But the names they call me... I've heard them before. In Europe. Uh -huh. There's something else. You want to know why I was running away? We need to know it. I was running away from a man. Morris Bernstein? No. Oh. No. Then who? I don't understand it. Wait. I lived at the same apartment house that Morris did. I know. That's why we were... I met him there, Morris. We, I don't know, we went to the movies together and did things like walking and looking at each other's face. Something was happening between us. Something... Morris hated the word love. He said it, it wasn't enough. And why were you running? A man worked there at the apartment house. What man? He wanted me to... He... He said that a nice girl like me shouldn't be spending all that money for rent. He said that. What, man? Listen to me. One night he walked into my room. I tried to reason with him, but he wasn't hearing me, so I screamed. He ran away out of the room. Didn't you tell someone about it? Morris. Morris had him discharged. He went to the owner of the building and had him discharged. The man's name, Miss Golden? I don't know. What, you? The, the name he, they called him by, that's all. Richie. They called him that, and after that I ran, but, but he followed me. Wherever I ran, he followed. You, you'll be all right, Miss Golden. I'll, I'll try to make it that way. Hey. Hey there, Mr. Clover. Come back to the clubhouse to look for me? Yeah, I am. How are you feeling, Mr. Peel? I'll feel better after this. <sighs> Nothing like a workout on the barbells to make a man feel good. Uh-huh. You caught me in the middle of some repetition presses, Mr. Clover. Press away. I'll wait. Thanks. Well, I relax between exercises, Mr. Clover. <laughs> What's on your mind? You are, Mr. Peel. That's why I'm here. Oh, you want to hand me that sweatshirt? We got a girl down at the doctor's hospital. She says you were bothering her. Oh? What's her name? Leah Golden. She only knew you as Richie. The Titans, your, your club, calls you that, too. Yeah, I know Leah Golden. She got hurt, huh? On account of you, Richie. Oh, come I'll now. I'll tell you about it. You were after her while you were superintendent in her apartment. She got you fired, didn't she? I quit that job. The people there... Well, you know. Leah told Morris Bernstein about you walking in on her one day, so Morris saw to it you got fired. People like that think they run the world, don't they? People like you, Richie. No, not me. Look at me. An out-of-work guy. Somebody waves a finger and I'm out of a job. But you figured a way to get back on them, didn't you? Volunteering your services to these kids. <laughs> Look, I I'm cooling off. Time for my bicep building exercises. You want to watch out for a minute? Uh-uh, leave them alone. I said leave him alone. Hey. Clover, don't push me around. Just stand there and listen. 
The kids, Richie. You heated them up, fed them your poison, pointed out Morris Bernstein and Leah Golden and said, sick them. I did that, huh? Good for me. With Bernstein. You were there, huh? You finished it up when the kids were through. Your boys, Peel, the juvenile authorities will want them. You got a long way to go, Clover. Just up town. Get your shirt on. <laughs> that easy, huh? Oh, you're so... <laughs> You're soft, Clover. You look big, but you're soft. Like I said, Peel. Uptown. time of June, Broadway shimmers like an enchanted island. Night falls, and the wave of neon floods the streets, showers it with its light and color, and a million sounds, and it ebbs. The pavements strike glints where dreams were caught in the mud. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Harry Bartell, Maria Palmer, Barney Phillips, Jack Crucian, Billy Hallop, and Howard McNear. Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, Charlie and Edgar, they're off on summer vacation, but Sunday night on CBS still offers one of radio's top bargains in entertainment. Red Skelton, Lucille Ball, and Corliss Archer are still here with their unbeatable brands of comedy, plus the bright new comedy star, Steve Allen. There's superb music with Dick Hames and Joe Stafford on the Contented Hour, with Guy Lombardo and his sweetest music, This Side of Heaven, with Percy Faith, his orchestra, and his guest stars. Horace Hyde is on hand with the original Youth Opportunity Program, and Hit the Jackpot can hit home to you with fine prizes if you get a call and can solve the secret saying. They're all here this Sunday on most of these same CBS stations, so be listening, won't you? Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where the Goldbergs are every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There's a thing about Broadway, it mixes well with the sunlight. On a noonday of summertime, the concrete strikes silver glints, and the mob is nicely proportioned with silken ankles and dachshunds and wind-blown hairdos. And an organ grinder plays background music for the big grin and the clown's funny nose. At headquarters, I stood watching it, pushing away the time for the filling out of my routine reports. The diversions were down there in the streets, the girl and the yellow silk dress she wore, both knowing about summer and loving the feel of it. Then I heard two things. The sigh that came from me and the phone ringing that came from the phone. Danny Clover speaking. Did you do what I told you? Who is this? Did you do it, Mr. Clover? I don't understand. Who am I talking to? I wrote you a letter about Stephen Courtney. But Stephen Courtney's dead. Yes, I know he's dead. What's the matter with you? Everybody knows he's dead. What's your interest in Courtney? Who are you? Can't you see it doesn't matter who I am? Can't you see?
Can't you understand? Stephen Courtney... Hello. 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 <laughs> he was murdered. It started that way. The anonymous call. Impossible to trace. The sifting through the dust of a man's death. Stephen Courtney's dying had for a moment upset the delicate balance of many worlds. Of finance, of corporate bodies, of dynasties in oil and steel, and the breeding of racing horses. The decay that for months had wasted his body had forced him finally down to the level of all old men who must die. The headlines wept, the commentators lamented. The memos came down from chairman of boards. There'd be a minute of silence for the death of Stephen Courtney. But now it was spoiled. Now a voice cried, murder. The policeman must listen. In the records bureau, I found Stephen Courtney's death certificate. Cause of death, heart failure. Date of death, June 16th. Attending physician, Dr. Arthur Fulbright. In his office, Dr. Fulbright was poised, curious, and annoyed. Uh, permit me to understand. You're questioning my diagnosis of the cause of Steve Courtney's death. We can put it that way if you want. And what do you base this sudden presumption? You have a right to know on a phone call. From whom? Another doctor? Some quack who wants to destroy my reputation? Chooses to degrade me by having me questioned by the police? It came from a woman. Who? She didn't say. All she said was Stephen Courtney was murdered. That's preposterous. Steve Courtney died last week as I had expected him to die. Of a coronary disorder. He knew he would die of it. As I knew it, his family, his servants, his enterprises. But you'll fill me in, huh, Doctor? Because I wasn't that privileged. Ah, uh, the newspapers had it for months. How old Steve was bedridden. How he had chosen me as intimate friend to be his attending physician. How I kept him by sheer know-how from death's door. Still, he died. There are things in heaven and earth Yeah. That... Tell me about his dying. Normal. I had a call from his estate on Long Island. I canceled all other calls, went out there. Found old Steve lying sprawled on the floor, dead. Peacefully dead. You said he was bedridden. Why was he... Why was he on the floor? I confess the question occurred to me at the time, but then I rejected it. Like everything else, old Steve chose his own way of dying. Describe it to me exactly how you found it. I have. He was sprawled in the middle of the room. He had knocked over a radio on a... Hmm. That's strange. What is? The radio. Quite left explicit instructions. Nothing of the sort was to be in the room with him. Too exciting. Yeah, what do you know? Old Steve defied me. Yeah, I guess he did at that. Sometimes it slips out of our hands, doesn't it, Doctor? It took about an hour to drive to Long Island in the estate of Stephen Courtney. And enough time driving through the estate to make an observation. The grass is always greener in a rich man's backyard. And plants that are only supposed to grow in the tropics will blossom on Long Island as long as they're nurtured by thumbs turned green by association with money. The plenipotentiary of the hibiscus beds told me he didn't know whether there was anyone in the house or not. But try at the track, he said. Yeah, the racetrack, way down there. Miss Lilla would probably be there. She always was. Then some more of the tour to the private track of the late Stephen Courtney. When I got there, the decor was still intact. A golden girl riding a black racing stallion. And a man leaning over the rails, holding a stopwatch. Uh, he did fine, Miss Lilla, just fine. Oh, son prince. Steady, boy. Steady, that's the boy. Uh, how did he do, Joseph? Uh, 101 and two fists for the five furlongs. Uh, I'll help you down, Miss Lilla. All right. Who's your friend? Huh? Your friend. I didn't notice any... Hey, what are you doing here, mister? My name's Danny Clover. I didn't ask Hi, you that. Hi, Danny. Cool off, Sun Prince, Freddy. What can we do for you, Danny? I'm from the police. Fine. I'm Lilla Courtney. This is Joseph O'Donohue, our trainer. How, How do, do you, Mr. Do? Danny? Uh, what's the police want with Miss Lilla? Joseph takes care of me. I see he does. The old man said I should. The old man said that, Miss Lilla. Joseph? The day he died. The next morning from that, his voice said to me, Joseph, you see that Miss Lilla is all right. When did my father tell you that? The morning after he died. Your daddy still talks to me. The way he always did. I'm glad. Things like that happened to Joseph, Mr. Clover. Once, well... No, tell me about it. 
I once chartered a plane to take some people down to Baltimore last year's Preakness. Joseph said, don't go. A voice came to him while he was sleeping and said, tell Miss Lilla not to go. But I went. The plane crashed. I was the only one who came out of it alive. Even at that... Well, here, feel my knee, Danny. Well, uh... Go ahead, you'll see. The doctor said I'd be a cripple for life. Dr. Fulbright? Oh, you know him. We just met. Don't go back to him, Danny. I think he's incompetent. But he diagnosed your father's sickness as heart disease. I know. Oh, I... I suppose I'm being malicious. Of course, Daddy had trouble with his heart. Of course, Dr. Fulbright is competent. What about the radio in your father's room? What did you say, Danny? The radio. Your father wasn't supposed to have a radio in his room. He did on the day he died. He did? Now, I don't understand either. Why are you here? Why is a policeman asking me questions about Daddy? Call it routine. Don't talk to him, Miss Lilla. Joseph. I got a feeling about it. I say don't talk to him. Danny... Danny, I'm sorry. I've got to go now. There's some questions, Miss You'd better talk to my brother. He's around someplace. Try the house. I just can't talk to you, Danny. You admire our graveyard of dead animals? Oh, oh. yeah. It's quite a trophy room. Hmm. <laughs> Yes, that stuffed specimen you're looking at, Bengal tiger. Huh? Many brave souls lie asleep in the deep Hindu jungle, all because old Steve wanted to bring home a pussycat. Old Steve, your father? My father. Brandy? No. Then your Burl. Yep. Mother and I got along fine. But old Steve said the boy is hard to handle, so he called me Burl. <laughs> He thought that would make Mother angry. But Mother fooled him. She died a long time ago. <sighs> First of the day, it says here. You know who I am, why I'm here? No, oh, the domestic staff is agog with it. A woman called me. Said your father was murdered. Nah, it's a free country. They have the vote. They can say people were murdered, even my father. <sighs> Maybe it proves something. Like what? That the old man was human enough to die when someone killed him. I didn't know that about him. I thought he always picked his own time and place for everything. Then you think he died because he was ready to die. Hmm. What does it matter? He's dead and I'm rich. We're all rich. It'll be easier if you try to stay sober. <laughs> sober? When was that? All right, all right, I'll stay sober. You said you're all rich. Who? Lola. I watched you from a window. An exciting thing, Lilla, wouldn't you say? Lilla? Who else? Yeah, you wouldn't say. Well, well, there's O'Donohue. He got a big hunk. And the cook and the maids and the nurse. And a man at Iowa who shined my father's shoes once. The nurse? A who was she? Alice Barnett. Nursed the old man for years. It paid off. Where is she? Who knows? Old Steve dies. Nursey goes somewhere to cry. Leaves this nice, big, cozy mausoleum. No nursing anywhere. She lived here. Mm-hmm. Bed and board and street dresses. Who cares? We do. I'll phone headquarters to find her. Good hunting. O'Donohue, the trainer, he told me your father talks to him even now. <laughs> My father. Joseph hears voices all the time. About a month ago, he had a three-way conversation with Orville and Wilbur Wright. There was a radio in your father's room when he died. How did it get there? You know, I wouldn't know... But he was dying. Surely you... I was a most unfilial son. Uh, look, why don't you ask Nursey when you find her? See, she knew about things like that. Yeah, you, you just ask Nursey. I uh, earned this, no? Welcome back to the doldrums, Danny. Huh? I was just leaving headquarters for the day. I thought it would be nice of me to welcome you back to them. The doldrums. What are you talking about, Detective? Well, Danny, since you have been cavorting with society and munching scones with the blue bloods, I wondered if you would be the same old Danny. And am I? Did you bring me a scone, Danny? Uh-uh, no scones. Tell me one thing. What about the nurse, Alice Barnett? Did you find her? She is being as scarce as a... As a... You didn't find her, huh? As a... As a... 
Danny Clover speaking. You'd better get up here, Mr. Clover. Who is this? Burl. What's the trouble? It's your business to find out. Get up here. Somebody just got beaten to death. <laughs> It was a design in horror, done in grotesques. The horse, rearing, screaming, clawing its hoofs against the stall. The girl, disheveled, twisted with terror, pleading with him. Tia! Tia, leave him alone no more! Leave him alone, Tia! Whirled, dazed, helpless, sodden with fright, with drunkenness. The blazing moon setting fire to the web of blood that reached out from under the stall gate. Tia, no more! Tia! Harold, help me! Help me get that horse out of there! I can't, I've been trying, I can't. Tia's a good girl. Help me! Help me! I'll open the gate. You grab her mane. Come on. Now. Come on, Tia. There's a good girl. Come on, Tia. I, I can't hold her. I can't. Let her go. Joseph. Oh, poor Joseph. Poor dead Joseph. Dead Joseph. What happened? Lilla, what happened? I don't know. I was coming back from a moonlight ride. I heard Joseph scream. Tia was standing over him when I found him, trampling him with her hooves. I tried to pull her away. I called Burl. We, Tia, we tried. Tia must have kicked him. He, he fell, and then she... Till he died. <laughs> Tia. No, not like that, Burl. Joseph died because he was murdered. <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Don't let a rainy day find you unprepared. Start saving for that rainy day right now by buying United States savings bonds. If you hold on to your bonds until they mature, you'll get back $4 for every $3 you invested. Buy United States savings bonds regularly. <laughs> In June, Broadway bursts out all over. It lulls in the breezes of the air-conditioned movie. It compares postcards from the family in the Catskills. It drinks deep of the neon-scented summer air. Sighs and wishes Mom and the kids would stay there. Because Broadway's having a wonderful time. Sixty girls, sixty, will pass a given point at any given hour. The music drifting out of the Diamond Dance pavilions is like partaking of an open-air band concert. And the drama on the front pages. A movie. A sheer, unadulterated drive-in movie. Consider, a tycoon dies, someone calls up, says it's murder. A horse trainer is kicked to death by a horse gone crazy with the moonlight. The police say it's murder. Where else but on Broadway can you spend a summer in such a way? And in the technical lab, a man in shirt sleeves wipes the sweat off his lips, breathes on a magnifying glass, wipes it on his pants, invites you to hold it to a photograph. Have a look, Mr. Clover. I, I suppose congratulations are in order. All because you made a lucky guess. Huh? <laughs> come, come. It was only a guess, was it not? You're saying this Joseph O'Donoghue was murdered? Well, anyway, the photographs, my analysis, quite bear you out. They do? Oh, yes. This one in particular. See the back of the skull. It's quite plain on this one that O'Donoghue was beaten to death. But not by a horse, by a weapon to make it look like a horse. A uh, horseshoe, I'll bet. But not of the type affected by thoroughbreds, by racehorses. More like one off a truck horse or one that pulls a milk wagon. Ergo, considering the circumstances, my view is the man was murdered by a human wielding a heavy horseshoe. He... <sighs> Technical. Con Reed speaking. Yes. Yes, he is here. Yes. Yes, I will tell him. Tell him. There is a woman waiting for you in your office, a Miss Alice Barnett. Lucky guess, huh, Mr. Clover? Yeah. I didn't even have a magnifying glass. Miss Barnett? Yes. We've been looking for you. Yes, I thought perhaps you were. I've come to give myself up. 
You're the one who called me, who told me Stephen Courtney had been murdered. Yes, I wrote you a letter, too. But there must be many things you want to ask me. There are. Why did you hide? Because I was foolish. Because I was frightened. Because I, I, I don't really know. It's all mixed up. You see, Stephen and I were going to be married. Oh? As soon as he got well, it was all planned. It would have been exciting to be married to Stephen. Not for the money, just for Stephen. He was much older. Was he? I loved him. I didn't notice. I see. Why do you think he was murdered? Because it happened on my day off. Because I don't think he would have died if I'd been there. Where were you? In town, shopping, walking in the park, feeding the pigeons. In St. Patrick's for a while. It was quiet there. Restful. But no place we can check. No, I don't think so. On your days off, who took your place? We had an arrangement with the nurse's registry. I don't know who it was that day. It was usually a different nurse each week. I'll check. Where? On Madison at 49th. It's in the book. You think Stephen was murdered. In your opinion, who would have a reason? Whoever wanted all the money. The money Stephen would have settled on me as his wife. Nilla, Burl, O'Donoghue. But O'Donoghue has been murdered. That makes the jackpot bigger for the rest of you, doesn't it? It does. It means another 50000 for me. I don't know about the others. Where were you the night O'Donoghue was murdered? I had a movie. It's a feeble alibi, isn't it? I'm holding you, Miss Barnett, on suspicion of murder. Miss Barnett accepted it. She folded her hands in her lap and waited patiently until a man in uniform nudged his head through the door, got the signal from me, and gave the signal to her. Somehow I got the idea that as long as she would stay in jail, people would spend their time apologizing to her. It was a time for thinking about things. Too many people had been unconcerned about the death of Stephen Courtney. And in the murder of Joseph O'Donoghue, the man who heard voices, there, that was the thing to think about. Somehow the first death necessitated the second. And in the matter of the nurse sent by the registry, that also needed looking into. I did. The receptionist said you were a policeman. That's right. You wish to hire a nurse? Maternity? Your wife? No, it's not that at all. We're conducting an investigation. And you want to see me? That's right. It's about one of your nurses. Mm, one of the newer ones, I suppose. If you would have seen the crop that just graduated, that just registered with us... Some of them are pretty. I wouldn't know. I want some information about the nurse assigned to the case of Stephen Courtney. There were several of them. I'm afraid you'll have to help me if you want me to help you. The relief nurse assigned to Mr. Courtney on June 16th, the day he died. Facts. That's what I like. Now we shall see. Courtney. Courtney. You see, we have them cross-filed. Patient's name, nurse's name, doctor's name, name of the illness... Courtney, Courtney, J. Courtney, S. Samuel, Courtney S. Stephen. Here we are. I said, here we are. Tell me about it. I was never much good with charts. Each little line has a meeting all its own. As you see here, there is no line at all opposite the date of June 16. So we turn the chart over. Naturally. And we see the reason why, written in longhand. Uh... On June 16, there was a phone call from the Courtney household telling us not to send a replacement on that day. Oh, who called and said that? Why, I wouldn't know. For information like that, you'd have to go straight to the source. Naturally. Perhaps if I'm more explicit, Mr. Clover, you'll understand. No one is to go into Miss Lilla's room. Not even the police. Those are your orders, Doctor? Precisely mine. Then you won't mind justifying them to the mere police. Justify? What presumption you people have. However, Miss Lilla is quite ill. Psychotic shock. Two people she loved very much are dead. She tried to stave off the inevitable by riding, gaiety, etc., etc., but it's, it's caught up with her. Natural in a woman of Miss Lilla's sensitive fiber. Yeah, I guess it is. Doctor, who gave the order that no replacement nurse was needed the day Stephen died? You? I hadn't the slightest idea of what you're talking about. No nurse? Well, that's preposterous. Oh, Julie, not... Get out of here! Get out of here! Why, 
I, whatever could Psychotic that... Psychotic shock, huh? Sensitive fiber, huh, doctor? You're a vicious girl. You're ugly and vicious and drunk. Oh, no, little sister. Don't throw anything else. It'll only bring on a relapse. Come on now, poor sick little sister. Out of bed! I can't... Leave her alone, Bertha. Are you all right, Lilith? Are you all right, Lilith? <laughs> sure, you're all right. Everybody thinks you're so sick, little sister. Shut up, Pearl. You can't say that to me. I am the master here now. You, Lilla, O'Donohue, old Steve, I crack the whip. And, and I... Pearl. Pearl, are you hurt? He'll be all right. Just let him sleep it off. I'm sorry. Sorry you had to see us like this, Danny. It's all so ugly. So like they want us to be in the papers, isn't it? You're not really sick, are you? No, Danny, just tired. I fixed it up with Dr. Fulbright so they'd leave me alone. I, I don't know doing it this way. <laughs> Maybe it proves I really am sick, you think? Lilla, listen to me. The day your father died, there should have been a nurse here. Why wasn't there? I don't know. We thought maybe things got all mixed up down at the nurse's registry and no one showed up. Because they were called and told not to. Who did that, Lilla? Someone called it. I don't know. I don't know who it could have been, Danny. I told you I don't know. Quite a thing, I Willa. told you. Get out, get out. I can't take any more. <laughs> Look at it, Danny. The boys found it, huh? It's not pretty. Yeah, a horseshoe nailed to a club. They dug it up back in the far turn of the Courtney track. Murder happened, Danny? The thing that beat her down who to death? I'd say so, Totagli. You know, it's not enough. I'm up to my elbows in the solution of this case with horses. But I had to go to the movies last night. Poor you. Comes the newsreel and more horses. The running of the Westfall Handicap. Nip and tuck, nip and tuck all the way home. Oh, Danny, that's Sun Prince. What a horse. Who? Sun Prince, the horse that almost won the Westfall Handicap. I'm telling you, I almost had heart failure. Why? Well, look, here was this horse, six lengths out in front. He stumbles, throws his jockey. This Westfall handicap, when was it run? Oh, Danny, I can see you are a man who is not smitten by the bobtails. This handicap was run last Saturday. Let's see, uh, June 16th. Gino, you went and did it. You put two and two together. And I got four, huh? Not only that, Gino, you got a murder. There was no hurry after that. I took my time driving out to the Courtney estate. I didn't even have to go to the house. I saw what I was looking for on a small knoll that overlooked the grounds. Lilla. Lilla holding the reins of a black stallion, standing against the early evening. A precise composition, sculptured to catch the eye. There was a flaw to it. Lilla had seen me coming, and the pose she'd struck was too steady, too pat. But it held until I walked to her, touched her arm. Oh. You've recovered, Lilla. Not really. Look at me. How do I look? The same. You've got some more clothes on than the last time I saw you. Outside of that, the same. I'm glad. But I need this. The quiet, the evening, riding. You want to ride with me, Danny? No. I expected you to come. I thought sometime soon you'd come back and use the gamut of let's ride together, Lilla, and I made it easy for you. Now I don't understand you at all. I'm trying to make up my mind about you. Oh, how can you? You're not really trying. Whether a murder becomes you or not. It made me ill for a while. You saw that. You're faking, Lilla. It's how you reacted to committing murder. Me? Your father's murder, Adonahue's. Oh, you're a fool, Danny. Your father's murder, by attending him yourself instead of a nurse, by turning on the radio when his prize horse raced. The excitement when the horse stumbled stopped your father's heart and brought you a lot of money. Is that murder? Because a horse stumbled, because my father's heart stopped, eventually it'll happen to all of us. Adonahue, because you were afraid of him. Because you really believed he heard voices. Because you thought one day your father's voice might tell Joseph who killed him. Ride with me, Danny? No. Come on, Lola. You're a fool. Sun Prince! Get off that horse! Up, uh, Prince! Up! Uh, kill him! Kill him, Prince! Kill him! The stallion reared high, fought at the gathering darkness. His jowls flecked with foam. Then a hoof caught me, spun me. And again, I looked up from the ground. He was a monster, poised on his haunches. Suddenly he lost balance, fell to his back, recovered. And in an instant, he was a fleeting shadow. 
And I got to the girl. And I got to Lilla. She was small, huddled. She didn't move. Only in her eyes was there life. And it held briefly. And it stopped. night turns into Broadway, the streets burst into fragments of electric flame, fling reflections hard into the shadows. It's a piece torn out of a jagged dream, the twisted concrete, the blare that ebbs, then screams again, the faces that dart and waver, and are lost forever. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Joan Banks, Mary Lansing, Florence Lake, Francis X. Bushman, Elliot Reed, and Junius Matthews. For more adventures with Danny Clover and Broadway's My Beat, CBS invites you to make a date with them for Monday evening, July 3rd. Yes, after tonight's broadcast, Broadway's My Beat moves to Mondays for the summer, starting July 3rd. Next week at this time, you'll hear the premiere broadcast of a new CBS show called Songs for Sale, featuring Jan Murray, Tony Bennett, and Ray Block's orchestra. Celebrities from the music world will meet songwriters with unpublished music on Songs for Sale, and you'll find it's full of fun and tunes of all kinds. Be sure to join us Monday, July 3rd, for the next broadcast of Broadway's My Beat. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where the Goldbergs are every Saturday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. It's the neon avenue of beggars, the gleaming alley where you dart and search and revel in the blaze of fury. You sidestep the gutters of night, try to close your heart against the carnival scream that rises high above Broadway, shatters, then prowls through the city. But it's no good. It holds you close. But at the waterfront, it releases you, hands you over to other sounds, the voices of the river, the waking wind that has slept in the sea... The siren wind that clears the way for morning and for death beckons you up the protesting stairs of a waterfront hotel, opens a door and invites you to consider a dead girl. She sits sprawled on the floor, her head resting on the edge of a bed, her eyes gray like mirrors reflecting the gray of the sea through the open window. Detective Muggerman lets you absorb it, gets your fill of it, then hands you a cigarette. Light, Danny? Thanks. If you want coffee, the manager's perking some down the hall. It's very friendly. It said while I waited, I could... Strangled. Yeah. With a cord off a robe. Man's bathrobe, I'd say. Where's the rest of it? Couldn't find it, Danny. I've been all over. The killer cut it in half. Thrifty-type killer, half a bathrobe cord. Very thrifty. Who found her? The manager. The friendly one? Yeah. A husband and wife registered here. Early this morning, husband woke manager out of a sweet dream, told him to bring breakfast to his wife in a half an hour. The manager did. But she wasn't hungry. She was that way. So the manager ate the breakfast himself. You said her husband. Yeah, Robert Burton, husband. Registered here last night with his wife, Laura Burton. No baggage, paid in advance. 
You're not reacting, Danny. You said something? Yeah, I did. I said, Laura Burton, you didn't react. She dies different from other people? Easy, Danny. I only meant it's funny you haven't heard about Laura Burton. You know, the heiress. Daddy made millions of baby food. Educated in watering places. Educated by counts and dukes and ski instructors. Married a few of them. Funny I haven't heard. Where's her husband? I told you. He ordered a breakfast, took a walk, fed a seagull. That's the last anyone saw him. He was talking to a seagull. Yeah. Oh, well. What's the matter with you? All that money. A park having your mansion. She dies like this. In a place like this. Mugovan sat at nice shrugged, and over Mugovan's shoulder and through the window I could see the early morning mist rise frostily from the river, and a tugboat and a man leaning over its side. And suddenly the sun was out, striking glints on the water. Daytime had just entered the port of New York. Laura Burton, heiress, Laura Burton, strangled in a dollar-a-night hotel. Find out why. Go to the Park Avenue address of Laura Burton. Be suitably impressed by the paneled oak doors, the musical chimes. The butler who took my badge and placed it on a silver tray disappeared, then returned and gave it back to me between his thumb and forefinger and told me to sit. Then 15 minutes of considering the 17th century tapestries and wondering how George killed such a big dragon with such a small sword. And just as I was about to figure it, someone tapped me on the shoulder. I had to leave George to his own devices. You like tapestries? Not especially. I was just... Oh, because if you did, I've got some in the study that would make your back teeth rattle. Oh, some other time, maybe. Right now... You're I'm... a policeman, aren't you? What policeman? Clover. Danny Clover, homicide. I'm Muriel Carlson. What can I do for you? I asked to see Robert Burton, Laura Burton's husband. And you're from homicide? That's right. Wonderful. Who did Robert murder? We just want to talk to him. We're not sure he committed murder, Miss Carlson. But it's possible that he did. Did he kill Laura? Laura is dead. Shot? Strangled? Beaten? Poisoned? Strangled. Well, I only ask because, well, I'm Laura's sister, and if any of my friends ask me how Laura died, I can tell them. That's all your sister's dying dust here. Yeah? Oh, it's much more than that, Mr. Clover. It's a release. For years I've been wondering how Laura would die. It's been bothering me. Now I can think of something else. Where'd she die? In a waterfront hotel. Then Robert killed her, of course. I say of course because there's no doubt about it. Laura was always running off to places like waterfront hotels with him so she could get to know him better. Or maybe her own canopied furniture bored her. You know, I thought Laura's second husband would kill her. Now it turns out her fourth husband. Well, what do you know? Where will I find him? Robert. Robert, the man with the muscles, the man with the flat stomach and the fat mouth. Robert, fourth husband, Robert the stevedore. Where will I find him? I wouldn't know. But Robert could never get water run out of his hair. Literally. You could smell it. Am I being helpful, Mr. Clover? Then the glee at what I'd brought her couldn't be held back. It bubbled up, <laughs> spilled out of her mouth, shaped itself into a girlish giggle. <laughs> she tried to smooth it off her lips with the back of her hand. Couldn't. Instead, stroked her throat, arranged her back hair, watched herself. Mm. Admired her image in an antique mirror. With her eyes, invited me to the same. And I got out. Then the official, the routine pattern began to spin itself out. The APBs, all points bulletin on one Robert Burton, suspicion of murder. The inquiries at the waterfront places. Robert, if you find a mister, send him back to me. I miss dear old Robert. My Prince Charming, I called him. Find him for me. The waterfront buddies. Robert, married something rich, I hear. Killed her, eh? Well, she wasn't the rich for his blood, huh? <laughs> That's a rabbit for you. The waterfront hiring hall. You're kidding, detective. We haven't seen him here since he married Mink and Lottie Dare. Robert's dreamboat come in, huh, detective? Dead wife, live money, huh? And finally, a man on the docks. A man loading cargo. A man who knew Robert like he was his brother. Like my brother, we loaded junk together. We dreamed together of faraway places and girls with bells on their toes. Now, where is he? Hold up with a bag of gold and a golden girl in some hole on Park Avenue. Like I'll be someday if I'm a good boy. Uh, by the way, I'm Marty Dixon. And you're a cop. But you've got a name, huh? Uh, Danny Clover. Danny Clover. They tell me you used to room with Burton. Uh-huh. We shared everything. A room, old comic books, girly magazines. Sometimes we shared our friends, too. <laughs> Till he married Laura? 
That part of himself he kept to himself, like I'll do someday. You won't begrudge me that, will you, Danny? Like I don't begrudge my friend Robert, who's like a brother. Tell me about their marriage. It's been in the society columns. You tell me, because you knew him so well. Gladly. I've just been waiting to be asked. I'm tired of thinking about it in the loneliness of my room. Their marriage was champagne and antique mirrors and velvet carpets. Sometimes he and Laura would come down and share the crumbs with me. That was gay. Why do you need to know nice things like that? Because we think he murdered Laura. Why, that crawl and no good... What's the matter, Marty? You want the killer? I'll give him to you. Where? I'll give him to you because that he shares with me. He comes to me and says he's in a little trouble. Will I put him up for a couple of days? Sure, I'll put him up. Where? In my room, 1823 West 6. You know something, Danny? I'm glad you found me. Cross my heart, I'm glad. Come on, open up, Burton. Open. Who is it? Police. You got the wrong room. Open the door. No? Okay, Burton. Let's go. Not gonna be that easy, copper. Like I said, Burton. Let's go. In here, Burton. Hi, Danny. Brought Burton along because he wants to talk to us. Good. Sit down, Burton. Over there. Thanks. Lawyer said I should tell all. You got a smart lawyer. And he can afford it. How many millions does your wife leave, Burton? Seven or ten? I never can remember. I get all flustered when I mention that much money. Why'd you strangle your wife, Burton? Oh, such a leading question, fellas. Next thing you'll want to know, did I enjoy it? Did you enjoy it, Burton? Thinking about it, I enjoy it because now there's all that money. That's the part that's enjoyable. But I didn't kill her. Is that what your lawyer told you to say? Say it, he said. If you didn't do it, my boy, he said, say it. How about that bathrobe cord? Whose bathrobe? Mine, fellas. Who registered at the hotel with your wife? I did, fellas. I've been telling the police that for six hours. You got a pretty nice place on Park Avenue, Burton. Why pick a flea bag? Salt air, fellas. The commonplace things. Laura and I enjoyed it. I'm a different man near the waterfront. Laura enjoyed it. Okay, Burton, what happened? Woke up this morning, felt like a walk, stopped at the manager's room, told him to send breakfast up to Laura. What about the manager, Muggerman? He's an old man. Dr. Sinsky said he wouldn't have the strength to strangle. So you killed your wife and went for a walk. Is that what happened, Burton? My lawyer said you might say that. Even said the DA will probably arraign me because it looks like open and shot I killed my wife. Why'd you run? Why'd you hide? Because he killed her. Because I came back to the hotel and saw the crowd and heard that Laura Burton had been murdered, so I ran. What'd you do with the other half of the bathrobe cord? The one she was strangled with? The one you used to strangle her. All right, it was my robe, but I didn't Why'd use Why'd you only it? use half the cord? Because, look. Why? You trying to confuse me? I didn't kill her. But you're glad she's dead. Now, take me back to my cell. Sergeant Muggerman asked you a question. Take me back to my cell. Your lawyer said talk, Burton. Talk. Take me back. Sure. Take you back and get your confession. Uh, Danny? Oh, what is it, Danny? Homicide call just came in. Waterfront. Call said, tell Clover to get down here. I'm busy, Gino. Call came through the DA's office, Danny. Said you. I got a squad car waiting. You gonna take it? Sure, Gino. That's all I've got to do. I've been waiting for you, Lieutenant. It's right down the alley. Thanks, officer. I was just making the beat. Stopped here for a drag and a cigarette. I mean, I was just checking. Routine, you know, Lieutenant. You stopped for a drag. Yeah, that's right, Lieutenant. Well, when I lighted up the light from the match... Oh, anyway, there she was, laying there. I thought she was a drunk. Told her to move on. I poked her. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. This is the way you found her? Yeah, just like that, Lieutenant. I, I figured she wasn't drunk. I figured she was strangled to death. I shouldn't have poked her. Don't worry about it. You know who she is? No. Here, I'll hold the flash so you can see better. Good. Hey, see? She looks a lot like that Laura Burton who was strangled with a bathrobe cord. Same features. Almost identical. Is that why they made such a big to-do about when I phoned in? 
Lieutenant? And I thought I had a killer. You were wrong, huh? Hold that flash, though. Over and over, they asked me, are you sure she was strangled with half a bathrobe cord? Sure, I'm sure, I said. You were wrong about having a killer, huh, Lieutenant? Yeah. I was wrong. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The election news. You'll hear it best on CBS next Tuesday, November 7, with its world-famous reporter Edward R. Murrow heading up the staff. CBS News will bring you the latest up-to-the-minute returns in state and important local contests. Be sure you get the election news fastest and the most accurately next Tuesday night. You'll hear it best on CBS. Broadway all depends on the mood you're in. You can be part of the mob and perform for the sightseers, or you can create a stir by strangling women with a cord of a flannel bathrobe. In the latter case, you have an advantage. Broadway performs for you. It hangs on the ropes and talks in whispers and clucks its tongue about the police department. The ray of sunshine the next morning, the pure gold in an otherwise drab November day, the Sergeant Tartaglia, who did remarkable things with file cards, with inkwells, with pencil sharpeners. Ah. What's the matter, Gino? Ah, this pencil sharpener, Danny. A veritable ogre of pencils. Chews them up and gives no points in return. I've been waiting for you to come in, and I've been sharpening your pencils. I'm here now, Gino. Uh Huh? Well, you said you were waiting for me. You got something to tell me? Roger. Then tell me. Wilco, of the matter of the girl who was strangled in an alley. Her name was Annalise Sisler, a name known most especially to Precinct 45 for various and sundry misdemeanors. Go on. Technical ass, and it be pointed out to you that Miss Sisler had physical attributes which were also observed on Laura Burton, also deceased. Uh huh. Such as, to wit, maybe the killer strangled the wrong woman the first time because both were blonde, both had blue eyes, both approximately the same age, same height, same weight, both strangled, and both by opposite ends of the identical bathrobe cord. You know, Danny, this brings to mind a famous case which involved Mike Shrek, the bald head. Tagliar. Well. It was almost a miracle detective from Philadelphia's undoing, Danny. If he hadn't disguised himself in the nick of time as a midget... Get on with it, it Gino. Uh, to wit, the DA has released Robert Burton as a murder suspect since he was in the pokey at the time of the murder of Miss Sisler. And since the murder weapon which killed Miss Sisler also killed Laura Burton. Okay, what else? What else is that Miss Sisler's last known address, according to the records of the 45th Precinct, is the Kenneth McManus Masseur Parlors on East 34th Street. <laughs> How'd I do, Danny? Great, Gino. I'll get you a new pencil sharpener. Sure you wouldn't care to grab yourself a steam, Mr. Clover? Then a nice salt rub from the salty hands of one of my experts. All in the house, of course. All I want And wanted. you can get your soup clean and pressed while being catered to. We think of everything in this calling. Look. And we got a ladies, too, in case you got a wife or a girlfriend or something else on the pump side. But for them, we got home permanence while being cooked and mauled and freshened up. That's all of it? You're through? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, can't sell you, huh? All you want is what do I know about Annalise Sisler? That's all. Why did, huh? In an alley, huh? Well... Such a good worker. One of my best. Little Anna Lee in such demand. By whom? Ladies. Fat ladies, skinny ladies, happy ladies, sad ladies. Little Anna Lee had a way with a steam cabinet. They always asked for her. She finished her work last night, punched her time card, waved goodbye to you from the door. That's right. She did all that, just like you said. Oh, but you got one detail wrong, Mr. Clover. She didn't wave goodbye. Wrong again. She waved, but not last night. Five months ago. She heard a call from somewhere deep inside her. She left my employee to answer it. You'll explain to me about the call. Happens to guys like little Anna Lee. She heard a call to be a photographer's model. Nice, clean wake. Uh, you wouldn't know where. Wrong again. With Leroy, the photographer on West 10th. Can't inveigle you into esteem, huh, Mr. Clover? My 
receptionist secretary said you were different from the other people who come to study with me. How much are you different? This much, Leroy. I've photographed those, too. Police badges, yes, in my formative stage, when I was desperate, naive about subject matter. But now you're doing better, huh, Leroy? Oh, much, much. As witnessed this mass class, three models, assembly line methods, pardon me. Uh, try one from the floor, Mr. Holmes, and this time we'll shoot it with film, shall we, Mr. Holmes? That's right. Yes, it's better with film. Now, Mr. Clover, where were we? You had a model. Oh, that's why you're here. You want stuff about Anna Lee. Now you know. Wonderful girl. Ordinary, but wonderful in such a wonderful way. The textures, the highlights, the shadows. Yes, we miss Anna Lee, don't we, Mr. Holmes? Of course we do. Ever done art studies in a prison cell, Leroy? The texture, the highlights, a man like you could do wonders. You mean because I don't nudge up to your questions, you'd do that to me? You'd, uh... Uh-huh. Hold my camera, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Now, look here, Mr. Clover. I don't believe it. Oh, I'm not going to hit you. Don't fear. I'm just going to tell you off. Annalise Sizzler was our favorite model. We've lost her. We've mourned for her for five weeks now. What? Five weeks ago, she said she had something much better than us. I pleaded with her, tried to bribe her to come back to us, even went to her apartment, my arms full of goodies. She slammed the door in my face. Her apartment, where is it? 1923's 32nd top floor in the rear. Wonderful subject matter, but you don't care. All you care about is murder, spoiling things, things like that. That's right. Yes. You can give him back his camera, Mr. Holmes. Leroy just told me off. East 32nd top floor in the rear. And a door open. And a woman in the room or back to you, not hearing you walk in. A woman intent on grubbing through the open drawers of a bureau, finding things, holding them close for an instant, tossing them on a pile of stuff already on the floor, grubbing for more. Then finally aware of your presence, trying to still the greed trembling in her fingers and her body. What do you want here? What are you doing here? Spying. Get out. This is Miss Sisler's apartment, isn't it? What of it? She's got no use for all this now. She didn't deserve things like this anyway. But you do. Yes, I do. All my life I deserved them. Now they're mine, and you can't take them away. Let's have a look. I'll call the police. I'm the police. And you? I own this place. I run it. Rent rooms to girls like her. Clean up after. That gives you the right to steal from a dead girl like her? Not stealing. Only taking what she would have given me anyway if she'd known she's going to die. Anna was a girl like that. Generous. I didn't care about her things. And they're expensive. Silk. Imported. Never had anything like that. Not next to my body, I haven't. Just watched her put them on sometimes. All right. Don't take them away, mister. She'd have given them to me, I swear it. I swear it. Danny Clover speaking. This is Gordon, Danny, the lab. Come across the hall for a minute. I have something to show you. What? The lady slip you brought in, the underwear. Don't walk around. Gordon? Hello? Did you walk or run, Danny? Don't you ever smile? What's on your mind, Gordon? On my mind? Well, all right, I'll tell you. Why is it when the department is up to its neck in unsolved murders, they make kissing sounds at John Gordon? You got something to tell me, or you just want me to admire you? Well, first I'll tell you something, then you can drop your chin in frank admiration. Take a look at this slip. Uh, go ahead, hold it up to the light. See what I mean? I see a black silk slip. A real expensive black silk slip. Feel it. Go ahead, right here. See what I mean? No, you don't see. That roughness is thread. Something was sewn on that slip and torn off. A laundry mark? Oh, Danny, what you don't know about slips. A laundry mark on a slip sewn here? Sewn here was a French word, toujours. And sewn here was a name, Laura. The stitches were pulled out, but they left their pattern. Now you want to admire me, Danny? The Taglia... Hey, Gino, where are you? Uh, what do you want, Danny? Call the seaboard shipping line, Gino. Get the dock foreman and ask for Marty Dixon. 
Well, suppose they won't call Marty to the phone, Danny. Dixon's just a stevedore. Well, that's what I'm counting on. Leave word, tell him it's urgent. Say Robert Burton wants to see Dixon as soon as Dixon gets off from work. Roger, Danny. And also, Wilco. It was four o'clock when Mugovan called in. He'd just seen the dock foreman of the seaboard shipping line hand Marty Dixon a note. It was a few minutes past 5.30 when Mugovan called back again. The quitting whistle had just blown down to the waterfront, and Marty Dixon had just punched his time clock. It would take him 25 minutes to get to Burton's mansion on Park Avenue. It took me 10 minutes. Robert Burton said he was glad to see me. We could talk in privacy. Laura's sister was judging a dog show on Long Island, and he'd given the servants the day off to grieve his wife's death. So we can talk in privacy, Danny, but you know what? What? You didn't have to come back and apologize for the rough way you fellas treated me. I understand these things. I didn't come back for that. Oh. Got something in your mind, Danny? Tell me I can fix it. I got nothing but money. Eight million dollars and change. Eight million dollars. And that's what the taxes skimmed off. Tell me, Danny. I know who murdered your wife. And you want a reward. How much you want, Danny? That's besides the gold watch you already got in mind. How do you want it engraved, Danny? And a matching gold cigarette case, too, anything. Because I'm indebted to you, fella. Don't you want to know who murdered your wife? I figure you'll tell me when the time is ripe, fella. Uh, Tell me and let's uh, forget all about it, huh? I'll tell you, fella. You did. You murdered your wife. Oh, Danny. You know better. How could I have killed Laura? Same guy who killed her strangled that girl in the alley. Even the D.A. knows that. What's the matter? Is he on your back for a killer? No. Matter of fact, he gave me permission to pick you up for murder. All this magnificence around here make your head spin, huh, fella? You tried to give me trouble before, Burton. Remember what it got you? Well, this time I get something better. I heard you've been admiring that tapestry, Danny. It's worth maybe 60 G's. How would you like to use something like that for a bath towel and not worry about it, huh? Like it, wouldn't you, Danny? You would, wouldn't you? Tell me, how do you figure I killed my wife? Like we told you before, strangled her in that flea bag. Your pal, Marty Dixon, wants to come in, Burton. How come you're so good, Danny? You stand here, talk to me, hear some chimes, and know it's Marty. How do you do things like that, fella? Open the door for him, Burton. Yeah, I will. What do you know? Hi, Marty. Come on in. You're real good, Danny. Hello, Marty. What goes on here? It's this way, Marty. The DA's on my back. I need a killer. Isn't that right, fella? Yeah. Yeah, that's the way it is, Marty. What does he know, Burton? Let me. I know Burton strangled his wife with half that cord. Gave you the other half so you could strangle that Sisler girl. Had it all arranged. How could the D.A. indict Burton when it was obvious the killer was still on the loose? You know a lot. How is it that you know a lot? That Sisler girl had an expensive slip that once belonged to Laura Burton. How long did it take you boys to find a girl with the same features as Laura to make it look like a killer had strangled the wrong girl when he killed Laura Burton? Oh, it didn't take you very long to find her, did it, Marty? A couple of weeks. Then you wind her and dined her. Oh, I helped, didn't I, Marty? Gave you my wife's cast-off clothes. You could give the girl presents, make her love you. You making a deal with the cop, Burton? He likes nice things. I'm in a position to give him anything he wants. Me too. Because everything you got, I got half. That was the arrangement he made when we started this thing, Clover. When did all this happen, Marty? It happened. And that's the way it is. I didn't sign anything. I don't remember doing that. Anyway, you're a murderer. Man in my position can't have any truck with murderers, and that's why I'm giving you to the cop. You know, when I got a message this afternoon, I figured something had gone sour. So I brought a friend. Uh, Marty, don't, don't be crazy. Uh, Clover, don't go for your gun. I kill cops, too. Look, Marty, we, we were having a joke, weren't we, Danny? It's, listen to me. <laughs> Marty. Marty. <laughs> you don't have to rough me, Clover. Gun's empty. Let's go, Marty. Sure. You want to know something? What? I feel real good. I'm going to the electric chair and I feel real good. How many men get the opportunity to die for half of eight million dollars? In 
In the minutes before dawn, Broadway lies huddled in a dreamless sleep. It's the time of the long black night, and no stars, and the muted wind, and on the wind the sly whispers. Start running, kid. You'll never get home again. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Clayton Post, Larry Dobkin, Betty Lou Gerson, Jody Gilbert, Ed Max, Jack Crucian, and Jerry Hausner. Every Saturday night, Americans from coast to coast play Sing It Again. Do you... Well, if you don't, you don't know the fun and excitement you're missing. Not to mention radio's largest cash award, if you can name the Phantom Voice. There's music on Sing It Again. Music with Alan Dale, Bob Howard, Judy Lynn, the Riddlers, Ray Block and his orchestra. There's contestants. Contestants from all over America. Phoned by Dan Seymour. And there's prizes galore, plus that special jackpot prize we mentioned earlier. So stay at home. Play at home on Saturday nights when over many of these same CBS stations, Dan Seymour says it's Sing It Again. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. At one o'clock in the morning, solitude whispers its invitation. The derelicts of night run from it, beat on a door, plead for a refuge from the offered emptiness. But no door opens to them. At headquarters, you consider it through a grime-stained window. Turn away from it. Find on your desk a slip of paper that hadn't been there before. Homicide, it says. Central Park Lake. And Broadway has finally opened a door. The password, the violent dead. There's the lake and the facade of the city embracing it. There's a shadow covering a dead girl with its coat. The puny effort to thaw the veil of frost on the girl's forehead. Then the shadow rises, shakes its head, and it's mug of him. I don't know, Danny. Sometimes it's, uh... You know, Danny, I got a nephew, three years old. He comes here during the daytime to play, to feed the ducks. Yeah. Who is she? We don't know. They're dragging the lake now for any identification she might have had on her. So far, nothing. Drowned? Uh-uh. Hey, come here, I'll show you. Hmm? See? A knife wound. Where it is, it probably killed her instantly. Then they threw her in the lake. Who reported it? A guy and his girl. They were, you know, smooching. They looked up, saw the body floating in the water. They reported the precinct near the house. Anything? We questioned them. Why didn't they report it right away? They had an argument about it, they said. Didn't want to get into a mess, they said. Then the girl said she told her boyfriend we better report it, so they did. Who were they? Smoochers. Nothing else, Danny. We're positive. You made no comment, Danny. On what? The way this girl is dressed, the expensive evening gown, the expensive mink fur coat. I know it's real mink because my wife talks in her sleep about mink like that. So? So a lot, Danny. A girl as expensive, as beautiful as this one. Somebody will come asking for her. It's the least they could do, huh, Danny? There wasn't anything to say after that. And from far away, across the stillness, the brief, wild sob of a boat whistle... The sudden flurry of wind through naked branches. The quick, small sounds in places where there's no sun. This was the autumn's night pastora, with death in it. I turned up my collar and walked away from it. (laughs) 
The next morning, it was back to headquarters. Received the report that so far nothing had been found on the bottom of the lake to identify the dead girl. Go downstairs to the place where it's never daytime, the morgue, and the three people waiting there. The quiet audience sensing the etiquette of stillness in the presence of the dead. All right, you, the lady over there. Muggerman? Uh-huh. We want you to be sure, ma'am. I'm sure. Well? No, it's not my sister. Uh, that way out, ma'am. Now, the gentleman? My wife was blonde. Is this your wife? Uh, take it easy. I haven't seen Aggie in three years. This girl is 5'6", weight 124, approximately 22 years of age. Aggie's going to turn up here one of these days. I'll make book on it. But she ain't done it yet. This ain't Aggie. Uh, through that door over there, please. Uh, you're next, lady. Mrs. Hunter. Coslo! Hey, Coslo! Yeah, what do you want? Oh, it's her. Uh, get her out of here, will you? Yeah, come on, Mrs. Hunter. Mm-hmm. We know. Ever so often this happens with Mrs. Hunter, Danny. Really identified a daughter here about five years ago. Keeps coming back. I don't know. That's all of them, huh? Mm. Funny. Lovely young girl, dressed beautifully. Someone must want to know what's happened to her, where she is. Someone must know who she is. Okay, Muggerman, we'll try it another way. Another way was to check with the men in technical. Maybe they had something. They had. The dress the girl had worn to die in was an exclusive, made exclusively for one woman in an exclusive shop just off Park Avenue. The coat, too. The girl had good taste, they told me, and the money to indulge it, and the beauty to grace it. Beyond that, all they had was a shrug. So I packed it, shrug and all, in a cardboard suitcase. And on top of it, the portrait of the girl taken in death. And closed the cover, snapped the lock. At Roderick's Incorporated, just off Park Avenue, a man tried to stop me from opening the suitcase. Maybe I should have been proud. It was Roderick Incorporated himself. My good fellow, the hours for salesmen are between 9 and 10 of the morning. They are? And on Tuesdays and Thursdays of a week. Now that you've been briefed, you may scurry off. And uh, take that uh, that thing with you. This could interest you, Roderick. Why? Because I'm a policeman. Uh, Don't turn pale, Roderick. You don't match the color scheme that way. Whatever would a policeman want with Roderick? This picture, Roderick. Look at it. Hmm. Stunning girl. But so, uh, so dead. You know her? No, no, no. Oh, but wait, that dress she's wearing, it's mine. Uh, that is, it's a Roderick original. A Roderick uh, inspiration. Is it this dress? Oh, but of course, and the coat too. <laughs> Who else could have molded those lines? You molded them for this girl? Oh, no, no, never, never. Obviously, your dead girl is a thief. I created these things for Gladys Hampton, the advertising executive. Surely you've seen her in these things in Harper's. Where else can I see her? She has a place on Fifth, a tired mansion. Uh, Kiss her for me when you see her, will you? Tell her you do it for Roderick, eh? If you don't mind, Mr. Clover, let's get this over as quickly as possible, shall we? All you have to do is cooperate, Miss Hampton. Cooperate? I've just come home from Vermont. Just this morning, I've got work to do. Cooperating with police is not on the agenda. I want to show you something. These clothes, this coat, this dress. Where'd you get them? Have you ever seen them before? I'll tell you why I have. I paid a lot of money for them. They're mine. What are you doing with them? Well, look at this. Go ahead. Take a look at this picture. That's Joan. What's this all about? Who's Joan? Joan is Joan. Joan Fuller, my maid. What's happened? Didn't you miss her when you came home today? No, she didn't know when I was coming back. What's happened to her? We found her in Central Park Lake, murdered. I'm not going to like the publicity about this. That's how sorry you are. I don't allow myself those kind of luxuries. I'm too busy. Tell me about Joan. Well, she's worked for me for two years. She came from Muncie, Indiana. She was efficient. She lived here. I paid her well. I couldn't tell you more than that. How is it she was wearing your clothes? Before I left for the weekend, she said a young man she knew from Muncie was in town. She wanted to dress well for him. Would I lend her some clothes? I would and did. What young man from Muncie? 
How do I know what young man from Muncie? I suppose Muncie has its share of young men, else eventually there'd be no Muncie. Did you get a look at him? Well, he was coming in while I was going out. He was nice looking. I'd probably remember him if I saw him again, but I couldn't describe him. You see, I'm being of no help to you. Besides, I'm busy. Please close both doors to the vestibule as you go out, Mr. Clover. I did, and walked out into the street holding the crumbs she'd given me. The identity of the dead girl. A girl who had borrowed her employer's clothes to impress a young man from Muncie. A girl whose final embrace was holding close the bitter waters of a lake. At headquarters, the routine that is a requiem for the violent dead. A telegram to Muncie asking for information on Joan Fuller. The order to Mugovan to riffle through hotel registers for a visitor from Muncie. A young man, good looking. The sifting, the questioning. The break for a cup of lukewarm coffee. And then another call from Mugovan. Hotel Adams, Danny. A Johnny Barrett. Registered with his wife from Muncie. I looked at him, Danny. He looks likely. The tired room. Complete with stained drugs, stained washstand. The young man at the dresser, manicuring his fingernails. You are here to present me with the keys to the city? I'd like that, because I'm fond of your city. To ask you questions, Mr. Barrett. Now, what would a boy from the country know that would interest a big city man like you? He might have known a girl named Joan Fuller. He might have known a lot of girls. Not one named Joan, though. That's one he's missed. How big is Muncie, Mr. Barrett? Big enough that I could walk its streets, put nickels in slot machines, order a beer, go alone to movies, and never meet a girl named Joan. It teases me, though. I'd like to meet her. She's dead. She was murdered. That makes me sad. I cry when girls die. It's a thing with me. Let's go, Mr. Barron. I haven't finished my pinky. You want to show me the sights? I want to show you to a woman who says a young man came calling on Joan Fuller. A young man from Muncie. Hey, that could be a sight. Get your coat, Mr. Barrett. Let's go. Can't wait. Oh, honey. Honey doll, come on in. Enjoy looking at the shop windows? Jimmy, who is... A policeman, honey. He wants to go show me to a lady. This is my wife, Mr. Clover. Mrs. Barrett? It's hard to believe she's my wife, huh, Mr. Clover? Me being young and... Well, honey doll here being... But we love each other to pieces. Don't we, honey doll? Hmm? Jimmy, I don't understand. What's a policeman doing with you? Don't worry, baby, I told you. He wants a lady to look at me so she can identify me as the murderer of some pretty girl named Joan. She was pretty, huh, Mr. Clover? Uh, Jimmy, uh... Uh, Go window shopping again, honey doll. The policeman and I have got a date. Let's go, Jimmy. Sure, let's go. This house. Nice house. Ever been here before? No. Bet you wish I had, though. Nice chimes. Pretty. Nice. Funny. Vestibule doors open a bit. Miss Hampton liked her doors closed. Oh, you wouldn't peek, would you? Yeah, I would. <clears throat> Stuck. It'll only open half. Hey. Hand. Hey, look. What there was to look at was a vestibule floor, a tile mosaic in a simple block pattern. Clean, gleaming. Even the blood that spread across it had a new quality to it. Miss Hampton's blood. Miss Hampton, lying there. I knelt beside her. Miss Hampton with a knife in her heart. Miss Hampton, dead. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Are you ready to sing it again this Saturday night? You'll find a whole hour full of the day's popular music by Alan Dale, Bob Howard, Judy Lynn, and the Riddlers. 
you'll hear the tuneful riddle songs that lead to Sing It Again's Phantom Voice treasure trove. $5,000 in cash and 10000 more in wonderful prizes. Be listening to Sing It Again this Saturday night when it comes your way on most of these same CBS stations. The Phantom's a puzzler, but some CBS listener will win that five grand in cash. <laughs> When it's November and the winter is a-coming in, Broadway is a place of regret. The dreams are dying, and it's a long time before April will come again. The orange juice stands put glass doors between themselves and the pavement, serve hot coffee as a buffer against the wind and loneliness. Somebody leaves a newspaper on the stool beside you, not very neat, folded badly. There's a small bit of blackberry pie on the item that tells about a girl who floated face downward in the lake. You flip back a page and consider the minor headline concerning a woman named Gladys Hampton, also murdered. Then flip another one and see how they ran at Hialeah. You take your time. Outside, it's pavements. And outside, it's cold. I didn't have it so good. I got my coffee out of a paper cup, and Sergeant Tataglia had put too much cream in it. Or as he put it... Too much cream, huh? And not enough sugar. Ah, uh, you always get them mixed up, Danny. Why is this? We all have our bad days, Gino. Eh, only I seem to have them more frequent than most. Have you noticed? Uh, let's get on with it. You got anything for me? Uh, yeah, Danny, yeah. In the matter of Jimmy Barrett, the young man from Muncie, it has been established by the coroner that he could not have killed Gladys Hampton since, at the moment of her demise, Jimmy was with you. What about an alibi for last night when Joan Fuller was killed? He claims that he was doing the town up with his wife and cannot tell us what time he was where. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, what? What? He cannot tell us what time he was where, Danny. How does he like our pokey, Gino? Uh, not very much. He's screaming for his wife. Also, he wrote the little verse on the wild to tell us how much he didn't like it. It starts well, off... Tell me later, Gino. I'm going out. Uh, where, Danny? To see a man's wife. It's you. Where's my husband? What have you done with him? He's downtown, Miss Barrett. We're holding him on suspicion of murder. Well, don't stand there in the hall making a show of me before the world. Come in here. Come in. Sure, Miss Barrett. I was just washing out some of my things in the basin. You live in a dirty city, Mr. Clover. The dirt eats into everything. What right have you to do a thing like that to Jimmy? What right? Because we think he murdered a girl named Joan Fuller. A girl I read about? A girl from Muncie? Jimmy never knew her. He never knew anything like her. Not like her. You know that much about your husband, Mrs. Barrett? I'm a middle-aged woman, Mr. Clover. I know things about my husband that no girl ever knew. Why did you and Jimmy come to New York, Miss Barrett? You won't say any of the things people say when I tell them. Jimmy and I are on our honeymoon. Mrs. Barrett. He loves me. You saw how much he loves me. The sweet names he calls me. I saw, Mrs. Barrett. Took me a long time to bring Jimmy around to me, Mr. Clover. To the things I wanted. I'm not going to lose him to you. You'll help us. Maybe we can give him back. This is a trick. You're trying to trick me. You want me to say something about him that'll make him dead. Something that can save him. Oh, what can I tell you that will do that? Did he ever leave you alone on your honeymoon? Go off somewhere alone? Never. Why, Jimmy waits on me hand and foot. That's what first attracted me to him back home. How polite he was. How considerate. When he could have had any girl. Here, Mrs. Barrett. Has he left you alone here? I told you no. He was alone when I found him. That was different. I, I went window shopping. I like to do that alone. I like to come back and tell him the things I saw. All the useless, expensive, frilly things that are no use to anyone. Just good to look at sometimes. You've done that other times? Oh, back home, in Muncie, not here. One more question, Miss Byrne. Did you know Joan Fuller? No, I didn't know her. My husband didn't know her. I haven't told you anything that'll save him, have I? No. But I will. You'll see. I hired a lawyer. He's getting a writ. You'll bring Jimmy back to me. You'll see. Wait till I tell Jimmy how you treated me. Just you wait. I'll wait. Don't take Jimmy back home with you, Mrs. Barrett. We'll want you both here. Here. <laughs> 
Come on in, Chino. Okay. Just a word to let you know that people questioned around the home of Gladys Hampton had never seen Jimmy Barrett. Also, that Jimmy is released on a writ. Yeah, I was threatened with it. And to tell you that outside is a gentleman from Muncie, Indiana. Another one? Yeah, Danny. You know, this is the first week in my life I have met two people from Muncie, Indiana. One on top of the other. Show them in, Gino. They're this way in to see Danny Clover, Mr. Fuller. Sit down, Mr. Fuller. Thank you. I'm Joan's father, Mr. Clover. I see. I'm very sorry about what... Thank you, but of course you're not sorry. If we mean the same thing by that word. You're a policeman on homicide and your job's got to do with dead people. People get used to death almost as easy as they do to cigarettes. The sorrow of Joan's death belongs to me, not to you. Forgive me, I made a speech. How did you know your daughter was dead? You notified the Muncie police, they notified me. I've come to take her home with me. If I can help... I'm the person who killed her. We're trying, Mr. Fuller. I've never been vengeful. I've always felt sorry for people eaten by hate. Now it's happened to me. I can understand. Tell me, Mr. Fuller, do you know a man named Jimmy Barrett from Muncie? Of course. Joan knew him, too. Pardon me a second. Bataglia. Roger, Danny. There's a man tailing Jimmy Barrett, isn't there? Yeah, Danny. Get in touch with him. Find out where Jimmy is. Roger. Over. We were talking about Jimmy Barrett, Mr. Fuller. Tell me about him. Well, Jimmy married a woman somewhat older than he. Rather wealthy woman. Why do you ask? He's honeymooning in New York. How well did your daughter know him? Mm, Valentine's. Letters on flowered stationery. Holding hands and dances. That much. No more than that. I see. What did Joan tell you she was doing in New York? Working in advertising, she said. Everyone back in Muncie thought that. I didn't know she was a maid. I know how you feel. Forgive me again, you can't possibly know. Did you have a daughter? Did you tell her stories? Did she cry against your cheek? Did you watch her grow up? Was she found in a lake? Was she murdered? Mr. Fuller, I... We don't know each other, Mr. Clover. We're not friends. Your sympathy doesn't mean anything to me. Just find my daughter's killer. Danny? Well, what is it, Tatalia? The man we had tailing Jimmy Barrett just phoned in. Jimmy just bought himself a new car five minutes ago. Brand new Hudson. Where? Tobin's on 105th Street. Thanks, Gino. You're primed to buy a new car, mister? You're just tantalizing yourself with this new model. I want to, uh... Sure you want to. Everybody wants to. There's no feeling like the feeling of running your hand over this new all-leather upholstery. Save it. I'm from the police. That makes you different? That gives you desires different from other people's Look, desires? a man named James Barrett was just in... Oh, I'll never forget him. He bought a new car off of me not a half hour ago, paid me cash, drove away on a dream. Cash? $2,500. He just took $2,500 out of his pocket and gave it to you? Well, not exactly. Uh, let me give you a vivid description of it. I found it very thrilling. It thrilled me, too. He looked at the car, asked me how much it was as I stood there, and I told him. Then he runs across the street to the bank, runs back with $2,500 clutched in his wet fist. So you see why it wasn't exactly he pulled it out of his pocket. He was clutching it in his wet fist. Bank across the street, huh? Yeah. Hey, what's the matter? He got it from the bank. It can't be counterfeit, can it? Don't give me heart failure like that. Hit me in the face with it. It's not counterfeit, is it? Don't you find it rather interesting, Mr. Clover, that I, Stephen Chase, am working for the Corn Exchange Bank? We Chases have a bank of our own, you know. I know. And you're the Chase who gave Barrett $2,500. Precisely that Chase. Does Barrett have an account here? As of this morning, a rather plump one. He opened an account this morning and withdrew that much money this afternoon? I see you don't understand banks. Oh, explain them to me. Uh, Mrs. Barrett had a letter of credit from a bank in Muncie, Indiana, which she chose to deposit here with us at Corn. Go on. Uh, please. Therefore, this account was in Mrs. Barrett's name. However, this morning, Mr. Barrett appeared. Mr. Barrett, the bearer of a letter from his wife to the effect that her account should now be a joint account. Was that all? Please. I called Mrs. Barrett to find out whether the letter was valid. Mrs. Barrett told me to give her husband as much money as he wanted. All this happened this morning? Precisely this morning. Precisely, Mr. Chase. Oh, 
Oh, hiya, Danny. Just going out. Want to go out with us? No, I'm coming in. Oh, Miss Barrett. So you got all your things packed. Going back to Muncie? Oh, no, no. You said we couldn't go back to Muncie until this thing was all cleared up. We're going to find a nicer place to live. Yeah, me and the honey doll are going to branch out. Nothing but a ball from now on. We're really going to live. Aren't we, honey doll? You're whatever you want, Jimmy. Tell me what you want, Jimmy. What I want? Get out of this crummy hole. New clothes for honey doll. And for me, drapes. Double-breasted. I understand you got a new car. It's got New York talking, huh? We're talking about it down at headquarters. Uh, Jimmy, uh, the man said he'd show us the penthouse at 9 o'clock. It's almost that now. You heard what Honey Doll said, Danny. I guess I'm henpecked, that's all. Tell me when all this happened, Jimmy. The last time I saw you, you were happy right here. How much are you allowed to meddle in our lives? What concern is it of yours where we live? Oh, Honey Doll, don't talk like that to Danny. He wants to come up for a drink sometime. He wants to know our address. Get him out of here. You didn't answer my question, Jimmy. When did you make up your mind about all this? New car, penthouse. I'll tell you. Honey Doll and me had a small talk. We decided we were tired of living like folks, like other people. Honey Doll wants to support me in the manner I'm itching for. And she can afford it. Come here, Honey Doll. Jimmy. Jimmy, get him out of here. Baby, this is Jimmy. Jimmy with his arms around you. Stop it. Okay, okay. But you're supposed to give me anything I want, remember? You're a little blackmail, Jimmy. Huh? I had a talk with Joan's father. He said you used to hold hands with his daughter. And if you did that, you lied to me. You did now, John. You did lie to me. Danny, so I lied to you. I was nervous. It's getting late, Jimmy. Did you lie to him, Miss Bert? Did you know Joan back in Muncie? No. But you knew Jimmy knew her. You knew Jimmy was seeing her while you were here, while you were on your honeymoon, Miss Bert. Oh, why not, Danny? Guy likes to look up old friends. Especially an old friend who's made good in the big city. I got news for you. Joan was a housemaid. Those clothes she was wearing belonged to her employer. I knew that. And I understand why she did it. To impress me. To make me hate myself because I married another woman. Jimmy, you realize what your lying can cost you. Sure, Danny. Now I'm your number one murder suspect. That's right. Danny. Uh Uh-huh. What's the penalty for murder in this state? Premeditated. Premeditated? Life, the chair. Depends on the jury. And how about for obstructing justice? Depends. One to ten, maybe. But for murder, it can be the chair, huh? That's right. Did you hear that, honey doll? You're going to get the chair. Jimmy. You killed so you could keep your husband in you, Mrs. Barrett. Jimmy. I'm begging you. Get him out of here. You were afraid Jimmy would get blamed for it because Miss Hampton, her employer, could recognize him. You had to kill Miss Hampton, too, didn't you? Jimmy! That's what you held over your wife, Jimmy. You knew all this. She had to give you everything you wanted. Thought you'd get as soon as you were married, but didn't. One to ten, huh? That's the way it was, Danny. No! Oh! You fell! I killed my girl! Killed my girl! And you fell! Don't take it so hard, honey doll. You've lived almost most of your life. They had a week of it with me. Let's go, both of you. Honey doll, I promise you this. When I get out, not spend your money. I'll be happy. Just the way you wanted me to. Broadway looks good now. It's wearing the funny mask with the funny nose. And the big smile painted in scarlet. The scarlet you've known in other places and other times. Don't rip off the mask, kid, because you couldn't stand what you'd see. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat.
Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Irene Tedrow, Dick Crenna, Bob Bruce, Peggy Weber, Stan Waxman, and Jack Crucian. This Saturday evening on CBS, Hopalong Cassidy comes riding to the rescue of an old friend who's suspected of a serious crime. It's a long, tough job Hoppy takes on, literally risking his own neck. With one of the greatest surprise endings you've ever heard, Hoppy comes through. Be listening this Saturday and every Saturday evening when the one and only Hopalong Cassidy, starring William Boyd, is heard on most of these same CBS stations. Dan Coverly speaking, this is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond. If you spotted me on the street, you'd probably figure me for an average working man. But you'd be wrong. I fit the description all right because I break my back six days a week to keep my piggy bank nice and stuffed. But my occupation puts me in a class by myself. I'm a private, honey, nothing in this world but detective. You probably say, so what? The average working man comes under the heading of a lot of different jobs. And you'd be right on that count. But there's one little thing that puts me in a class all by myself. Trouble. Mr. and Mrs. Average John Doe work six days a week to keep clear of it. I put in the same time playing footsies with it. It's a kind of silent partner with references dating all the way back to the year one. People get in trouble every second, and I count on a small percentage to come to me to get them out of it. The rest? Odds and good advertising. As an example, take the other night in a little bistro over on 48th Street. A couple of guys sitting at a back table were getting set for a special brand of trouble. The big kind that you find under the heading of murder. Oh, Bert, old boy, this is turning out to be a wonderful evening. I'm glad you're enjoying it, George. Yes. Say, who's a blonde over there in the booth? Hmm? Well, I've never seen her before, but she's cute. Yeah, she's sure. Good evening, baby. Oh, George, George, take it easy. Maybe she's waiting for someone. Oh, don't be silly. Look, she's smiling. Let's ask her over to the table. Well, huh? I still think she's waiting for someone. If you want to take the chance, go ahead. You ask her. All right, I will. I uh, said good evening. Good evening. Uh, my friend and I noticed you were sitting alone, and uh, we wondered if you'd join us. Oh, I don't believe I can. You see... Oh, please. Just for a few drinks? No, Really? Thank you, just the same. Well, if you say so, but I'll be unhappy for the rest of the evening. Hi, baby. Tony. I'm sorry I took so long, but... Hey, who's this guy? Not Tony. I said, who's the guy? Uh, if you'll excuse me. No, you wait a minute. Uh, George, come on. I think we'd better leave. This guy a friend of yours? Yes, he is. Was this guy making a pitch, man? No, he only asked me over for a drink. Oh, he did, huh? Now, wait a minute, pal. Please, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. So you made a mistake. Well, I don't like jokers that try and pick up my girl. Oh, hey, wait a minute. You didn't have to slug him. Maybe you'd like to do something about it. Maybe I would. Oh, Loud enough. That's the first time Tony ended up on the short end of a fight in a long time. Is that right, George? Yes. I think I cut my head. Yeah, you're bleeding all over the place. You better get out of here, mister. I saw the manager duck in the back room. He's probably calling the car. Here, let me give you a hand, George. Uh, uh, here, now, uh, take my hat and wear it over the cut until you get home. I'm getting out here, too. You want me to drop you off? Uh, what about your boyfriend? He's still unconscious. He was that way when I met him. You want the lift or not? Yeah, what about you, Bert? Oh, I'll be all right. I'll go on let her take you somewhere so you can get cleaned up. I'll grab a cab and head for my place. I'll call you in the morning. But I don't now want... Now, stop to... arguing. You can't afford a scandal. Well, all right. Come on, honey. Let's go. Well, this very 
nice apartment. You better go get cleaned up. Uh, back through that room. I'll get a couple of drinks. I can sure use a drink. I won't be long. Take your time. Yes. Tell me, get out of here. Where is that guy? Come on, get out of here. Why, you cheap little... I'll beat it out of you. Let go of me. Take your hands off me. Take your hands off her. Help. I'll kill the both of you. Help. There's a gun in the a gun? All right. I'll wring your little neck. Oh. You shot him. I did? You better get out of here. Yeah, but uh, what about you? Go on, get out while you can. I'll think of something. Yeah. Leave the gun. I'll throw it in the river or something. Hmm? Huh? Oh, all right. Now go on, beat it. You just killed a man. <laughs> Yeah, come in. Hiya, Mr. Diamond. Well, Hennessy, what did you do, wreck your cab? Nah, it's down in the front. Hey, that's a warm magazine you're reading there. Yeah. Listen to what it says here about women's bathing suits. Huh? 1949 suits allow maximum exposure to sun. Note plunging neckline. <laughs> Note. Who's going to miss it? If it plunged in the lower, it'd wind up at the bends. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Mr. Diamond, would you mind shoving it in a drawer? The picture distracts me. Mm, not at all, no. I, I don't blame you, Hennessy. Thanks. Now, what's on your mind? This. A hat? Yeah. Well, I don't think I can do you much good. What did you bring it to me for? I found it in the gutter over in Flatbush. So what? Some guy loses a hat. Don't tell me you want me to find him. No, I, I just got to worrying a little, you see. I, I found this beside you. Oh, a thirty-eight. Well, let's have a look. Take a look at the hat, too. It's got blood all over the inside. Yeah. And initials on the inside. BK. Gun's been fired. You can still smell the powder in the barrel. Why didn't you take this to the police? Oh, I didn't want to get mixed up in it. You see, I got to pick up as many fares as I can. I ain't got nobody to drive my cab for me, and I didn't want to spend the day answering questions down at headquarters. You understand? Well, you'll probably have to anyway. I'll have to notify them. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I, I thought maybe you could find out who owned the hat and maybe solve the case before you notify him, you see? That way I wouldn't have to spend too much time. I could just tell him I found it and beat it. Well, I can't withhold evidence. It'd take away my license. And if you did, they'd lock you up. Okay, I, I just thought Well, maybe... I can check the hat store before I get to the 5th Precinct. Yeah, well, uh, won't that be a tough job? There's a lot of hat stores, well, you this know. this hat's got a label. Besides, when someone finds a bloody hat with a thirty-eight lying next to it, I, I get interested. Particularly when there isn't a corpse to go with it. Yeah. Well, I gotta go, Mr. Diamond. Thanks a lot. You got a free ride any time you want it. I may take you up on that. So long, Hennessy. Well, there you are. What did that tell you? When you're working with trouble, something always shows up. Sometimes it's just a routine case. A guy knocks off his wife and he comes to you because he suddenly found out that he had that lonely feeling. Or maybe you get a real screwy one. A taxidermist that got tired of stuffing animals and went to work on a neighbor. Or then you get one that gives you the same feeling you get when you pick up a poker hand and the first four cards you look at are all spades. Well, I was holding two cards. A hat with blood on it, a gun that had been fired, and all I needed to fill out the hand was a body. By all rights, I should have taken the evidence right down to my friend, Lieutenant Levinson, at Homicide. But I didn't have anything to do, so I decided to see what kind of pieces I could fit into the puzzle. The label in the hat was from a store on Fifth Avenue. It wasn't far from my office, so I walked it. Yes, sir. Something I can do for you? Yeah. Stop munching your sense in and tell me if this hat is from your store. Well, let me see it. These glasses are not telescopes, you know. Yeah. Here. Well, if you're planning to return this merchandise, sir, I can assure you the store will not accept it. You've been bleeding on the sweatband. Look, Rosebud, I just want to know if the hat is from this store. It most certainly is. It's one of our custom models. Who did you sell it to? If you found this hat, we will be glad to return it to its owner. We are not supposed to give out the names of our clients. I have a small badge here that should cut this conversation down to a few words. See? Oh. Now, would you mind telling me to whom did you sell this hat? Well, just because you're a detective, I am not impressed. 
However, under the circumstances, I'll give you the buyer's name. You're a real sport. I suppose you wear a shoulder holster, too. Or is that bulge your tailor's fault? Psst. Come here. I really keep a midget in there. You don't say. Yeah. He spits through the lapel of stupid hat clerks. Oh, really? Now, come on, Bright Eyes. Who bought the hat? Well, if you'll just hold your horses. That's the new line, if I ever heard one. Come on, Bubbles. Yeah. Here it is. This hat was sold to a Mr. Bertram Calmus. We make all his hats for him. Well, bully for you. What's his address? 430 Sutton Place. Now, will that be all, sir? Yes, that will be all, and thank you. You've been a brick through the whole ugly mess. I left him watering his gardenia and headed for the residence of one Mr. Bertram Calmus. The apartment house was about ten blocks away, and with the money I had in my pocket, all taxicabs started looking like iron claws with four wheels. I walked. Yes? How do you mean that? Yes, I don't want any. Oh, and I've got a pretty good sales talk. I never buy anything unless I have a demonstration. My middle name is Semper Paratus. Like the Coast Guard, I'm always prepared. I suppose I could top that, but I'm getting tired of trying to close the door on your foot. What is it you want? I hate to admit it, but I'm looking for Bertram Calmus. My husband. Good for him. Is he in? No, but he will be any minute. And for the boss. This hat, I believe, is his. What blonde's apartment did it turn up in? It was found in the gutter in Flatbush. Well, Flatbush is a little out of his territory, but the gutter sounds familiar. It's that stain all over it. Blood? Does your husband bleed a lot? Not recently. We've been getting along. Are you from the police? I'm a detective. Oh. Come in. Mm, I'd hate to be selling brushes. I'd have slammed the door on your face. Oh, well, then I made an impression. Perhaps. Let's just say you're waiting for a sacrifice to move you to second base. <laughs> Won't you sit down? Thanks. What happens when I round third? And that depends on your batting average, Mr. Diamond, Mrs. Calmus. That fits. Now, getting back to a very dull subject, does this hat belong to your husband? I don't know. It looks like one of his. Has it got any initials in the band? Mm-hmm. BK. When did you find it? I didn't. The cab driver picked it up this morning. And it isn't my husband's blood. He left about a half an hour ago to do some shopping, and he was very bloodless. No cuts on his head? No cuts. He came in around two this morning. He'd been drinking, but he wasn't cut up. Oh, there he is now. I hope he can discuss baseball and the time. Oh, I got all the things you wanted in it. Um, Bert, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Yeah? Well, how are you? Fine, Mr. Calvin. Tell me, is this your hat? My hat? Let me see it. Why, no. No, it isn't. The hat store on Fifth Avenue says it's older to you. Well, I can't help what they say. That's not my hat. Are you sure, darling? It was found in a gutter. I don't care if they found it on a Yale man in the Harvard Club. It's not mine. Well, I guess I'll have to take your word for it. Uh, wait, wait. Isn't that blood on the hat? Mm, yeah. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Calmus. Mr. Calmus, nice meeting you both. I'll see you to the door. I can do it. I know you can, dear. Coming, Mr. Diamond? Sure. Bye. Come back again, Mr. Diamond. Well, goodbye, Mr. Calmus. Where? Where can I call you? What? I can't explain now. Where can I call you in about a half an hour? My office. It's in the book. You'll hear from me, but please, please don't do anything until then. Okay. Half an hour. Then I go to the police with this hat. <laughs> So, why did you deny it? Well, I was out with a pal last night. There was a fight over a girl. I didn't want to mention it in front of my wife. Oh, how did the blood get on the hat? My friend got hit on the head, and I loaned him my hat to cover up the wound. What was it doing in a gutter in Flatbush? I really don't know. My friend left with the girl, and I went right home. Oh. Well, who is this friend of yours? I think something may have happened to him. Well, I called him this morning, and he seemed very nervous about something, and he asked me to come over. I'm in the lobby of this hotel right now. Ah, uh, he's probably just worried about the girl he picked up. As long as the blood on the hat was from a cut on his head, I don't think there's too much to worry about. No, no, Mr. Diamond, I, I think it's more than that. He's my employer, and I know him pretty well. I do wish you'd come over. Well, all right, Mr. Calmus. What's the address? The Whitsitt Hotel on East 54th Street. I'll meet you in the lobby. 
Don't ask me why I started getting that lousy feeling when all I had was a bloody hat, a gun, and a pretty good explanation for one of the items. But there it was, that jammed up feeling in the pit of my stomach like I'd just swallowed a whole pineapple. Something was wrong, and I wanted to find out what. So I hurried over the, to the Whitsitt Hotel and met Calmus in the lobby. I'm glad you came, Mr. Diamond. I just put in a call to George's room and someone else answered. So what? Well, the man asked a lot of questions, like who I was and why I... What did I want with George? And... Oh, I, I take it George is your friend of last night. Yes, George Watkins. He's the president of the firm I work for. Well, let's go up. When someone starts asking questions like that on the phone, it begins to sound like the police have moved in. Come on. Yeah. Oh, hello, Walt. Rick, what are you doing here? Fair question. I'll answer yours if you'll do the same for me. I came up to see a Mr. George Watkins. So did I. Well, what's the matter? Is George in some kind of trouble? Who's this guy? Oh, he's a friend of Watkins. Works for him. Oh, yeah? Well, come on in. George. George, what's going on here? You better let the lieutenant tell you, Bert. I can't think anymore. What's the charge, Walt? Murder. But, hmm? Murder? You got a call from a girl last night who said a man named George Watkins killed someone in her apartment. When we got over there, we found the girl there, too. Oh, well, you must have the wrong man, Inspector George. Lieutenant. Wouldn't... And I'm sure you think George wouldn't, but he just confessed. George? Yes, Bert, I killed the man. But I, I didn't kill her. The man came in and tried to strangle her. She told me to get the gun in the drawer, and when the man wouldn't let her go, I shot him. That isn't what the girl told us. She said she took this gun home, or this guy home after he'd been in a fight, and when they got to her apartment, he made a pass just as her boyfriend came in. Then Watkins shot him and ran out. We figured he got excited, and when he had time to think about it, he went back and killed the only other witness. I didn't kill the girl. I never went back there at all. I came straight here. Uh, Walt, Mr. Kalmus here was with him up until the time he left with the girl. Is that right, Mr. Kalmus? Why, yes, sir. Now, there was a previous fight, and Watkins got that cut on his head. Mr. Kalmus loaned him his hat to cover the wound. That's right, sir. And, uh, oh, by the way, Walt, what caliber was the murder weapon? Thirty-eight. but we haven't found the gun yet. Here, check this one with ballistics. How'd you find this? Cab driver named Hennessy brought it into me this morning. Found it lying with a hat. Did you ever see this gun before, Watkins? No, I, I told you I don't own a gun. Well, what time do you figure he killed the man and the girl? The coroner fixed the time of death about one o'clock this morning. Hmm. How long were you at this girl's apartment, Mr. Watkins? Why, about five minutes before her boyfriend came in. I shot him and left immediately. And you don't remember taking your hat or the gun? What are you getting at, Rick? This is an open and shut case. He admits killing one of them, but he won't admit the other killing because he knows it was premeditated. Oh, just a hunch, Walt, just a hunch. Mr. Watkins, would you mind telling me just what happened after the girl's boyfriend started choking you? Well, I grabbed a gun out of the dresser near the kitchen and I shot him. And the girl told me to get out, that she'd take care of things, so I dropped the gun and ran. Did you hear anything else? Anything unusual? No, but yes, now that you mention it. I did hear something, but it slipped my mind until now. What did you hear? Well, I, I don't know whether I can describe it or not. It uh, sounded like someone had opened a bottle of flat champagne. What are you getting at, Rick? Oh, wait a minute, Walt. When did you hear this noise? Right after I shot the man. I remember wondering if someone hadn't opened a bottle in the kitchen. Is that where the noise came from? Uh, yes, I think so. Hmm. Oh. All right, if I go over and case the scene, Walt? We've done that. Yeah, but you weren't looking for something. Why don't you come with me, Mr. Calmus? I'd like to talk with you. What's the address, Walt? 16 West 113th Street. Well, now, look, don't worry too much, George. I can handle the business, and in the meantime, I'll do everything to get you off. Thanks, Bert. Now, you wait a minute, Rick. If you think you know something... Walt! Yeah? Bye. Calmus and I went downstairs and took a cab over to 16 West 113th Street. It was a middle-class apartment house in Flatbush, a four-story brownstone. I let Calmus pay the fare, and we went in. I wonder what floor it's on. Well, she'll tell on the mailboxes. Yeah, here it is. Nan Phillips, 206. Well, let's go up. Oh, uh, what do you do for Mr. Watkins? I'm his vice president. That's why I took him out last night. I wanted to interest him in a new account. I just can't imagine him killing anyone, but... I guess people do funny things when they lose their heads. Oh, oh. 206. Oh, here it is. Yeah? Hello. Oh, no. 
Good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. What do you want, Diamond? Oh, I want to stand out here in the hall and count the hairs in your five o'clock shadow. Now let us in. The lieutenant said it was all right. Okay, comic. Mr. Calmus, meet Sergeant Otis. How are you? Hello, Sergeant. Otis, make like a policeman and point out the circumstances in this killing, will you? Well, I don't know why I should, Shamus, but if the lieutenant sent you over, I guess I'll have to. Mm. Two bodies was over there by the window, lying pretty close together. Uh-huh. And the killer, that Watkins fellow, was standing about here in the center of the room. With his back to the kitchen door? Yeah. He shot them both from about here. Hey, what are you looking for? Oh, I like to get out on my hands and knees. It's cooler. And I won't do you no good to start looking for fancy clues. The guy already confessed. Well, 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 well. Hey, what do you got there? Just a wad. So, you got some wadding from the murder gun. You better give it here. Sure. But hang on to it, Otis, and be sure to give it to the lieutenant. Maybe you haven't noticed, but murder guns don't throw this much wadding unless you can kill someone with a blank cartridge. What? Uh, don't let it throw you. Mr. Calmus, I've got some things to do. Can I drop you somewhere? Well, no thanks. Now that Mr. Watkins can't take care of the office, I'd better go down and check over some things. But I'll keep in touch with you, Mr. Diamond. Uh, you do that. Uh, now, wait a minute, Diamond. Oh, stop trying to figure it out, Otis. You'll snap your wig. I was getting close to something. I wanted to tie the ends together before it caught up with me. I had a big, fat hunch that Watkins had been framed good, and the more I found out, the more it looked like a killer was still loose. The whole setup had been screwy from the first. Why would a guy lose his hat and drop his gun in the same place? Or, if he threw them both away, why wouldn't he burn the hat and throw the gun in the river? Nobody's frightened enough to lay them side by side in the gutter. I learned a lot since this morning, and I was certain of one thing. The killer tried to make it look good. But he was an awful amateur. I knew something else, too. Amateurs can be awfully mean sometimes when you corner them. I put in a call to Walt and told him what I had, and then I asked him to give me half an hour and, and meet me at Mrs. Calmus's flat. I grabbed another cab, and 20 minutes later, I was sitting on a long couch next to Mrs. Calmus. It's easy to get that crowded feeling, even on a long couch. You just both sit on the same cushion. Comfy? Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of perfume is that? My sin. Past or future tense? A rounding second. Mm. What brought you back, Mr. Diamond? Oh, I, uh, I want to ask a couple of questions. Past or future tense? What time did your husband get in last night? I told you, about two o'clock. Why? Do you know if he knows a girl named Nan Phillips? I really don't know. Oh. Well, all right. Just a few more questions, and then we'll get back to that perfume. I'll think ahead. You said you'd been getting along with your husband. Would you mind explaining that? Certainly. I like nice things, and lately he's been buying them for me. Oh. What's your husband's salary? About 15000 a year. Oh, could he afford to buy you these things? Well, he told me he was getting a raise, and then he'd gotten a big advance. What's this all about? Maybe I'd better tell you. Bert, I didn't hear you. I did. What are you doing with that gun? I'm going to use it. I found Mr. Diamond making passes at my wife, and I shot him. Are you crazy? Don't ask him that. He's allowed to start thinking about it. You can't shoot me and get away with it, Calmus. What are you going to do with your wife? She won't back you up. No. No, I guess she wouldn't. All right, both of you, get up and walk downstairs to my car. Bert, what are you doing? Your husband killed two people last night, Mrs. Calmus. Now he's going to try and cover because he guessed I knew how it was done. You're not going to kill me, too. Get moving. Bert, please. Go on. Why did you kill anyone, Bert? He wanted to frame his boss. I'll bet when the company checks, they'll find out he's had his hand in the till. They won't find out, Mr. Diamond. With Mr. Watkins' book for murder, I'm next in line for president. I'll be able to fix the book so it will look like he took the money, too. Is that where you got the money for all those things you've been buying for me? You shot the man and the girl from the kitchen with a silencer, didn't you, Bertram? That's right. I knew you were onto something when you discovered that wad from the blank cartridge. I was onto something a long time before that. Yeah? All right. Come on. Over to that gray sedan. And remember, I've still got this gun in my pocket. Ah, uh, you're an amateur, Bertram. Is that right? Sure. I knew you had something to do with it when we got over to the girl's apartment. I didn't know what floor it was on, and you looked in the mailboxes. That's the best way to find an apartment, isn't it? Yeah, but not once at any time did anyone mention the dead girl's name. But you knew it and found it on the mailbox. All right, stop right here. 
Open the door, Jean, and get in first. The front seat. Please. Get in. All right. Now, you, Mr. Diamond, you're going to drive. You know, I left my license in my other suit. Stop stalling. I had to do something to stall for just a second because over Bertram's shoulder I spotted a prowl car sliding up to the curb and good old Walt was climbing out. Uh, uh, Bertram, would you mind answering just one question? What is it? The gun that Watkins thought he killed the man with was loaded with blanks, wasn't it? Sure. I killed the guy from the kitchen with a silencer. The whole thing was rigged, huh? The man and the girl were supposed to stage that fight, and Watkins was supposed to shoot the guy with the dummy slug. You said one question. Now get in the car. All right, Thomas, don't move. What? Why, you... Just... <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was a close one. You're so right, Walt. Take his gun. I think you'll find it's the one that Watkins fired the branks from. How is he? On his way. Hey, Bertram. I'll go call the wagon. Bertram. Yes? You want to tie the ends together? I paid the girl and the man to stage the fight. I told them I wanted to frame George and blackmail him. So you framed him with a double murder instead. Why? I've been stealing money from the company. How'd you know it was me? Well, knowing the girl's name, for one thing, and your wife told me you'd gotten in about two. Oh. You told me over the phone you went straight home after the fight in the cafe. The killing took place about one. Watkins uh, said he'd been at the girl's for five minutes. About 15 to get to her place, so that meant you all left the cafe around 12.30. It doesn't take an hour and a half to get... Hey, Bertram. Diamond. Huh? I don't think Bert can hear you. Yeah. Well, it was a pretty dull story anyway. <laughs> Well, the wagon got there, and I briefed Walt on everything that had happened. They took Mrs. Calmus home and released Watkins. It was a stinking hot afternoon, and I needed something cool to bring me down to normal, so I headed for 975 Park Avenue. A tall lemonade with a mind of its own, and a covetous redhead with the same gimmick. Yes? Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Diamond. Afternoon, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the study, reading. Thanks, Francis. Oh, uh, how about something cool? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Hi. Hi. Well, you look cool enough. That's a nice getup. You like it? It's the newest thing. Yeah, I uh, saw it in a magazine. What do you do if it shrinks? Oh, silly. No, no, I'm concerned. You might get raided. Don't you like it? Yes, ma'am. What do you think of me? Ah, oh, you're adorable. You're beautiful and you're cute. Too. Hey, that sounds like a song. Uh-huh. Come here. No, not nice sing it. It's cute. That's too hot. I'm rather cool. Well, I was only lukewarm until I spotted that play suit. Go on. A, you're adorable. Okay, but uh, then I want to play. <laughs> Get it? Play? Play suit? <laughs> that was then. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No. Go on. A, you're adorable. B, you're so beautiful. C, you're a cutie full of charm. D, you're a darling. And E, you're exciting. And F, you've got feathers on your arm. Oh, Rick. G, you look good to me. H, you so heavenly. I, you're the one I idolize. J, we're like Jack and Jill. K, you're so kissable. L, is the love light in your eyes. Rick. M, hmm? Do you want me to finish? I love you. Oh, you're sweet. Come here. Mm-hmm. Uh, just one moment, sir. Uh, yes, Francis? I'm not going to be embarrassed again. Here's your lemonade. Uh, thank you, Francis. Oh, it's nothing, sir. A, you're adorable. B, you're so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Byron Kane, Lorene Tuttle, Paul Fries, and Wally Mayer. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. 
Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. I have a little office on Broadway at 53rd Street. And if you happen to be in the neighborhood sometime, you might notice a sign on the door. It reads, Diamond Detective Agency. Yeah, that's how I make a living, such as it is. I sit at my desk behind that door and wait for someone to come in and hire me. Eventually, trouble works its way into someone's life and gives him a shove in my direction. He tells me about it, and I listen with the attitude of a father confessor. When he's done, I dry my eyes and tell him what I think. What I think really doesn't matter, because it's just a shortcut to a hundred dollars a day in expenses. Sure, you can hire a guy for less money, but when I work, it's for a price I figure I'm worth. It's got to be that way because sometimes it works a little dirty, and I have to swallow a lot of pride. I get mixed up in everything from simple divorce to muscle-bound homicide, and when trouble can't find me a client, it starts working on yours truly, and I wind up in a corner. I guess trouble figured I was just about due for a squeeze play because one night last week... Two lifers in the state pen started working me into their plans. Well, what about it, Walsh? Shut up. Wait until the guards pass. Okay. Drag out the cards like we was playing. Sure. Is it uh, set for the night? Yeah. I got the car and everything. Yeah. We'll head for Florida and get across to Cuba. Oh, well, I'd be glad to get out of this. Uh, three lousy years. Yeah, I got eight behind me. I used every minute figuring how I'm going to take care of a guy. Oh, Walsh, you're not going to start that again? Forget it. Be glad you're getting out. You knock off that guy and you'll never make it to Cuba. Now, look. I figured this whole thing out. I paid out a lot of dough just to make it come off. And when it does, I'm going to kill an ex-cop. And you're going to help me. Me? Yeah. Unless you want to rot here. Oh, you're out of your mind. If this break comes off, it'll be the neatest trick in years. And you want to louse it up by knocking off some guy on the outside? You can stay here and rot if you want to. The only way I take you along is you help me to get a guy named Diamond. Yeah, but you waste a lot of time in New York. They'll have the roads covered by then. Look, just because this diamond guy knocked off your brother in that bank job, you see. You, you bust out of here, it's on my terms. I... Now make up your mind, it's getting late. Okay, give me the layout. <laughs> Yeah, what is it, Otis? We just got a call, Lieutenant. Two prisoners busted out of Sing Sing, killed two guards. Who are they? Big time. Bob Wells and Charles Walsh. Charles Walsh? Yeah, lifer. I know, I know. Diamond helped send him up before I took over this department. Otis, get Diamond on the phone. Diamond? Yeah, Diamond. Who'd you think I meant? Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah, yeah Lieutenant. Mm, oh, Diamond, Otis. Bring me my bike, Diamond, Otis. Someday I'm going to get good and sore. What did you say? Uh, nothing. Ah, uh, nuts. Now, what's the matter? His office don't answer. Give me that phone. Huh? We've got to find him before Walsh does. Maybe he's over at Helen Asher's house. All right, Otis, stop standing on one foot. You can leave. Mr. 
Asher's residence. Hello, Francis. This is Lieutenant Levinson. Is Diamond there? Why, no, sir, but Miss Asher expects him. Oh, oh wait a moment, sir. Here's Miss Asher. It's Lieutenant Levinson for Mr. Diamond, Miss Helen. Oh, thank you, Francis. Hello, Walt. How are you, Helen? I was looking for Rick. Oh, I was just talking to him. He should be here in about 20 minutes. Why? Uh, will you have him call me right away? Is something wrong? Oh, no, no. Just tell him... Tell him an old friend of his is in town, and I have to talk to him about it. Oh, all right, Walt. I'll tell him. Well, thanks, Helen. It'll be at least 20 minutes. He's walking over from his office. Okay, Diamond, hold it right there. Start walking over to that sedan. Don't you know it's not polite to point? Look, laughing boy, I got a big gun in my pocket. Well, I'm proud of you. I thought it was a crossbow. Get moving. Okay. I'd never seen him before. He was a tall guy with a scar on his chin. He walked me over to the sedan and opened the door. He moved in close and shook me down. He relieved me of my thirty-eight and motioned me into the front seat. I slid in and he started to follow, so I kept one leg out in front of me and kicked him in the face. <laughs> I couldn't get enough leverage to cool him, but it gave me enough time to get out the other door and start making like a miler. I looked over my shoulder and saw him climb out holding a bloody nose. I knew he wouldn't take a shot unless he got close enough to make it count. So when he started after me, I ducked into the subway. I found a dime and went through the turnstile. A train was getting ready to pull out, so I pushed my way on just as the gonnet came down the stairs. He said he wasn't happy to see me go. He didn't even wave goodbye. Wait a minute, you! Wait! Oh, nuts. I know it. Got him away from me. I really like call like that. Uh. Yeah? Yeah, you and your swell ideas. What's the matter? I waited for Diamond outside his office, like you said. I started to hustle him in the car and he kicked me in the face. Oh. I think my nose is you broken. You stupid. I told you to be careful. Yeah, sure you did. You think I like getting booted in the nose? Look, if you want diamonds so much, you get them yourself. Maybe you can tell me how you're going to get to Cuba without me? Huh? Oh. Well, what do you want me to do now? I still want diamond. Yeah, but he jumped the subway train. How am I supposed to find her? I found out he's got a dame over in Park Avenue. Pick her up and bring her over here. Pick her up? I'd give you the chair for kidnapping. I'll use her to get Diamond. Pick her up if you want to get out of the country. Yeah, but a no, snitch. Look, I busted you out of store. I can bust you right back in. No. Now pick her up. Her name is Helen Asher. She lives at 975 Park. Well, what if someone else is there? What if there is? You want me to stop over making a fourth for bridge? Get him out of the way and bring the dame to me. <laughs> Hello, Otis. Well, Diamond. Lieutenant's been looking all over the city for you. I bet you've been a nervous wreck. I wouldn't care if you fell off the George Washington Bridge, Shamus. Why, Otis? And after all, we've been to each other. Uh, nuts. You better go on in and see the lieutenant. Sure. Hey, uh, Sergeant. Yeah? When are you going to get some new shoes? If yours turn up any more in front, you'll have to ski to work. Uh... Hello, Walt. Rick, we've been looking all over for you. Why don't you cops get on the job? It's getting so it isn't safe for a citizen to walk the streets at high noon. What are you yakking about? Well, I leave my office to go to see Helen and some goon tries to hold me up. Well, you're lucky you didn't get it right then. Do you know who busted out of jail last night? Go on, scare me. Charles Walsh. He swore if he ever did bust out, he'd get you. Well, that explains something. Why, what happened? This character tries to hustle me into a car, so I shoved my foot in his face and beat it into a subway. But it wasn't Walsh. Might have been Bob Wells. He busted out with him. I can tell you in a minute. Got a file on him? Sure. Otis, bring in the file on Bob Wells. By the way, Lieutenant. Oh, uh, Walt, do you mind if I use your phone? No, go ahead. I better call Helen. Tell her I'm going to be a little late. And I just talked to her and asked her to have you call. Where is everybody? Yes? Francis? Oh, Mr. Diamond. Please hurry over here. Something's happened to Miss Asher. What are you talking about? Miss Asher's been kidnapped. What? Yes, sir. A man came in and made Miss Asher go down to his car at the point of a gun. He also hit me over the head. Was he a tall man with a scar on his chin? Yes, sir. That's right. We'll be right over. 
Walt, I think the guy that tried to push me around has kidnapped Helen. Oh, no. He pulled a gun on her and slugged Francis. We better get over there. Now, if Charles Walsh is loose and he's trying to get me, then snatching Helen is a sure way to get me to come around. Hey, uh, where's that file on Bob Wells? Wait a minute. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Haven't you got that file on Wells yet? Yes, I'm just bringing it in. Well, step on it. Otis is bringing it in. Here you are, Lieutenant. Let me see it. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh, shut up, Otis. This is the guy, all right. He's the one who tried to pick me up. Uh, uh, may I take one of these pictures, Walt? Sure, but what are you going to do? I'll see if I can find him. You go on over and talk to Francis. See if this is the same guy who took Helen. I'm going to go down to Skid Row and talk to a wise old owl who knows about things like this. I got out of the 5th precinct in a hurry and grabbed a cab for Skid Row. I knew an old deadbeat down there who had a line on every crook in the underworld. And there was just a chance he could tell me where Bob Wells was hiding out. His name was Wilbur Truitt, and he hung out in a shabby dive called the Parrot. Hello, Wilbur. What? Again? You at the piano strike up a chorus of my buddy, for the wandering boy has returned. Look, Wilbur... I, I would rise and bow from the waist as befits the occasion, but I fear that some sterno I accidentally came in contact with has rusted my spine, and I am forced to remain in a sitting position. I haven't got time to listen to the routine, Wilbur. I- I'm looking for someone. Here, take a look at this picture. Ever see this guy? Unless I have my morning constitutional book... I can bring nothing into focus but a large bottle and a straw. Oh, a waiter. Waiter, uh, give me a bottle. You have arrived in the nick of time. I get that wonderful warm glow when you ask for a whole bottle. A snap comparison would be that of a happy mother smiling blissfully at a nursing babe. Okay, Wilbur, now tell me, uh, uh, do you know this man? One sip of strength, and I shall have the eyes of a carrot-stuffed feline. Now, ah, yes, I can see the gentleman clearly. In fact, my vision has so greatly improved it begins to take on the functions of an X-ray. For instance, I can readily perceive that the man in question is addicted to false stimulants, and his low brow and squinty eyes tell me that he is indeed a person of some doubtful character. You're looking in the mirror. Huh? No, here, here's his picture. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Mr. Bobby Wells. The description is flexible. Know where I can find him? Up until yesterday, he was residing at an institution upstate. Sing Sing, I believe. It is very possible that he is hiding out in one of his old haunts on 23rd Street, but uh, I couldn't say for sure. Oh, why not? Uh, This bottle you purchased entitles you to one of my best Yes, To be absolutely accurate, I would need further inducement. It's the risk, bucko. Uh, bring me another jug, bartender. Ah, bless you. Try looking in a rooming house at 533 West 23rd Street. Now, if you don't mind, I shall forget the necessity for long conversations and begin to concentrate on the work ahead of me. Goodbye, Bucko, and stop in again. Say tomorrow morning if you wake up feeling charitable. I left Wilbur trying to figure the best way to parlay the two bottles and headed for the address he'd given me. It was a typical apartment house of the district. A four-story building with a high premium insurance policy. I asked the landlady if a Bob Wells lived there, and she told me a man answering his description had taken a room there that morning. He told me he'd gone out a few minutes before and she'd let me into his room. I told her to keep a lookout and warn me if he showed. Then I started looking. I tore the place apart, but I didn't come up with a thing. I spotted the phone and started to call Walt, and that's when I saw it. A pad lying by the base of the phone with a heavy imprint left from the writing on the top sheet. I pulled an old trick. I took a pencil and rubbed the lead lightly over the imprint. And up came one telephone number. I dialed it and waited. Feinberg's delicatessen. Oh, uh, is Bob Wells there? Oh? Bob Wells. Never heard of him. Thanks. Well, it's like that. One minute you think you've got a lead hot enough to melt your change purse, and the next you find yourself looking like a tree surgeon in Death Valley. 
But in my business, it takes a conventional three to strike you out. So I found the address of the delicatessen, and 15 minutes later, I was standing between a smoked herring and a three-foot salami talking with Mr. Weinberg. What can I do for you, sir? Oh, uh, I talked with you, oh, say, 20 minutes ago about a Mr. Bob Wells. Bob Wells? Oh, yes. Never heard of him. Uh, take a look at this picture. Maybe you know the face and not the name. It's familiar. Yes, I think I've seen him somewhere. Think hard now. This is important. Are you a policeman? Detective. Oh. How about it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So long as you're a cop, sure I remember him. He came to my store last night. I remember because I had already closed and he kept pounding on the door. Finally, I let him in. He was very rude. He bought a lot of groceries, but very rude. Have you seen him again? Sure, he came in this morning about locks and bagels. Stell Road. Hmm. Where's your phone? In the back. Has uh, this Mr. Wells done something? He left Sing Sing without saying goodbye to the warden. Ha! Ha! Now, look, uh, I'm going in the back and use your phone. If Wells happens to come in while I'm back there, stall him and come back and tip me off. I'll do my best. But he better not be rude. Hey, Walt. I'm in a delicatessen over on 24th Street. Yeah, Rick. I traced Wells this far, found out he's been buying food here, probably for Walsh. You think Walsh is hiding somewhere in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, that's my guess. They probably took separate places so they could move in a hurry if one hideout got hot. I'll be over there right away. Good. Comfortable, honey, but no yelling, or I'll have to stuff up that pretty mouth. I don't understand this. Why did you kidnap me? Sure, I've been having a hard time getting in touch with your boyfriend, Diamond. Figure if his girl's in trouble, he'll come looking. I, I don't have a boyfriend. <laughs> sure, sure, play it straight. But you watch. Tonight I call your butler and tell him we got you. If Diamond wants you alive, he comes to a spot I got picked out. And he comes along. I don't know any diamond. Ain't she cute, Bobby? Yeah, cute. Want me to fix it so she forgets how to lie? No, I don't care if she claims diamonds are uncle. <laughs> Go on down to the delicatessen and get some food. I'm getting hungry. Okay. But I still think we ought to be getting out of town. In one hour, I call this dame's house. At 12 o'clock, I meet Diamond in the park. Then we get out. Why do you want to see uh, this diamond? Oh, we're old friends, baby. He sent me up for life, and he shot my kid brother full of holes. I just want to see the diamond gets everything that's coming to him. You talk too much. You've got some bad habits yourself, and I get that food. And if you're too lazy to walk downstairs, I'll show you a shortcut. Uh, Three floors, straight down, you can jump for it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. What can Weinberg do for you? Hey, Lieutenant, that chopped liver sure looks good. Keep your fat hooks off of that, Otis. Walt. Oh, yeah, Rick. Back here. All right. The storekeeper is watching out for Wells. If he shows, he'll come back here and tip us. I parked the squad car two blocks over. I didn't want Wells or Walsh to think something was up. Where's Otis? Otis! I'll be right with you, Lieutenant. I'm just buying something to nibble on. Hmm. His nibble would grind up a whole cow. If Wells comes in and spots a cop, he'll take off like a jackrabbit. Hold it, Walt. It's huh? mayor. That guy coming across the street. Looks like Wells. Oh. Otis, get away from that door. Huh? I can't hear you, Lieutenant. A man's coming in the store. Get away from the door. He is? You want me to hide? No, you idiot. Just play it smart like you didn't know him. But get away from the door so he'll come in. Oh. Okay, Lieutenant. Leave it to me. Oh. Walt Duck. Good evening. What can Weinberg do for you? Uh, I'll have a couple of sandwiches. Hey, try the salami. It's great. Huh? Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, make it salami. Call slot. Uh, pickle beer. Nice pickle. night. Listen, uh, idiot. Yeah, sure. Master. Uh, he's doing fine, no, Walter. Just... Relax. You live around here? Oh. Huh? No, uh, just seeing a sick friend. Yeah. Uh, maybe that salami ain't such a good idea if your friend's sick. You know, I had an uncle with ulcers. He couldn't touch the stuff. It's too much garlic. Ketchup? No. My friend's got a cold. Oh. Well, then I don't guess it'll hurt him, but... You know, the best thing for a cold is good mustard plastic. And now you, you, you take the plastic... Here's your sandwiches, sir. Uh, Sixty cents. Sixty? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Hope your friend gets better. 
Yeah. Whew. Yeah, come on. How did I do, Lieutenant? Well, one thing is sure. He thought you were too stupid to recognize him. Can you still see him, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, he crossed the street and he's starting to walk west. I'll tell him. He knows you. Good. When you spot the place, call me here. Think I should throw a net around the neighborhood? Not till we spot the hideout. Right. Hey, Diamond. They got your girl. How you gonna get her out? They'd probably use her for a shield. That's a good point, Sergeant. Believe me, I've been thinking about it. Here's the sandwiches. Swell. Hey, hmm. you only got two. Oh, there was a cop in the delicatessen. A cop? Yeah, a big stupid one. Listen, I, I told him I'm getting food for a sick friend, see? And he starts giving me all kinds you of... You sure rem- you weren't tailed? Tailed? No, who tailed me? Cop stayed in the delicatessen. Okay. Here, honey. Have a sandwich. I'm not hungry. Oh. Suit yourself. Here, Bobby. Oh, Thanks. Hey, when are you going to put in that call to this dame's butler? Right after we eat. Then we go to the park and wait for Mr. Diamond. Yeah? I'm in a drugstore across from the building that Wells went in. It's about a block away. Nifty drug. Block west on your side of the street. I'll wait inside. We'll be right down. Come on, Otis. The lieutenant hasn't spotted. Okay. Thanks for the bagel, White Boy. That's all right, officer. Come back again when you can pay for it. Come on, Otis. Move your big feet. Okay, okay. Hey, you got any brilliant ideas how we're going to get Helen out of there in one piece? No, I got to admit I'm stuck. Why don't you get that bear trap mind of yours working and make yourself a hero? Uh, Well... Maybe we could start a fire in the building and have to come out. Oh, swell, swell. There's nothing I'd like better than a well-done girlfriend. Well, I was trying. Yeah. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Otis, remind me to kiss you on both cheeks. Hey, what are you doing? That's a firebox. I'm turning in an alarm. There. Oh, we're going to start that fire? No, but Walsh and Wells won't know there isn't one. When the trucks come and the firemen bust in the place, they'll think it's burning down around their ears. Yeah, maybe then they won't watch Helen too close, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. Well, here's the nifty drugstore. Yeah. Rick, I've been worrying about something. Yeah, I know. How do we get Helen out? Yeah. Well, relax. Otis came up with a solution. Otis? Yeah, I turned in a fire alarm. And when the trucks get here, you can tell them what's up and they can go in the building and make like it was on fire. Well, won't Walsh know it's a phony if he can't smell smoke? The chief can tell him it's blazing in the basement. When they hit the street, we can get enough firemen to shield Helen and then take Walsh and Wells. I'll call the precinct and have the blocks around it. We'll need lights if they make a break for it. Uh, which apartment house are they in? That one, across the street. After I call the boys, we better go over and find out which room they're in. Quietly clear the rooms on both sides in case the shooting starts before we expect it. <laughs> Garlic upsets my stomach. How about that call? Yeah, right. Well, what's your phone number, baby? It's in the book. Oh, she gonna be troubled, Bobby? <laughs> he wants your number. Now, come on, we ain't got all night. All right. Evergreen, 54308. Oh, that's better. Gotta be more careful, Bobby. Your lip's bleeding. Yeah. Hey, Walsh, what's that? Sirens. Maybe that's the cops. If somebody tailed you, you... I told you I wasn't tailed. Wait, I'll go see. That's fire trucks. They're coming down a block. I don't smell no smoke. Hey, they're pulling up in front of this building. The joint must be on fire. Let's get out of here. Uh, maybe it's the building next to us. No, they're bringing the hoses right in front of the door of this joint. I'm getting out. Sit still. Maybe it ain't a big one. We can't go busting out in the street. Well, maybe it ain't a big one. But if it is, I don't want to end up like a pound of spare ribs. <laughs> Why, you... Yeah. Why, now, come on. Hey, what's that? Yeah, what is it? Fire department, we're back here from the building. What are we going to do with the dame? Shove her in that closet. Just a minute, we'll be right with you. Hurry, Tom, there's a fire in the basement, sneering a gas man. The whole place may go up any second. Did you hear that? Yeah, step on it. Okay. Well, you better step on it, down these stairs. We can find our way. Hey, there's a couple of prowl cars. Yeah. Separate. We'll meet at the other place. Okay, Walsh. That's far enough. Ah. It's the shamus. Get him, Walsh. Don't 
Don't reach for it, Walsh. I owe you something, Diamond. You all right, Rick? Yeah, Walt. He's a worse shot than his brother. Where's Wells? He made a break for it, but he won't get through. All right, Wells. You can't get through. Drop your gun. You won't take me, copper! Well, that's that. What about Walsh? Uh, He's pretty dead. Come on, I want to find out what happened to Helen. Well, Walt and I went up to the room and found Helen in the closet. We took her downstairs and she cried a little on my shoulder. I like that. Makes me feel so protective. Walt cleaned things up and dropped Helen and me off at her place. An hour later, Helen got back to normal and we relaxed on the couch and forgot about Wells and Walsh. <sighs> How do you feel now, baby? Daddy. Want to get Francis to fix some dinner for you? Oh, no, I'm not very hungry. You can have some if you want. No, no. Want to play some canasta or something? But you always said it was a bad 200 game. Yeah, it is. Well, I forgot my jack. <laughs> Silly. Want a neck? Ooh, what you said. Come here. No. Helen. No, I'm mad. Mad? What for? Because those two thugs ruined a wonderful evening. What's the matter? Want me to go? Oh, you idiot, of course not. I had a big surprise planned. You did? Yes. Believe it or not, I had two wonderful seats for South Pacific, and now it's too late to go. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, well, I'm sorry, baby. I'd love to have seen it. Me too. Well, I'm not exactly it's your pinza, but I'll try to make it up to you. Oh, Rick, that's a wonderful idea. Well, what'll it be? Uh, some enchanted evening. Oh, really? Me, 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 me. Hmm. A some enchanted evening. You may see a stranger. You may see a stranger across a crowded room. Rick. What's the matter? I was just trying to make like pizza. But, honey, it's safer for you to make like diamond. Oh. And somehow you know. You know even then. That somewhere you'll see her again and again. Oh, you're not Pinza, but it's wonderful. Thanks. Some enchanted evening. Someone may be laughing. You may hear her laughing across a crowded room. And night after night, as strange as it seems, the sound of her laughter will sing in your dreams. Rick. Who can explain it? Who can tell you why? Ricky. Fools give you answers. Wise men never try. Oh, Oh, honey, what's the matter? I was just falling in love with myself. Come here. You never let me finish. Do you mind? Mm. Oh, well, no. And I'm sure Mr. Pinza doesn't either. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Paul Fries, and Larry Dobkin. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there. This is Diamond. Hey, what about this heat? I can think of a lot of times I've been uncomfortable, but this runs itself right up to the top of my list. About the only thing good I can say about it, get your laundry dry in a hurry. I usually wash a few things out in my office because the soap's free. Come to think of it, I was scrubbing a pile of things the day we had that big wind. 97 degrees in New York and we get a tornado to cool us off. I had so much dust in my office, I could have supplied mud pies to the whole neighborhood. And after it was all over, the cigarette ad on Broadway was blowing smoke rings through the trap door of one of my scattered longies. The waves in Long Island Sound were so rough friend of mine capsized, and when he came up, he found three terrified herring hiding in his nose. Oh, it was swell. One minute, it was so hot you couldn't move, and the next, a 58-mile-an-hour wind was doing the moving for you. Then, to top it off, I got mixed up in one of the grisliest cases I'd ever worked on. It all started one evening. The car was moving down a lonely road, two people in it. In a couple of minutes, one of them would be pretty dead. What are you stopping for? (laughs) What are you doing? Let me go. Get your hands off me. No, help. Please, please. Ah! Hey, Ed. Huh? Stop the car a second. What for? Thought I saw something lying back there on the road. So what? Probably a dead dog. No, no, no. Hold it. Too big to be a dog. Oh, for Pete's sake. Back it up about 20 yards. <sighs> that, 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 that's good. Okay, where is it? Right over there. Yeah. Hey, come on. Hey. <gasps> oh, holy cow. Yeah. She dead? She's wrecked. I think I'm going to be sick. Me too. Uh, uh, Let's get to a phone call the cops. Knit one, pearl one. Hmm. Knit one, pearl one. Ah, there, you little fiend. Now, what does it say about the heel? Mm hmm. Turn the heel. Hmm. Oh, I dropped a stitch. Now I gotta go back and pick it up again. Yeah? Rick, what's the matter? Oh, Miss Asher? You and your bright ideas. What did I do? You did plenty. I'm a nervous wreck. What from? You remember you said I ought to take up something to keep me busy in the office? Yes. You remember you mentioned knitting? Oh, no. Oh, yes. I've dropped more stitches than the cross-eyed surgeon. You idiot. I was only fooling. Well, I wasn't. I did it up right. Book of directions, enough yarn to wrap up King Tut and all, the, all his handmaidens, <laughs> and two of the finest bone needles and gimbals. <laughs> now, don't laugh. I was making Francis a pair of screaming argyles. Well, keep with it, strong heart. You went out. Yeah, you darn right. Oh, what I said. Darn. Get it? Helen, are you still there? Yes, wasn't funny? No, Rick. Okay, come on over. Let's neck. Yes, Rick. Shame on you. Yes, Rick. Is that all you can say? I love you. And I'll see you about eight. Oh. You don't sound very happy. Well, that's such a long way off. Give you time to make plans. Bye. Bye. Now, let's see. I got to take out one, two, three, five rows. Yeah, what is it? Rick? Oh, oh how are you all? Very unhappy. You should see me. I got to take out five whole rows just to pick up one lousy stitch. What? No, forget it. What are you unhappy about? 
I'll tell you about it when you get down here. The 5th Precinct's 20 blocks. Can't you give it to me over the pipe? I wouldn't ask you if it wasn't important. And I'd rather not say anything over the phone. Okay, okay. Stop making like Porsche face in life. I'll be down as soon as I finish this heel. Heel? Yes. If you must know, I've taken up knitting. Coming from you, I am unmoved. I don't care if your building sergeant notice a fur line money belt. Get down here as fast as you can. All right, Walt. But you'll be sorry when it starts getting cold again, and I won't knit you a sweater to cover your little old blue stomach. Oh. Bye, Walt. Getting Walt's goat was a sport with me, and whether he'd admit it or not, he got a kick out of it, too. Sometimes I wouldn't stay on the rib as long as I usually do, but that was only because Walt always starts sounding just a little bit worried. Then I know it's time to lay off and get serious. Don't misunderstand me. I never lay off entirely, and I never get completely serious. Those are two habits that don't help find the solution any quicker. They just fit you with a mess of ulcers, and you still end up too worried and too serious. I closed my office and headed for Walt's precinct. When I walked in, I spotted Sergeant Otis leaning back in his chair with his number 12s resting on the desk. Hello, Otis. Well, how's the big private detective today? Just fine, Otis. And how is the flash of the 5th precinct? Yeah, don't you worry about me, Diamond. I'll get along. Better go on in and see the lieutenant. He wants to see you. <laughs> hey, what's it about, Diamond? You need someone to help you from the police force? You know, Sergeant, you've got a fine head on your shoulders. <laughs> well, I'm glad you noticed. The one under your arm isn't so bad either. Uh... Hello, Walt. Rick, why don't you leave that poor guy alone? After you leave, he comes running in here and cries all over my desk. Otis? Ah, he wouldn't shed a tear if he was standing in an onion warehouse watching his grandmother set fire to herself. Yeah, well, give him a rest for a while. I got a big problem I want to talk to you about. All right, Walt, what's on your mind? Well, I don't know quite how to give it to you. It isn't strictly kosher for the police force to go around asking for help. Now, wait a minute. I don't want any apology routine. If you want a favor, you came to the right boy, and you know that goes without saying. Yeah, I guess I do. But this is a pretty big favor, Rick. The, uh, the commissioner's on my back. So is everyone else that's got anything to do with this city's government. Sounds rough. What did they do? Find out you were hiding a chimpanzee in a cop's uniform and calling him Sergeant Otis? Oh, now be serious for a second, Rick. Sure, if you'll get to the point. All right. I guess you've been reading about these homicides I've been having for the past three weeks. Yeah. Pretty messy. Well, the powers that be say, solve them or turn in my badge. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. Don't they know that this is the toughest kind of a killing? The killer's obviously got a lot of screws loose, and a maniac doesn't need a motive to kill. Don't those swivel chair bigwigs know that a crime without motive is the toughest job in the world to crack? Sure, sure, they know all that, but the public and the press is yelling its head off, so the pressure is on. Well, what do you want me for? You've got one of the best departments in the state. When you were on the force, it was the best department in the state. Now you stop that. Then stop twisting my arm. What do you want? I want help. I've got to crack this case by next week or I'm out of my ear. You're the best detective we had on the force, and you're the best private gumshoe in the city. Oh, well, that's better. Now, what about these killings? Each time they find some dame looking like the last of a hamburger sale... That... Oh, excuse me a minute, but... Yeah? Lieutenant? No, Jack the Ripper. What do you want, Mallet Head? Uh, we just got a report from a guy out in the river road. Another one of them butcher killings. What? Yeah, some dame all hacked up and lying beside the road. Okay, get the car out. I'll meet you downstairs. Oh, did you hear that, Rick? Mm-hmm. Well, come on. You want me along? Of course. I can brief you about the whole setup on the way over. Oh, I don't know whether it's such a good idea to get mixed up in this. Why not? Well, it looks like whoever gets close to this killer doesn't have much of a future. Well, you can't live forever. Oh, aren't you the sweet one? No, that's not what's worrying me. Well, what is then? When I go out, I want a nice, comfortable place to lie down in. The way this nut goes to work with a knife, I might end up in a freezer. <laughs> All right, all right, everybody's back. Go on through, Lieutenant. Show him your biceps, Otis. Ah, comic. How did all these people get out here? This is ten miles from anything. Uh, someone must have heard me call the police. Uh, when I left the phone booth, the whole crowd followed me out here. Who are you? Uh, my name's Ed Cody. Me and my friend here found a body. Where is it? Right over here, Walt. Oh, how does it look? The way you thought it would. Oh, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Yeah, here's your bicarb. Now you see what I'm up against, Rick. Pardon me. This is the third killing like this in three weeks. Oh, I don't feel too good. 
Let's walk over this way. Yeah. Cody, you and your friend come along. We want to ask some questions. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, whoever the guy is that's pulling these murders is a complete lunatic. Are they all like that, Walt? You should have seen the last one. How'd, uh, how'd you guys happen to spot the body? Oh, well, I saw it first, and I told Ed here. Uh, yeah, uh, we were just driving along when Max spotted something lying beside the road. I backed her up, and we got out. I saw what it was. I left Mac here and went back to town to call you. What's your full name, Mac? McCarthy. John McCarthy. Okay. Now, what are you doing, Rick? Uh, looking at the road. Hey, uh, that's your car up there, Cody? It's Max. I was just driving. You went ahead how far? Oh, I'd say about 20 yards. Then we backed up and left the car where you see it now. You won't find much even if the road is soft. Their car and any other car would have blocked out the killer's tracks. Uh, maybe he didn't use a car. Maybe he walked her out this way and then killed her. No, this place is ten miles from anything. He drove, all right. And this crowd has ruined any footprints for sure. Oh, here come the boys. Come on, Rick. As soon as they start examining things, we can get back to the station. Yeah, I want to go through the whole file on the last two killings. You won't find much. Well, a change of reading never hurts anyone. I'm getting tired of reading those dime novels. Too bloody. <laughs> the whole mess. No leads at all, huh? Not a one. I'm getting nearsighted from looking at all the lineup. We've picked up everything from drunks to safe crackers. Not a lead. Same type of crime in every case. Hmm. This killer's got a crazy streak as wide as Broadway. Oh, wait until the commissioner hears about this one. Well, yeah? Give me a pencil. Now, tic-tac-toe is out. I got a headache. Stop waving your gills and give me a pencil. Here. What are you doing with that map? Drawing circles. Now you stop that. That's a scale of this city, and I don't want it loused up by your doodling. Look at that. So you make a dandy circle. Thanks. What's it for? How should I know? You drew it. Drew what? The circle. Wasn't that a little foolish? Of course it was. That's what I'm yelling about. Well, that's bad for you. What is? Yelling. I know it. I thought you said you didn't know. Know what? About the circle I just drew. What circle? The one on the map. That's what I was yelling about. Why? You didn't draw it. I know I didn't. You did. What for? How should I know? You're a policeman. What in blazes has that got to do with it? You were a rookie, weren't you? Of course I was. You worked your way up to sergeant and then to head of the homicide, didn't you? You know very good and well I did. Wasn't it a little tough? You bet it was. I pounded the beat for four long years. Did it by the sweat of my... Now, wait a minute. How did we get into this? You asked me about this circle I drew. I did? Yes, Walt. But you didn't know what it was for. Oh, yeah. What is it for? It's for you. I get... Yeah, it's not bad. Oh, I knew it, I knew it. You lowlife, you conniving, dirty, underhanded louse. You always do this to me. I think you sit around nights and pull the wings off of flies. Moths. All right, moths. Sit around and dream up little monstrosities to pull on the police force and use me as a... a, a, a guinea pig. A, right, guinea pig. You call me, Lieutenant? No, get out of here, you idiot. Yeah, yeah Lieutenant. Diamond, for once I'm going to find out what's at the end of this merry-go-round. I want to know about that circle. And I'm going to get it out of you if I have to shove that map down your throat. Huh? This happens to be the commissioner, Oh, uh, not, not you, Commissioner. Are you on the map, Yes, Commissioner. I'm Yes, Commissioner. Well, I just went out and looked at the body. Yes, but, 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 your motor's running. You shut up. Oh, no, Commissioner. Somebody else. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, who was it? I am not talking to you. Don't you want to know about the circle? No. Fine. When I was looking over the reports on the killings, I noticed something. You don't say. Say what? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you don't want to play, be a sorehead all your life. Well, I noticed that all of the killings, including the one we looked at this afternoon, were within at least ten miles of each other. And the first one, this one, this one right here, was exactly in the other direction from the last one. Bully for you. No, it's nothing. Well, using the first and last homicide for the edge of the circle, we find that the other killing also fall within the sphere. Okay, so what? Mm -hmm. Getting interested? No, I'm not. Well, the girl this afternoon had been dead for about 14 hours, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but the coroner can come closer. Well, about anyway. Now, in the other two cases, it says that both girls met their deaths about 3 in the morning. Now, if the last one was dead 14 hours, she comes close to that time, too. Okay, okay. What does that prove? Not a thing. But it's something to go on. This is a wild one, Walt. But 
Let's say that our killer started off with his victim somewhere within that circle. To drive five miles, half the distance of the circle, it would take him, oh, about... uh, Fifteen minutes. Okay, fifteen minutes. Now, that means he left his starting point around 2.45. Now, that's a funny hour to be so consistent. You're right. Bars close at two. Forty-five minutes to talk a dame into a ride. Hmm? Might be. I'll be done. I may be all wet. The killer probably started from somewhere outside the circle, but we can start by eliminating the idea of the night spots anyway. Yeah, Lieutenant? Checking all the night spots from... uh, 45th Street and Broadway, the center of the circle. From 45th Street and Broadway for ten miles in every direction. Yeah, Lieutenant. That means cafes, bars, bowling alleys, anything that stays open until two or after, and step on it. I hope we're right. So do I. I don't like walking on eggs. Then sit down. Who knows, you might hatch something. Walt found out the name of the last victim, and the family supplied us with a picture. Her name was Martha Kirk, and her family knew nothing of her whereabouts the night of the murder. You can't really appreciate a police department until you really see them in action. Inside of two hours, Walt had every dive, bar, and night spot in the ten-mile circle tagged. They spread out, one man to every five blocks, each with a picture of the three murdered girls. Because it had been my idea, Walt wanted me to swim with it and maybe sink. I took a little section from 48th Street to 46th Street, and by late afternoon, I'd covered most of the likely prospects. You guessed it. The bottom of the barrel was coming up fast, and it was emptier than a ballpark during a thunderstorm. No one had ever seen the three victims. The last spot on the list was a bowling alley. I walked in and spotted the cocktail lounge. When I climbed up on one of the stools, a bartender with a head that should have been out on the alleys walked up to me. Yeah, what'll it be? Uh, how about a glass of milk? Glass of milk? Think you can stand it? Well, if you're worried, water it a little. I don't want to pass out on you. Eh, hey, get him. He made it funny. So did your family. You're looking for trouble? Only if I get pushed. I'm looking for information. Place door on the left. Yeah. Ever seen any of these girls before? What are you, cop? Let's say I'm nosy and that I've got a badge to keep me in the spirit of the thing. Oh, why'd you say so? Uh, uh, let me see him. All right. Here's the first one. Uh, no, no, no. I ain't never seen her. How about this one? Uh-uh. And this one? Nope. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, sure, I know this one. Comes in here about twice a week. Was in last night. Gets lushed up, cries about how tough a family is on her knees. Uh... Uh, Kirk? Yeah. Uh, Martha. Uh, Martha Kirk. Nice looker. She was. Huh? Uh, did she ever come in with a man? No, but uh, sometimes she leaves with one. Same guy every time? No. Do you remember her leaving with a man last night? Uh, yeah, yeah. Come to think of it, she did. What time? No, mm, about 2.15. Uh, we stop serving the two right on the dot. That we do. That you do. Yeah, okay. Think you'd know the guy if you saw him again? Oh, sure. He comes in a couple times a week, too. Uh... I seen him pick up a couple of strays. <laughs> I guess you call him a wolf. Yeah, with a hatchet. Huh? No, forget it. Where's your phone? Uh, right over there. Hey, here, use a slug. It's on the house, officer. Thanks. Hope nothing's happened to Martha. She was a rotten drunk. What a wonderful kid. She was, huh? Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me speak to the lieutenant, and if you crack just once, I'll come over there and shove your head so far down you'll have to untie your shoelaces to cough. Okay, okay, Diamond. You don't have to get nasty. Lieutenant Levinson. You can forget about retiring, Walt. You got something? Yeah, it looks like. What did your boys turn up? Nothing yet. What is it, Rick? Don't play games now. Get over to 47th and 9th, the bowling alley in the middle of the block. I'm in the bar. Want me to bring the boys? No, no. This is one we've got to play quietly. I don't want to scare our ghoul off. I'll be right down. Hey, what about that milk? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, coming up. Uh, hey, uh, is there going to be a pinch? Uh, there is, Buster. There certainly is. Walt romped in about a half hour later, and he talked to the bartender. He finally looked satisfied. He had to because it was the only lead that had turned up. We told the bartender to tip us if the guy showed again, and we sat down to wait. Maybe my rabbit's foot started thinking it was back with the quartet because around 1 a.m. it started kicking. The bartender gave us a nod just as a big guy wandered in and sat down at the bar. He weighed in at about 2.20 and his clothes were sloppy. 
He ordered a drink and started eyeing a cute little number sitting at the other end of the bar. Let's take him. Hold it, Wob. He's making a pitch. What? The dame at the end of the bar. So he's making a pitch. What do you want to do? Wait around till he takes her out of here? Maybe you'd like to help him sharpen his axe. Look, you haul him in now, you'll have to beat it out of him. You want him to pick the dame up? Well, is that against the law? Arrest me. Now, you stop clowning. You'd rather catch him with the goods, wouldn't you? Yeah, but... Now, don't start that again. You butted the commissioner to death. Just relax, and maybe you can pick up a few pointers. Our big boy moved all right. Right up to the seat next to the cute little girl. She was under full sail, didn't seem to mind it at all. He landed at 1.15. At 1.30, he'd established a firm beachhead, and by 2 o'clock, there was a flag raising. Okay, he scored. Now, the joint's closing. Now, they're leaving. I'm going to tail him. How? He's probably got a car. And if he gets away with that girl, he may kill her. Look, Walt, I promise you, he won't get into that car unless I go, too. Now, come on. We'll both stick close to him until I can think of something. We followed the man and the girl outside and walked a few yards behind, making like we had a little load on they headed for a big parking lot, and that's when I got the idea. The parking attendant was just walking up to him when I stumbled forward. Hi, hey, boy. Rick, what are you doing? Stay with me, Walt. Yeah? Uh, son, I, I want a car. Hey, just a minute. I was here first. Sure, honey. Don't let him get away with uh, it. Look, old man, my, my friend here is late getting home. He's got a wife that's ten feet tall. You mind if I get my car first? <laughs> ah, go ahead. Some nerve. Relax, honey. They're going to take a little drive, huh? Yeah. Okay, let's see your ticket. Oh, I'll go here someplace. Well, come on, we'll walk up. I know where the car is. Okay, but you got to have a ticket. Rick, what's going on? Keep walking. Hey, I thought you was loaded. Keep going. We're the police. Huh? That's right. Oh, what's wrong? Which one is that guy's car? You mean the guy back there with the dame? Yeah. Uh, he gave me his ticket. Oh, uh, right over there, the coupe. Rick, come on. I'm going to climb in that trunk, and you're going to put in a general alarm, Walt. Then you're going to get in your car and tail us. But stay far enough behind so that he doesn't spot something. Okay, but I think you're crazy. Is the trunk open? Yeah. Now get going. Well, they'll see me coming back. Tell them you forgot something in the bowling alley and that I passed out my car. All right. Uh, and son. Yeah? Don't let on that anything had happened. We think that man is a killer. Oh. I squeezed into the trunk and waited. About two minutes later, the lovebird showed up and got in the front seat. We rode like that for about 15 minutes, and it wasn't bad until we hit the dirt road. Then my inside started bouncing around like a pound of rice in a wind tunnel. We drove for about 10 minutes more and came to a stop. I raised the trunk just enough, just enough to get some fresh air and listen. I didn't want to climb out because they'd feel the movement up in front. I was sure they could hear my breathing. <laughs> What are we stopping for? Well, I, uh... Uh-uh. <laughs> I, uh, just wanted to look at the pretty scenery. How can you? It's too dark. Uh-huh. <laughs> I can see you, baby. <laughs> You're nice. Thank you. So, uh, are you? They went on like that for another half hour, and I started thinking I'd picked the wrong guy. Then the conversation changed. What's the matter? It's so funny. Don't you know? No, and I don't like the way you're acting. Women. That's what's funny. They're all the same. Huh? Just like my wife. She was like all the other women. Hey, let's get out of here. You're talking funny. Funny? Yeah. See a man and you like him. Any man. You're all alike. Now you stop that. I just came along Come with here. A... No, you let me go. You ain't no different. Come here. No, stop that. Let me get out of the car. Sure. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't want no blood stains on the seat anyhow. Ah! Go on, run. right down the middle. I rolled out and didn't forget to take my 38 along. I spotted him in the moonlight, moving after like a big animal. He was laughing. I could see something in his hand. It was a knife. 
he tripped and fell and he moved in. He gave me goosebumps bigger than grapefruit. When he was nearly on top of her, I closed in. Ah! Okay, hold it! Help! 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 You shut up! Drop the knife! I'll kill him! I'll kill her! I'll kill her! I'll kill her! You all right, honey? No, no, no. Just take it easy. Take it easy. It's all over. I'm so glad you got here. Come on, now. Let's, let's get back to the car. Easy. You sure you're all right, dear? You know something? No, what? I think that man was crazy. <laughs> Well, Walt finally got there and we sent the girl home. The wagon came and cleaned up things. I found out later that Walt was blessed by the commissioner and I got an assist. I needed calming down, so I stopped off at 975 Park Avenue, the home of the best remedy for bruised nerves I knew of. Oh, good evening, sir. Good evening, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the study, knitting. Knitting? Knitting. Thank you, Francis. Knit one, curl two. Knit one, curl two. That's like taking stupid pills. Rick. Hello, baby. Oh, look what I've gotten into. I'm a nervous wreck. Well, that'll teach you. What are you building? Well, it was going to be a surprise for you. Oh, a whole suit. <laughs> really? Ricky. Yes? I need relaxing. You need relaxing. Oh, swell. Ricky, come here. I know just the thing. No, come over here. There's an old a spinning wheel in the parlor. A spinning dreams of a long, long ago. Ricky! Well, what's the matter, dear? Well, what about this? Cruising down the river on a Sunday afternoon. Ricky. With one you love, the sun above, waiting for the moon. Ricky. The old accordion playing. Ricky. A sentimental tune. Rick. Oh, honey, what's the matter? You can sing later. Oh. Please. What is it really, baby? Come here. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know something? What? I may never sing again. Okay. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Bill Conrad, Lorene Tuttle, Jack Crucian, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Dick Powell will next be seen in the motion picture Mrs. Mike, based on the best-selling novel Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. 
About the most strenuous effort I might give out during a working year is maybe chasing some thug up the escalator at Bloomingdale's department store. But last week, I really outdid myself. The all-stars of the police force challenged the private detectives to a baseball game for the benefit of the vice squad. And I wound up stiffer than a pair of starched overalls. Because the private detectives are quick to take advantage of the slightest opportunity, by the eighth inning, we realized the need for some immediate strategy. The score at that point was six to four, the cops leading. So I got a hold of a little blonde I knew and had her walk across the infield in a sweater. The idea was to disturb the opposing team and take their minds off the game. It would have worked, but it seemed that since I had last seen my little blonde friend... She'd become quite a favorite with the police force, so they just waved hello and went about their business. My drooling colleagues, however, had not come in contact with said hunk of fluff, and before the game was over, three of them had picked up the bat boy and tried to bunt with him. You may have read where the police force finally beat us. Close game, 37 to 4. But I want to say right here and now, they never could have done it without that sweater. And oh, yeah, I got mixed up on a little honest murder the next day. It all started in the back booth of a middle-class nightclub. A couple of people were busy trying to think up the fastest way to make a homicide billiard. Oh, uh, that's the three-cushion variety. Killing to frame up to the electric chair. Leon... Are you sure this will work? You want to get rid of that old man of yours, don't you? You know I do. Well, I got a wife that I want to dump, too. This letter from her is going to fix it, so we both end up very unmarried. Are you sure they'll blame it on Martin? Sure, I'm sure. When they find him with this letter and his own gun and the dead body of my dear little wife, they'll slap him in the chair so fast he won't know what happened. Wh- who's going to find him with the body? That's your job, baby. I'll get the letter to your husband and you swipe his gun and get it to me. And you go get yourself a private detective and tell the shamus that you suspect your husband of running around with another girl. You and the shamus tail your husband. I'll have a time so you catch him with the goods right after the killing. Well, all right. I hope it works. It will if you want it to, baby. I want it to. Because I want you. Yeah. Yeah, and all that nice money your husband's going to leave you. Leon. Come in, you. Yeah. Come in. Mr. Diamond? That's right. I want to hire a private detective. Well, good for you. Sit down. Thank you. What is your fee? Hmm? What's the matter? Oh, stand up and sit down again. They're 52 gauge, Mr. Diamond. Like them? Oh, you'd look good if they were sweat socks. I don't think they'd go with a high heel. Uh, You've got a point. Now, uh, what were you saying? I wanted to know what your fee is. Oh, a hundred a day in expenses. Uh, Isn't that a little high? I stopped eating at the automat six years ago. All right, I'll give you a retainer. Oh, wait a minute now, wait a minute. What's the job? I think my husband is running around with another woman. What do you want me to do, hustle him off to the nut house? Aren't you nice? I want you to go with me as a witness. You know, uh, any other time I might get shy, but I'm really interested in seeing a girl who could beat your time. Mm. When do I start? Meet me in front of my house at 10 minutes to 8. My husband leaves around 8. What's the address? 521 East 58th Street. My name is Hires, Mr. Diamond. Uh, June Hires. All right, June. I'll see you at 10 to 8. Now, uh, uh, excuse me, but about that retainer. Oh, yes, that. Um, here's a hundred dollars. Is that enough? Uh, it'll keep me interested. What's your husband's name? Martin. I'll see you this evening, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, one more question. Yes, why haven't you and your husband been getting along? Uh-huh. Oh, a lot of reasons. By the way, Mr. Diamond, how old are you? Hmm? No. Oh, well, I'm frisky, but I passed the foolish mark when I was three and a half. Mm-hmm. Did you? Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. I wonder if I did. <laughs> Diamond Detective Agency, with men who know the corpses best, it's Diamond two to one. Rick. Oh, oh, Helen. Hello, baby. What are you doing? Uh, what gauge nylons do you wear, dear? Fifty-two. Why? No, nothing. Oh, Rick, are you going to buy me a present? Oh, you never can tell. I was just looking at a pair a few minutes ago. Rick. Yeah? Where were you looking at them? 
Now, what kind of a question is that? A very good question. Have you got a girl up in that office? Helen. Don't you, Helen, me, have you? Well, I give you my word I haven't. All right. Was there a girl in your office? The, the... Was there? Well, a client. I got a hundred dollar retainer. I don't care if she gave you the George Washington Bridge. You were obviously looking at her leg. Well, I couldn't help it. She sat on that way. Now, look, honey, she's just another client. Mm Mm-hmm. With 52-gauge nylons. Would you do count the threads? Oh, can you do that? Oh, you wolf. Yeah, but you're the only one who gets the benefit of my talents. You can put the soft soap away. Well, I got some business at eight. I'll, I'll be over later. Well, I'm going to stay mad until you get here. And you're going to tell me all about those nylons. I'll be sure and do some research. Bye. Well, there you are. You sit around and wait for a meal ticket to come in, and just because it happens to be fitted with curves, your best girl digs up the green-eyed monster. I don't know why gals get sore at a guy just because they catch him panting a little. (laughs) After all, it's hot in New York. I spent the rest of the afternoon trying to hit a big horse fly with a rubber band and some paper clips. And by six o'clock, we shook hands and called it a draw. I closed the office and went home. I got into some clean clothes and grabbed a bite to eat at the corner drugstore. At ten minutes to eight, I was sitting in June Hire's car, parked across the street from her front door. Mr. Diamond, how did you ever get to be a private detective? Uh, Mrs. Hyam, how did you ever get to be a housewife? You think things up in a hurry, don't you? Only when I got competition. You like competition? Uh, Yeah, up to a point. After that, I get tired of the struggle. (laughs) I feel like I was back in college, sitting in a parked car with a good-looking man. Your education must have been pretty tame. I haven't moved once. Well, I really started to study after I graduated. Oh, I bet you got straight A's. Must you top everything? I play around with a lot of trouble, Mrs. High, and I've got to stay one step ahead of it. Do I look like trouble? When's your husband coming out of that house? Any minute now. You didn't answer my question. I'll tell you as soon as I see your husband. Well, how will that tell you? If he's wearing a beanie with a propeller on it, I'll know you've been giving him a lot of trouble. So I've been giving him trouble. Does that mean I'll do the same for somebody else? Uh, What's the difference, a husband or a private detective? They both got their names from a guy named Adam. Oh, look. A cab pulled up to the front door. Yeah, I see it. And here comes Martin. Mm, he's getting into the cab. Well, what do you know? What's the matter? No beanie. We both sat and watched while Martin Hire got into the cab and it pulled away. Mrs. Hire put her car in gear and we started the tale, giving her the safe distance. He led us across town to a middle-class apartment house and we stopped the car and waited up the street. He's getting out and going into that building. Come on. Oh, what for? Shouldn't we let him get up there first and, and then... Look, look, baby. Do you know who, who this gal is? No, no, of course not. Well, then come on. I want to see what door he goes in. But, well, won't he see us? Honey, I don't tell you how to put your lipstick on. Now, don't tell me how to make it like a bloodhound. Well, the, the lobby is empty. Well, watch the elevator. Oh. It's stopping on the fourth floor. Hadn't we better go up? Look, uh, look, lover. The fourth floor probably comes equipped with a lot of doors. Now, if you want to just knock on any of them, go hire yourself Humphrey Bogart. Then what do we do? You stand by and watch like you... Make like you knew what I was doing. See, the little old elevator's coming back down. Now, you just hold it there while I look at the mailboxes. Mrs. B. Callahan. Mrs. Lillian McEdward. Mrs. Mike. Well... And Miss Sally Maxwell. Okay, now we push the button for the fourth floor and away we go. Fun? Um, h- how do you know where to go? I got the name off the mailbox. But you said yourself there must be a lot of people on the fourth floor. Elementary, my dear girl, process of elimination. We're lucky this time. Only one single girl on the fourth floor, Sally Maxwell. Come on, it's 406. What if there'd been more than one single girl? So I make some new friends. Now stop asking questions and stick close. Mm, I'd love it. Now, here it is, 406. Now hold it down. Can you hear anything? No. Yeah, somebody's moving around. Oh? Oh, Duck. What? Too late. What? June. Uh, good evening. I represent the Great Nothing Life Insurance Company. What are you doing here, June? I might ask you the same thing. Do you mind if we come in? I'd like to interest you in our indemnity clause. 
Stop pushing. Get out of my way. Oh, you don't know what you're missing. You get $3 million if a python bites you in the middle of Times Square. You can't force your way in here like that. You... Oh, now you've hurt my feelings. Then take your hands off me or I'll strike you again. Sure, but you need two more to put you out. Here, have one on me. <laughs> now, the next time you go striking people... Mr. Diamond, look. I looked past the little guy and spotted the body. She was blonde and I didn't know why she was hanging on to the rug that way. She wasn't going anywhere. All right, you... Get out of my way. Huh? Oh, what a lovely gun. Martin, you killed that girl. No, I did not. I came in here and found her like that. But I didn't kill her. She's been shot. I know that. I found the gun by her body. You don't think I'd kill her? I was in love with her. Martin! Is that the gun that did it? Yes. I mean, no. I, oh, I don't know what I mean. But do stand right there. Don't take another step. That's your gun, Martin. Don't shut up. I didn't kill Sally. But I know I haven't got a chance of proving it. So if you come any closer, I will most certainly shoot you. I hate to look like an idiot, but it's against the law to shoot people. Mr. Diamond, be careful. Come on, Martin. Give me the gun. You don't think I'll shoot, do you? Come on, give it to me. Just one more step. Look out, he's going to shoot. Come on, open uh, up in there. What? Better drop it, Martin. You've got company. Stay back. Stay back. This is the police. Open up or we'll break the door in. Police. Oh, give me the gun, Martin. No, no. Let, yes. let him in, June. Before Levinson tears down the whole wall. I've got Martin. Yes, all right. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. What's going on in here? Uh, hello, Walt. Hey, Lieutenant, look. It's the gumshoe. Rick, why do you guys always have to break down doors? Why don't you try turning the knob first? Otis, didn't you see if it was unlocked? Uh, I forgot, Lieutenant. You mallet head. We got a report that someone heard a shot from this apartment. There's the body, Walt. Who's this guy? Uh, Martin Heyer. Here's his gun. He was going to use it on me. I didn't kill her. I came in and found her that way. Oh, no, shut up. Who's the girl with you, Diamond? Uh, this is Mrs. Heyer. Martin is her husband. I don't say. The old triangle, huh, Rick? I engaged Mr. Diamond to follow my husband. That's right, Walt. We caught Martin trying to sneak out on the corpse. I told you I didn't kill her. And I told you to shut up. Is this your gun? Uh, yes. But I found it lying by the body. I knew I'd be blamed if someone found my gun, so I put it in my pocket. You search him, Rick? I haven't had time. Shake him down, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. I want my lawyer, and you get away from me. You open your trap just once more. Okay, butthole. Please, Mr. Diamond, I'd like to get out of here. Sure. Okay, Walt? Yeah, but I want to talk to both of you down at the station later. Uh, here's something, Lieutenant. What is it? Oh, letter. Are you coming, Mr. Diamond? Uh, you go on down. I'll be right with you. Uh, all right. Walt. What does the letter say? It says we can't continue this way. I've decided to break it off once and for all. It will do no good to see me, so please stay away and leave me alone. Sign Sally. Let me see that. Yeah. Well, what about it, you? Is the dead girl named Sally? Yes. I don't know why she sent it. We were both in love. Sure, sure. What were you going to do about your wife? I was going to tell her this evening. Then I received this note. I came right over to see Sally, but... Believe me, I didn't kill her. Tell me something, Martin. Is this the way you received the letter? Yes. Why? Now, you wait a minute, Rick. I'm very happy with what I've got, so don't start making like Sherlock Holmes. Oh, well, I, I guess you're right, Walt. He admits it's his gun, and this letter is certainly motive enough. Yeah. Otis, call for the wagon and put the cuffs on hire. Right, Lieutenant. Walt, why would someone send the letter after tearing off the top of it? Huh? See, the top of this letter is missing. The part that usually reads Dear Julius or something. So What? Do me a favor, will you, Walt? Oh, what is it? Give me three minutes and then have Otis fire a shot from this apartment. What? Is that all you can say? Have Otis fire a shot in about three minutes after I leave? I will not. The police department can't go around making like it was the 4th of July. You want to solve a murder, don't you? I have solved it. What more do I need? I got a suspect, the murder weapon, and a good motive. Uh, Walt, if you just killed someone and a guy caught you at it, what would you do? Ah, uh, Knock him off, too. Well, I caught Hire in the act, and he didn't pull the trigger. Well, you said yourself he was going to. But he didn't, and he took too much time thinking about it. Walt, I can't remember hearing a shot when I came in this building. So you didn't hear a shot. Maybe you couldn't. Well, that's what I want to find out. I was right behind Martin all the way up to this apartment, and I didn't hear a shot. Maybe he didn't kill her. That's right, I didn't. Please, I didn't kill her. You see, Walt? Oh, you always start something like this. Martin, did your girlfriend Sally have any enemies? No. At least she never told me about any. Now, where are you, brain trust? Just a little more sure of myself. First, Martin can't make up his mind about shooting me. Then he claims that the murdered girl didn't have any enemies. Does that sound like a killer trying to cover up? You've run into smart killers before. I'm surprised at you, Rick. I called the station, Lieutenant. I'm proud of you. Uh, 
Go on in the other room and shoot that cannon of yours off when I tell you. The what, Lieutenant? You heard me. Shoot it into a mattress, but don't muffle a shot. Uh, okay. But not till I tell you. You might think it's fun and blow up the whole building. Thanks, Rob. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, uh, just looking around this desk to see if I can find the top piece of this letter. Oh, uh, Martin, are you sure that your girlfriend didn't know anyone who might want to kill her? She never said she was in danger. But you might ask her husband. Her husband? Oh, swell. Why didn't you say something about her husband before this? You didn't ask. Oh. Who is her husband? His name's Leon Fisk. The gambler? Yes. Oh. Bye, Walt. Now, you wait a minute. Have orders start making like a Roman candle three minutes after I leave. What's that you've got in your hand? Huh? Well, it's a piece of stationery from the desk that matches the stationery this letter was written on. You can't take that letter. It's evidence. What is? That letter the murdered girl wrote to this guy. Well, how do you know she wrote it? Because this guy said so. Yes, but I'm not sure. It could be forged. See, Walt, maybe she didn't write it. Well, that's why I want it. The lab will be able to tell from other samples of her handwriting. Tell what, Walt? Who wrote that letter? Well, don't you know? Of course I don't know, but we found it on this guy and it's police evidence. Why? Why? Well, because it just is, that's all. Well, anybody could have written it. You could have written it, Martin. Yes, I guess I could. And send it to yourself? Why would I send it to myself, Lieutenant? You wouldn't. That's why it's important. You mean the letter itself or the fact that he couldn't have sent it to himself? Both reasons. Well, if he couldn't have sent it to himself, that eliminates him as a suspect. It does? He didn't do it. Did you, Martin? No. See, Walt? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why do I always get into something like this? You asked me if I sent the letter to myself. You shut up. And you said he couldn't have. That's right, he couldn't. Then someone else did. Of course they did. Okay, then as long as you're not so sure it's important, I'm going to take it with me. Who says it's not important? Well, if he didn't send it to himself, then someone else did. And if someone else did, the murdered girl couldn't have, so anyone could have sent it. Isn't that right? Say that again. He said if I didn't send the letter to myself, then I couldn't have gotten it. In no, no, no. He said you couldn't have sent the letter to... No, no, wait a minute. You couldn't have written it to... To, to... myself. Yeah. So someone else wrote it and sent it to the murdered girl and... No, 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 no. Send it to me. You're crazy. I distinctly heard him say... Walt. Yeah? After you figure it out, be sure and have Otis fire that shot. I'm going to see Leon Fisk. Okay, okay. Now, let's start it again. If I didn't... If somebody didn't... If, if you didn't... If I didn't what? Lieutenant? Oh. <laughs> What is the matter, Lieutenant? He did it again. And you helped him. You rat, I'll see that you get the chair even if you didn't kill her. What did I do? You shut up. Well, what took you so long? I had to get a merry-go-round started. Oh, um, can I drop you somewhere? Just relax for a second. I've got to think something out. Well, I didn't ever think Martin could kill anyone. Yeah. What was that? Just, uh, just a backfire. Look, uh, drive me across town. I want to talk to a guy named Leon Fisk. Le Leon Fisk? Yeah, runs a nightclub with an iron claw in the back room. Uh, what's the address? Uh, 222 East 45th. I remember it because when I was on the force, I used to raid his place for exercise. Uh... Thinking of doing some gambling? That's the way it'll probably end up. Let's go. She drove me across town, and ten minutes later, we pulled up in front of a low building with a flight of steps leading down to a basement door. A large sign over the door read, Cellar Club. I got out and thanked June for the lift and watched her drive off. I went down the steps and through the door. Something I can do for you? Yeah, I'd like to see Leon Fisk. Maybe you don't want to see it. What's the name? Just tell him Diamond. Okay. Uh, you got a phone booth? Yeah, right over there. Thanks. I found the phone booth and went in. In my business, you work with hunches, and sometimes they pay off. I knew that the torn letter had to be sent to someone the dead girl was going to slough. I didn't think it was higher, so the next best prospect was her husband, Leon Fisk. I didn't have a thing to pin on him, but a good bluff can open a lot of doors. I took out the letter and copied the handwriting on the other piece of stationery. I wrote the name Leon at the top and then the words, We Can't Continue, so they'd correspond with the first part of the original. Yeah? What was your writing? What's it to you? You don't have to get sore. I just thought maybe you was getting a tip on the horses and I sure could use a winner. The nags have been beating me to death. 
Oh, no tip. Okay, the boss will see you. That door right over there. Thanks. Well, Diamond, it's been a long time. I haven't missed you, Leon. What brings you here? Your wife was killed tonight. Sally? One's usually the lemon. Uh, that's too bad. How did it happen? I thought maybe you could tell me. I don't know anything about it. Mm, never see this letter before? Hey. Uh, what's the matter? That's your wife's handwriting, isn't it? Yeah. It uh, says, uh, Leon, we can't continue. Then the writing stopped. Well, so what? Well, the guy the police are holding got a letter from Sally, too. It started the same way, but it wasn't addressed to anyone. The top was torn off. You know what I think? No, tell me. I think she started one letter to you, then threw it away and wrote another one. I think you sent the second to Martin Haar after tearing off the name Leon. Now, go on, Diamond. You didn't count on her starting a second one, so you went up to her apartment and killed her with Martin's own gun. Oh, with his own gun. Uh, maybe you can tell me how I got it. Oh, oh, I think so. You had to know a lot of things before you could kill your wife. What time Martin would arrive, so the time of death would be close. You had to have his gun to leave by the body, and you had to have a witness who would swear Martin killed her. It had to be time, just right. You're talking yourself into a corner. How would I get all these things? By working with someone who was close enough to Martin... Maybe like his wife. You're crazy. Am I? She just drove me to this place. So what? A lot of people know this place. She told me she didn't. So I gave her an address eight doors down, but she pulled up right in front of your door. Well, that could happen. It was too pat, Leon. Getting me to come to her place at ten minutes to eight and knowing her husband would leave close to eight. She had to know it because that letter was delivered just before I got there. Think you can prove it? You made one mistake. I didn't hear a shot when I got to your wife's apartment. I found out later that you could hear one all the way down in the street. Your wife was killed before Martin went into that building. Probably when you saw his cab pull up. Well, anyway, it's enough to hold you on, and I think we can prove later on that you've been seeing June Hires. You're a pretty smart shamus, Diamond. Oh, you mean you admit it? Okay, baby, come on in. June, come on out of there. Leon, are you crazy? Well, well, well. I didn't know you kept your back room stocked with nylons, Leon. Yeah, yeah. I guess you two don't need any introduction. Why did you have to drag me into this? You heard what Diamond said. He knows all about it. You got the car out back? Yes. But what are we going to do with him? Diamond? Well, he's going swimming with a barrel of cement. Lieutenant Levinson wouldn't like that. He knows I came here. You're lying. Wait a minute. Maybe he isn't. Diamond was upstairs with him for quite a while. Okay, so we'll have to hurry things up. Leon, you you can't shoot him. Yeah. You should know it's not polite the point. I'm not going to knock him off here in the office. We'll take him in the car and do it later. No, Leon. What do you mean, no? It was your idea to kill your wife. I just helped get the gun. I'm not going to be along if you kill Diamond. You're going to be right with me, baby, because you're in this up to your pretty neck, and I need that car. I'm not going to do it. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, you and Diamond go swimming together. Leon! Give me that gun. You... Let, me... Let me go. Come on, drop it. You go to the devil. June, June, come back here. I'm getting off. You got me into this mess. Come back here, you... you dirty little tramp. Don't you take that car. You're not going anywhere, Leon. You want to bet? I'll... You diamond! He hit me with the butt of his gun, and I went down like the price of wheat in July. As I picked myself up, I watched him run for the back door. June! June, wait for me! You're not gonna leave me here to take the rock! I got my gun out and stumbled over to the window and looked out just as the car started up. I spotted Leon with a gun in his hand. He looked mean enough to start shooting with it. He did. I started running up the alley then. I suppose I could have said something like stop or I'll shoot, but I was too tired. I just rested my arm on the window and let him have it. Ah! Well, Walt finally showed and cleaned things up. I was bleeding again, so I headed for 975 Park Avenue and my usual first aid station. Yes? Hello, Francis. Miss Asher in? Oh, my goodness, Mr. Diamond. Come in, sir. Come in. You've been hurt again. I guess you'll have to answer the door a little quicker after this, Francis, or build a first aid station in the hall. The usual, sir? No, you can forget the plasma, Francis. I had liver for dinner. I can stand the loss. Just as you say, sir. Miss Asher is in the study. Oh, thank you. Why don't you go to bed? You look tired. Yes, well, good night, sir. Boo. Oh, oh, Rick. Yeah, isn't it awful? Oh, what happened to your chin? Oh, I got it caught in the 38. Wanted to go. Want you to go? Why? Well, I thought maybe my poor little face scared you. Oh, 
I like your poor little must up face. Well, thanks, Sporty. How about some music? Oh, I'm too tired. Turn on the radio. All right. Now, let me look at that chin. Oh, that's soothing. Hey, oh, shut that radio off. I'm trying to sleep. Now, what is that? Oh, it's that crabby old neighbor. Oh, it is, huh? Now, Rick, don't get mad. I'll turn it off. You want something, Max? Yeah, some sleep. Is that too much to ask? Well, stick your head in a closet. Now, look, bud. You look. That radio wouldn't wake a two-year-old. Well, just pretend I haven't stopped teething, wide guy. All I want is some sleep. Oh, you do, huh? Sleepy time, gal. You're turning night into day. Uh, you... oh. Rick. Oh, that guy upsets me. All right, he upsets you. That's too pretty a song to sing like that. No. Now, you do it right or I'm going to be mad. Well, honey, then that's the last thing I want you to be. Now, now cuddle up on the sofa. You comfy? Mm-hmm. Don't be mad now, baby. Sleepy time, gal. You're turning night into day. Sleepy time, gal. You've danced the evening away. Oh, that's wonderful. Before each silvery star fades out of sight. Please give me one little kiss. Then let us whisper good night. It's getting late, and baby, your pillow's waiting. Sleepy time, gal. When all your dancing is through. Sleepy time, gal. I'll find a cottage for you. You'll learn to cook and to sew. What's more, you'll love it, I know. When you're a stay-at-home, play-at-home, eight o'clock, sleepy time, gal. Well, how was that, baby? Helen. <sighs> Helen. Well, how do you like that? She snores, too. Hey, you! Max! Yeah, now what do you want? How about a game of gin? I'm lonesome. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Jay Novello, Joan Banks, and Stacey Harris. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Now, Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is Diamond. You know, there are a lot of people in a big city like this. Good ones and bad ones. They walk down Broadway and rub elbows and you can't tell them apart. Why can't you? Because a lot of them are poured out of the same mold. Brought up in the middle of garbage cans and gang wars. Weaned on the smell of slums and conditioned to the taste of dirt and a kick in the ribs. By the time they get old enough to raise their fist, they're given two choices. Two ways to beat the gang wars and garbage cans. One guy picks himself up, shakes off the filth, and jumps over on the right side of the fence. The other guy picks himself up, too. But when he does, he raises that fist and shakes it at the whole world because he wants things the easy way. 
He continues to shake his fist until someone shoves a gun in it. Then he's a swaggering giant. Sometimes he climbs over with his little bag of rot and hides in the lap of society. But take away the gun and he ends up right back in the middle of the garbage cans with his face in the dirt. What about the guy on the right side of the fence? Well, you rarely ever hear of him, unless he becomes president or gets mixed up with a guy on the wrong side of the fence. Like the case I bumped into a couple of days ago, it all started in Central Park. Girl got run over. That young guy over there ran over with his car. I came up right after it happened. He was leaning over her and crying. A little late for crying, I'd say. Says he didn't kill her. Says someone pushed her in front of his car. <laughs> Ain't that a good one? All right, everybody back. Here comes the ambulance. Come on, you. But I tell you, I didn't kill her. I was in love with her. That's the last thing you should have said. But I swear I didn't do it. I was going to meet her about a, about a half a block up the street, and someone pushed her out in front of my car. I couldn't stop in time. Hey, look, I just got to write a report and take you down to the station. You can tell it to the inspector. Now look out. Here's the ambulance. Hello, Crackett. Yeah, you're too late. The body's ready for the morgue. Ah, yeah, Central Park's turning into a graveyard. I'm going to start taking my girl someplace else. What do you mean? Somebody else got run over in the park? Somebody got shot full of holes. The call came in just for this one. That uh, gangster Chino Scarbo? Scarbo got knocked off. He was dough, wasn't he? Please, officer, can't I get to a phone? Shut up. One of the biggest gangsters in town gets rubbed out, and I gotta show up at the station with you. You know, Sonny, I'm not pleased with you at all. Diamond Detective Agency, corpses designed with you in mind. Rick. Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Where do you get all those awful slogans? Ghost Rider. Ho, ho, ho. Get it? Rick. Wasn't a riot? No, Rick. Was a bomb. Oh. Okay, maybe this will get a yuck. Oh. Oh, here's a butte. Are you lonely? Join the Lonely Souls Club and find your perfect soulmate. All ages. Guarantee satisfaction and money refunded. I wonder if Mighty Joe Young knows about this. Rick, what are you talking about? I'm reading the personals. Hey, get a load of this one. We'll give ride to coast, must be young, companion, pretty, easy on the eyes. Hmm. Think I ought to apply, baby? You're ridiculous. Oh, here's an odd one. Anyone witnessing unusual accident at the 77, 72nd Street Transverse, 11 p.m. Wednesday night, when young girl was killed, call Skyler 6036. Urgent. That's in Central Park. Yeah, somebody's got troubles. Mr. Diamond? Uh, hold it a minute, baby. Yeah, I'm Diamond. What can I do for you? I, uh, want to hire you. Uh, Helen. Yes, I know. Bye. A hundred dollars a day in expenses, sir. That's your fee? Yep. I like to give it to the prospective client first. If he turns green and faints, we both save a lot of time and talk. How do you feel? About the fee? Fine. Well, what else is bothering you? My son is being held on a manslaughter charge. Well, if he kills somebody, that's a job for the police. But he didn't do it intentionally. The girl was shoved in front of his car. That's his story. Yes, it is. And I believe him. Hmm? Who was the girl, and why do you think anyone would want to kill her? Her name was Jean Cooper. My son was in love with her. Why anyone would want to kill her, I really can't say. Uh-huh. Your name and your son's name, where he's being held? My name is Cook. Earl Cook. My son's hmm? name is Tom. He's at the 5th Precinct Police Station. Oh, wouldn't you know it? I beg your pardon? Uh, forget it. Uh, what's your business, Mr. Cook? Politics. Where can I reach you? I live at 261 Riverside Drive. My phone is Skyler 6036. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? I don't know. That phone number's familiar. Where did your son run over this girl, Mr. Cook? The 72nd Street Transverse. 11 o'clock Wednesday night? Why, well, yes. How did you know? I read the papers. Is this your ad in the personal column? Yes. Yes, it is. You see, the police claim there were no witnesses. But I had hopes that there might have been someone who had seen the accident. Well, if, if anyone called you, let me know. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'll take $100, Mr. Cook. That's a retainer in case I run into trouble and have to get buried in a hurry. I hate to strain my relatives. He wrote me out a check, and I closed the office and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. An automobile death isn't exactly up my alley, but if someone had pushed the girl out in front of the car, then it was murder. And that was a territory I knew my way around in. Well, well, good morning, Sergeant Otis. Uh, 
Oh, where did you come from, Shamus? Sugar and spice and everything nice. Huh? That's what little boys are made of. You're crazy. That's what little girls are made of. Why, Sergeant, you peaked. Uh, you want to see the lieutenant? I think that would be lovely. Go on, then. Oh, uh, Otis. Huh? I just had a horrible thought. Yeah? Wouldn't it be awful if there was a whole room full of you? Hello, Walt. Diamond, you get out of here. Every time you wander into this office, I grow another ulcer. Why, Walt, I'm surprised at you. Well, you wouldn't be if you had to listen to Otis belly aching all over the precinct 12 hours a day. Why don't you leave that poor guy alone? Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him? How can I help it? He screams so loud, only dogs can get with it. Have you got a boy book here on the manslaughter charge, uh, Tom Cook? Yes, we have. I knew darn good and well you'd be springing something before you'd sit down and act like a normal human being. What do you want Cook for? He ran over a dame last night, and that's that. Maybe you want to give him a driving lesson? Uh, uh, uh. You're turning blue again, Walt. I'll light up like a pinball machine if you don't start giving me some peace and quiet. Can I see Cook? No, you can't. Well, why not? I know you. You'll end up by proving he wasn't even in the city last night. Before the day is gone, we'll be booking Otis for the killing. Did he do it? Who? Otis. Now, you stop that. Don't you dare start that routine again. I'm the biggest sucker in the world for that thing, and I admit it, but I am prepared. I know who's on first base today. Who? Williams. He's playing for... Uh, Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Yeah, Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant. Is that all you can say? Take Diamond down to see that guy cook. And if you let him back in this office, I'll break every bone in your fat head. Yeah, Lieutenant. Oh. Where is that bicarbonate? My Walt. I left Walt coming on like Vesuvius, and Otis took me down in the tombs to see Tom Cook. Cook was a man about 25 or 26, put together like a high jumper. He had sandy hair and a nice face. Also, he looked pretty worried. I tell you, Mr. Diamond, I didn't intentionally run over Jean. She called and asked me to meet her in the park. Why? Well, we always met there. Oh. You say she was pushed in front of the car? Well, that's what it looked like. There were some bushes right near the sidewalk. She came flying out of them and fell in front of me before I could put on the brakes. What did she want to see you about? It was personal. Now, look, look. You're up on a manslaughter charge. You can get a lot of time for that. Now, what did you want to see you about? I can't tell you. I, I just can't tell you. It would ruin someone. It's going to wreck you if you don't. Then it'll have to. Okay, okay. Did she have any enemies at all? Boyfriends, girlfriends, ex-husbands, jealous ice men? She had an ex-husband. When did she separate from him? About a year ago. Why? Do you think maybe Cooper was jealous? Is his name Cooper? Yes, uh, John Cooper. Oh, live in town? Well, he was living at 498 West 81st Street, but that was a year ago. Okay. Tell me where your girl was living. 383 Madison Avenue, apartment 206. She was living under her married name, Cooper. Mm. Sure you don't want to tell me what she wanted to see you about? I can't, Mr. Diamond. Okay, but I hope the person you're protecting appreciates it. Five years in Sing Sing is stretching loyalty a long way. This person's worth it. Uh, Otis, let me out of here. You locked me up with a Boy Scout. Yes? Uh, Mr. Cook? Yes? Uh, who is this? This is Diamond. Diamond, I'm so glad you phoned. Oh? Remember my ad in the personal columns? Yes. Well, I just received a call from someone who claims he saw a man push a girl in front of my son's car. Oh. He said he was in a hurry, so he didn't wait around to see the rest. Can you imagine that? In too much of a hurry to stay round. No, I can't imagine it, unless he was running away from something, didn't want to be caught. Did he uh, tell you anything else? No, I, I asked his name, but he hung up. No. Oh. Well, if you hear from him again, call Lieutenant Levinson of the 5th Precinct. And I'll call you later. All right, Mr. Diamond. But now I'm sure my son is innocent. Well, I hope I can come up with more than your confidence. I knew a guy who yelled frame all the way to the electric chair. They fried him like a lean pork chop. I left the phone booth and took off for John Cooper's apartment. I found the place and gave my rabbit's foot a pat on the hock. The little bunny was still with me because a John Cooper was listed on the mailboxes. I took the steps two at a time. Yeah, who is it? Uh, the name's Diamond. I don't want any. I'm selling a homicide, complete with samples. You better open up. Hey, what are you talking about? I'm talking about your ex-wife. She was killed last night. What? Mind if I come in? No, 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 come on in. Jean dead. How did it happen? She was run over by a car. Oh, that's awful. Are you from the police? You got a gold star. 
Where were you at 11 o'clock Wednesday night? Well, it was right here in my apartment. You can prove it? Well, if I didn't leave, I don't guess I can prove it. I hope you don't think I ran over, Gene. I know who ran over. I'm trying to find out who aimed her. I don't understand. She was pushed in front of the car. How do you know that? Why shouldn't I know that? Well, what... I don't know. I, I, I guess you should. When was the last time you saw your ex-wife? Oh, about eight months ago. We didn't get along, so we didn't speak after we split up. You haven't seen her since? No. Or are you jealous of her new boyfriend? Jealous? Why should I be? Good question. I'll see you later, Mr. Cooper. Yeah. I hope I've been of some help. You've been dandy. I left Cooper pinning up his gold star and headed for the dead girl's apartment. I knew the law had already been there and that it would probably be locked tighter than a wine truck on Skid Row. I found the landlady's door and gave it a jolt. Yeah? Oh, what do you want? I'm uh, looking for the landlady. You want an apartment? We got one coming up in a couple of days. The dame that was in it croaked. You can pay in advance if you want it. Can I take a look at it? Nah. Lousy coppers told me not to let anyone in. You got my word, it's a good one. Oh, well then, you'd better let me talk to your mother. My mother? My old lady's been dead for 20 years. She has? Aren't you a little young to be running an apartment all by yourself? <laughs> hey, Sonny. Yeah? How old do you think I am? Well, it's hard to tell. I'd say, oh, about 28. <laughs> Come on, I'll show you the apartment. But watch those steps. I think you could use some glasses. Right up here, handsome. Was the poor girl who died married? Used to be, but she got divorced. Here it is. There you are, honey. Go on in, take a look around. I'll go on back downstairs in case the law comes back. I'll have to stall them, I guess. Thanks, beautiful. Oh, that's all right, honey. When you're done, stop in at my place and I'll give you a drink of gin. I waited until I heard the old bat fly down the stairs, and then I took the place apart. It took me exactly ten minutes, and even if I do say so, it was a pretty neat job. I was on the last lap, going through the wastebaskets, when I spotted something on the magazine stand. It was just below eye level. It was a late issue of a magazine, and it was addressed to Mr. John Cooper, 498 West 81st Street. I grabbed it and picked up the phone. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Oh, uh, this is Wu Lee. Wish you talking to Lieutenant Levinson? Oh, how are you, Wu Lee? Uh, get it for you, chop chop. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? Oh, very fine, chop chop. Your head, maybe? Huh? Will you say very fine? You speak very fine Chinese. Oh, Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, this is uh, uh, this is Diamond Walt. It is. I told Otis I didn't want to talk to you. He said Wu Lee was on the pipe. Oh, this is Wu Lee too, Walt. Oh, that lame brain, Otis. Oh, what is it now, Diamond? I got a liar in the balcony, Walt. What are you talking about? I've spoken to three people about the girl that was run over. One of them lied to me. Now, I believe the kid's story. I think she was pushed. So, she was pushed. I can't be bothered with that right now. I'm all tangled up in the Scarborough killing. We found the gun that did the job lying in the bushes in Central Park. Wait a minute. In Central Park? Yeah, we traced it to a pawn shop, and the pawnbroker identified one Louis Spiegel as the one that bought the gun. Well, at what time was Scarborough knocked off? The shots were heard about five minutes to 11. Hey... That's just about the same time that Cook ran over the girl. You are so right. And Scarborough got killed on the other side of the park. About five minutes to run to where the girl got run over. Now, what are you getting at? If you know something about this Scarborough killing, I Well, you... some guy called Tom Cook's father and said he saw the girl shoved in front of the car. He wouldn't tell his name because he said he'd get in trouble. Uh, probably a crank. No one would duck out on a deliberate murder. Unless he just rubbed out New York's biggest gangster. Hey. Yeah. Have you got Louis Spiegel on tap? No, he's hiding out. Oh. Now, do me a favor. Check your files and see if you've got a record on a John Cooper. The dead girl's ex-husband? Yeah, then I'll call you back. I've got a guy who might show us where we can find Louis Spiegel and the guy who pushed the girl in front of the car. Oh, he killed two birds with one stone. It's quite a billiard shot, but give my little stool pigeon two bottles of fermented grape juice and he can run the table. I left the apartment and slipped by the landlady's door. I knew she was building a party because I could smell the hunted proof clear out in the hall. I ducked out on the street and headed for Skid Row in a place called the Parrot Club. When I went in, I spotted my man sitting in his usual spot at the bar. His name was Wilbur Truitt. Ah, greetings, bucko. You have come just in the nick. Not having the necessary funds to purchase another bottle of strength, I asked yon bartender to put it on the cup. Uh, Wilbur, Whereupon I... he handed me this can of rat poison. Mm. It turned out to be rather soothing in a toxic sort of way. 
Bucko, you know me. I do not wish to deprive the little rodents of their daily constitution, so I would much rather nurse on the succulent end of a box. Wilbur, I'm looking for someone. I have been looking for someone all my life, preferably a brewery owner. A uh, bartender, uh, bring me a bottle. Oh, noble sir, your over-kindness doth wring tears from me. I do embrace your offer. Now, you don't wrap your hooks around this jug until I find out where Louis Spiegel is. Ah, that is indeed a difficult problem. Mr. Spiegel carried a rather large gun under his arm. Then if I sit here and gaze at that bottle for any great period, I shall become cotton-mouthed and surely choke to death. Mr. Louis Spiegel might be found in the freight yards, hiding in an old shack at the end of 50th Street. Now, bucko, I'm rusting. Here you are, Wilbur, and thanks. Farewell. Lord knows when we shall meet again. I have faint, cold fear thrills through my veins. (laughs) But no matter. I have never let a cork confuse me before. Bartender, a corkscrew, and bring the cat. I owe him a drink. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Diamond, Walt, what did you find out? John Cooper has no record. Uh Uh-oh. But George Kingsley has. Oh, alias? Yeah. George Kingsley, alias John Cooper, did ten years for embezzlement. Oh, fine. Thanks, Walt. Now, here's the pitch. Lou Spiegel is in a shack in the freight yards at the end of 49th Street, North River. Get some men to surround the place and have Otis pick up John Cooper and bring him down there. I'll be there in half an hour and give you a couple of killers. All I needed was a motive, so I hung up the phone and headed for the house of my client, Earl Cook. Oh, come in, Mr. Diamond. I'm very glad you've come. Uh, Mr. Cook, did you... I uh, want to show you something. Here. Uh, What are they? Letters to my son. Blackmail letters. Oh? Where'd you find them? I was going through my son's things, trying to find something that might help uncover the motive for his accident. Mind if I take a look? Well, I can save you the trouble. They're about me. About you? Yes. I told you I'm in politics. Well, I am. And I'm a big power. When I began my rise, I was a young criminal lawyer. I had to accept a lot of cases that I might have turned down under different circumstances. And the opposition tried everything to discredit me smear campaigns, saying that I was getting acquittals for common thugs who were known to be guilty. Later, when I became a judge, they switched the campaign and said that the men I sentenced were innocent. Were they? Of course not. But in those letters to my son, the blackmailer said that he had definite proof that could ruin me. My son knew about my past, and when he started receiving the letters, he was afraid to confront me with the evidence, for fear I might have to admit my dishonesty. Have you talked with your son? I just left him. That's why he didn't tell you anything. He thought he was protecting me. His girl, Jean, found out who was sending him the letters and... Well, she was killed before she could tell him. Well, that fits. If the girl found out, then the blackmailer would not only have to know your son pretty well, but he'd also have to know her. You think you know who he is? Uh, see this magazine? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, some of the pages are cut up. Now, take a look at these blackmail notes. They're formed with cut-out letters to spell out the words. Mm. The type is the same as the type in the magazine. Where did you get that magazine? In the girl's apartment. Well, then she must have had something to do with it. She found the magazine, all right, but it wasn't hers. Uh, look, Mr. Cook. Yes. Did you ever send a man to prison named Kingsley? Yes, I believe so. For embezzling. Ah, thanks. Where are you going? I'll call you later. I've got a date at the freight route. Oh, hello, Rick. We've got Spiegel boxed up. He's in that shack down there. Ah, will he come out? If he does, it'll be feet first. I guess he'd rather have it that way. Any shooting? He tried a couple, but I had the boys hold their fire until you got here. I see. Where's John Cooper? Otis hasn't showed up with him yet. Uh, let me use your loudspeaker, Walt. Sure, go ahead, but, uh, keep your head down. Spiegel! Spiegel! Lou! Why, that low life, I'll blast him to kingdom come. Hold it, Walt. Spiegel knows me. Louis! Lloyd, this is Diamond. I want to talk with you. You better get out of here, Diamond. Ain't none of your business. Lou, you've got my word. There'll be no shooting. I want to talk to you. Look, Diamond. I know they want me for the Scarborough killing, and I say, okay, I've done the job. But I'm allergic to electricity, and I don't like cops. 
You blow this place apart, I say okay too. And that's the way I want it. How do you still want to talk? I want five minutes. Okay, come on, Tom, but keep your hands behind your neck. Walt, no shooting, huh? Okay, but I think you're crazy. He kills guys for practice. I moved out from behind the boxcar and put my hands behind my head. I started down toward the shack and I could see Spiegel looking at me over the barrel of a forty-five. One bad move from any of the men stationed around the yards and I was going to get dead quick. I walked up to the shack and went in. That's far enough, Diamond. You've got five minutes. Uh, it won't take that long, Lou. Keep your hands where they are. Oh, I uh, thought you might want a cigarette. Oh. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm all out. Yeah. Keep the pack. I uh, just one. I got a date. Now, um, light? I can make it. Four minutes, Diamond. Did you see a girl shoved in front of a car the night you knocked off Scarbo? Yeah. I called some guy and I told him about it. I read his ad in the personals, but I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, because then the law would know you were in the park. Looks like it don't make much difference now. The kid who ran over the girl is in on a manslaughter rap. You'll get five or ten. That's tough. You got three and a half minutes. Lou, did you get a good look at the man who gave the girl the shove? Sure, I'd remember him. Rick! What do they want? I'll see. With your hands up, you'll see. Sure. What is it, Walt? Otis has got Cooper. Lou, will you do me a favor? I don't know. I want you to tell me if a guy they've got up there is the one who pushed the girl. Sure. But I can't see him from here. I'll have him brought down. I hope you ain't up to something. I don't want to see no kid get sent up in a bum rap. But if you get funny, you get holes. Walt! How about his bring Cooper halfway down to the shack? He doesn't want to go. Then drag him. I've only got two minutes. They bringing him? Yeah, here he comes. Okay. Out that door. What are you doing? I'm doing you a favor. I'm tired of this shack, and I'm walking out with you in front of me. Okay. Don't get too far ahead. Rick, what's Spiegel up to? I don't know. Hold your fire. I'm surprised at you. Even if I identified this guy, it wouldn't hold water. I got a bad reputation. Hey, what's going on? Take it easy, Otis. You can't do this to me. What's this all about? That's the guy, Diamond. I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you do. I saw you push that dame in front of the car. You're crazy. Now, I don't like that. You got just ten seconds to admit it. I won't admit anything. Then I shoot you. Hey, you can't... Shut up, Flatfoot. Stay out of this, Otis. I tell you, I won't admit anything. Five seconds. Come on, Cooper. I found out all about your prison record. I know Cook sent you up and you wanted to get even. You found those letters Tom wrote to your ex-wife, so you started blackmailing him. And I know you lied when you said you hadn't seen your ex-wife. I found a magazine in her apartment with your address on it. Time's up. No, 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 no. All right, I did it, I did it. You're too late. I'm on schedule. Oh, you idiot. Why did you shoot him? What's the difference? I kill people, he kills people. Besides, he wasn't polite. So long, Diamond. You got your favor. He's making a break. You'll never make it. Spiegel. Spiegel, in the name of the law, stop. From what? There they got him. They sure did. You know something? He wasn't such a bad guy. Wasn't he? I guess he's killed a dozen people in his time, but maybe you're right. Maybe he kissed them all goodbye before he pulled the trigger. Well, I got a right to an opinion. Yeah, yeah, and it scares me a little. You're lucky you didn't try to pull a gun on him. You'd look pretty silly telling everybody what a nice guy he was after he'd shot off the top of your head. <laughs> Lots of lemon, honey. What's that you're playing? I don't know. It says on the sheet music for kazoo and voice. <laughs> you idiot. Here, see how this tastes. Ah, uh, oh, that's swell. But can't you drop a muscle in it or something? No, that's plenty strong. Oh. The last time you complained about my weak drinks, Francis had to carry you home piggyback. Yeah, remind me to buy him a saddle. I hear they uh, let the cook boy out of jail this evening. How the dickens did you know that? Mm, never mind, I find out things. You have been snooping. Well, you won't tell me anything about your cases. How did you find out? Uh-uh. Helen? No. You'll be sorry. Here. 
You sing this, and I'll tell you how I found out. Well, I don't know whether I can. Your lips tell me no, no. But there's yes, yes in your eyes. I've been missing your kissing. Just because I wasn't wise, I'll stop my scheming and dreaming, cause I realize your Oh, Rick, lips. that's wonderful. Oh, okay, now, make like a truth serum, or I sing 20 courses of McNamara's band. <laughs> well, I was looking for you, so I called Walt Levinson. He told me all about it. Very elementary, my dear Diamond. Oh, get her. Do I look smug? Close your eyes and let's see. Now that's silly. Why do I have to close my eyes? Close your eyes. <laughs> oh, that's better. Mm. Rick, aren't you nice? I certainly am. But people always notice my dimples first. Come here. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Helen. Mm hmm. You're looking smug again. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Eleanor Audley, William Johnstone, Sam Edwards, David Ellis, and Frank Lovejoy. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evening. Shows like Hollywood Calling, Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, The Ethel Merman Show, and the NBC Symphony. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial tuned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, I saw something the other day that's as typical of New York as the Empire State Building. I was walking down 2nd Avenue when I spotted some kids around the fire hydrant. They had turned it on and the whole gang was splashing around, keeping cool. They'd done something else, too. They'd found a barrel... And I suddenly remembered when I used to play in the gutter with the same kind of barrel. It's open at both ends, and when it's held over the gushing hydrant, it acts like a big hose, and a lot of passing New Yorkers can end up pretty wet. I stopped and watched, and just like always, one of New York's finest showed up and the kids scattered. He turned off the water and the fun was over. Oh, but not for long. Somebody was sure to give the kids a monkey ranch, and ten minutes after the cop had disappeared, the street would be flooded again. Yeah, kid can have a lot of fun, even in a big city. But it's unfortunate that every once in a while there's a boy who forgets to have fun and heads for trouble. Like a case I got mixed up in not long ago. It all started in a candy store under the L on 9th Avenue. Hey, I'm just closing up, boys. We want to talk to you, Pop. I told you I was closing up. Come back tomorrow and we can talk then. Eddie said he wanted to talk to you, Pop. You better listen. Yeah, what is this? You kids get out of my store. You want to buy something, you come back tomorrow. You ain't been making enough on your number sales. We come to see why not. Oh, so that's it. 
First, they threaten to beat me up unless I sell the numbers. Then they get sore because they ain't selling enough and send young hoodlums to see that they do. Well, you go tell your boss that I'm through selling numbers to poor people who think they can get rich quick. You tell your boss if he don't like it, I'm going to the police. You tell your boss that. Sure, we'll tell him. He wants us to tell you something. I don't want to hear nothing from you bunch of no goods. Now you get out of here. Oh, no, that ain't nice. Is it, Jim? No, that ain't nice at all. I told you to get out. If you don't, I'll call a cop. You ain't calling anybody, Pop. Here, what are you doing? You get away. Help, please. No, no, please, help. Shut up. Okay, Jim, make him shut up. Please, I'm an old man. Yeah, yeah, sure you are, Pop. But old guys like you need exercise. <laughs> Think he's had enough, eh? Yeah, grab some of them cigarettes and cigars off the counter. Ah, yeah, sure. Hey, we better get out of here. Maybe somebody heard him yelling. Okay, grab me a box of candy, too. I got a date with Nancy tonight. I'll grab a couple. I got a date, too. Let's go. Down this alley. Yeah. Okay, okay, slow it down. Yeah. Let's get over to 27th Street. Okay. Come on, Mr. Parrish wants to see us. Right. Uh, hey, Ed. Yeah? You want to see your brother today? Yeah. How's he doing? He's doing all right. Ain't he scared or nothing? <laughs> What's the matter, Eddie? Oh, hey, what did I say? What did I say, huh? I told you once not to say nothing about my brother. I was just asking. I didn't say nothing, hey. He asked if he was scared, didn't you? Okay, okay. Well, he ain't scared. He's a big shot. He wasn't scared of the guy knocked off by the cops or nothing else, see? Not even a hot seat. <laughs> hey, that's the cop who spotted us. Come on. Diamond Detective Agency, we filtered the choke on the way to your throat. Oh, for Pete's sake, Diamond, aren't you ever serious? Well, Lieutenant Levinson, what's the matter with you? Did someone swipe one of your ulcers? Now, stop that. I wouldn't call you unless it was something important. I know. You're losing Sergeant Otis to Barnum and Bailey. You stop that. Ringling Brothers? Don't be ridiculous. I'm not. What other sideshow could boast a pointed head with a gray suede face? Diamond, I have an important message for you, so for the sake of my sour stomach, act like a normal human being for five minutes. Ah, uh, it's sure to be a strain, but go ahead. Bill Garrett wants to see you. Bill Garrett? Yes. He goes to the electric chair tonight at eight o'clock, and he wants to see you. Well, he can't sit in my lap. Now, look, I don't like the type any more than you do. He's going to die, so why the cracks? The guy he shot had a wife and two kids. Maybe you want me to make cracks about them? All right, all right. But will you see him? It's his last request. All right, sure. I'll call the warden and tell him you'll be up. Well, uh, you be sure and put in the call. If Otis does it, the warden will get so confused they'll turn Garrett loose and toast me. Well, in my business, you get a lot of scurry ones. But you never know where they'll lead, so if you've got that nervous, got to get in trouble feeling, you follow it up. I put in a call to my lovely redhead, Helen Asher, and told her I'd be a little late, but to keep the bottle spinning anyway. Then I took off for Sing Sing. Hello, Garrett. Hello, Simon. I'm glad you got here. Wouldn't miss it. Neither would I, unless I could help it. Look, Garrett, I'm busy, and you're on a tight schedule. Now, what's on your mind? Well, it's like this, Rick. The name's Diamond. Okay. I know you hate guys like me, but I ain't ashamed of what I've done. The way I lived, that's the way I'm going to go out. Now, if you want someone to listen to you feel sorry for yourself, you'll be along in a few minutes before eight. Uh, maybe I better forget it. You ain't got no use for nothing. I got use for everything that doesn't include guys like you. There's no middle with me, Garrett. It's got to be right or wrong. And uh, right keeps you out of trouble, huh? Well, not always. But it helps people to live together. Okay. I guess you know I got a kid brother. Yeah. He's going on 17, and it looks like the family's going to have another guy for you to hate. What do you want me to do? He thinks I'm a big shot. I want you to convince him I'm not. Oh? What's he done? I don't know, but he's just like I was when I was that age. Tough, wise guy. He wants to be just like me. Oh. Has he been up here to see you? Yeah, but that don't change his mind. Just makes him madder at the world. I ain't getting soft, see, but he's a great little guy, and he's smart. A lot smarter than I was. It's just going to take someone to show him which foot to get off on. Ah, uh, okay, okay. What's his first name and where can I find him? His name's Eddie. He's got a club they call the Panthers. Uh, you know the kind. Yeah, with me it was the Brownies. It's over on 26th Street and he's got a girl he told me about. Her name's Nancy Hyde. She lives with her aunt over 37th Street. Okay, I'll see what happens. 
He's tough. Oh, lots of guys are tough, Garrett. Sometimes if they get a break, they turn out to be so tough, they even get to be All-American. Hey, I'd like that. I'd like to see the kid get to be All-American. That might be a little difficult, but you never know. Maybe they've got television down there. The kid's around here, boss. Okay, tell him to come in. Okay, Eddie, go on in. Thanks, muscle man. Hiya, Mr. Parrish. Hello, Eddie. We took care of old man Thompson like you said. Good, good. You, uh, beat him up bad? Bad enough. Yeah, yeah, we really waked him over. We got Shut up, I'll do the talking. What do you think's running this mob anyway? Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Get a load of that, Bart. We got a big shot. Yeah, yeah. You run your bunch pretty good, don't you, Eddie? I run the whole club. The Panthers got 23 members now. You hear that, Bart? 23 members and Eddie's the big boss. <laughs> I like that. I like you, Eddie. You and me and the 23 Panthers is gonna go a long way. Well, that's something I wanted to talk to you about, Mr. Parrish. We're getting awful tired of just beating up guys. We want to start doing something big, like knocking over gas stations or something. <laughs> so you want to start doing something big, huh? Like knocking over gas stations, huh? Yeah. Well, you got a lot to learn, Eddie. Well, I've been doing all right, ain't I? Well, you're gonna do a lot better. How would you and the Panthers like to start making some really big cash? Hey, we'd like that. Shut up. We... <laughs> well, what does the boss say? The boss says great. What do we do? It's a cinch. Bart, go out in front and see that we ain't disturbed. Yeah, sure thing, boss. Bart carries a gun, don't he, Mr. Parrish? Yeah, Eddie. He carries a big one. I'm going to carry one someday. Sure you are. You're going to be a big shot. But you gotta learn first. You gotta start from the bottom to be a big shot. Now, here's the pitch. You get your gang together and explain that this... We swipe cars, so we swipe cars. I don't know, Ed. Beating up guys is one thing, but swiping cars is pretty dangerous. Look, it's a cinch. We go out in the road someplace, and one of us thumbs a ride. Huh? When the car stops, we all jump in. Later on, we knock the guy over the skull and take the car. Oh, stealing cars is a tough ride. If you get caught, but we don't get caught, see? If we catch a stoop out in the road someplace, it'll take him a long time to get to a phone. We drive the car to Mr. Parrish's warehouse and collect 50 bucks. Easy. I don't know. You better know. You're in the gang and that means you're in on it whether you like it or not. Okay, okay, Ed. You're the boss. Okay. We pull the first job tonight. The, the, I, I thought you had a date with Nancy. Oh, I got a date. I can break it. She does what I tell her. Yeah, but... Hey, what do you want? Yeah. This is a private club. I'm, uh, looking for Eddie Garrett. Who wants him? Nobody for a present, but I'm still looking for him. Well, beat it. You smell like a cop. You got a good nose. That's pretty close. Hey, just some... Shut up. We ain't seen any. Uh, yeah, that's right. We ain't seen him. Okay, but if you do, tell him I got a message from his brother. From my... From his brother? Yeah. Tell him that if you see him. Oh, well, wait a minute. I'm Eddie Garrett. Good for you. Proud of it? Oh, you're a wise guy, ain't you? I'll tell you later. Your brother says he thinks you're in trouble, are you? Trouble? <laughs> that's a hot one. What made him think that? He runs around with it. He says you think you're a big shot. Maybe I do. Then you're in trouble, Sonny. Oh, what are you talking to this guy for, Eddie? He talks crazy. Why don't we throw the bum out? How are you going to do it? Grow 12 feet? Oh, you're a pretty wise guy, you are. You wouldn't act so wise on the other end of a shiv. Shut up, Jim. Come on, get out of here. What about this wise guy, Ed? You want to be left alone with him? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, but I'd still like to wake this wise guy over. <laughs> Hey, hey, what's the idea? You tripped me. Ed, you see that? That's why he's got tripped me. You're pretty clumsy, Sonny. Now beat it. No, wh why you... You hate that? him? Beat it. You're lucky you didn't pull that knife, Jim. You'd look pretty silly with a broken arm. Yeah. Well, okay, okay, wise guy. I'll see you again. Now tell me what you want, and then you'll get out of here, too. Nice clubhouse you got. It's all right. It's, uh, six o'clock. So it's six o'clock. Doesn't it bother you? Two more hours and your brother dies. So what? So he doesn't want you to end up the same way. Don't you worry about me, mister. Your brother's worried about you. He wants me to help you. How about it? 
I don't need no help. You're a copper. Guys like you that sent my brother to the chair. I'm not a cop, Eddie, but I used to be. You ain't a cop? No, but if I was just a plumber and I had the chance to put your brother away for a killing, I'd do it. Yeah, I thought so. You look like the type. You're still a copper and you're no good. Now go on, get out of here. I don't need no help from a lousy copper. I don't need no help from anybody. Hey, Eddie, I... Oh, didn't know you was entertaining. This guy's just going. Come on in, boy. Let's go, Eddie. I mean, let's go. I want to talk to you. We'll go up to my place. I ain't going nowhere with a lousy copper. Copper? Yeah, yeah. He's been in here preaching to me. Better leave, Flatfoot. Come on, Eddie. No, I ain't going nowhere. You heard what the kid said. Now, look. Yeah. Well, well, well. Guns and everything. Like it? Goes bang, bang. Hey, hey, wait a minute, Bart. I don't want no killing. Oh, don't worry, Eddie. I'm just going to put the Flatfoot to sleep. No. <laughs> Hey, you slugged him with the gun. Mr. Parrish wants to see you about tonight. Huh? Okay. He, he ain't dead, is he? No, no. I just tapped him a little one. Come on. Tapped me a little one. <laughs> that was the biggest understatement of the year. He tapped me so little, my, health, my head felt like it was in sections. I lay there for a while trying to find the piece that did my thinking and... When I started coming out of it, it was like trying to open a beach umbrella in a 90-mile wind. I didn't know how long I'd been lying there, but when I finally opened my eyes, I I saw something that made the beating a welcome relief. Hey, look, Lieutenant. He's with us again. <laughs> oh, no. Shut up, Otis. Rick. Rick, how do you feel? Uh, I wish I was dead. Oh, now it can't be that bad. No. Well, you lie down here and look up at Otis. Makes you want to slash your wrist. Hey, he's riding me again. You're all right. Here, try to, try to sit up. Without my head? Oh. Now, who beans you? A guy named Bart Lippett. He didn't know me, but I recognized him. Small-time muscle man. Works for Sam Patton. A lovely group. So how the devil did you find me? Well, we certainly weren't looking for you. We came down to pick up Bill Garrett's kid brother. Pick him up? What for? Your job's ho- homicide. Yeah, he and another kid beat up an old storekeeper last night. The guy's in pretty serious condition. Oh, no. How serious, Walt? Well, the doctors say critical, but he does stand a chance. Hey, now, you, wait a minute. Where are you going? What time is it? Seven o'clock. Why? I got an hour to keep a promise. I hope that storekeeper doesn't die. If he does, Sing Sing will be building their electric chairs in tandem. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. But first, traffic accidents claim a victim on the average of more than one a minute, all day, every day in the year. The difficulty is that people continue to think of the horror of accidents as always happening to someone else. It never occurs to us that we may be killed dashing out to lunch tomorrow. The National Safety Council reports that in almost every motor vehicle accident, there is one or more violations of the law. Speed, drink, and carelessness being the worst offenders. Every motorist and pedestrian is urged to support actively the safety movement in his own community. Be careful. The life you save may be your own. And now back to Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Well, the law was after Eddie Garrett, and I'd promised his brother that I'd keep him out of trouble. If the storekeeper died, Eddie was sure to get life. But if he lived, and I could make him give himself up, I'd stand a good chance of helping him. I remember that Garrett had said Eddie had a girl, so I took off to 37th Street in a hurry. Yes? Are, uh, are you Nancy Hyde? Why? Well, I, uh, I'm looking for Eddie. Oh, uh, well, I, I haven't seen him. Huh? Hmm? You're a little nervous. Well, no, I'm just a little worried. About Eddie? Who are you? Oh, I know his brother. He wanted me to find Eddie. Oh, his brother. Well, I don't know where Eddie is, and you stay away from him. You, uh, don't approve of Eddie's brother? No, and I'm not afraid to say it. Eddie's a good boy, but he worships his big brother, and he thinks he's tough. So you can just go tell his brother that Eddie's not going to turn out like him. Not if I can help it. Well, he's not if I can help it either. I am a private detective, Nancy. My name's Diamond. You said that Eddie's brother wants you to find Eddie. He does, but he wants to keep Eddie out of trouble as much as you do. Oh, well, honestly, Mr. Diamond, I don't know where Eddie is. He called me a little while ago and said that he might be able to come over later. And he didn't say where he was? No. Hmm. Well, if he does come, try to keep him here, and I'll get in touch with you later on. All right, Mr. Diamond. 
I went down the hall and back down the steps in a hurry. When I reached the street, I stopped and waited for a cab to come along. I took out a cigarette was just about to light it when I spotted a shadow ducking in behind the doorways and making its way up the street toward me. I slipped back in the building and waited. Hey, what is this? Take it easy, Eddie. Oh, the copper. Let me go. That storekeeper you beat up may die. I'm taking you down to the station. What? That's right. He's in a bad way. Now, come on. Let's go. I might have known it. But you said you wanted to help me. That's a lad. This is the only way I can help you. Oh, sure. But if the law picks you up, you won't, won't stand a chance. You may even get shot. Well, I'll take my chances. Not tonight, you won't. Let me go. Let go of my arm. Now, look. I don't want to hurt you, so stop kicking. Yeah, this is swell, this is. Everybody wants to help me. My brother's going to chair, and if that old guy dies, I'm going to prison. Please let me go. I just as soon get shot. Ain't got nothing to live for. Now, take it easy, kid. The old boy might not die, then we can work something out. <laughs> what was that? That's Nancy. That's Nancy. Let me go. Come on. I turned him loose, and we both went up the stairs three at a time. We reached the door, and I got that lousy feeling. The screams had stopped, and from the way she was yelling... It would take a lot to shut her up, like dying. It's locked. Nancy. Nancy. She don't answer. Look out. She ain't here. Look in the other room. Nancy. Nancy. She ain't in here either. Hey, hey, what's the gun for? Get rid of the window, quick. What's the matter? That car driving off down there, you know it? Oh, why? Because I saw your girl being pushed in it. I couldn't take a shot because it might have hit her. He took her down the fire escape. Yeah. Eddie, Eddie, who would want to kidnap Nancy? I don't know, I don't know. You're working for Sam Parrish, aren't you? How did you know that? I recognized his muscle man just before he put me to sleep. I ain't saying nothing. Now look, you stupid little idiot. Aren't you worried about your girl? Yeah, sure I'm worried about her. What's that got to do with Mr. Parrish? Nothing, maybe. But if he heard that the law was looking for you, he might be afraid you'd talk. What were you and your gang doing for Parrish? I, I, I can't tell you. Okay, okay, then you're on your own. If the girl gets killed... They'll let you cry about it for the rest of your life and sing, sing. I'm through trying to help you, Eddie. You're too far gone. You're no good. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Mr. Diamond, please. I'll tell you, I don't want Nancy hurt. Please, I, I don't know what to do. Well, first, try to take it easy. And then tell me what you were doing for Sam Parrish. Well, we used to beat up guys that wouldn't sell enough numbers. Mr. Parrish controls a lot of the numbers racket. We were supposed to start swiping cars. He was going to pay us 50 bucks a car. Oh, call him. Call him? Yeah. Here's the phone. But for Pete's sake, don't let on that you know anything's up. Okay. I want you to tell him that you've decided to give yourself up. Okay. If he's got Nancy, I'll kill him. You just be sure and tell him that you're going to give yourself up. He'll tell you whether he's got Nancy or not. Yeah. Mr. Parrish? Uh, Eddie, is that you? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Me and Bart have been looking all over town for you. The uh, cops are after you. I know. I'm going to give myself up. You what? Yeah, it's better this way. They might go easier on me if I do. Look, kid, you, you got to stop talking like that. You're going to be a big shot. You can't go turning yourself into the law. No, I'm going to do it. Uh, you come down here and talk to me first. Uh, where are you? It's no good, Mr. Parrish. I'm leaving for the station right now. Eddie? Yeah? You ain't going nowhere unless you want to see your girlfriend scooped out of the East River. You have got it. Sure, I got it. So you get on down here. I just left her and she don't look so happy. She's with Bart and you know Bart. Well, you dirty no look, good look. baseball. You get out of my office in 20 minutes or I'll call Bart and the little girl dies. Now get down here. Hello. Hello. He's got her, Mr. Diamond. I got to get down there or he'll kill her. Where's his office? He don't have Nancy there. He told me she was with Bart. I, I got to go. You do and he'll kill you. Then he'll do the same with the girl. You can't take the chance. What are we going to do? I only got 20 minutes. Does Parrish have another office or a hideout? No, no. Wait a minute. Yes, he does. Sure, the warehouse. He told me about it this afternoon. We were supposed to take our stolen cars there. Okay. I'll call Lieutenant Levinson and tell him to meet us there. You think that's where they got Nancy? I hope so. 20 minutes isn't much time. I put in a call to Walt and briefed him in a hurry. Then Eddie and I took off to the warehouse. It was at the foot of 14th Street, and by the time we got there, we had only 10 minutes left. The building was as dark as a foggy grave and locked tight. We found a window in the basement and finally jimmied our way in. You all right, Eddie? Yeah, but I, I can't see nothing. Come on. That looks like some stairs. Maybe we guessed wrong. <laughs> what was that? 
I don't know, but there was a jockey on it. Come on. Hey, look. There's a light. Yeah. A little office in the back. Now, you stay here. There might be some shooting. Uh-uh. White's in there with Nancy. I went in on it. This is no time to argue. Now, back over against the wall. Gosh, I bumped into some boxes or something. Oh, shut up. Look. It's Bart. Hold still. Who's there? What are we going to do? He's got a gun. Answer him. Answer him? Yeah, quick. Come on, come on. Who's out there? Uh, it's uh, me, uh, Bart, Eddie. Huh? What are you doing here? We've been looking all over for you. I'm on the lam. The cops are after me, so I remember this place. Well, ain't that nice. The boss been worrying about you. Come on back, Eddie. <laughs> got a friend of yours here. Go on. I'm going to circle him. Uh, sure, sure, Bart. Uh, I'm coming. Come on over here where I can see you. Yeah. That's it. Okay, kid. Now hold it right there. Hey, what's the idea? Well, the boss is afraid you'll do some talking if the cops pick you up, so I got orders to knock you off. Sorry, kid. You know how it is. Drop it, Bart. Hey, hey he wait. drop it! Oh, you, you love Duck, Eddie! Uh, you got him. Yeah, thanks for the assist. Let's see if the girl's in the office. Yeah, they got a gag in the mouth. Nancy. Oh, she's okay. There. Oh, Nancy, honey. Oh, Here, I'll get those ropes off you. Man, I'm in some pretty bad trouble, but I swear if I get out of it, I'll go straight. Oh, you'll be all right, Eddie. I know you will. Oh, ain't that cozy. Huh? Look out, Eddie. Hold it right where you are. Well, things are really getting crowded. That's Paris, Mr. Diamond. I guess. You shoot pretty good, Diamond. I saw you get barred. I guess I'm going to have to pay you back for that. The law's on its way. So they find a morgue. Eddie! Oh, shoot Nancy, please. Shoot me, but don't shoot Nancy. Here they come, Parrish. You seem pretty anxious, mister, so I'll let you have it first. No! No, you can't! Look out, Eddie! Oh, Eddie! You slob, Parrish! Oh, Eddie! Eddie, he's hurt, Mr. Diamond. Oh, Parrish, but his is permanent. Eddie. Eddie, where you hit? I... think in the stomach. We'll get you to a hospital quick. You saved my scalp when you jumped in front of me. Thanks. How about Parrish? I paid him in full. What time is it? 8.35, Eddie. Oh. Funny, I don't feel so bad about my brother now that it's over. He'd probably be sore about me helping a cop. But you know, I don't mind. Especially when it's a nice guy like you. Walt busted in. They got Eddie to the hospital. Otis tripped over a pipe and broke his big toe, so they had to throw him in the wagon along with Eddie and his girl. Eddie recovered all right, and so did the storekeeper. He helped beat up. The kids all got two years, sentence suspended, because my lovely redhead, Helen Asher, convinced the judge that the boys would become much better citizens if they worked out their two years on her farm upstate milking the cows. Before Eddie left for the farm, Helen had him over to the house, and he brought his girlfriend. Well, we got to be going, Mr. Diamond. i got to catch a train. Thanks for the swell dinner, Miss Asher. It was my pleasure, Eddie. It was wonderful. Oh, Mr. Diamond. Yes, Nancy? Miss Asher was telling me that you sing. Oh, Miss Asher is sometimes afflicted with an extreme case of blabitis. Where? Hey, I'd like to hear you sing something before I take off. Would you, Mr. Diamond? Certainly he would. Do you want it after I tear out your pretty tongue at the lungs or before you, dear sweet little girl? Now, you mustn't talk that way in front of guests, Rick. They'll think we're married. Well, he's not as tough as he sounds. Now, come on, Mr. Diamond, give. Yeah, I'll give you a hit in the head. Come on, after Eddie hears me, uh, he may realize that crime does pay. It's on your pretty head. Just sing. Stop making like a prima donna. What do you want to hear? Oh, uh, something romantic. Oh, bless your little pointed head. You kids go sit on the sofa. Okay. Come on. Where are you now that I need you? Now that I want you so badly, I cry. Where are you? Where did fate leave you? Funny how I dreamed you'd still be standing by. Anyone. 
I had you at my beck and call. I called you any time at all. I guess I took you too much for granted. I never thought I'd lie awake and sigh. Where are you now that I need you? Now that I love you so madly, I could die. Well, how was that, kids? Rick, look. Well, how do you like that? They're stealing our stuff. <laughs> Come on, Eddie, break it up now. You got to catch a train. <clears throat> Eddie. <clears throat> Nancy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Sheldon Leonard, William Tracy, Mary Ship, Sidney Miller, and Bill Conrad. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evening. Shows like Hollywood Calling, Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, The Ethel Merman Show, and the NBC Symphony. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial turned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King, inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week, when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. I wonder if you know who first said, let George do it. Now, if your name happens to be George, don't say my wife, because you'll be wrong. No, it was all started back in the 15th century by a fellow named Louis XII, who must have been a pretty stale character, because unlike his grandson, Louis XIV, he didn't have any furniture named after him. You see, back in those days, it wasn't considered fashionable for a king to go around stabbing people in the back. So as a result, when some peasant got out of line, he called in George, a fellow with a sharp knife and no scruples. Now, I don't mean to say that George Valentine employs the same tactics, but if you hire him to do a job, he expects you to look the other way if someone starts to bleed. All of which brings us up to the moment whereby George is about to get himself hired by a group of evil politicians. If you'll shut the door, we can put the plot on to boil. Boys, you're a little noisy. Guess the luncheon's broke up. <laughs> Civic League. Just a lot of talk. None of them will ever do anything but the three of us. Always away, you're not. I don't know. You've only written one sentence. Shut up, Vic. And summer, spring. Um, perhaps you visited the hotel here yourself, Mr. Valentine, but at least it's a sure thing you've seen the outrageous charges the federal grand jury and city newspapers have been making about uh, us. Now, now, wait a minute, Nielsen. I'm still not so sure this is the right way to go at this. Here, here, the mayor speaks. Well, now, Vic, you're a lawyer. Would you hire a man you've never seen to investigate your own backyard? Now, there's a man I know, a fine detective, who would be only too glad to come down fine here. Fine detective to... like that police force of yours, I suppose. Can't see what's under their own noses. Well, I'm the responsible one, and it seems to me that Emmett I should be... Wall, his back's to the wall, and his head is all full of surmises. Now, she's You've here, got Vic, to you... stop being cautious sometime, Emmett. In my bank, I make decisions, and I make them fast. Yes, but I'd I... I rather... agree with Nielsen, Emmett. If we don't get in an outside investigator quick, the grand jury will do it. I say let's us find out first. Clean up our own town. <laughs> Objections overruled. Now we're getting someplace. Mr. Valentine, I'm enclosing railroad tickets. A public-spirited group 
of which I am the head. Three of us. Don't we sound fancy, though? Expects your immediate presence. It has been alleged that Summer Springs is being used as the center of payoffs for the big city collection racket. That our fair town has a jackal in its midst. And it's your job to find him. There. I do it? Oh, well, yeah. all right. Now we'll get some action. I'll mail this right now. Only, see here, both of you. Nobody knows about this but the three of us. Remember, nobody else knows about Valentine. That's what I call a happy little trio. I wouldn't trust that mayor any farther than I could toss the city hall, which ain't far. On the other hand, here's something you can put your faith in and never be wrong. Well, I guess George got the tickets all right, because there he is at the railroad station. The gorgeous one with him, uh, that's Brooksy. She works for Valentine when he hasn't got anything else to do. They made a reservation for me at the Summer Springs Hotel, Brooks, so you can phone me up there. George, why can't I go with you? Just because they don't expect Look, me to it's come... it's a five-alarm to... fire all set to go off, and you know it. Summer Springs is going to be hotter than but the... But nobody of... knows about you, just the men who rode. Angel, I'm looking for a guy who poses as respectable, a big-timer who hasn't been identified. And if you were there, I wouldn't be able to duck as fast. But there's nothing to. dangerous if nobody Valentine. knows. Hey, wait, Mr. Valentine. Huh? Yeah? The baggage man pointed you up. Yeah. I need your help. I need your luck. I got a case for you. Sorry, I'm tied up on one. My, uh, grandmother's dead. Oh, that's too bad. My grandfather killed her. Used an axe. What? I'm not interested. George. You see, my aunt's insane, and what happened I doubt if the... you ever had a grandmother, gorilla boy, or even a mother. Now say it in English and fast, because I'm not going to miss that train. I got a thousand bucks here for you to take my case. I could think of one. Uh-huh. You mean if I don't take the train? I don't mind. I can tell it to you on the way to Summer Springs. That's where you think I'm going? No, just where you think you're going. So somebody else does know. Hey, Buster, get out of my way before oh, I miss it. Stay that. away, I'm telling you. Oh, no, you George, don't. George, look, look out! out. No. Yeah, yeah, easy. We're attracting attention. A corpse would attract more. Who hired you? A thousand bucks. The trip ain't necessary. Stay home. Okay. Okay, maybe you're right, mister. Too late now, anyway. There she goes. That's a sooty kind of a trip. You wouldn't have enjoyed it. Uh-huh. Shall we go count the money? Sure. My name's Lemuel. You're a smart guy. I thought you'd see the light. Yeah. I hope you do. So you get to go after all, Angel. Yeah, you get to drop me off in Summer Springs yourself. From the car. much of a hotel, is it? For a fancy town like this, no more potted palms than usual. Do I get to come in with you? Sure, sure. Lemuel kept me off the train, didn't he? Okay, then the more casual, the better. You mean whoever hired him won't be expecting you to show up now? I mean, Lemuel isn't in My condition dear to report fellow, for a while. I do not care what the union says about chambermaids. I have an opinion, too, you know. Have you been a clerk for 12 years? Well, have you? Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Be just a moment. Oh, no, no, no. Finish the phone call. Now, listen. I don't care how many chambermaids you've known. Do you run a laundry service or a... or a... Oh, hold on, will you? I'm so sorry. Now, what was it... George you... Valentine. I've got a reservation. No, I won't call the manager. He doesn't live here. Uh, what was the name, sir? George Valentine. Oh, let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, he's in his room. He... What? At 350 towels, I told you. Not 340... Oh, for heaven's sake, hang on, will you? What's the matter? Well, I asked... Oh, yes, 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 it was George Valentine you asked for, wasn't it? Well, he just checked in a few moments ago. Yeah, he's in his room. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. It's room 419. It's elevated to the right. Um, but... Oh, thanks a lot, Buster. Come on, Angel. You see, my dear fellow, if the chambermaids don't count the towels... <laughs> But 
Who is it, George? If somebody took your oh, room... Oh, I don't know, Brooksy. Looks like they're still one step ahead of us, whoever they are. It's essential Emil couldn't have revived in time. Well, whoever the impersonator is in there, he doesn't seem to answer very fast. Come on. <gasps> yeah, sure. Of course he's dead. They shut that door. There's no gun. I don't shut see a gun. Shut the door, will you? Uh-huh. He's shot, all right. George, he's about your same bill. Huh? Around the same age. Yeah. Yeah. There's a briefcase over here under the bed. It's a sample case, isn't it? The kind salesmen carry? Neckties. Nothing but neckties. Look, George, there's a key on the floor next to it. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, to another room, 631. Hey, wait a minute. Here. Yeah. Card in his wallet. Sure, of course. Harold Stark, Sure Silk Tie Company from Salt Lake City. Necktie salesman. Well, he suppose he came in on the train tonight, George. Uh-huh, yeah, sure. Single guy looking generally my type. You mean suppose he got picked up by somebody watching the hotel here, somebody expecting me. So they kill him and put him in your Wait a minute, room? wait a minute. Let it ring. We ought to talk to the clerk, to the bellboys. Now, boys listen, whoever shot this guy did it and ran. Okay, then so will we. George, that's crazy. Is it? I was hired to find out who a big-time collection man is in this town, right? Only whoever it is got one jump ahead of us. I can't even start working until I get out from behind the eight ball, can I? Oh, George, that phone, it keeps ringing. Somebody's going to hear it. And... What are you doing? I'm putting my wallet, my own wallet, on the body. What do you think? No. You take this guy's. Go back to that drive-in on the edge of town. Run a fast telephone check on him. Harold Stark, Salt Lake City. The clerk knows we're here. He'll keep ringing. Wait like I grab the neckties. We'll dump him in the alley. Well, I'll be out from behind the eight ball if I'm dead, won't I? George. I'll be free to find out those guys who hired me. So come on, give the police a chance to find the body of George Valentine. Yes, come in, Mr. Uh, uh. Valentine, I told you. Your name is Nielsen, isn't it? You sent for me, didn't you? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, of course. Well, don't look like a ghost, like you're scared. What do you want with me? What's that? Why do you keep your hand in your pocket? Because I want a cigarette. Look. See? Oh. Now all I want is a little talk, Mr. Nielsen, with you and Mr. Vickery and Emmett Wall, the mayor. You know all of our names. Well, sure, of course. Here's the letter you wrote me. Oh, <laughs> hey, I'm beginning to get this. Have you just had a phone call or something? Yes, I have, as a matter of fact, from Vickery. He happened to be at police court. For once, they work fast in this town. A patrolman has reported the murder of George Valentine. <laughs> okay, sit down. I'll explain if you will. I have nothing to... Buster, I'll use your phone. Prove it to you. The police here in the city... I know you've never seen my face, but they can identify my voice for you. Here, let me have it. Oh, no. Hello? George? Oh, yeah. What'd you find out, Brooksy? I found out that you're crazy. Absolutely crazy. What? Darling, I tried to contact those people in Salt Lake, but I can't. I mean, I got the company all right, but nothing about Harold Starr. Why not? They've never even heard of him. Nobody by that name has ever sold neckties. Don't you see what you've done? Throw away that wallet, George. The man who was killed was a phony. You can't be somebody that doesn't exist. All right. I believe you. I agree you're Valentine. Then you realize how fast I gotta work, Nielsen. I told you what Miss Brooks said. The body was a plant of some kind. This thing gets deeper every minute. And you haven't even started your investigation. Whoever the man is I'm after is calling the shots in advance. And you claimed only three of you knew about me. Yes, yes, I understand. You think it's one of us. But I'm afraid it doesn't make much difference if I do help you now. What do you mean by that? Well, Mr. Valentine, I'm not a cowardly man. But I'll admit, when you knocked on the door... Yeah, sure, you were scared to death. What's that got to do with... Valentine... I don't think you realize yet just how far behind that eight ball you are. That same patrolman who found the body also saw a man and woman throw away a briefcase in an alley. Huh? You and Miss Brooks, there was identification with the neckties. At the door just now, I thought you were the man every policeman in town is looking for. Harold Stark. He doesn't exist, you say? (laughs) His description is yours. And you know who you are? Never mind, never mind. I get it. I dug my own grave, didn't I? Yeah. I killed George Valentine. Well, 
this should prove something, but nothing's impossible. Who else do you know can bump themselves off and live to tell you how it felt? I think George is wasting his talents in Summer Springs. This boy should be in Washington. They could use him, just like you should hear this. I don't know if you've been able to follow this little story up to now, so in case you haven't, don't let what I have to say confuse you, because it will. It seems that a group calling themselves the Syndicate figures the politicians in the town of Summer Springs as fall guys for their nefarious deeds. Now, the mayor of said hamlet does not look kindly on this plot, as he figures that he's committed enough crimes already to go around. So what does he do? He writes George Valentine. And what does he do? He bumps himself off, which is getting out of it the easy way, which the mayor does not like and tells himself. Well, Valentine, for once it seems the police wasted no time discovering a mistake, that George Valentine was not killed. Well, that's nice to know. You mean they re-identified that body I found? Clarence Prell, up-and-coming accountant. His name's been mixed up in this thing already. He's been making a tremendous amount of money the past few years. It's just possible... Our big shot is already dead. Well, why would this man, this accountant, have the identification of Harold Stark on him? Who killed him? Who put it there? Who put him there in my hotel room? Now, listen to me, Valentine. You can get to work now. You're off the hook. They know it's not your body. Now, look, I've been in trouble because it wasn't kept secret that you three were hiring me. Is that right? Oh, there you go again. We're honest. Stupid? Yes, but honest. None of us are mixed up in any rackets. Okay, okay, skip it. But even if the big shot isn't one of you... You're now in the way, aren't you? What? Well, maybe I'm wanted by the police, but if the killer with strong boys knows about me, he also then knows about you. Yeah. Lock your doors tonight. Shh. Turn out those lights. Huh? That car just stopped out there. I could see the lights blinking. <laughs> Take it easy, Nielsen. It's only Miss Brooks. I'll see you later. George, sometimes I think you're the eight ball. Angel, the heat's on the big shot, whoever he is, a lot more than it's on me. Come on, we're going in here. Where, the drugstore? Yeah. Got a nickel in your purse? Yeah. Why don't you go straight to the mayor himself? Brooksy, I need a little more time to work alone. You're going to give it to me. What? The mayor's got his own ideas. I've got mine. But if, if I don't work fast, a lot of people are liable to get hurt. This... Hello, operator. I want a policeman. This Mr. Rex will do anything to cover his tracks before a full investigation... George, what on earth are you doing? Hey, police, look. I just heard that thing on the radio. I, I mean that description of that guy and that girl, that, that Harold Stark with the girl who was dressed... Well, slow down. How can I? I just seen her, the girl, having a soda and... Hey, what's the name here? Oh, yeah. Kleshima's Drugstore. She's wearing you a... rat. A uh, brown coat. Hey, you better down. come and get it quick. George Valentine, of At all the dirty tricks... At least you won't get hurt, Angel. Tell him to look for me any place but the Summer Springs Hotel, room 631. Now, you play eight ball for a while. Six thirty one. Chief, it's all right. Ouch. Where are the lights in this plane? Oh no. How long have you been dead, Baldy? Just about as long as the other guy, I guess, huh? Only what's your name? You the real Harold Stark? Are you the... Hey! Shut up. People in the next room. Hey. Lemuel. Yeah. It's a lousy hotel to let anybody in. I thought I knocked you out of the picture before once. We're even. I didn't hit you hard enough either. Yeah, you're out of condition, Buster. That's bad. You kill that guy? 
I was with you and another Tom. Don't talk so loud. All right, all right. Hey, wait a minute. What are you trying to... Hey, get out of my pocket. What's the idea? There's a gun in your stomach. Don't argue. Well, why put a gun in my pocket, too? It's empty. Don't get your hopes up. Be quiet. Another wallet, too. If you think you can frame me for killing this guy, whoever he is, you're crazy. I'm not. Cops don't kill cops. What? Can't you tell Flat Feet when you see him his name's Harold Stark? An eye that got shot. Like you're gonna be. Oh, so that's it. Yeah, sure, there is a Stark, a detective. Came to town acting like a necktie salesman, huh? Ouch. Just let me get in that chair, would you? Sure. You're fixed. You got everything. Wait a minute. Two guns. Two guns I got in my pocket. That's a lot. There's two men dead, aren't there? You're a bright boy, a real up-and-coming eye. Dead eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. The real Stark dead in this room. That accountant named Prell dead in my room. So come on, bright boy, get on your feet. Yeah, sure. Whoa. Look out. Get away from that phone. Hello, anybody. Now oh, shut up, like I said. Hey, what's going on there? Can people have no privacy? You're listening. That's what you're doing. Oh, for the love of it. Walk, will you? Go on the door. All right, all right. Plenty of standing room. Don't shove. Well, what are you listening to? You think you hear something or something? Of all the mirrors. Now out the door. Okay, okay. Just thought you might not want the guy who's coming down the hall to see you. What? Oh, it's only the desk clerk. Get back in there. What's going on here? What in the hell is that? What do you think you're doing? Come on, get out of the way, fast. Let go of me, really. Down here, will you? Okay, he's not going to shoot. Shoot? What kind of a disturbance is this? This is not the sort of hotel you get... Wait a minute. I've seen you before. Yeah, you're the guy who gave out my description. What? No, no, I didn't give any description. Oh, you're the laundry man. Oh, no, no, that's what I was talking about. I remember you're the... Oh, well, see here, there was a mix-up Come on, on skip it. Just show me the fastest way out. Don't, get that gun away from that me. That big man in there, was there anybody with him when he came into the hotel? What? Well, no, no. Yes, I, I mean, yes. Uh, uh, there are several men down the lobby. I, I don't know who they are. You're wanted by the police. That, that's all I know. The back stairs, then. Where are they? Come on. I won't help a criminal. Come on, don't argue, friend. Well, all right. Here, here. Here, duck in here. Uh, there, there are several policemen in the hotel, too. There, there are cars at the alley entrance. You're going to find me a way out, so stop shaking. I didn't kill anybody. The police don't think I did. Why not? Now, look, you. I'm just a guy behind the eight ball, see? There's a big crook in your town, Clarence Prell. You know him? Uh, no. An accountant. Man in a nice spot to take payoffs coming in from the city. But Prell is dead. So he's not the crook. What? Oh, for heaven's Find sake. Find me a way out of here or people will be wrong. They'll think he was the crook. They'll say he killed a detective named Harold Stark who was on his trail. Let them say what they want. I... They'll say I killed Prell, maybe in self-defense. But I was real smart and collected all the evidence, including the guns. Then poor Valentine. He was on his way to get himself out of trouble with the police when something happened to him. You're mad. You're worse than the laundry people. Now, look, Buster, I'm telling you all this so you'll help. It's a frame-up, see? To get rid of two private detectives and take the heat off by making Prell look like the big shot. A triple play. Here we are. Here. Give me a hand with the window. Ah. Okay. Only six stories up. I forgot my umbrella. I can't jump, Buster. No, 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 no. Look. Out there, you see? Ah. To the side. It's an old fire escape. It hasn't been used since we built the new wing. But it comes down in the service yard. This is the side street. Yeah. You, well, go on. How much help do you need? Oh, there's no one down there. Here, you see? Yeah. Yeah, sure, I see. Uh-huh. Little rusty, though, isn't it? Well, what do you expect? A red carpet? I expect you to go first. Lead the way. What? It just occurred to me it's not so bad being behind an eight ball. If you've got the cue in your hand. Mr. Valentine, for the love of... Remember the gun, Buster. Lead the way. Now, tell me. Why do you call me Valentine? Why not Prell or Stark? 
Or any of the other names thrown around tonight? Well, well, back there, Lemuel called you Valentine. How do you know his name? Well, I'm a hotel clerk. I, I see lots of people. And that switchover of rooms today. I don't see how anybody could have done it but the hotel clerk himself. Well, but what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> Human nature. How you and your boy Lemuel found out about my coming here. How I? An accountant sees lots of people, sure. But a hotel clerk sees a lot more. Now, who's in a better spot to receive payoff deliveries on the QT than the man behind the desk? I'm going back. You're going nowhere. Now, listen, Buster. It had to either be one of my three clients or you. What? Yeah, so take human nature again. It couldn't be one of them or why get me in it. But they did write the letter right after a Civic League luncheon. Uh, what do you mean, human nature? I mean how people mail letters in hotels. In a hotel, you just hand the letter to the clerk to mail, don't you? Get out of my way. Oh, no, you don't. I'm going back. What's the matter? Don't these rusty stairs go on down there? Do they just fall off in the dark someplace? That's you who's going to fall off in the dark. Not even afraid of the gun, are you? You already know it's not loaded. Just evidence to be found on the patsy. Look out. Don't. This is where you get racked up, eight ball. I don't think that was very nice of George. He gave Buster time to open everything but his parachute. While we're waiting for the desk clerk to make a three-point landing, here are a couple of good points for you. George, how did you get off that fire escape? It was rusty. You would have fallen through. That's why he led you out there. What he expected hey, you to do Hey, was... hey, hey, slow down, will you? How'd you get out of jail, Angel? Oh, George, please, I want to understand. Oh, he was a guy, all right, the hotel clerk. Yeah, he kept the job so nobody would ever guess, as well as because it was such a perfect spot for payoffs. He knew the heat was on when he heard I was coming, and Lemuel couldn't stop me. He had me all set for a double fancy frame. But that other detective... Well, the mayor said he wanted to handle things himself, didn't he? Did he know a man he wanted to hire? Harold Stark. Posing as a necktie salesman. Yeah, and that accountant had been working with a clerk on the rackets, so he figured he'd make him fall guy. Strictly from desperation, Angel. But it all might have worked. But you would have died accidentally, fallen and been killed, and that would have been the end of it. Mm -hmm. Only how on earth, after you knocked him out, how did you get him off the fire escape? <laughs> how did you get out of jail? Well, you saw him. That big, good-looking policeman. So what? You said you didn't tell him anything. No. Well? <laughs> he was very sweet. Well, he... I mean, after a while, there was no reason to hold me. In jail, I mean. Oh, why, Brooksy. And... Well, why should I tell you if you won't tell me? <laughs> Good night, Georgie. I'm telling you, George, you better watch your step with Brooksy. Didn't you ever hear the saying how when the cat's away, your secretary will play? Play what exactly, I don't know. But I do know that Robert Bailey plays George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and Eddie Dunstetter kept things organized at the organ. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Do 
Do you remember way back in the 30s how the blowhards went around with the spiel? A car in every garage, a chicken in every pot. Do you know why they didn't have more success? They left something out. A valentine in every closet. Think of all the trouble he'd have saved you. Like the time Junior ran Rover through the lawnmower, as he figured he'd look better in a crew cut. Now, don't take it out on the little rascal just because he has aspirations to be a barber. Let George do it. He'll give it to him once over light, like he never got. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun to George Valentine. He gets all kinds of mail. Take the letter he's about to get from this old tumbleweed character. Mr. Valentine, sir. Uh, I'm a cowboy movie star. I'm sure you must have seen me sometime, even if it's only on television. Well, anyway, I, I know how silly it sounds, but uh, I need help. There's the most desperate situation that requires the action of a hero. And while I'd like to qualify, this same situation requires certain proficiency that I haven't got. Notably, there's a mystery. Mysteries aren't my longest suit. Uh, you see, I met her. Uh, her, I mean, but just barely. And Mr. Valentine, this lovely young lady I refer to, she's in distress. She is. But, Mr. Disbro, in your letter you didn't tell Daphne, us... Daphne. That's who she is. Oh, Daphne. Daphne. Yeah. I met her just the other day, you realize. I was talking to a man I know, a song plugger. That's like a fuller brush man, only with music, you uh -huh. see. Uh, he pointed her out. The little school teacher type that's always having westerns, you know, big bashful blue eyes and hair like honey and a heart just as big as all out of doors, you with know. With a head to match. <laughs> I know. Uh, who cares if she's smart? I don't. Uh, Anyway, I find this little girl lives all alone, way up in the Imperial Crest Apartments. Uh-oh, I take it back. <laughs> Daphne does all right, doesn't she? Oh, uh, she has money, but she's nervous, if you know what I mean. So nervous, she'll hardly talk. And afraid, oh, yeah, I, I think somebody's watching her up there. Well, I'm not surprised. A big bad wolf, maybe. Well, me? No, no, this is different, no. It is. She didn't even want to meet me, and most women do. Oh, now, look, cowboy. Yeah, and today when I tried to talk to her on the street, even after I'd been properly introduced, she just up, walked away. So am I. Now, wait, no, wait a minute, Mr. Valentine. She wanted to talk, and she would have, if the man she walked away with hadn't been carrying a gun. Oh. So maybe it is a case, huh? What man? Big. Bigger than both of us. Black hair and sour face. Her husband, maybe. Oh, well, she told me she wasn't married. I don't know who he is, but she's afraid of him, all right. Uh-huh. And what do you want me to do, scare him away? No, figure it out, Mr. Valentine. Go meet her. And protect her before something worse happens. And then let me know before it does. Oh, I see. That's it. I do the dirty work, hand you the answers, and then you step in to scare away the rustlers. And win the girl, of course. Well, that's right, honey. And having to keep my public name intact, uh, my fans and all, you know, I... I'm a beautiful patsy. Okay, partner. But don't think you've got a corner on the market. Well, you better get out your earplugs, kiddies, because me thinks there's going to be plenty of shooting in this here Opry. Oh, but don't put them in for just a minute, because first I want you to hear this. You know something? That did this old heart good. Now let's see if George is doing any good for Daphne. Uh-oh. Hey, George. Someone is trying real hard to bump you off. Hey, George. Duck! <laughs> Hey, what the... <laughs> I put your cigarette out, didn't I? Well... One shot at 30 feet, that's pretty good. Oh, but I missed the sandbag again. Look at them holes in my wall. Hey, lady, you got holes in your head. Oh, now, what? don't be angry. I'm practicing here on my roof garden. Uh, see that clay pipe down there? <laughs> I never oh. miss. Oh, fine. You must make a big hit with lots of people. Well, my landlord and neighbors do complain once in a while. See the other pipe? Hey, you. But I talk them out of it. Well, now, look, I don't talk so easy. Don't you? No, he doesn't. 
Not when you're around, you mean. Oh, no, you right, bet. Annie Oakley. So you're nice to look at. Daphne. Daphne Crockett. Girl type Davy. Crockett? Oh, of course. The club Paris. Mm-hmm. I've been there five years. Longest run of any act in nightclubs. Everybody likes my shooting. <laughs> oh, so that's it. Little Red Riding Hood turns out to be Two-Gun Nelly, professional bullseye artist. Mr. Valentine, where are you going? To see the bull about some black eyes. He... No, no, wait a minute. I'm here now. I might as well speak my piece, even if it's only for laughs. Speak your piece? Like Miles Standish? In a way. Only John Alden's name this time is Rafe Disbro. Oh, him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's funny, all right. He thinks you're in danger. The cowboy says you're being watched up here. He says what? Well, there's the building next door. I guess from that one apartment over there, you could oh, probably... Oh, no. No, of course not. All right, lady. But the rest of my recitation says you're afraid of a big man, black hair, sour face. How about that one? Mr. Disbro has quite an imagination, hasn't he? Maybe. And maybe not. I suppose he sent you over here to protect me. That was a general idea. And think twice before you say no. I'll show you what I think of Mr. Disbro in spite of that lovely Texas accent. You see those three little dolls in a row? Lady, I said think twice. And there are three bullets left in this gun. Oh, now look, if you are in trouble, Daphne... Three answers you can take back. Okay, lady, never mind. We get the idea. This is where we came in, Angel. Hey, that was four. Miss Crockett, Daphne! No, I'm all right. Oh, God. It missed me. What missed you? Where'd that extra shot come from? No. No, there wasn't one. I... Get out of here, won't you? Please leave me alone. Please leave me alone. Don't waste your breath, lady. We've already gone. George, shall I telephone Lieutenant Riley? No, he's on vacation. Oh. Ask for Clary and tell him to get up there fast. Yeah, but you I got a date next door, Angel. See you in the second reel. There's a card outside this apartment that says R. Siever. You him? I don't know. You? Now, look, Bright Eyes, I What's want you to look. A guy comes busting in, upsets my equilibrium. I'm teaching myself to nasty. Now, go away. All right, don't mind me. I won't tell if you cheat. Your manners get worse. The door's back that way. Remember? Yeah, just call me a building inspector. Come to take a look at your window, that's all. Don't fall out. Yeah. Yeah, this is it, all right. The only apartment from which you can see the roof garden. You don't say. The only apartment from which you could take a pot shot at a woman across the way there. Sit down. Maybe we could both learn canasta. You always wear a hat when you play cards? Sure. What woman? What's it cover up? Black hair to match your sour face? I said what? We don't like each other much, do we? Daphne Crockett. I was there when it happened. Now we like each other less, huh? I don't know. Friendship begins slow sometimes. Sit down, will you? I'll deal out a few. What do you use for chips? The bag there? Huh? The black bag there by your foot. The one you're trying to keep me from seeing. A real observant boy, aren't you? Oh, wait a minute. I can see a hand when it starts to move, so stop moving it. I'm dealing this, Inspector. Oh, no, you're not. you <laughs> Too bad nobody can argue with a blackjack, Inspector. We might have had a nice little game. Shall I tell you what hit you, Valentine? No. But don't tell me that's Lieutenant Clary's voice, not at last. At last. Valentine, if you'd wait for the police once in a while, or better yet, if you wouldn't get mixed up in cases like this... All right, all right. You sound just like Riley. My headache's bad enough. Uh, His name was Curly. Curly Blackson, the strong boy, wanted for ducking out of prison back east. What was he in for? He was serving time for shakedowns. He was a blackmail artist. Blackmail? Hey, is there a little black bag still around here anyway? Never mind, of course not. No, there isn't, George. And this Curly may have been the man Rafe saw once with Daphne, but I don't think he took the shot at her across the way. He didn't talk like he did. Not to mention the small fact he had a gun, but it was still loaded and hadn't been fired for some time. He had a... So you know an awful lot, don't you, Lieutenant? Come on, wake up. Open your baby blue eyes wide. Huh? Oh, I get it. Curly's dead, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, I... 
I know I didn't do it. No, no, no. You just slept through it, that's all. First you get mixed up in it, but then when you might be useful, you take a rain check while Curly takes a bullet. Bullet? One shot, clean as a whistle, right through the heart, from a short distance. Yeah. And he was armed. Somebody outdrew him or surprised him. And a marksman, too, huh? Or a markswoman. Yeah, where is she? Where is she? Where do you think she is? Gone, of course. And why we look for her? There was all the time in the world for this to happen. All the hey, time for the... Listen, take it easy. Hey, somebody's coming. Yeah. And remember, Lieutenant, the girl didn't shoot at herself out there on the roof. And if Curly had... Shh, wait a minute. Keys. Sure. Sure, it's the guy who lives here. I'll see. You want to bet? All right, friend, that's enough music. You can notice us now. Grab him. Hey, now. That's it. Okay, put down that stick, Buster. That's better. Well, well, surprise, that's all. You can let me go. I'm all right. You're all right. Sure. You're breaking my heart. Never leave a tune unfinished. <laughs> Had to finish it, that's all. Say, didn't expect a room full of roses. Sit down. Roses are in seventh place this week, you know that? My name's Clary. Homicide. All right. Sit down. Sit. Listen, my friend. Hold on, Lieutenant. Just a minute. Roses are number seven, huh? How's Jealous Heart? A little raise on records. Down in sheet sales, though. <laughs> oh, but you ought to hear the blues number I've song got. Song plugger, huh? Maybe even the same song plugger who once introduced a cowboy to a girl. Maybe. I don't know. Play piano down at the Club Paris, too. The Club pa- Oh. All begins to tie together, doesn't it? My friend, we're going to pull up our chairs for a nice long talk. <laughs> Be careful, don't stub your toe. What? Chairs are all nailed down. Keeps the maids from moving them around. <laughs> Keeps them in. Look, Looney, Daphne Crockett was being watched from here, and I doubt if Curly did it. She was shot at from here, but he didn't do it. Did it, do it, did it. My name's Seaver, Lieutenant, not Looney. Seaver. Dick Seaver. Dead Eye Dick, they call me. Dead Eye? And Curly was murdered by a dead. Well, brother, if you're crazy enough to wait admit minute, it. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. Wait a minute. Chairs nailed down, that stick you carry. You haven't even noticed the body yet. You haven't been watching Daphne, have you, Dead Eye? Of course not. I couldn't. I'm blind. <laughs> George, if I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times. Don't jump at conclusions. You tell me how a poor old blind guy goes around filling people full of lead. It just can't happen. Unless maybe he uses seeing eye bullets. Hey, you know, that's all right. And for that matter, so is this. Say, before the shooting starts again, I think we should pause briefly for story identification, don't you? It seems that a self-styled cowboy named Rafe Disborough, who got himself fired from monogram because he could only ride side saddle, hired Valentine to keep his beady brown eye on a doll named Daphne. He figures that only one eye will be necessary, as he will have to keep the other one peeled for a guy named Curly, a black-haired character who is very repulsive. On further investigation, Daphne turns out to be an up-to-date Annie Oakley, who's been knocking him dead at the Club Paris with her fur-lined six-shooter. However, some patron who doesn't like the cover charge takes it out on Daphne and starts shooting back. Only he misses and plugs Curly. Meantime, George has been sleeping it off in Dead Eye Dick's apartment, a song plugger around town, as he has become very drowsy from a hit on the head. George immediately points the finger at Dead Eye. Only Dead Eye is blind and can't point back. Still, George figures that if he can plug songs, he can also plug people. However, this sets well with nobody, so he goes back to see Rafe Disborough, who was no help either, because all he can say is, Gosh, Mr. Valentine, it's all I can say is, gosh. Well, you should try harder, Mr. Disborough. Usually there's just the good men, the bad men. And the little school teacher in between, I know. Well, this isn't the plot of a western. But why you really wanted us to meet Daphne, you didn't say. So suppose you start saying, Buster, right now. What? 
But uh, I told you she was in distress. Are you being blackmailed, cowboy? Uh Uh-huh. That was Curly's business, you know. And I saw a little black bag once. Blackmailed, I said. No. No, no, not me. Not you. Well, I'm always cautious about those things, but... Well, Daphne, she has another suitor besides me is Mr. Michael J. Martin. Martin? Yeah, one of those millionaire fellows. This is strictly confidential, you understand. And you figure Martin's a better sucker than you are, huh? Oh, well, he he is a married man. You know, I, I've never taken that step. Uh-huh. And you really hired us to look into Daphne because you were afraid she was going to knock you over, too. Oh, no, no, Mr. Valentine. You totally misrepresent me. No, I mean nothing of the kind... The little lady is always innocent. Okay, Disbro. When you decide to tell me the truth, let me know, will you? I am. I'm just a bystander who... Or better yet, let the police know. This is still a murder case, Rafe. And they tell me cowboys are pretty good shots. What? Oh, I'm just a singing cowboy. That's the last straw. No, I'm not proficient, except with a guitar. I don't shoot guns. Well, my fans wouldn't like it. Well, listen, I'll show you. Come on, Angel. Let's get out of here. Here we are, George. Dressing room number four, three, two. Sure, sure. She's number one with a star on the door. Mm. Hey, just a moment, please. I'm very sorry, but no one's allowed inside. Well, I'm sorry too, Shorty, but we want to see... Miss Crockett isn't receiving any callers this evening. She hopes you understand. Well, now, that's real thoughtful of her. Just step to one side. You needn't you? raise your voice, but if I haven't made myself clear... Oh, George, just pick him up and throw And him. I really don't feel like arguing Shorty, about it. Shorty, get out of the... Well, hello, Mr. Valentine. Goodbye. Oh, no, you don't. Stand still, sister. Well, I've really got nothing to say. Come along, Mike. Hey, get out of my way, Shorty. Wait a minute, you. Please don't be difficult, Mr. Valentine. Mac, Fred, Joe. Slow down, I said. Would you... Hey, quit. Oh, let George. Go. Let go. Bye-bye, Mr. Valentine. Hey, would you... All right, Mac, Fred, Joe. She's gone. You can let go. Sure, don't get sore. Let me brush your coat. The boys, huh? Stage hands, that's all. Don't want to see you getting in trouble. Buster, I'm not the one who's going to be in trouble. Oh, yes, you are. Little guy's important, tough, too. The what? Little guy with it went with her, the Michael J. Martin. Martin? You mean that little shrimp was Martin? Lucky we saved you, huh? Lion hunter, you know. Toughest little guy in the world. Best marksman, too. No, Miss Crockett isn't here. Of course she's not here. Don't expect her to show up. I even had one of our own men, Taylor, and Martin shook him off, too. All right, all right, so she's not here. You said that, Lieutenant. Little schoolteacher type, caught in the middle. <laughs> Martin's not much to look at, only five feet tall. Two million bucks you could look at. Mm, maybe blackmail does make sense. I told you that a long time ago. But nothing else means sense. Why did Curly come out here? Why did he get killed? Oh, stop asking questions. All right, you want an answer? Curly was Daphne's husband. What? It's in the record. They used to be married. Sure. And now she was afraid of him. Sure. Does it tie together a cowboy, land hunter, Annie Oakley? To tell which one of those marksmen put a bullet through a man's heart with one shot? Let's not leave out Seaver. All right, so he's tied in. He's a friend of Curly's, too. But let me tell you something. When we were at the Club Paris, who was playing the piano? Huh? Well, it was... Oh, George, it wasn't Dixie. Uh Uh-huh. See what I mean? He's missing, too. And you know, Lieutenant... A blind guy who's a heel could get into trouble easily. Now his heart's beating. Now he's just unconscious, I think. Come on, Seaver. Come on, snap out of it now. Huh? His door is still open. Somebody must have slugged him when he was running out before he could get away. Oh, Daddy beat me. My head. Oh, he's okay. Take a look inside. That's what I'm doing. Quite a mess. It's been ransacked. All the drawers, only things still in place are the first... <gasps> Michael J. Martin. Dead. Would you look at that? Another one-shot victim. Sharp shooting. Even about the same distance. Yeah. Got Martin a little higher up, though. Hmm? Yeah, look here. Hit him right in the neck. So what? He's as dead as Curly, isn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just... What is it, George? The window. Lights just went on there, opposite. What? Yeah, yeah, so they did. The roof garden. Our little Nell has finally come back home, huh? And, Lieutenant, if you work a process of elimination... Come on, let's get over there. I'll stay here. But, George... Go on, go on. I'll take care of Seaver here. Yes, now, I'll take you five minutes to make it from building to building anyway. All right, we'll keep our eyes open, but you watch from here. Don't worry, I've been wrong before. I'm not going to be wrong this time. Get going. Oh, Daddy, what a head. 
What's happening? What's happening, Mr. Valentine? Yeah. Come in, I'll give you a hand. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's my chair. Uh, the poker table. Okay, careful now. Uh, there she is. Whew. Sit down yourself, Valentine. It's good for the rocks in your head. From the chair opposite me, the wing chair there, you can see out the window. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Already there, aren't you? I can tell by your voice. What you doing now? Nothing. Taking off a coat. Take off your coat. Take off your hat. <laughs> Cigarette? Got some right here on the table. No, thanks. Go on into the kitchen now. I bet you can't cook. You've never seen her, huh? Nope. Blind since I was 21. Lost him in a stick-up I got messed up in. Stick-up? Nice guy. Oh, I've been around. But I'm straight now. She's back on the roof now. Why do you say you're straight, Siva, when you were all mixed up with Curly? <laughs> I didn't know he'd taken a hop from prison. He was up here all the time watching his wife, wasn't he? Sure. It's a cinch I wasn't. You were in on the blackmail with Curly, too, weren't you? Somebody must have tipped him off that there was a good touch going, that Martin here was a pushover. <laughs> all right, so what? What have I got to lose? Conspiracy to blackmail, but everybody's dead. You're right, we can't prove it. I've been around. You're not <laughs> What's that? Oh, she's just practicing, that's all. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Everybody's a marksman. You know, poor Martin there has a gun in his pocket, too, but he was outdrawn, just like Curly. That cowboy can shoot, too, Mr. Valentine. I don't believe that stuff he says to you. No, no, I'm not talking about murder anyway. I was thinking about when Daphne over there was practicing early and somebody took a pot shot and missed. Well, what about it? Well, that couldn't have been a marksman, could it? So it must have been somebody who just stuck a gun out the window and shot to attract attention. <laughs> You've been around, too, haven't you? You knew somebody'd come running over like I did and find Curly and lock him up. He was a fugitive. Good way to get rid of a partner, a Seaver. Well, she's going to work on the clay pigeons now. Good shot. Never mind her. Then what happened? Well, it didn't work, obviously. Curly knocked me out instead, so when you ducked back into the room to pick up the dough in the black bag, you found Curly alive and plenty suspicious. So you had to kill him, I guess. Oh, is that it? Now, how could a blind man do that? Then maybe later Michael J. Martin figured out who'd been in on the blackmail and came up for a little talk. So you had to kill him. <laughs> well, I guess you can't be blamed. Lots of people think I'm not really blind, but I am, see? Look. Look at the match in front of my eye. Never mind, skip it. <laughs> it's because you are blind that I know you killed both of them. Who else but a blind man would shoot two men at the same height? A big man in the heart and a five-footer like Martin in the neck. You're crazy, Mr. Valentine. I'm blind. I don't even know where people are. You can tell by the sound of a voice, can't you? What? But not close enough to... Tell what chair they're sitting in? The chair that's always in the same place because it's nailed down... Well, come on now. Tell me the rest, Buster. What happens? Yeah. <laughs> You'd like to know how it works, wouldn't you? You'd like to know which chair. Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'll show you. It's the chair you're sitting in. Ain't I an old meanie, though? You know, a situation like this could set Cliff hanging back ten years, which might be a good idea. For that matter, so is this. Now let's see how the little game of Blind Man's Bluff is turning out. It can't be good for George. Because old Deadeye is getting his jollies over something. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? The blind man can fool them all. A little heavy on the downbeat, maybe. <laughs> eh, won't look like a marksman this time. Ah, but the coroner won't care. I'll just move him out of the chair and... Valentine. Valentine, where are you? Where are you? Just where <laughs> I was, Siva. Huh? Standing by the side of this chair. Oh, 
Oh, thank you, Mr. Valentine. I can't tell you how grateful I am for apprehending that barman. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. He was a little twisted, I guess. George, we've got to be going. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. I asked you out here to explain about her. Oh, boy, she's really nice. She was afraid of her husband, she was, afraid of what he might be up to. And, and she wasn't really mixed up uh, much with that rich man, Mr. Martin. Oh, we know, Rafe, you told us. She's a schoolteacher type. I hope you'll be very happy. Oh, I'm sure we will, Mr. Valentine. <sighs> well, this is the last reel, Angel. So look out for the cactus while we <laughs> mount up and ride off into the sunset, leaving the little ranch house behind. Huh? Well, George... Uh... At this point, doesn't the hero usually kiss the girl? Oh, no, ma'am. Huh? He always kisses the horse. Oh. Uh. You know, after a crack like that, I'm not going to even try and defend that boy anymore. I'm just going to say that Robert Bailey played George Valentine with the story by David Victor and Jackson Gillis. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, you all set for another visit with Valentine? You know George. He's the boy whose motto in life is let George do it. Nothing too small, nothing too big. Better still, nothing too dangerous. He runs an ad in the personal column, but some of his clients are sent by friends. That is, if you can call Lieutenant Riley a friend. Dear Mr. Valentine... I am without doubt the ugliest man in the world. Hey, wait a minute. Who is this? However, I need your help or the man standing beside me will go crazy. Because, Mr. Valentine, I... Riley, it's you, him. isn't it? Lieutenant Riley. Yes, yes, it's me, and I'm the one going crazy. All right, have it your own way. Only, what are you talking about? Valentine, I've got a client for you. A little ugly stumble bum wants your help. A slot machine repair man, no less. He needs help, or at least he won't help me unless somebody helps him. Only he won't trust the police. I don't blame him. You make so much sense. Uh, Okay, then. Let's say I need your help. Sure, this little guy isn't much, but the idea is... Riley, hold it, will you? You said this guy's dying? Yeah. Police hospital. The doctor gives him a day or two at the best. Can't operate, can't stop the infection. From what, Lieutenant? Oh, gunshot wounds, Miss Brooks. One gun, but all six shells. Happened in a dark alley. Whoever it was didn't want to miss him, I guess. That little man must be tough. Maybe. Or lucky or unlucky. He's one of those guys who's born to end up at the bottom of the pile, Valentine. Then why are you so interested in him? It's just possible that he can steer us all the way to the top of the pile. His name's Trailer. I told you he was the littlest shrimp in the slot machine racket. The repair man. Well, we've never found out who the big shrimp is. Uh, I see. I worm my way into the man's confidence, and then maybe he spills. Is that it? Blows the whole racket apart. No, no, no. You just help the little guy find his girl. Betty. Betty, that's her name. I was going to see her tonight. 
Betty who, Charlie? What's the rest of her name? She's beautiful. I'm not, but she is. I'm just her bill, she said. But you don't believe it either, do you? Trailer, can you understand me? There's nobody in the world to believe. You gotta be careful. You can't trust people. You gotta test them and test them and test them. And then, then you can't trust them because they're all the same. What are you talking about, friend? The racket? I won't tell you anything. I won't. Why should I? All right, all right. Take it easy. I, Who shot you? Ants. You can test people to see if they're ants, you know. Put honey in front of them. See if they choke themselves. Why did you ask me? Betty. Hey, Trailer. Fine, Betty. Hey, look, Trailer. Uh, 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 Nurse? Betty. Uh, uh, Guess you can have him back for a while. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Riley, I'm willing to bet he doesn't know anything that'll ever help you pry open the big time. Is that so? Well, just let me show you. Look in here. Oh, you mean the tall, skinny man over there? Yeah. Yeah, Wilson, the highest price legal beagle in the state. Waiting to see if anybody off stage needs defending, huh? Yeah, that's it. The watchdog. Ever alert. Just in case the police have a squealer who might stop worrying about the girlfriend and climb out of his delirium long enough to sing. Sing? What's this? What's all this, Lieutenant? Somebody singing? That's right, Mr. Wilton. Trailer in there tells me you own all the slot machines in this state. <laughs> yes, of course. It's just a sideline, though, rather a bother, particularly when I don't live in this town. Here on business, Mr. Wilton? I beg your pardon. Uh, Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks. Oh. How do you do? Charmed. No, I've, uh, I've been retained by a client, Mr. Valentine. Oh, who's that? The Black Company. Mm. Riley here knows about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Out of town corporation. Manufactures Will of the Wisps. Well, I'm only a lawyer. I'm not familiar. Oh, the Black Company's quite an outfit, Valentine. Perfectly legal. Only nobody knows who runs it. But do they own the slot machines? Oh, of course not. No do more they I know do. who they make bank deposits for? Does this bird trailer even know who he works for? Does anybody? The basis of all good organization, Lieutenant, is the pyramid. Like a spy system, huh? No one man knows enough to incriminate any of the others. Then why are you here, Mr. Welton? Why are you worried about this trailer person? <laughs> I haven't really said I even know the man, have I? <laughs> Or that the company I represent is interested in anything more than employees' indemnity, his uh, accident and so on? <laughs> Spoken like a lawyer. Riley, maybe it is possible that the best of pyramids get a little wobbly once in a while. Huh? Maybe it is possible that the reason Trailer in there got shot was that he found out too much about the higher-ups. Yeah, hold it, hold, hold it. Wait. Yeah, hello, Lieutenant Riley. Oh, I, I... I wanted to speak to the nurse about Bill Trailer. Well... All right, who's calling? Well, I... Just the nurse, please. The nurse on duty there. Well, just a second. Valentine. Valentine, it's a girl. Now, take it, will you? You're the intern on duty, or anybody, anybody. What's this? Misrepresentation, Lieutenant? Here, let me have it. Hello? Nurse? Well, she'll be here in a second, honey. I'm the receptionist. Well, I just wanted to find out about a patient. His name is Trailer. Uh, trailer? Well, uh, wait till I get my cards here. Trailer. Hurry up, please. Somebody said he was there, but I, I want to know what happened to him. Well, we had an appendix case come in this morning. Oh, just tell me what happened to him. Just... What? You don't handle cases like that in the police ward. Well, I meant in the other ward. I... Hmm. She hung up. It's all right. We got the number. 
call came from a phone in a bar at 1612 Commercial Lane. The old Durfee Hill section, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's quite a district. A 50-cent flop house or a $5,000 penthouse. It's what the harness boys call the Ant Hill, Valentine. The Ant Hill? Huh? Mm-hmm. Let's go, Brooksy. A million people a day use that phone, my friend. Every third one tries to slug. But, bartender, all we wanted to Besides, know was... Besides, if you whistle the dame, where's it get you? Maybe your boyfriend's a prize fighter. Me, I'll take television any day. The girl used the phone only a few minutes ago. Who was she? Should I know? Should I watch the cash register and be a bulldog for the phone company at the same time? All right, all right. You don't know. Or maybe you don't want to know. I suppose you never heard of a guy named Trailer around here, either. Trailer? No, not until the fight last night. What fight? Uh, him and Louie. Who'd you think? Nice guy, that trailer, I guess. But he'll never amount to much, mixing it up with a guy hey, like slow Louis. down, will you? Slow down. Who's Louie? And what was this fight about? About a dame, natural, classy blonde, lives up the street, named Betty. Fight ended quick. We threw them both out. Betty! Sure. See what I mean about whistling a dame? You mean this guy, Louie's tough? Go on, go on. More about Louie. Not a price letter, no, but a real sharp boy. Just the same. Working his way up for a good outfit. Makes collections for the black company. That slot machine's to you. Oh, fellow employee, huh? Only Louie's higher up in the pile. He makes collections from guys like you. From me? You, you're you crazy. Sure. Sure, what's the rest of his name? Louie what? Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Good day, friend. Brooksy, this is where your job begins. <laughs> I said I'm sorry, sister. Wrong place. No Betty here. Now beat it, will you? Hi, lady. Find your party? Well, no. This gentleman Look, what is I... this? The Census Bureau? Box of flowers, Max. Sign here. What? Oh, look. All of you go someplace. I huh? haven't got all day. Sign here and don't keep the pencil. All right. All right. Yeah, not clear off. A dime. Uh, people send you flowers? Come on in. I don't know where Betty is. What do you want? Oh, just to see her. Betty sings down at the nightclub, I found out. She mentioned to me once about a job, and I thought maybe dancing or selling cigarettes oh, might... Oh, great unemployed, huh? Look, you gotta be a jerk not to get along in this world, sister. What's the matter? No angles? Oh, I'm just new in town. Gee, that's a pretty box, isn't it? You gonna open them? How do you like that? Dated yesterday. Now, there's a florist who's gonna fall right out of business. Betty gets them like that all the time, sister. She knows her way around. Nothing better than the best. Gee, I met Betty's boyfriend, too, once. Trailer or something. <laughs> That's what he told you? Boyfriend? <laughs> There's a laugh. <laughs> well, sure he wasn't dressed so good. But oh, he... hopeful, Harry. She can do better than him any day. I didn't know. You mean you're the one she... Say, roses. Look, I'm Betty's brother. My name is Louie. Oh, now, where did you say you met Betty? <laughs> Gee, has a girl got to relieve all of her privacy? We was only in the beauty shop. I was seeing about a tent. Well, don't look at me that way. She spoke to me because I complimented her on a corsage she said her boyfriend gave her. Boyfriend? <laughs> look at that, sister. Those aren't just roses. A wristwatch wrapped around them, you see? Holy smoke. I'm an admirer, see? Guy she hasn't even met. Told you she was good looking. You ought to hear what they say about her singing. Well, go on places, her and me. <laughs> You don't have to hate my wrist about it. Uh, so go be unemployed. Beat it, will you? Dear Betty, I look forward to meeting what? you. What's that? I'm on the level, and I don't mean just opposite your eyes when I say I'm not a masher, and won't you please, please telephone me at Durfee Hill. Hey, give me that. Hey, let go. It's just a card with the roses, that's all. Come on, get out of here. Gosh, I'm not going to try to beat Betty's time or anything. I'll say you're not. I never... Heard that name anyway, Mr. Black or... Black! Valentine, of course, of course she's all right. You talked to her yourself, did you? Sure, Brooksy read me the note she'd seen on the flowers, but why... We had a man watching him. After Miss Brooks left that place, a slewy fella took off in the opposite direction like a flying duck. But my man lost him. Now, now, will you please clear up what you've been doing? That Durfee Hill number in the flower note. It's a new number, Riley. Private listing and installed only a couple of days ago from somebody from out of town who just rented this place. What place? The fanciest penthouse in the whole section. Hey, Riley, people really look like ants from up here. 
You mean... Sure, sure, I'm in the place. There was a loose hinge on the service door and nobody inside. You've got the loose hinge, my friend. Don't you realize it was a Mr. Black who sent those flowers? Oh, Riley, add two and two, will you? Nobody knows who owns the slot machines, who runs the Black Company. And yet a mysterious Mr. Black shows up in town, a man nobody's seen, not even the janitor downstairs. Trailer's girl, Betty, she must have seen him. Oh, remember, he just wanted to meet her. Probably had seen her at the nightclub or something. But that was Black's mistake if he wanted to stay incognito, giving a girl his telephone number. Because now here I am with $10,000 in my pocket. But what? What'd you say? Sure. Must be collection time in the three lemon business. About two seconds ago, a delivery boy hands me an envelope at the door. Inside was an accounting sheet for all the slot machines on the south side and proceeds for the past month. Well, I... Riley, I figured out who's the man at the top of the anthill. Don't ask me how long it'll last or why it works this way. But right now, Riley, that man seems to be me. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. You go to help Lieutenant Riley... Because there's a man dying in the police hospital who might tell what he knows about the slot machine racket, provided somebody helps him find his girl, Betty. Well, so far you haven't found Betty, though you have discovered that there's someone else in her life. Someone a little more successful than Trailer, a man who calls himself Mr. Black, who owns the slot machines, whose identity is a secret even from his own employees. Only if your name is George Valentine, now it's you who occupy Mr. Black's apartment. It's a dangerous game, and no one realizes that better than Claire Brooks. Down at the police hospital now, she seems unable to help. I, I don't know anything. I tell you, Trailer, I don't know. if you could just remember why you and Louie had that fight last night in the bar, was it over Betty? Betty? Or is something wrong in the business? In the black company? Fine, Betty. Just fine, Betty. Of course not, Brooksy. We've gone way past trailer now. We're in the middle of the ants, the scramblers. The police have the apartment surrounded now, George. Well, tell them to keep out and lay low unless I whistle for help. But, George... Angel will never find out who fired those shots in the trailer or who runs this racket unless we ride right along with the gang. You'll ride yourself right into a funeral notice. Sooner or later, the person who rented that apartment will come back I said then... don't worry, will you, Brooksy, as long as I can... What? Go on, George. What do you people wash those shirts in anyway? A cement mixer? The, the collars come back with ground glass on the edge. George, what's the matter? Who well, just cares? don't use so much starch, that's all. Hello. I didn't mean to interrupt. The door was open. All right, then shut it and come in. Now, what is it? What do you want? Uh, don't get sore, boss. Now, take it easy. Your name's Louie, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Sure it is. How'd you know? You fit the description. Look, look, I, I know I'm not supposed to be here. I know I should have just sent the stuff up by messenger the way we always do, wherever the point is each oh, month. Oh, so but... that's it, huh? You're a collector. Uh, Durfee Hill and Eastside, sir. You brought some money. All right, let's have it. Here, here. The counting sheet's right on top. I had all those figures in my head. It's a trick. I taught myself. Right, boy. I, I know it's not healthy to come up here and find out who you are like this, Relax, but I... relax, will you? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew you wouldn't mind when you saw that. It's almost double last month. Twenty-three thousand five hundred bucks. What did you do? Fix the machine so they pay in bubble gum instead of jackpots? Oh, oh, oh no, sir. No, I, I didn't touch them. But uh, I've been in there giving them the old boost. You know, talking it up with the bartender. A real climber in the business, aren't you, Louis? Uh, now, what's this really about, Buster? How did you make so much money this month? Well, well the truth of the what happened is... to Trailer, the repairman? I don't know what you mean. Happened? Who shot him? Boss, listen. He was cheating you. Did you know that? Did you? I can prove he was. He was what? Hold out. Jack up the setting on the machines and then split the rake off with bartenders. That's how he did it. You must have heard the same thing, Mother Districts. He floated around all of them, didn't he? 
You know, it's getting too complicated for me. Uh, now, wait a minute. Wait, listen, that's how I build up my total for the moment, by catching them at it and stopping it. Yeah, you earned the Silver Star, all right. Uh, look, who are you, you going to call? Listen to the rest of what I got Buster, I'm going to see a man about pinning a medal on you. But I didn't do it. I didn't empty any gun into him. Well, everything happens at once. Uh, you want me to get it for you, Buster? No, no, I'll get it. Go mix yourself a drink or something. All right, don't mind if I do. I, I know who it is anyway. Huh? This is great. Oh. Hello. I guess you're the man, huh? <laughs> Are you the girl? Don't be funny. I mean, well, after all the notes you've been sending me with the flowers. Oh, sure. Come in, come in, Betty. Thanks. Say, you live all right, don't you? <laughs> I hope to. Uh, you know, you're not so easy to find, Betty. I've been wanting to meet you for some time now. Yeah, I got the idea. Do you always use that whirlwind stuff, flowers and presents on a girl, Mr. Whatever your name is, Black? Uh... Hey, slow down. Take your coat off. Uh, sure. Huh? You wanted to meet me. You saw me in the nightclub and you heard my singing and you wanted to meet me. Well, now, who wouldn't? You're very beautiful. Do a girl good to be known she associates with you? <laughs> no comment. Any girl would break her neck to get up here. She'd give her eye teeth to walk up. Close to you like this. Hey, what's the matter? You dirty hey, sis, cut it out. Cut it out, sis. You said you'd be nice and I'll stop it when you cut it out. I, I don't know what's the matter with the boss. Honest, I suppose you both be quiet. She said she was coming up here to see you. She promised She promised you would. You know, I I, I told her what a great guy you I said, I... shut up, killer. What? <laughs> now, 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 look, boss, this is my sister. Say, one of the greatest kids in the I know, world. I know, I know. A guy could go places if his sister associated with a big shot like me. What was it you said? You call Louis. Freddie, you came up here to find out about Trailer, didn't you? To slap my face and ask the big shot which one of his hired hands was responsible for your boyfriend being down there in the hospital. Wasn't that it? He's not a boyfriend. She's ten times as good as him. He's only been hanging around a couple of months. Sure, he's not an eager beaver like you, Buster. He wouldn't try to use his own sister to get him ahead in the world. Oh, no, no, they just fought about it. In that bar the other night? Oh, yeah, but that was all. I it told him to stay fight. away and he got mean and no. took a One at a time, will you? Honestly. You live with the oh, ants. No, Don't you know what they're like yet? Oh, was that what you saw in Trailer? That he was a little different from the Scramblers? He was a dope. He was stealing, holding out. You want to bet it was you who was holding out from collections, Louie, and he caught you at it? Boss, so no, long no. have a chance to get rid of two birds with one stone, get in the boss's good graces and cover your Louis, own tracks by being the guy... You said you didn't see Trailer after that fight. Well, All I, I know, Betty, is that your brother said something to me a minute ago about a gun being emptied in the trailer. Huh? Well, it so happens he was shot six times. Only how could you know about that little specific thing, Louie, unless you were the guy? Boss, look, everything I've done is for you. It's for the good of the company. I'm looking ahead all the time. See, I, I want to... Fly... He did it if you like. Huh? What? Hey, who's that for? Got a gun? Shut up. Hello, Mr. Wilton. <laughs> party's over, huh? Yes. Yes, the party's over, I'm afraid. And besides, it's making too much noise. Next door? No, I've been on the back of a wardrobe you overlooked. Oh, sure. Well, I didn't think it could last. It never did make sense that such a careful setup as this apartment wouldn't have... Wouldn't have me. Yes, me. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. So is Louis. So is Betty. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, who is this guy? Now, if the three of you will I'll just... I'll take care of him. down that gun, Buster. Don't worry. He can't get away with anything. Stand still. Louis, stop it. You're making a mistake. Louis. Ambitious to the end. Couldn't resist trying to make one last impression on you, could he, Mr. Valentine? Mr. What? <laughs> yes, Betty. I'm afraid I'm the Mr. Black who's been so anxious to meet you. Yeah, it was too bad. Things couldn't have worked out better for us. But if you're Mr. Black... I... The great organizer. The best of pyramids totter once in a while. I was here to make my own collections this time. I thought it was about time for a visit to South America. So if you'll just hand over my money... Why don't you come and get it? You've caused enough trouble already, Valentine. Sure, come on, come on. Shoot some more people. I'm warning you. No! That's the only way you're going to get out of here. Valentine, Stop I... that gun! Well, thanks, Riley. Mr. Slot Machine King, see what the sound of those shots brought you? Three lemons.
We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. And that was it, Trailer. A gun test proved that Louis shot you. Yeah. Why? Well, ambition, I guess. Uh-huh. Cover his own mistakes, get in good with a big boss. Uh-huh. Can you understand me, Trailer? Uh-huh. Can you understand what I'm saying? Yes, Ants. All scrambling around. That's all Louis was. Sure. That's all Wilton is, too. But the girl's different. I think she'd like to see you, Trailer. Yeah. Yeah, we found Betty. She's a nice girl. Yes, yes, I know. Since when? What? I said, since when did you know? I mean, that she was the kind of a girl who's a little different. Who might have really meant it when she said she liked an ugly little guy like you. Mr. Valent, I'm very tired. I'm very... Wilton isn't kidding anybody. I just want you to know that I know that, Trailer. I... Begun to guess it, I... His biggest mistake was trying to take over the slot machine empire tonight. Like the rest, he couldn't resist the opportunity. George... Think back, Angel. Wilton's tall and skinny. Would he have ever written a note to Betty, just an ordinary-sized girl, saying, I'm on the level, and I don't mean just opposite your eyes? No, of course he did He's only a lawyer. A rat trying to grab what he can off a sinking ship. But Valentine, I had no idea... I'll say it for you, Trevor. Wilton didn't ever own the slot machines like he claimed he did at the last minute. And he wasn't the Mr. Black in the notes. No, they'd have to be a short man, probably. A little guy. Yeah. A little guy. Like maybe a man who'd made such a success out of not trusting anybody that he couldn't believe a girl liked him. He had to test her by making her think a big shot was after her. To see if she'd drop him and run for the honey. He was in town for the collections anyway... And to nose around the way he always did, inspecting the anthill he built while looking like a repairman. You mean, Trailer here is really Mr. Black? Yeah, Brooksy. What would you have done, Trailer, if Betty had dropped you and chased after you, Mr. Black, the way her brother wanted her to? I... I would have killed her. No. No, I... I wouldn't have. I... I don't... I know, Buster. It's pretty ironic. You kept your identity so secret, you did so well, that what happened? You got shot by a guy whose only ambition was to get in good with the boss, make a big, fine impression on you. Now you still want to talk to Betty while you can, Mr. Black? No. No. She's... Leave her out of our anthill. just heard The Ant Hill, another adventure with George Valentine. Robert Bailey stars as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, uh... 
Do you ever hear of anyone who was afraid of an angel? Now, I'd always heard they were pretty nice people with wings and harps and stuff. But not so with Lefty's gal Friday. She had this angel as figured packing forty fives, all aimed at her. Now, instead of getting panicky and chewing her nails until she resembled Venus to Milo, she should have looked up George Valentine. His motto is, let George do it, and he isn't afraid of forty fives or even forty sixes. I must say, however, she had a reason to be scared. You see, she played a big part in building this angel. And just in case you've never seen an angel being manufactured, listen, and you'll get it firsthand. <laughs> Get your paper, let the lump but kill an auto crash. Law couldn't get him, but wet pavement dead. Here you are, let the lump but big shot. You say your name's Emerson. You heard me, Mr. Valentine, Frank J. Emerson. Oh, but you're the president of. That's right, young lady, Emerson and Citibank. And I'm a very busy man. I only want to know if you've read about Lefty Lumpert's death in that auto accident. Sure, who hasn't? Naturally, naturally. When the biggest crook in town dies, it's news. Young lady, but I know what sort of reputation Mr. Lumpert was supposed to have. Well, just because they could never nail anything on him, not even the income tax board. Of course, yes, yes, I know. But I must remind you that Mr. Lumpert owned a perfectly respectable small investment <laughs> office. Invest in a dog track or a five-foot shelf of bookies. Perfectly respectable, I said. Regardless of whatever criminal connections or power Mr. Lumpert may or may not have had... That front, that uh, business of his, was proven many times to be perfectly... Yeah, perfectly respectable. I heard you the first time. Okay, okay. Lumpert was real smart. He worked alone. He never told anybody anything. His ostensible occupation was strictly legal. There. That reassure you? Well, yes. I just wanted to make sure... Only, uh, what's it to you? Why so insistent? And why should a banker like yourself be concerned with Mr. a guy... Mr. Valentine, my bank has done business with Lefty Lumpert many times. Oh... And never mind that tone of voice, either. A dollar is a dollar. Our money was only used in legitimate purposes. It's not up to us to refuse business to a man merely because he's supposed to be engaged in other outside activities, is it? Now, really, let's not be naive. Oh, no, no, let's not be naive. All right, Mr. Valentine. It's embarrassing. Of course it is. Business is business, and I have nothing to be ashamed of. But, uh, well, I've never liked it very much. Then why are you here? Why does Lumpert's death oh, mean... Oh, no, no, no. Don't get the wrong idea, please. There's nothing I'm really worried about. But you see, he had a secretary, Myrtle Dane. And through the years, I've got to know her pretty well. Myrtle Dane? The one who was in the accident with him? That's right. Probably as close to him as anyone could ever be. At least anyone from the legitimate end. She's quite a person, Myrtle. <laughs> She's uh, rationalized working for him much better than I have. A very realistic person. A very good secretary. If she knows anything about Lefty's more private life... She certainly never let on. Wait just a minute. The newspaper said that Miss Dane was hurt. She was driving, they were going to an appointment, and in a hurry, but the steering wheel saved her. Banged up and shaken a good deal, yes, but not badly enough to make her behave irrationally. What do you mean? I've just been to see her at the hospital. Normal, friendly act, that's all. But she refused to see me. I forced my way in, but it didn't do any good. For some reason, Mr. Valentine, the girl is terrified. She's even afraid of me. Ah. Well, what do you want me to do about it? If there is any scandal or kickbacks or new discoveries about Lumpert's activities now that he's dead, I'll admit I want to protect my own name and the name of the bank. But also, Mr. Valentine, I think it's my duty as a citizen to wonder, why is she afraid? <laughs> You know, I think that's a pretty silly question. Now, if you'd taken part in bumping off the town's leading gangster, how would you feel? Now, don't start looking for the nearest cave, because I want you to hear this. Now, let's see how George is doing with Myrtle. Nope. She's still standing her ground. No, I don't want to see anyone. I told you. They brought you some candy, dear, in the doctor. Please, nurse, how many times Hello, do I Myrtle. have to... how are you feeling? What? Uh, will you excuse us a minute, nurse? Yes, Mr. No, come back here. I told you. That I... <laughs> Sorry, but she's a friend of Miss Brooks here. Hello. Who are you? What do you want? Nothing. Brought you some candy. Take it away. Get it out hey, of here. Hey, take it easy. Myrtle, look. 
It is just candy, that's Won't all. Don't blow up or anything. Uh, a little nervous, aren't you? Uh, I'm sorry. The nurse called you Mr. Valentine, didn't she? You're George Valentine. I know you're all right. I... There's a hall full of flowers and fruit and candy out there. Lots of people have been pestering you, huh? <laughs> Suddenly I'm popular. At my age and with my face, can you imagine? Who sent you? Emerson. Oh, the banker. Well, you can tell Mr. Emerson that I am not just another working girl out of a job. I have been very well paid. I don't want another job. That I am taking a year off to take a trip around the world and will probably never come back to this town or ever talk about the time I've spent here. Hold on, hold on, will you? I don't believe you. What? Mr. Valentine, the doctor says I can leave this hospital in about ten minutes. And I tell you, I'm going straight to the airport. I know, I, I know, sure. You're running away fast. But to work for a guy like Lefty Lumpert, you must be a very sharp and cold-blooded girl. Certainly smart enough to know that people will raise their eyebrows and say, oh, she only worked in his legitimate enterprises, huh? Running away, huh? Keeping her mouth shut. You wouldn't believe me one way or another. Any more than anyone else would when I tell them I know nothing about Lefty's criminal connections. No, you're wrong again. I do believe you. Thank you. A dollar is a dollar, you know. But it takes some rationalizing to work at a job like mine for so many years. And ignore the other kind of remark. Whose remarks? What makes you so bitter, Myrtle? Oh, no, you don't. My personal life is still private. Big Shot dies unexpectedly. Faithful, tough private secretary is suddenly scared to death. Why? Well, that's the only reason I'll believe you didn't really know anything about Lefty. Because now you don't even seem to know whom you should be afraid of. Mr. Valentine, there's an assistant district attorney by the name of Bill McCoy. Do you know him? No, but I can certainly find him. Find out. him and meet me at Lefty's office. Give me an hour to get dressed and checked out of here. Why? <laughs> because the two of you are like cold water in the face. Oh, no, I'm not afraid of Bill. Maybe you've just reminded me of my debt to society, that's all. Is he the one? Bill? What one? I'm not very good at double talk. Yes, you are. Because I'm doing it right now, of course I am. He's the only person who hasn't come to see me. Bill McCoy. All right, so I'll go see him. And we'll all try to solve the riddle of Lefty together, shall we, Mr. Valentine? Well, that's the general idea. I'm scared, Mr. Valentine, but you're wrong. It's not because I don't know whom to be afraid of. No. And it's not any mysterious partner of Lefty's, either. It's an angel. I'm scared to death of Lefty's angel. An angel, George? Protect her, Brooksy. That's what she was talking about. She means a guy like Lefty couldn't get along without someone to protect him from higher up. Oh, someone respectable. Maybe that's why the police could never get anything far enough. Hey, hold it. Huh? Hey, you. That's not the way you get into a hospital, is it? Through the fire entrance? You make up the rules or something? Oh, but I got friends on this floor. That brightens my whole day. Now, get out of the way. Hey, look, that's an operating room. You want to visit that? Eh? Huh? Only a couple of private rooms up here. Hey, maybe you're mixed up. At least my friend doesn't want to see anybody. Come on, come on now. I'll show you the reception desk. Yeah, I got business to attend to, now get oh, out no, of the... Oh, no, you don't. I'm going to see you and you can't stop That's me. That's what you think. All right, all right. Cut it out. Mistake, see? That's all. On the wrong floor, I guess. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Come back here, you. See you again sometime. George, what on earth was I that? Stop being tough when I bumped his chest when I noticed he carried a gun. Oh. Is she afraid of an angel or a devil, George? Hey, look, get to the police and give them a description of that guy, will you? And check the reception desk on everybody else who's tried to see Myrtle. I got a hunch this case is going to go off like a string of firecrackers. Did we keep you waiting, Myrtle? Found your friend here in the barber shop. Hello, Myrtle. Hello, Bill. <laughs> well, that's a friendly greeting. Why did you want to see me here at Lefty's office, Myrtle? I thought the big investigator might enjoy a chance to search through Lefty's private papers. Well, McCoy, it seems like the place to start if we're going to try to find out who his angel was. No, no, I just thought it would be a good idea. Hmm? We're too late. Somebody beat us to it. Look. Holy smoke. Yeah. 
Looks like a typhoon went through here. It was like that when I got here a few minutes ago. Filing cabinets open, papers all over the floor. Yeah, and any incriminating papers just plain aren't here anymore, Check. I've never told this to Bill, Mr. Valentine. But Lefty always said the law would never get him. He had an angel watching over his shoulder. Yeah, an angel who just tore this place apart. Yes, that's the point. Lefty was no fool. If there was such a person, then somewhere he must have kept a file on him to protect himself. Only where is it? Oh, cut it out, both of you. He didn't keep it here. Huh? How do you know? If his own secretary is... I was more delicate, but I ransacked the place myself two nights ago. You what? And there wasn't anything here then, Valentine. Two nights ago? The same night you took me to the movies? Oh, now take it easy, Myrtle. And you said you had to go home early to get some sleep? Mr. Valentine, do you know how many years this waste basket from the district attorney's office has been trying to get something on my boss? Do you know how many laws he's broken himself? Cut it out, will you? A job is a job. Yes, isn't it, though? Like like taking me out of it. Okay, never mind. You're on opposite sides of the fence. You don't like each other. Myrtle, he's dead now. Please, won't you? Oh, Skipper, will you? Hey, Myrtle, did Lefty have a safe deposit box? Yes. I know where the key is. You know what's in that box? No. I suppose you won't believe that either, Bill. Oh, for the love of... Look, Myrtle, the thing I've been trying to do ever since he died is to round up that muscle head of his, Murphy. I don't know anything about him either. I've only seen him once or hey, twice. Hey, hold on, will you please? What's all this? Who's Murphy? The other side of Lefty's life, bodyguard, errand boy. Myrtle's right. He never hung around the legitimate end. Murphy is a big, ugly guy with one cauliflower ear, which is probably the only ear that's ever heard Lefty in private with whoever he dealt with. Wait a minute. I'll get that. Hello? George, I'm down at the police station, and I gave them a description of that man in the hospital. Oh, Brooksy, yeah, yeah, I, I already know who he is. You do? Just caught on this minute. His name was Murphy. He's the link with the angel. Maybe Lefty's only link with his angel. Hey, watch this. Who are you talking to? Mr. Valentine, you mean you've seen Murphy? Wait, wait a minute, Brooksy, listen. No, George, you listen. You wait a minute. Do you know that they found Murphy ten minutes ago in an alley? Do you know that Murphy's dead, that he's been murdered? <laughs> Say, this angel really gets around, doesn't he? Or is it Lefty's angel? Could be that uh, eager beaver from the DA's office. I wouldn't know. I only know a good thing when I hear it. Just like you're going to right now. Lefty Lumpert, the big shot no one could ever nail, least of all Bill McCoy, the DA's man who's always handled the case, is finally dead from an automobile accident. But what's to become of Lefty's mysterious underworld empire? Well, the secretary who handled Lefty's legitimate business says that Lefty had an angel, a protector, but she doesn't know who it is, of course. A faithful bodyguard named Murphy might know, but he's just been shot to death. So if your name is George Valentine, you know that now it'll take some fast flying to catch up with an angel. But, Brooksy, where was That's the... That's all I know so far, George. The police are down there now. It was in the alley, just a block from the hospital. So it must have happened just after we chased him away from Myrtle. Okay, Brooksy, stay there at headquarters. I'll meet you later. Hey, Myrtle, you said you know where Lefty kept his safe deposit key. Yes, of course. All right with you, McCoy? Sure, if Lefty had a file on the angel Okay, somewhere. then let's go. Sometimes files have teeth. size boxes. At least he had plenty of room for this stuff. Miss Dane, Mr. Valentine. Hold it. Oh, well, hello, Mr. Emmers. And McCoy, I noticed you people come into the bank. I hurried over as fast as I could. Thanks, but I don't think we need you. Left your safe deposit box. That's what you're after. Any objections? Well, no, not at all, as far as I'm concerned. I've got the authority. I'll take the responsibility for approving it with a court order. Oh, my signature's on file as Lefty's secretary, if you'd rather we handle it that way. No, no, no. Go right ahead. Yeah. You just wanted to watch her. Okay, here goes. Hmm. Plenty of stuff. Well, these are just income tax things. Yeah. How about this? Oh, wait a minute. No. No, it's the same. And these are audits from the investment office, see? Bonds, 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 bonds. 
Brother, look at this. I know he had a lot of money invested in buildings. There's a million here. bucks worth here, or I'll eat it. Lefty never talked much about his money. Say, look, let's not be naive, Emerson. Lefty couldn't have made that kind of deal with his legitimate business. Of course not. Not a tenth of it. So you prove he had other enterprises. So what? We already know that. Oh, come on. This is no good. We're wasting a... Hey. Yeah. Dusty little envelope down at the bottom. Acme Rental Service. Yeah, let me have that. All right. Take it easy. Huh. A key. Nothing in it but a key. Well, it looks like a house key. We can trace it all right. There's a date on the envelope. Acme will have a record. Sometimes I've called Lefty at his house and there wasn't any answer. I mean, lots of times when he was supposed to be home... And his wasn't... own home is pure as driven snow. So maybe he had another house. A place nobody knew about. The guy playing it safe would keep a duplicate key in the bank. Okay. I'll see you later. What? I'm running over to Acme. Valentine, you worry about the murder. Running down Lefty's other life is my worry. Well, well, after all this time of getting nowhere, the heroic DA's man steps in... Sure, I'm after a headline, so what? Skip it, and I'll call you back in an hour. So you want to know about Murphy's record, eh, Valentine? A guy like Lefty can be a smart lone wolf, but not a strong man. Sure, that's the idea, isn't it? So you ask me about the weak link strong Johnson, man. Johnson, what's eating you anyway? Oh, nothing. Murphy was just as smart as his boss. Never been locked up, never had friends, never hung around bars and shot his mouth off. So he's dead and we might as well forget about him. You want to know something? I bet he didn't even know anything about any angel. Just left these big, faithful muscles. And what's all this stuff on your desk here? Angels. I'm starting a list of angels. And do you know how many there might be? What do you mean? The DA's office always thought Lefty played it alone, like a genius. So now we get into it, because there's murder. So what do we find? Well, Emerson at the bank has dealt with him for a long we time. We find a corporation executive who played cards every Friday with Lefty for years, a real estate king, a fire chief. My friend, I'm telling you, there could be an angel behind every cloud. Okay, okay, Johnson, I get it. Now, which one is it? His lawyers, that's the best bet. Big, respectable outfit. Ask them to call back. Hello? Oh, uh, who is this? Here, give me that phone. Take the extension. What is this, a date bureau? Hello, Myrtle. Mr. Valentine, did he call you? Who? Bill McCoy. He was going to. He was going to call me, and it's nearly two hours. No, no, he hasn't, Myrtle. Say, where are you? I called his office, but they haven't heard from him, and I stopped by his apartment, but nobody answered. Listen to that. Everybody's getting into the... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Myrtle, I'll ask the police well, to... I checked the Acme place, and they gave me the address he went to. It's a houseboat. What? But I still can't find Bill. Amateur detectives. Listen, lady. Mr. Valentine, come out here fast, will you? That's where I am. Lefty's hideout. The houseboat. <laughs> Pretty fancy place. Yes. Rigged strictly for business, though. It's where he must have handled his contacts and things. Well, there's certainly nobody here. Say, was the door open like that when you came here? Oh, yes, I haven't touched anything. I don't care about that. I was just thinking about keys. What? What do you mean? Well, if a guy's careful enough to keep one in the bank, chances are there's only one other. Left his own key. Well, that was in his pocket in the wreck, George. Lieutenant Johnson checked the number of it for me. So the only key loose is the one McCoy has. So he must be the one who left the door open. But why? Unless he was in such a hurry. Take it easy, will you? He means quite a lot to you, doesn't he? And vice versa. No. No, I hate him. Always following me around. Hey, wait a minute. You notice the wall safe? What? Here, behind the table. George, it's been left open, too. Uh Ah, by somebody who knew the combination. Johnson can tear this place apart now, but I'll bet he won't find anything. Whatever there was is gone. Bill, I don't care about that. What's happened to Bill? George, yes. Whoever opened it had to know the combination, so it couldn't have just been Mr. McCoy that was here. He could have found it that way. Or he could have found somebody else here and taken the stuff out of it and headed for the DA's office. Oh, no, you know that's not true. George, if the angel was here too... Stop jumping to conclusions, both of you. Come on. You heard me no. Hasn't shown up at his office. Hasn't phoned anybody. Look, Johnson, what about asking the traffic department? They can't find him either. They're checking taxis now, but no luck so far. Hey, where are you going? McCoy's apartment. Try to get some more leads on him. George, look. Uh, McCoy. Hey, McCoy. Bill. 
You're wasting your time. Look at the bureau in the closet door. I'll see. Somebody sure went through here fast. No neckties on the rack. Drawers left open. Uh-huh. No razor blade. No toothbrush. George! Yeah. No suitcase in the closet, either. Somebody else must have been here, don't you think? I mean, it seems to me most likely... Hey, what are you doing at that fireplace? Listen, Get away I, from that... No. Yeah. Ashes. Papers. So you try to step on them and put... They're all burned, whatever they are. Hey, Brooksy, shut the door. Get rid of that draft in here. Maybe I can still make out this... Yeah, that's what they are, all right. All right, Myrtle, look. Whose handwriting is that? I don't know. A second ago, I thought you were scared because you thought McCoy might be dead. Now, come on, whose papers are these? I don't know. They're burned so badly, okay, I can't Okay, you won't tell me, but I know somebody who can. Naturally, I've seen Mr. Lumpert's writing many times. I doubt if the lab will get much out of them, Valentine. But that's what the papers were, all right. Records of payoffs, dealing with gamblers, a whole works, whole underworld empire. Lefty Lumpert, his records. Except for one page concerning his angel. Mr. Valentine, no, it, it, it can't be true. He wouldn't His have. angel by the name of Bill McCoy. Well, it's happened before. No one in a better position to protect him. The investigator who somehow could never find anything. Until today. And then he destroyed it as fast as he could and ran. Well, that does it. I got all the evidence we need. Uh-huh. All over but chasing down McCoy. And Myrtle, you'll feel different when we find him. And if we hurry, I know how to do it. Once you said I was tough, Mr. Valentine. Well, now you know why. Take it easy, take it easy. You rationalize yourself into taking a job like mine with Lefty. You deal with phonies. And the first nice guy who pays you a lot of attention. It turns out to be a phony, too. It's that kind of a word. I know, I know. You said you knew where to find it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I phoned the River Patrol to meet us. Who? Lefty Lumpert's underworld business is still really intact. Those ashes won't tip off any names or places. And it's a good business. Worth continuing. You mean... You mean you think Bill I mean, is suppose Bill wasn't the angel. He was really a partner of suppose Lefty? Suppose there wasn't any angel. After all, you're the only person who ever said there was one. What? Just like you made a big show of being frightened. To prove there was one, I guess. But Lefty so often If told Lefty me wasn't that... a lone wolf, the way everybody else figured, then the only possible associate was you. Mr. Valentine, you're I really tough, don't know all right, he... sister. Suppose that's what Murphy knew. Suppose that's what he wanted to see you about. You, the new boss. What? Suppose that's why you shot him in the alley near the hospital where he waited for you to come out. Shot him to quiet the only person who knew your real position. This is the most ridiculous oh, accusation. Oh, wait a minute. Except Bill McCoy, of course, sure. The man who was breathing close to the truth. And that's where we're going now. To drag the river real fast before the mud and silt keep us from finding his body forever. His body? Sure. But but he was the angel. You you saw Lefty's own Private file. Private secretary and... for years. That forgery would be a cinch for you. Just like you had time to murder McCoy there at the houseboat. Then tear over and fix up his apartment to look like he'd run away. Burn those papers, but leave just enough stop so we think... Stop it, I won't listen if to you. If we find his body where you dumped it, then there's no other way it could work, is there? Yes. Yes, there is. Now, you could keep on driving right across the bridge, uh, right out of town. Put that gun away, sister. And never mind attracting any attention to speeding. You see, there's no reason for me to do all those things. Why would I? Lefty was my... Where did he come from? What are you trying to Right behind to us, sister. Head of the traffic department. I asked her to pick me up. Wait. Oh, no, careful with that thing, sister. I'm going to ask the department to reinvestigate that accident of Lefty's, the one with you driving, because that would explain everything, wouldn't it, if this case really had three murders? Well, Myrtle, those policemen are getting out of their car. You've only got about two seconds to make up your mind what you're going to say. You know what I'd say if I was in Myrtle's shoes? Bye. Of course, you couldn't count on it working. Not to the extent, anyway, that you can always count on this. Mr. Valentine, you don't count very well, do you? Oh, yes, I do. 
Three murders. Because everything that's happened would make plenty of sense. If you maybe happen to give Lefty the extra blow after that accident that supposedly killed him. Or you could have rigged the accident I by... I said you don't count very oh, God, well. Give me that. Oh. oh, yeah, I can still count. So can you. Three murders, I said. Not four. First Lefty, then Murphy, then McCoy. Real tough woman, Brooksy. But she wanted to take over Lefty's empire. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, at least one thing tonight, George. I noticed this case made you stop calling me Angel. Yeah. just heard another adventure with George Valentine. Robert Bailey starred as George with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. A few years ago, a new slogan or slang expression was thrust on the vocabulary of the American public. You remember it. It came in very handy when the wife wanted you to clean out the attic, or your brother-in-law put the bite on you for a ten spot. It was, quote, drop dead, unquote. Of course, it never did you any good, but it was better than 23's could do or go jump in the lake. If you listen carefully, you may get some tips on how to use the expression with more effective results. It all started with a phone call to George Valentine's office by a little fellow who was just full of questions. Oh, let's see if George has any of the answers. Don't you want a story? Hold it, will you? Who is this? Jerry Yule, I said. I'm a writer and I have a story. Yeah, well, this is George Valentine and I'm not a publisher. Please listen to me. You've got to meet me right away. Captain Charlie's Neptune Palace. The old waterfront district. The captain's who's what? I live here. It's an old hotel. I'm collecting material. But this particular story, I'm afraid I don't know how it ends. And that's why I need you. Sounds to me like it goes around in a circle. I want to be there when it ends. Don't you understand? That's why I'm calling you instead of the police. Police? What kind of a story is it? Well, it concerns a mysterious stranger. And a seaman who chews tobacco. And mostly, of course, the parrot. The what? The parrot, a green and orange parrot. Ordinarily, I don't like parrots myself, such mangy, squawking creatures, but Captain Charlie, of course, will... A green to... and orange parrot. Now, look, friend, and if meet you... Meet me in 15 minutes at the foot of Tide Street, please. You don't want anyone else to get their hands on this story, do you? <laughs> Well, I don't know, Mr. Yule. It all depends whether or not this story has a happy ending. And from where I sit, I'll bet you it hasn't. However, to keep things even, here's another kind of story that I know has a happy ending. Now, let's see. Uh, George and Brooksy were supposed to meet a Mr. Yule at the foot of Tide Street. Say, that's a pretty rough part of town. You better watch it, George. You might get in over your head. Is it always so foggy down here? Well, only in the summer. Captain Charlie's Neptune Palace. Quite an ornate old place, isn't it? Oh, the rooms are empty now, or most of them, and half of it is locked off, of course. It tips like a one-legged man. There where the pilings underneath are sinking. 
The commercial docks went away and left this district, you see, when they built the new piers yeah, farther down. Yeah, I know. Beer and sandwiches. Step into the kitchen and make your own. Rooms, 50 cents. Quite a come down from the kind of hotel it must have been once. Oh, but there's no transient trade, you understand, Miss Brooks. Just the ones Captain Charlie asked to stay permanently. Like writers who specialize in foggy stories. <laughs> now, just be patient, Mr. Valentine. I want you to understand this setting, that's all. It's mood, it's it's character, it's strange... Shut it... the door. Oh, oh, hello. You want some coffee? Pour your own. Oh, don't look at me, friend. Captain Charlie, I suppose. No, no, this is Mawson. Sure, I'm not crazy. I I just look that way. The business cards, menus, and wedding announcements. That's his line. What? Why, he used to do the menus on the Lusitania, no less. Mm, been sunk ever since. <laughs> he prints Charlie's stationery for him. Not that Charlie ever uses any, but that's how he took him in. Where's that coming from? Who opened the door? That's all right, Sadie. Go back to your knitting. Oh, there, that's Sadie. She used to own the place back in the gay days when it was Sadie's Neptune Sure, place. sure, but Captain Charlie never had the heart to throw her out either. Who are your friends, Jewel? Oh, never mind us. Who's down there? All we care about is a story. Not that we'll ever get it. Oh, yeah, well, now, Morton here, he was in it. Oh, no, I'm not. Charlie, give me a check for the 25 bucks. Don't mix me up in your fiction. Parrots. Ha! Bird feathers. I said who's down there? You, Captain? Look, Buster, for the last time, will you tell us what this is all about? Come on, come on. Through here. No barroom. I'll tell you all right. Well, well, well. And who might your friends be, Mr. Yule? No matter, no matter. The welcome's always out. But you know what I've been here sitting and thinking? Me and Limey here? Right, Skipper and me been thinking. Be quiet. Right, Skipper. The next thing this hotel needs is a rubber plant. I remember in Bombay once, I, I seen the most lovely rubber plant. Hey, wait a minute. I wanted to tell these people about last night. Oh, that. Well, now, I don't blame you. Last night, young lady, I bought the most lovely green parrot that any man ever saw. Do you know this morning he Captain, actually... would you mind sticking with last night? What is it? What happened last night? He told you, Governor, he bought a parrot. No, 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 no. But a story should begin at the beginning. And, Mr. Valentine, the very first thing was $25. That's what woke me up. What? Right. I woke you up to borrow it, see? Only he didn't have it. And neither did Sadie, so I had to break the lock on Morton's room and dig it out of his stuff. It, that's on account of the skipper here was a little short in the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> made Morton sore, too. Made all of you sore. Oh, not me, skipper. Nobody appreciates a good parrot, young lady, but I do, and I bought him. Had to scrape up a whole hundred dollars. That's the story. But I made it, and I bought him. Limey. Run, fetch the bird. Show the people. All right, Skipper, whatever you say. Uh, I'll give you a hand in case he talks back. Uh, Yule, is that all there is to it? Just that the captain bought a bird? Uh, Mr. Valentine, uh, the, the stranger. Now, let me tell you about him. The man he bought the bird from. The mysterious stranger. Now, uh, don't look at me that way. He was. He was a foreigner of some sort. He was a Hindu or Sikh or something. One of those big fellas with a beard and a turban. Uh, but a sailor. And he and Charlie gibbered away at a great rate in some heathen tongue. Oh, now, look, friend. He wanted to get rid of that bird, the sick did. Act as if he was afraid of him. That's why all the fuss about the money. He was so anxious to get paid and get out. And when he left, he left a running. Well? Hey, here, now wait. <laughs> here he is. Thank you, you ducky, though. Careful there, Limey. Careful he don't slip off your shoulder. <laughs> He's taking quite a fancy to Limey here, you know that? So that's the parrot. <laughs> Isn't he the most lovely bird you ever saw? Well, I wouldn't exactly say... Oh, he... Limey's going to clean him up a bit. You know how it is. But here, here, let me show you. This is a piece of resistance. Now, come on, baby. Say it. Speak out for the people, oh, baby. Oh, fine bird. He talks you. That's a baby. That's a baby. Talk right up like you did to the heathen. Speak out, baby. Speak ah, out. Drop dead. Drop dead. <laughs> drop dead. Ah. Isn't he the most lovely thing you ever heard? Drop dead. That does it. Uh, Valentine, wait, 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 wait. Wouldn't it interest you if I told you that I took a walk this morning just before I called you and that I found the sick, that heathen sailor who was so afraid and so anxious to get rid of the bird and that the poor man was just lying there in an alley, dead. Now, 
Now, wait a minute. That man didn't drop dead. He was rolled. Look at his pocket. See for yourself. Slugged and rolled, that's all. Yeah, you're right, Lieutenant. Only whoever hit him tapped him a little too hard, Chuck. It's happened more than once down here. But don't you think it's interesting that... Uh... And never mind that Eye of the Idol mystery magazine stuff either, Mr. Yule. What I want to know is why you didn't report this to the police quicker. But here in the alley, I knew no one would find him. Besides which, a beard and a turban. You don't even know he's the same guy you saw last night. I think he is. Ah, there's a whole shipload of these birds in port. Can you tell them apart? Routine, that's all. Routine case, and you've got to clutter it up. Big mystery. (laughs) Okay, boys, where's that wagon? Well, Mr. Yule... I wrote a story about one of these fellas... Hey, hey, wait a minute. What are you doing? Johnson will cut your gizzard out if you touch that body. You're in enough trouble as it is. Let go of me. Ah. The turban. Here, hold that flashlight. Oh, Oh, brother. There. You see, I told you it was the same man. Whoever rolled the sailor just wasn't so bright about where he'd carry his money, huh? No, 60, 70. Yeah, give me that. Yeah, it's the hundred bucks, all right. No, 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 I'll keep it. Only so what? This still doesn't mean the parrot had anything to do with it. Hey, Mr. Valentine, look at this. Did you ever see an Oriental who chewed tobacco? Mm, what? A plug. Okay, so there's been somebody around here lately who chews tobacco, but... Oh, yeah, I remember. You said on the phone something about a seaman who chews tobacco. Yes, 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 a big fellow, but an American seaman. Well, where did he creep in? Now, look, Buster, you'd better spill the rest of what you know fast. I've told you everything, honestly, I have. He was just a seaman, that's all. I didn't get much of a look at him, but this morning when I woke up, he was peering in my window. And when I shouted, he ran. I came out to look around. That's when I found the body. And then I ran. Hmm. Well, that's a good idea. Mr. Valentine. All right. You too, Doc. Miss Brooks is still back in the car. You will out of the other way. Tell Johnson I went to get her, will you? Or some other lie? Uh, What? But I... No, no. You stay there and hold hands with Johnson. Hey, Valentine. See you later. I'm going to write a story. George, remember? He said that man in the turban seemed so anxious to get rid of the Take birds. Take it easy, Angel. Hey, Captain. Captain Charlie. This is a crazy, strange place, isn't it? That captain gives me the jitters. Ah, never mind. I don't want to see him anyway. Limey's the one who'll talk for us. A weasel if I ever saw one. But why? What can he tell you? What is it you're trying to... Here we are. Through here. Just check the information we've already got, Brooksy. Yeah, I'd like to weed out some of Yule's weird notions. He's about stupid enough to think that bird is some sort of weird super... Drop that, drop that. George. Relax, Angel. Up at the head of the stairs, that's all. Come on. Let's speak of the devil. Yeah. yeah. Something at the bottom of the stairs, too. Limey. It's Limey. He's dead. Drop that, drop that. You know, I've always found it pretty tough to squeeze juice from a lime. Well, that can't be true with everyone, because here's a case where somebody squeezed a limey too hard. Couldn't have been the parrot, but he might have been the inspiration. Now, uh, if you're in need of inspiration, why don't you give this a listen? George Valentine, you don't believe in the kind of story that has a parrot in it. When the parrot says, drop dead, people drop dead. The only trouble is, they do. First, a foreign sailor who sold the bird, and now the next man that the bird took a liking to, Limey. Yes, Limey is just about as dead as the sailor was. Who's going to be murdered next, George? Oh, Brooksy, cut it out, would you? But Limey didn't just fall down the stairs. It's a dark stairway. It could have happened. Only you doubt it. Yeah. I guess he was dead before he fell. But a guess isn't good enough, is it? It's all so unbelievable, all these crazy characters. There's another explanation of some kind. You want to bet it's nice and simple? No. (laughs) Okay, maybe not. But for instance, why is the parrot important? 
Why was that mangy captain so anxious to buy him in the first place? And why is Mr. Ewell so interested? I get the idea. So run out and get the police, will you? Well, what are you going to do? I want to see who's around, Angel. Mostly upstairs. Well, the bird is, for one. Yeah, I know. He hopped off down the hall. See you later. All right, George. You sure fell all right, Buster. Well, so who pushed you? Or slugged you first? Who? Help! Get him off me! Help! What the? Help! It's Sadie! <laughs> Sadie. Get him off. Send him off from Sadie. Oh, what? Get out that window. Boy, shoot. All right, all right. Just a oh. parrot, that's all. Just a, of all of the ugly memes. All right, take preaching. it easy, take it easy. He's out the window now, huh? Ah, sitting there on the kitchen roof like he was real proud of himself. Only what happened? Hop through here across my face. I was sound asleep. I told Captain Charlie I wouldn't stay here if he kept that bird. I never allowed parrots when it was my hotel. This was a respectable place. Sure, sure. Was... But look, Sadie, did you hear any noise out by the stairs a while ago? Maybe about half an hour ago? No. Why should I? Everybody's been out except that awful creature. I heard them go. Why? Strip it. Only tell me something, Sadie. How long have you lived here? Forty years now, I'd say, off and on. Barring a couple of marriages. But I always come back. Oh, my lands, I wouldn't know any other place to live. None of us would. All been here for years with Captain Charlie, huh? Well, of course. Except that Yule, naturally. He's recent. We're all sort of has-beens, but... The captain, he keeps us all under his wing. He's a wonderful man. He's a generous, honest... That was what you wanted to ask about, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, Captain Charlie. Ask anybody in the district about Captain Charlie. Okay, okay. Nothing bad about anybody here, except for that bird. Yeah. Well, I'd better get him off that roof. Well, don't you bring him back in here. You won't have that thing screaming at me. Oh, like... be quiet, Sadie. Somebody else trying to get him off that roof, too. Huh? Very popular bird. No, no, stay there. I can make it around the ledge. Just stay in your room. Easy now, boy. I'll be up there and get you in just a minute now. Keep the big trap shut, will you? Less noise now, that's huh. the stuff. Don't you know, a seaman. Hey. Now we got you, baby. Would have been easier to climb up with a ladder. What? Bird watching society. You always chew tobacco when you go parrot hunting? Beat it, will you, buddy? I don't want no trouble. I don't blame you. Not on a slippery roof. Stay out of it, Mac. Hey, don't reach for that bird. I want to talk to you. I ain't the type. Stay where you are, I said. Drop that, drop that, drop that. Hold still, you blast. Yeah, now look what you did. That's the kitchen flue he's climbing into. Now we can all have fun getting him out. Yeah, well, let him stay there. Forget him. You're the one I want. There's a little matter of people dropping oh, dead. Oh, no, you all... don't, Mac. I had enough. I don't want no trouble. This is where I came from. Oh, don't try that. Hey, you... So long, sucker. Look out. You, you'll slip. Look out. Drop dead, drop dead. Valentine, you're the oh, one. Oh, stop it, Johnson. Drink your coffee. Yeah. And for everybody here, folks, help yourselves. The seaman isn't dead, Lieutenant. His skull wasn't fractured. So we gotta wait for hospital reports before we can get him to talk. Johnson, for the tenth time, leave. Everybody, get out of here. There's a genius working on a story. That's all for now. Bring it up, bring it up. George. All right, they've gone now. So come here, brace me, Angel. Then you can beat it, brace too. Brace you? What in the name? George, get off of that stove. Oh, it's a big one. Got a big ear, man. What? The flu. Hope he's all right. Yeah, now I can reach him. Oh, where are you, boy? Come on, come on. Oh, brother, suit, grease, and cobwebs. You mean he's been there all this time, the parrot? I hope he's in here. Hope I can reach him. Yeah. Sure, here we go. Look at the poor thing. Yeah. Well, I'll clean him up a little. He'll be all right. But George, what are you going to do with him? I wouldn't touch that bird if it laid golden eggs. All right, hold still there, Abner. Now, Brooksy, listen. we got to find out once and for all if this bird really does have anything to do with all the crazy stuff going on here. You're sure hard to convince. Hey, hey, get off my coffee. If you're thirsty, boy, we'll get you a drink. Now, Brooksy, you go in the bar where Johnson is. Give me five minutes head start, then tell people I found the parrot and took off down the alley. Well, of all the well, this is the only way to find out, isn't it? To see who comes after me. The bird itself can't have any value, but maybe somebody thinks it does. Or... Drop that. Drop that. Oh, 
Brooksy. Now, look, just because everybody who's been around this long-nosed chicken has gotten into all trouble... All right, all right, I'll do it. But there must be easier ways to find the end of a story. Okay, bird. Let's get some of the grease off your feathers. Bird of ill omen, huh? Big mystery bird. Oh, you like that, huh? Well, get yourself all stretched, because in about five minutes we'll go outside and see if anybody meets us. We'll find out just how dangerous it is to hang on to you when you're... Drop you know... that, drop that, drop that. Hey, hey, shh, cut it out, cut it out, will you? That's drop that, drop that, huh? drop, drop. What? Hey, bird, snap out of it. What's the matter with you? Hey, Abner, come on, boy, come on. That... This, there's nothing wrong. Oh, brother, drop that, huh? Coffee. The coffee you took a drink of my coffee. Brooksy. Johnson, what? John. George, listen to me. Can't you hear me? Here. Here, slap him with the wet towel some more. I'll do it, I'll do it, Captain. That you... stuff can't hurt him any. Get you and your crazy joint. Get out of here. All right, all right. Oh. You you all drink that stuff, too? Oh, George, here, now, don't move. <sighs> you told me five minutes. It was five minutes before anybody even started yeah. to look for you. Sure, sure, sure. Just me, huh? Just my coffee. We're not all dead, huh? Valentine, I regret never to mind, say. Never mind, I know. I'll lost it up again. An old-fashioned knockout drop, eh? Keep them behind the bar. Naturally, the wood in this kind of a place. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The bird. He's all right, George. And making a lot more sense than you are. Okay, Johnson. Somebody dope my coffee. Everybody had a chance. Everybody knew I was going to be here alone. But at least it proves that somebody right here, doesn't it? Hmm. You nominate the seaman? Yes, but why did this happen, George? We found you and the bird hadn't been touched. Hey, or... did you move me? What? Here, I'll help you. No, get no, up. don't touch me. If it wasn't the bird they were after, it was me. Only why me? What have I got that they... That got? hundred bucks. Look in your pocket. See what was taken. Yeah. I thought I had it in this pocket. Oh, the wallet's okay. Everything else? 50, 70, 80, 90. No, it's all there. Well, nobody'd commit crimes just for that amount of money anyway. No, no, of course not. So get on your feet. We start all over at the beginning. Johnson, I think better on the floor. You know, all this business could be awfully simple. Sure, Hindus and parrots and sea captains This thing and... with me could be a mistake. Limey could just have fallen down the stairs. The first guy we already know was just slugged and rolled. I think you'd better stand up, George. Okay. Too far-fetched, huh? But a desperate man might hope that's the way it'd go down. Like what, man? Like why? What are you talking about? Captain Charlie's respectable, isn't he, Johnson? Honest and good with the police. That's right, for years. And the same goes for the people he's kept under his wing. Morton, Limey, Sadie. Sure, sure, sure. Charlie keeps the place clean, all right. Only, what's that got to all do right, with... now listen. A foreign sailor comes in with a parrot last night and all blazes breaks loose. Everybody's imagination dives off in seven directions. It isn't imagination that the bird was involved in every crime, though, is it? Here with you, with Limey who took care of him, with a sailor who brought him in? Sure, and you get so wound up, you don't notice something else that was involved with everyone. What, George? The money that paid for the parrot. Huh? But you just said that dough in your pocket hadn't been touched. I thought I had it in the other pocket, that's all. But suppose while I was out, suppose the reason I was dope was to get at that money and do something with it. Now, look, if it's there, it's there. And that something was the last crime that needed to be done. From here on, the mysteries could stop. George, for heaven's sake, tell me... Okay, Angel, okay, words of one syllable. Suppose in this place one person isn't so respectable, being fooling Charlie along with everybody else for years. And last night, Limey broke a door, a lock. Why would anybody lock a door around here, incidentally? But who are you... Fr- because Charlie needed $25 more to make up the 100 the sailor wanted for his bird, remember? Well, Limey got it all right. He found it in Morton's room. Well? Well, Johnson, from there on, one, two, three. Morton was mad, remember? But the sailor had already gone. Then the sailor was slugged and rolled. But if it was Morton, he couldn't find the money he wanted to get back. George, Limey didn't have any money, Limey so- was a weasel. Suppose he got to asking Morton about that money he took. Suppose he caught on to what I'm catching on to. So Morton killed him, scared to death of discovery now, with one accidental murder already to his credit. All right, then came me. Do you want to bet I was dope so that 25 of that 100 could be replaced with a different 25? Holy smoke. Sure, that's right. Replaced with genuine money. George, Morton's a printer, isn't he? You got it. His press must be in the locked room. He printed menus, remember? Green ones with pictures of Lincoln and Washington and people like that on them. That's the idea. And it explains everything. A counterfeiter. 
trying to keep from being discovered. Well, come on. Don't just stand there. Martin. Hey, Martin. Well, he was here just a second ago. He ran upstairs when you came out of the kitchen. There he goes. Martin, stop. Sergeant, Sergeant, get him. Ah, that, Hold it, Angel. Let the police do the rest. Hey, what's going on anyway? Look, ma'am, ain't this a lovely bird? You know, someday I'm going to get me a rubber plant, and then... Oh, but George, even if Martin did commit those crimes, it still doesn't explain everything. There's still that tobacco-chewing seaman who fell off the roof and the parrot... Hey, hey, you didn't start this story. You did. So stick around a minute, and I'll give him the rest of it. You're right, Brooksy. There are a lot of questions that still need answering. So, while George is getting his story straight, suppose we all give this story a listen. Yes, he was a counterfeiter, I understand. All he wanted was to get his $25 back. But the seaman, George, Oh, yes, yes, yes. The mysterious man chewing tobacco. Why well, use a little logic? The sick, the foreigner who was so anxious to sell the bird in a hurry didn't speak English. Yes, that made it all the so more... So where did his bird learn to say drop dead? Oh. Yeah, and every clue Yule gave me about him suggested the obvious. The sick had stolen the bird and was trying to sell quickly before the guy he stole it from caught up with him. You telephoned the hospital, huh? Well, this might not be all clairvoyance, but sure. The seaman didn't want to get mixed up in any trouble, but he still wanted his bird back. Huh. His bird. And that's all there was to it? Oh, my beautiful, romantic story of the waterfront. With all those strange characters. Watch it, watch it. Don't get carried away again. Oh, dear. My beautiful story. Anyway, cheer up, Mr. Yule. Maybe you could sell it to one of those mystery shows on the radio. Sure. Call it Drop Dead. Just in case we lost you somewhere along the way, George Valentine was played by Robert Bailey and Brooksy played by Virginia Gregg. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the tale and Eddie Dunstetter played the music. Now this is yours truly inviting you to our next visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say... Have you got any skeletons hanging in the closet? If so, dig them out and set them by the radio, because we have a dandy story that's going to make them feel right at home. It's called Uncle Harry's Bones, and it's complete, all except for his floating ribs he lost somewhere between 18th and 19th on Chestnut Street. Now, where they keep Uncle Harry's mortal remains, only time will tell. Besides, George Valentine has to have something to do for the next little while. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to go around saying, let George do it which would not be good, since that is his aim in life. Anyway, if the maestro will throw us a bone in E-flat, we'll get on with the epic. My dear Mr. Valentine, you will please report to me at the Stedman Farm. That's two miles down the road from Pine Lake if you turn right at the Red Silk Post Office, or the house with the unpainted shutters if you come over the hill. 
I want you to clearly understand that you're working for me, no matter what anybody says. And Lordy knows the people around here know how to say things. For instance, they all say Uncle Harry is their uncle, but he's not. He's mine, and nobody else's. Mr. Valentine, please come quick. My trouble is, I don't know if Uncle Harry is Uncle Harry, or somebody else's who's not important. I've got to find out. Now, don't you think? Sincerely, Sophie Sturdivant. <laughs> Hey, friend. Hey, you. What's your trouble? Hello. We're looking for the Sturdivant place. Oh, well, down the road, past the hill. If you're looking for Doc Sellers, he's just gone into town, I think. Doc Sellers? Who's he? No, it's Sophie Sturdivant we wanted to see. Oh, Sophie. Her. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Eh, nothing. Doc's her brother. He's all right. Well, what's the matter with her? Nothing. Okay, thanks. Look out for your foot. Hey, hold up, hold up. Don't see many strangers around here. Where are you from? Looney Bin? Uh, Looney Bin? Sure. Uh, Sophie's all right. What are you driving at, Buster? My name's Dorky. What are you driving at? Say, tell me something. Where does Sophie's Uncle Harry live? Who? Uncle Harry. Some kind of a character around here, I get it. Nope. No Uncle Harry around here. But she wrote... Uh, Look, this is a nice, peaceful place. People don't like strangers making trouble. None of my business, none of yours. Let well enough alone, I say... You'll live longer. You know what I'd do if I were George? Go back to town. Ah, but not fearless Valentine. Besides, he's got Brooksy there to help him. Just like I've got this to help you. Now let's see if George and Brooksy took the old-timers' advice to get out of town. Nope, I guess they didn't. Because there they are, walking up to Sophie's front door. It's kind of a run-down place, isn't it? And all the places around here seem to be, George. Yeah. Mrs. Sturdivan? The door's open. She's probably out back in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Mrs. Sturdivan? Sophie! Hmm. She's not in the kitchen, George. Of course she isn't, huh? Oh, what do you think does the cooking around here, anyway? Uh, hello. Yeah. We didn't mean to walk right here. must in. be Doc Sellers. Well, I ain't Abraham Lincoln. You looking for Sophie? Uh-huh. I'm George Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. I've seen your car out there. Just come in myself. Hey, sis! Come to the party. You're a doctor, are you? Sure, sure. <laughs> you want a pill? <laughs> Here. Oh. <laughs> Pretty good size, huh? <laughs> no, I haven't practiced for years, but I still got these. I was over trying to unchoke a neighbor's horse yesterday. Eminent sawbones, that's me. Uh Uh-huh, you're a vet. Yep. (laughs) Retired livestock killer. Sophie! Hey, Sophie! Upstairs, I guess, working on a butterfly collection. Come on through. Sophie, for the love... She must have fallen down the stairs, George. I'm all right. I'm Here, all right. Get her over to the couch. I'm all right. Um, Ox, what'd you do? Tip over your own feet? Oh, here, let me. She didn't fall downstairs. Huh? Yes, I did. That's what I must have done. But how did your face get those blotches on it? How'd you get that black eye? Uh, no one hit me. What'd you say that for? I mean, I, I fell, that's all. Look, did somebody slap you, knock you no, down? No, 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 no. Well, who was it? Why? When did it happen? Oh, stop it. Stop it. Now. We've come to help you, Sophie. So I want you to tell us what... Oh. Huh? Huh? What are you looking at me for? No reason. Just wondered why she's still so scared. Oh, no, that's ridiculous. Doc's my brother. Oh, hey, Douglas! Douglas, come on in here. Is Douglas with you? Yeah, I just got back from looking at the old office. Oh, what did you find? Nothing, not a blame thing. Oh, look, both of you, what are you talking about? Yes, Doc, what is it? What do you want? Hey, Valentine, Miss Brooks, Douglas Kent. Just says your law, I'm not the kind of man beats up his own sister. Uh, how do you do? Hi. I... Sophie, what's happened? I'm all right, Douglas. Doug, here's another crazy, eager beaver like Sophie is, Mr. Valentine. Going off half-cocked whenever mm-hmm. he gets... Mr. Valentine's here to help us. Isn't that right, Sophie? He's here to help find out. Oh, look, will somebody please explain what this is all about? No. 
No, I I think that perhaps I was wrong. What? Mr. Valentine, I shouldn't have been so hasty in writing. Uncle Harry, that's what it's all about. Uncle Harry? No. No. Douglas and I only thought... Oh, be quiet, Soph. You started it, let's finish it. Come here, I'll show him to you. Show him? Uncle Harry, the great Uncle Harry, so they say. There, see for yourself. <gasps> oh! Skeleton. Nothing but a skeleton. Uncle Harry's bones. Says you. I was out fishing in the lake, Mr. Valentine, and my line got tangled, and here he is. But just a skeleton. I don't see how you can tell. Who was Uncle Harry? Man disappeared five years ago. Man who bought out the breeding farms, a hermit. Sophie's uncle. Uh Uh-huh. Well, look, I don't know much about anatomy, but is a shin bone supposed to look like this? Well... Go on, Doc. Tell him. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Jump to conclusions. Yeah. I made the mistake of remembering that I once set a fracture for Harry. That's all. It's what I get for play in M.D. We've been downtown looking for the x-rays in Doc's old office. We were going to the barn, too, to check in his old trunks and things. You see, I thought that if we could find the x-ray that he took five years ago, it might give us a positive way of identifying... Bones are bones. It's not going to tell you anything. How about this? Piece of rusty wire tangled around his leg. George. The lake is full of stuff. It don't mean anything either. But it means something if we knew his leg was tied with wire before he died. Exactly, Mr. Valentine. That's just the way yeah, I... Yeah, see, everybody who reads mysteries goes off half-cocked. Well, what kind of a skeptic are you, Doc? Why don't you think it's Uncle Harry? Mister, I don't think one way or another. Only lots of people come up summers to fish in that lake. Could be practically anybody. Okay, Doc, I'm going to go with you to keep looking for that x-ray. Douglas, get the local sheriff up here as fast as you can. And tell him to send for a police x-ray man, too. Brooksy, take care of Sophie. Look, I- I'm just as upset about Sophie as Don't you are. Don't bother, Doc. I finally got the idea. It's a skeleton in the closet we're after. Well, come on, then. We're going to start opening doors. <laughs> Set the blame leg in the first place if there was a real sawbones around. Last a bunch of recluses in this part of the woods. Yes, sir. Did you try this box here? Old Sears Roebuck catalogs. Ugh. Blasted cobwebs. Hey, how about the tin one? Uh, oh, yeah, let me see. Your x ray stuff ought to be boxed up somewhere that you could find hey, it. Hey, Doc, where are you? Oh, is that you, Sheriff? Right here. Uh, may I meet Mr. Valentine? Worse than cleaning out an old attic. Why? Don't stick your paw at me, young man. Wow, wow, wow. What's your trouble, Sheriff? Don't you like to know what's going on in your territory? I know all about it. Don't need any city boys to come telling me what my job is. Uncle Harry disappeared five years ago. Let's leave him that way, I say. Uh huh. You're not interested in skeletons, huh? Sheriff, I think I'd like to have a little talk with oh, you before quit we. Put your blab and give us your pocket knife. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah just airtight box. Maybe you've got it. I. Don't know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that looks like negatives. That... Hey, look out for that spider. <laughs> yeah, open up closets. Got to expect to be in bit. Here. Let's see. Uh huh. Oh, that's that's a horse, isn't it? Uncle Harry, horse, spider. What difference does it make? Uncle Harry, there you are. Yeah, name, date, chin bone. Yeah. That's him, all right. Here, let's get it in the line. Well, Doc, well, could be the same as the skeleton. Yeah, looks the same to me. Set crooked on top there. Like a hundred others, I suppose. Holy smokes, Mr. Valentine, I can't tell for Sheriff, sure. did you get that police x-ray man? Yeah, over at the house. Mr. Kennedy. Okay, give me that x-ray. Come on. Absolutely, there's no question about it. But isn't it true lots of people have broken bones, Kennedy? I'll be glad to swear before a jury that this is the same bone. Before a jury? Of course, Mr. Valentine. Hasn't anyone here noticed the fracture in the skull? Mm. Here, right here. Why, no. Enough to cause death, I should say, in that location. I will also testify that the fracture must have been made before the body became a skeleton. In other words, the x-ray proves it's Uncle Harry. Precisely. And the combination of fracture and wire around the legs unquestionably proves that he was murdered. 
There you are. Quite simple. Murder. Uncle Harry, all right, Sheriff, but the important thing is who did sure, it. Sure, sure, Sophie. Now me and Mr. Mallantyne have... Wait a minute. To... Listen to Young her. lady, I've known Sophie for years, and anything... But she that knows you... who killed him. She what? Of course I do. And I always knew it had happened, too. And that's why I hired you, Mr. Valentine, to catch him. Somewhere in Manitoba, Canada, I think, was the last place. You know, he sends me checks. You see, that's because he feels guilty about the way he treats me. Gary was a skin flint, a miser, a bloodsucker. I've sent descriptions. I've had detectives after him lots of times, but they've never been able hey, to catch him. Wait a minute, him. wait a minute, please, she, both of you. She's talking about her husband, George, her second well, husband. He only married me because of Uncle Harry's money, and I was the relative, but Uncle Harry was too smart for him. He'd never give him any. Oh, no, not him. Sophie, why do you... Bunker, his name is, and when you find him, you'll hang him, won't you, Mr. Valentine? I know Bunker did it. He always said he got Harry's money, and five years ago he did it, don't you see? And then he disappeared. Hold it, hold it, would you please? This Bunker, what happened? Was he a husband that ran away from you? <gasps> I beg your pardon? I sent him away, don't you understand? He was no good, and I sent him away. That's why I'm using my first husband's name. Bunker was a lying cheat, and he killed Uncle Harry, and I sent him away before I knew what he'd done. <laughs> well, get him, that's all. Get him and hang him. <laughs> And now, Valentine, will you listen to the voice of reason for a minute? Bunker ran away from Sophie in San Francisco, but it was two months before Uncle Harry disappeared. Oh. Sophie's just a little cracked on the subject, that's all. As I figure, Bunker's the one person probably didn't kill Uncle Harry. Forget him. What do you mean? Lonely area around here. Anything can happen. Nobody will be able to remember. Five years is a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I understand it all now. It isn't just the skeleton in her closet, is it? Nope. Yeah, Sophie wanted me to prove it was Uncle Harry so she could prove it was her no-good husband who did it. Instead, now we've got to solve a five-year-old crime that everybody else would have to have hushed up. Because everybody in the whole area is a suspect for murder. And you know who'll get the last laugh? <laughs> Uncle Harry's bones. <laughs> Now, tell me, how is that possible? For Uncle Harry to start laughing, that is. It isn't. Not unless all that's left of Harry is his funny bone, which is a nice, happy thought. However, in case it didn't hit you quite right, here's something that's not off the elbow. It seems your client, Sophie, is the only one who ever liked Uncle Harry. Everyone else, including the sheriff, would prefer to let sleeping dogs lie. And if your name is George Valentine, you know how hopeless it will be to try to solve a five-year-old crime when everyone in town is a suspect. Sheriff Harry was a miser, wasn't he? A hermit and a miser. What are you getting at? I don't know. Gold. Misers have gold, don't they? Of course they do. If they're smart, like Harry was. Well, sure, that's why he was killed, I guess. What do you mean? Well, most of his money was in property. But people always said he had a good many thousand dollars stashed away somewhere. Somewhere like where? Ooh, up around that place of his. I could never find any. And I'm the one who boarded the place up after he disappeared. Oh, Uncle Harry's place. You mean, you mean there's a house, a farm or something? It's a cabin. Nothing but a cabin. Well, come on, Brooksy. What are we waiting for? It's about a mile around the lake from here. I boarded her up solid in case he ever came back. George, what about Sophie? Never mind her. Now I know who smacked her. Not much of a cabin for a rich man, is it? No. Yeah. 
Oh. At least he kept it neat and clean. Turn your flashlight over here. Oh. Just a desk, that's all. You think there's any point in going through it? Not if you're looking for money. Listen. Oh, it's just the wind, I guess. Hey, wait, Brooksy. What? A brick out of the fireplace. Yeah, a nice little hole underneath. Well, maybe Uncle Harry did have some money. Sure, of course he did. What's the matter? Hole in the mattress. Place for a box, or... Oh. Hey, look out. Oh, I tripped. <laughs> well, there's nothing funny about it. Yes, there is. Loose board, ain't it? This place is honeycomb with old hiding spots. Yeah. All of them empty. Look. Look, here's a coin. This one wasn't empty. I mean, once upon a time. None of them were, from the looks of it. I mean, that doesn't quite make sense, does it? What do you mean, George? You know, with the kind of tough old guy that Harry must have been. I don't... Duck, duck, Angel. What? Get down, get down. Turn off that flashlight. Hey, George. Take it easy now. This is who I think it is. The man with the shovel. I can see him in the Shh. doorway. All right, shut the door, Buster. There's a draft. Uh, Never you... mind the match. George, look out for the shovel. Get away from all right, I guess now we can have some light, Angel. Well, it's our neighbor. What's your name? Dorky, that right? Let go of me. Sure, sure, I'll let go. The man who warned us away, the man who said Sophie was the just The man who ridiculous. warned Sophie away, you mean? What? I did not. You got mad and hit her, too. That's assault. Now, look, listen to All me. a matter of geography. I remember what she wrote me about the two roads. And Doc Sellers and Douglas went to town this morning. That's in the other direction from your place by the hill. So how did you know that Doc had gone to town? He wouldn't have gone past you. That's the wrong direction. So I guess you knew he was gone because you'd been over there. Sophie herself must have told you where he was. All right. Don't prove anything. No, but your shovel does. I wondered why a guy who'd committed murder five years ago would be stupid enough to commit an overt act today. Murder? Now, look, I hated Uncle Harry, I sure, but I... didn't say you did, did I? Relax, relax, Buster. You're just a little greedy, that's all. Come digging for the miser's cash. George, I don't understand. When people thought Uncle Harry disappeared, they'd naturally assume he took his loot with him. Now it seems he was murdered. That makes it a little different. Nobody alive would be smart enough to kill him and find all of it. An old cowhide skin flint like that. I know, I know. That's why you wanted Sophie to stop raising alarm. If everybody knew for sure Uncle Harry was dead, why, you'd get trampled in the rush up here. He built me out of some of my property. You can't blame me Buster, for Buster, I'm you... not blaming you for anything. That's not my job. Now get out. Go on. Go home. George, why don't Come I... on. Come on. You heard me. There isn't any gold around here. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Don't you understand? We're all through with this case. <laughs> Oh, sure, coroner. There's not much to say. I've given him a testimony. He's identified the body. That's all we need from Doc Sellers. Well, Sheriff, who has got something to say? I understood this fellow, Valentine, had caught somebody up at Uncle Harry's shack. I know this isn't a court, but we sure want to hear everything that... I haven't got anything to add, coroner. Now, see here, Valentine. No, no, coroner. I'm all through with this case. Yeah, I'm on my way back to the city. Valentine. Yeah, yeah, what was the idea back there at the, at the inquest? There's no idea, Doc. Well, see here, if you think our sheriff is capable... The sheriff's all right, Douglas. Yeah, big compliment. <laughs> he only wishes it were true. All right, now listen, all of you. Uncle Harry was a heel. The whole town wished him dead. Sheriff, when the skeleton was found, your idea was to let sleeping dogs lie, huh? Well, not exactly, but holy smoke, we got to live with the people you know. This place has been pretty nice for the past five years. Well, then... We'll take care of Dorky, all right. For but... assault, that's all, Sheriff. That's your business. Yeah, but now I got a murder to solve. You help get this rolling, you can't just walk all off. All right, and... all right. Keep your shirt on, Sheriff. You won't have to nail anybody in your town for murder. But you said that the well, mur- let's start at the beginning. Five years ago, Uncle Harry, the hermit, the miser, the boy with the gold. Somebody comes and tries to get his gold. Kills him, takes his gold. But you've been up to the cabin, Sheriff. How did the killer find all the loot? In at least three separate hiding spots. Well, he could have twisted the old boy's arm or dug around. Nothing was disturbed. He went right to the spots. Yeah, I remember. And if he got rough with Harry, would Harry have told him where all the spots were? Well, no. 
I see what you mean. No, you don't, Douglas. Maybe Sophie's an unhappy, bitter woman, but uh, she had the right idea. Sheriff sent some telegrams to, uh, where was it she got her last money order from? Someplace in Manitoba, Canada? Bunker, that, that no good husband of hers, he's the one. Bunker? Well, I grant you, he could have come up here after he left Sophie in San Francisco. You guess nobody would have known if he was out at Harry's place. Yeah, but she's had detectives looking for Bunker, tracing those little, those little money orders he sent once in a while. Oh, that's right. They ain't been able to find him, Valentine. Okay, okay. But, Doc, you wouldn't be able to lie about x-rays of anybody who's still around here, would you? I mean, right out in public court and all? No, 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 you couldn't do that. You'd be caught up. What are you talking about? Perjury. I waited just long enough for you to commit perjury at the coroner's inquest, Doc. What are you... What are you talking about? A tin box with a live spider in it. Spider? Yeah, that's what gave me the idea, and it's the only way to explain everything. Suppose the spider got in there when the box was open, say, a few days ago. By Doc alone. You're crazy. No more than your sister is. Suppose you switch some x-rays. We'll tie that together with what I said about Uncle Harry's hiding places. There's only one person who could have gone right to the hiding places. And that's Uncle Harry himself. No, now look. But he couldn't do that if he were dead, could he? All right, then. Suppose Doc here once treated a fracture for Bunker. Bunker? Yeah. Oh, boy, that would... Yeah, hey. simple as that. Five-year-old crime. Man killed another man, threw him in the lake. And now, because his sister would inherit some property and so on, Doc decides to make the skeleton into Uncle Harry, when it's really the skeleton of Bunker. That's not true. Now, Sheriff, you've got to believe me. Perjury, I Doc. Perjury, remember? Uh. But, Sheriff, I think the reason detectives haven't been able to trace Bunker is pretty simple now, don't you? Wrong description. Just send a description to Canada of Uncle Harry. They'll get him all right. <laughs> and there you are, Sheriff. Instead of just a bunch of bones... Uncle Harry is a real live murderer. Uncle Harry? Well, I'll... Hey, Valentine, wait a minute. Where are you going? Back to the gal what brung me. Sophie. Yeah, there's a lot more important stuff to clear up in this case than dead skeletons. Yes, yeah, Sheriff, I got a live client to drag out of her closet. A gal who hired me and then slammed doors in my face. Why? Well, in a couple of seconds, I'll find out. You know, I'm kind of sorry for old Sophie. I've got a feeling that when George gets through with her, she'll be sorry the story wasn't called Aunt Sophie's Bones. But while we're waiting for the worst, let's give a listen to the best. He hated Harry. Bunker hated Harry. Sure, Sophie. He must have come here to get some money out of Harry, and, well, Harry defended himself, I guess. It's been sweet of Uncle Harry to send me the money orders all this time, even if it is trapping him. Mm, I wouldn't be too sure it was sweet. It's kept the illusion that Bunker was still alive. He'd do that on purpose. Oh, yes. Perhaps. In fact, I wouldn't be too sure you love that uncle as much as you claim. I think you just hated Bunker. But now Bunker's dead. Now you know he's dead. People can waste a lot of time hating, can't they? Oh, Sophie, I'll tell you something. You wasted a lot of our time before I caught on why you hired me, then didn't want to talk. Well, I, I told you you were working. Well, I didn't think it was just Dorky's getting rough. It was the fact you began to remember whose leg had really been fractured, wasn't it? Well, I, I couldn't understand what the doc was up to. <laughs> I'm so glad it was only perjury. Makes me feel much better. He'd been willing to wait another two years. You might have had Uncle Harry declared legally dead and collected his property that way. Yeah, but Doc wouldn't wait, that's all. Too good an opportunity. <laughs> and the ironic part is, if it had worked, Uncle Harry couldn't have done anything about the inheritance slipping away from him. Not without admitting the whole story. Well, I can see why Doc was tempted, all right. Doc hated Harry. Such a waste of time. And you said that before. About hatred being a waste of time. I collect butterflies, you know. People say I have about as much brains as one. But anybody who wastes time is uh, crazy. Uh, sure. Butterflies, I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> He's stupid, isn't he? <laughs> Doesn't learn any lessons from seeing what happens from, from an unhappy marriage. Don't worry, Sophie. I'm the teacher. What? 
Hey, what is this? Come along, George. Time to say good night. Oh, now you haven't seen my butterfly collection. You come upstairs with me and I'll show you my real prizes. <laughs> Well, you can hang Buster back in the closet now. It's all over. Oh, but before you do, be sure to tell it that uh, George Valentine was played by Robert Bailey and Virginia Gregg played Brooksy. The story was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and Eddie Dunstetter dug up the music. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Oh, hi, Harry. What's on your mind? I have a case for you, a very important one. Good. Tell me about it. John, did you ever hear of Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote? Lord, who... Say that slowly, will you? Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote. Sorry, I left my kilts and bagpipes on the other side of the drink. Huh? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling real sharp this morning. But what about this Laird Douglas Douglas something or other? Uh, can you come down here to Philadelphia and see me? I hate to be so blunt about it, old boy, but what's in it for me? A nice retainer fee in any event. Well, good. And, of course, expenses and your regular commission if anything happens to Laird Douglas Douglas. Of Hedderscope. Uh, why, yes. Okay, Harry, I'm on my way. Oh, oh John. Yeah? Uh, come down by plane, will you? The first one you can get. Urgent, huh? Yes, John. Very. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Harry Branson at the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter, whoever Laird Douglas Douglas is, and whether investigation is the proper term at this point, who knows. In any event, well... Expense account item one, 2250, air transportation and miscellaneous, Hartford to New York to Philadelphia. For a change, I decided to stay at the Benjamin Franklin, not only because it was convenient to Harry Branson's office on Walnut Street, that is, the office of Philly Mutual Liability and Casualty, but because I'd heard it was a nice hotel. It was. And it was convenient to everything else in the center of town. Theaters, good restaurants, nice stores, even a nightclub. Well, anyhow, when I got to my room, I found a half dozen urgent messages that Harry had called. Pretty good indication that his lordship, Douglas Douglas, of, or at least this case, was pretty important. So instead of bothering to unpack, I had the bellboy dump my luggage, tipped him, and was standing there debating whether I'd better forego a quick shower and change of clothes when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. John, didn't you get my messages? Why haven't you called? I've been waiting to hear from you. What's wrong? Hey, take it easy, Harry. I just this minute got in. Oh. Well, I hope you're coming right on over here to my office. Well, what's the matter? Something happened to this client of yours? No, not yet. But being you, you're expecting the worst, huh? And look, you still haven't told me a thing about this emergency or whatever you want to call it. John, it is an emergency because of the time element. You see, why do we waste time on the phone? Well, this was your call, not mine. All right, all right, I'm sorry. I'll be waiting for you. And Harry, I'll be there. Still knowing nothing whatsoever about what was going on, I decided I'd better be prepared for anything. So I slipped the 38 cold out of my bag and took it along. Expense account item two, 65 cents, cab fare. I've said it before when I handled the Amerigo case for him. Harry Branson is a good insurance man, but a worry wart. So I kind of hoped he was making the usual mountain out of the usual molehill this time. However, when my cab pulled up in front of his office building, he was standing waiting on the sidewalk out front. Hey, I keep the change. Thank you, sir. 
John. John, what took you so long? Huh? Thank goodness you're here. Harry, what are you doing out here? Lose your office or just forget the key? I almost wish I had. John, we have a problem. A serious one. Yeah, with Laird Douglas... Douglas of, uh... Heatherscoat. Heatherscoat. He's up in my office yeah, now. Sounds like international intrigue. Has Scotland declared war on us or something? This is no time for levity. He's up in the office now, and you must take over immediately. It's a very serious situation. Come. Okay. Oh, now, what's it all about? Has Laird Douglas died and... Oh, no, no, you said he was up in your office. And I'm sure you don't mean just his body. Yes, he's there with Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Kelly Van... Huh? Are you kidding? I certainly am not. You see, she insists that you act as his bodyguard. Oh, now, wait a minute, Harry. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately for you... 13th floor, please. Yes, sir. Unfortunately... I said 13th floor, operator. Please, quickly. Yes, sir. So, Harry? Unfortunately... Young man, will you please start this elevator immediately? Got to wait for the signal, sir. Signal? This is an emergency. Take off immediately. Emergency? Yes, it involves Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope. Oh, well, sure, if it's... Who? Good man, good man. <sighs> okay. Now, you were saying, Harry... Uh, was I? Uh, unfortunately, something. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Fortunately for you, she was quite cognizant of the fact... Who was that... cognizant? Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. She knew about the excellent work you did for us in connection with the Ricardo Amerigo case not long ago. Excellent detective work, she called it. Thirteenth floor. You remember the case, Ricardo, the concert violinist who disappeared, presumably. Yeah, murdered. I remember. And your almost intuitive deduction that he wasn't dead at all, but had merely staged the whole thing to make it uh, look as the... Harry. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Thirteenth floor. You mean uh, Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van... Excuse me, mister, but I'm getting signals from the other floors. Mm, quite right, you should. As I started to say, John... She is one of our biggest personal policy holders. Good, good. But uh, hadn't we better get into your office and meet her? Oh, yes, yes. But I want you to know about the personal premiums. Alone, they run to something over $20,000 a year. Mr. Please. Well, she is an important client. Yes, yes. And that's why I Mr. didn't... Mr. Williams, I didn't please? hesitate to accede to her request that you be called in on this case. I called you and here you are. Mr. Please. Hmm? Oh, well, get us up to the... Th oh, oh, we're here. Why didn't you tell us? Come, John. Mister, if I was to tell you what I'd like to, I... My office is right this way, John. Come, please. Hey, look, you better calm down, Harry, and give me the dope on this case right from the beginning. Yes. Yes, I'd better. All right. Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten is a very important client, has been for years. So you said. But there are a lot of things you haven't said, like... Uh... What has she got to do with this Laird Douglas character, and why is he so important? It's this way, John. The policy on him runs to $5,000. No double indemnity, which is good. As a matter of fact, the policy on him was purely a favor to Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. You know, considering such short life expectancy and all. No, I don't know. Is he in his dotage or something? Well, hardly. Or are you being facetious again? But you said... Hey, how old is he? His birthday is next month, May 7th to be exact. He'll be four years old. Hip four? That's right. Short life expectancy? Of course, you see, John. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, some horrible disease or something, huh? What's the matter with him? John, you wanted this from the beginning, so I'll give it to you from the beginning. Okay, but Harry, If it you're... hadn't been for Mrs. Van Pyten's own policies totaling something in the neighborhood of half a million, uh, more in fact... Harry... Why, we'd never have written the one on Lord Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat. So, now we've cleared that up. Harry, we passed your office three or four doors ago. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yeah. But uh, as I'm sure you understand, I wanted to give you some of the background before you talk with Mrs. Van Pyten. After all, you asked for it. Yes, yes, I guess I did. But uh, what you've given me so far has landed me smack dab in the Department of Utter Confusion. And I'm beginning to think maybe I have company. Oh, where? Who? Right here. You, Harry. Now, look. Why don't we quietly stroll into your office and let me get the whole thing from Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten herself? Or better still, from Laird Douglas Douglas. But you couldn't. Of course not. What? At least not from him. Oh, why not? John, will you please stop joking? Who's joking? This is serious business. Very. <sighs> Look, Harry. Yes? There is one thing I'd like to talk over before we go in to see him. Them. Somebody. Yes? Yeah? Well, apparently the life and or welfare of this Laird Douglas Douglas is in danger. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I thought I'd made that very clear to you. Yeah, well, you said you've written only a $5,000 policy on him. That's right, $5,000. And purely... Yeah, as yeah, a... yeah, I know all about that. 
Now, look, I don't want to seem crass about it, Harry, but my commission, if anything were to happen to him, wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. Which is precisely why I told you you will be paid a retainer while you're on the case. A most generous one. A generous one? By you? By Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. How much? Well, John, <clears throat> now mind you, this may not require your services for more than a week or so. As bodyguard, that is. How much? And, of course, she has authorized an expense account. Ah. But, mind you, John, not the usual kind that you seem to have the knack of piling up beyond all reason. Clearly, a completely honest, legitimate accounting... Harry, that... how much? But as a matter of cold fact, I have assured her that it will total no more than the amount of the retainer she is prepared to pay you. Any more than that, and, uh... Well, you'll have a lot of explaining to do. Harry... How much is this retainer to be, if I take the case? I might even go so far. $750 per week, or a fraction thereof, and I am sure you will agree that that... What's the matter, John? Seven fifty a week, plus expenses, when there's only a $5,000 policy involved? That's right. But if this four-year-old Laird Douglas Douglas of... of, of, of... Had the scope. Yeah. If he's only worth a $5,000 policy... And what was that crack about short life expectancy? John, I told you he is already four years old. He... Oh, look, start all over again, will you, Harry? Yes. No, on second thought, perhaps you were right. Perhaps you'd better get the details directly from Mrs. Peter Malcolm, Malcolm Kelly, Kelly Van Pyten. I know. Now, look, Harry, I, I think I'd better. I'd better get it from somebody. You're Incidentally, not... John, you understand, of course, that your services will be required only during the affair at Bala Kinwood. And not one minute there. No, thereafter. I don't understand. What's Bala Kinwood? Out around Westchester, outside the city, one of the suburbs. Very nice suburb, too. That is where Laird Douglas Douglas... I've had this code. Yes, John, that is where he will appear. And you or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyden, or both, if you think his life will be in danger. Exactly. Oh, John, I knew you were just joking me all the time. I wish I knew. Uh, here we are, and everything will be clear. Yeah. Oh, thank heavens, dear Mr. Branson. I was afraid something had happened to you. You were gone so long. You really had me quite worried. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I had hoped to tell Mr. Dollar something of this affair, and I'm afraid we loitered on the way up. Uh, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, this is Mr. John Dollar. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I'm so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. You see, Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me. And I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but where is he? Uh, why, yes, Mrs. Van Pyten, what's happened to him? Oh, don't worry, don't worry, my dear. He's all right. But after all, he is so temperamental. I fear he got a bit impatient waiting for you. And I know you'll forgive him. You will, won't you? Yes, yes, of course, but where is he? He's asleep, Mr. Branson, in your inner office. He sat down in your chair and fell fast asleep. Oh, if I could only relax that way. But you must meet him, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I'd certainly like to. Of course you would, and I know he'll want to meet you. Gently now. Oh, good, he's awake. Oh, no. That's Laird... Laird Douglas, Douglas of Heatherscote. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hey, oh, John, hey, yes, Douglas, no. Somebody. Let go of Mr. Dollar's leg. Douglas, dear. Douglas. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's, uh, intriguing? Well, tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, I've handled some pretty doggy cases in my time, but never as a pooch's bodyguard. But suddenly this one begins to smell much too strongly of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ray Rowland, Johnny. Oh, hi, Ray. Just got your message. What are you doing in Philadelphia? Oh, a case for Philly Mutual liability and casualty, and I may need your help. What do you know about Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote? Why, he's one of Scotland's finest. Wait a minute. That's your case? Yep. Insurance? And bodyguard. How's about lunch? Johnny, have you met the... Have you met his lairdship? Yeah, and I nearly lost a leg doing it. Oh, then you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, shut up. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, in connection with my investigation, or rather my involvement in the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope matter. And I wish I'd had some idea of what I was getting into before I ever left Hartford. But it's too late now. Expense account item three, thirty-nine fifty. One pair of slacks. For well, within a few minutes of my arrival in Philadelphia, Harry Branson of Philly Mutual buttonholed me and dragged me up to his office to meet two important clients he had. First was Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I am so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me, and I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. And then came... Well, Mrs. Van Pyten made the introduction. Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Huh? Oh, no. <laughs> Holy jump of Johnny, the... Johnny Stone, no, you mustn't do that. Oh, my. Douglas oh, dear, good heavens. Get on oh, your own Douglas. chair, Harry. This no, one's taken. No. Sorry, John. Sorry. Down, Douglas. Down. Oh. There, dear. That's the boy. That's a nice boy. That yes. is now. Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote? Yes, isn't he adorable? He's so playful. He was really just playing, you know. There, dear. Come now. Harry. Yes, yes John? This yes, is the client you call me all the way down from Hartford to see? Yes, John, yes. Seven fifty a week, practically unlimited expense account. Oh, dear, just look at your trousers, Mr. Dollar. I don't need to, thanks. I can feel the draft. But you'll need new ones. Here. And I insist you let me pay for it. Down, oh, oh, Douglas, oh, oh. down. Here, Mr. Dollar. Will a hundred dollars be enough? Uh, gee. No, here, a hundred and fifty. I can see those are very, very nice. Ones. Well, uh, you see what I mean, John? Here, please. Now, I insist you take it. And if it isn't no, enough... No, 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 thanks. That's plenty. But now, Harry, you listen to John, me. John, I know what you're going to say, but as I explained to you on the way up you to my office... You explained plenty, but not nearly enough. But I tried. I really I tried. I think you and I had better have a quiet little talk, Harry, and the sooner the better. Oh, boys, please, can't you do that another time? Please come down from those chairs so Mr. Dollar can meet Douglas and we can make all the arrangements. Please? Mrs. Van Pyten, that's precisely what I want to talk about. <laughs> you really look very funny up there. And see, Douglas does want so much to be friends with you. Yeah, you're sure it isn't a piece of my leg he wants. Oh, no, of course not. Here, Mr. Dollar, just give him one of these biscuits. I have them specially baked for him. And he'll be your friend for life. Really? Huh? Here, now just come down and hand it to him. Well... He'll love you. It's true, John, I know. Yeah? Then what are you doing up on that chair? I... I forgot, that's all. Nice, Douglas. Huh? Please, Mr. Dollar. Well, hey, oh, all I hope is he doesn't forget. That's right. Just hand it and to him. And then he knows which is biscuit and which is my hand. Yo, uh, here, boy. Here, boy. Now, take it easy, take it easy. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, there you see. Now he's your friend, well, isn't that sweet? Yeah, yeah, sure is. Well, well, I'd better get back to my hotel and change and Harry, I'll call you. Oh, but we haven't made the definite arrangements yet, and I want you staying out at our place in Germantown, the Maples. It's a lovely little place, Mr. Dollar. Well, much as I hate to say it, I'm, I'm not quite sure about taking oh, this Oh, I know. The money. Well, don't you worry about it. Not at all, not one bit. If you'd rather have a thousand dollars a week, that's what we'll make it. And I do wish Mrs. you'd let Van me Pyton. do more about these poor trousers. I know. 
Why don't you go straight over to Wanamaker's men's store and have them tailor you a whole suit? Wouldn't that be nice? You'd look lovely. You've already given me more than enough to buy a suit. Oh, that. Now, just forget it. Now, you have them make you anything you want and just charge it to me. Oh, and look. Douglas Deere is licking your hand. I knew he'd like you. Never underestimate the power of a woman, somebody once said. Or maybe they should have said never underestimate the power of a fast buck or a thousand bucks. Anyhow, Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten had set her heart on my handling this whole affair, and she simply wasn't to be denied. Couple that with a chance to pick up enough loot in a few days to, uh... Well, what would you do? And the darn mutt did take a liking to me. So, with Laird Douglas Douglas in my lap... Oh, he's a Scotty, by the way. Scottish terrier, Mr. Dollar. If you'll pardon my correcting you. Sorry. And it's all because of the show at Bala Kinwid on Friday. Bala where? Uh, B-A-L-A-C-Y-N-W-I-D, John. Yes, Bala Kinwid. Laird Douglas Douglas simply must win. Not only best of class, but best of show. And he will... If somebody doesn't interfere. Oh, you uh, you think somebody might uh, might do something to to uh, Douglas? Here? I'm sure of it, because he's been tried before. You mean poison him or something like that? Worse. Oh? Dope. Poison would let him die a hero, a martyr. But drugs would keep him from winning the show. Oh, I... Well, what makes you suspect somebody might try it? As I said, it's been tried before. Huh? Last year and again a few days ago. And if Harrison R. Kenworthy thinks he can do it again, he's mistaken. Then you know who did it before. I refuse to divulge any names. But you just said... Mr. Dollar, I will not tell you. All I ask is that you watch over Laird Douglas Douglas until he has won the show. Oh, and if he does win, as I'm sure he will, I'll insist that you accept a nice bonus. So you can see, I'm very, very serious. And so it went on for another half hour or so. And finally she left, after I promised to pick up my bags at the hotel and move out to her joint in fashionable Germantown. I talked a few minutes longer with Harry Branson. I'm so glad you've agreed to take this on, John. As I told you, Mrs. Van Pyten is the most important individual policyholder we have, and doing this favor for us... Harry, it's not the Mutt Show at Bala Kinwood or Laird Douglas or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten or you I'm doing this for. It's purely love of the green stuff. Phew! That old dame must be really loaded. John, she has so much money. Well, she doesn't know how much she has. Industrial empire, that sort of thing. All right, all right. But, Harry, if word ever gets around in the trade that I came down here to play bodyguard to a mutt, so help me, I'll have your head. Yes. Uh, But now, hadn't you better go on out to the Maples? Well, first I want to know about this Harrison R. Kenworthy she mentioned. Oh, that. Yeah, that. She accused him of doping up her Scotty. Well, she really doesn't know, and it's really quite complicated. How do you mean? Kenworthy owns a beautiful Kerry Blue Terrier, Lady Odetti's Rollamar Main. Lady O... Holy cats, and no pun. Why can't they give an honest dog an honest name? Look, we'll call her Mimi. Go ahead. Hi, dog lovers. Ray, just in time. Meet Harry Branson, Ray Roland. Oh, we know each other. Hello, Harry boy. Mr. Roland. Sure, Harry called me in last year when these two dogs were at each other's Of course, throat. he doesn't mean that literally, John. You see, Mr. Roland is quite an authority on show animals. I've held it against him for years, ever since school. Well, there's no need to hold it against him. And I don't reason. mean that literally. Oh. Well, John Boy, so you came down to help yourself to a handful of dear Mrs. Kelly Vian Python's coin. More power to you. I knew Harry would call you in on the case. Felt it in my bones. And, brother, you may be in deeper than you think. Oh? What's that supposed to mean, Ray? Has Harry told you about the villain of the piece, Harrison R. Kenworthy? I was just starting to when you so rudely... Yeah, well, Johnny, the whole setup is a riot, but just remember one thing. Yeah? A lot of people have been killed in riots. Now, what's that supposed to mean? I'll tell you what he means, Let me tell it, Harry. It would take you all day. Sorry, no offense. All right. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. Okay. Bella Kinwit is the biggest event of the year in the doggy set, okay? Okay. All right. Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten owns Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope. Real fine Scotty. Yeah, good tea, see? Hey, those pants are really gone. Anyhow, Harrison Kenworthy owns Lady O'Diddy's Rolamar Meme, Carrie Blue. Mimi. Huh? I'd get indigestion trying to say that other name. Okay, Mimi. They're two pretty good dogs, especially Mimi, international championship blood and all that. But Mimi's the better dog. Douglas won't stand a chance. I've tried to tell her this, but... Well, go on, go on. Okay. Harrison Kenworthy loves Kelly Van Pyten, see? Oh, loves her money. Him? He's loaded, too. No, I think the old coot really loves her, and I think she loves him. Right, Harry? 
Yes, I think I'm inclined to... Right, but now get this. Yeah? She won't marry him until her Laird Douglas beats his Lady O'Diddy, uh, uh, Mimi, yeah. far and squar at the Balakinwood show. How do you like that? Are you kidding? Oh, no, John, it's an accepted fact. Right, that so what happens for over wait a year Wait a minute, now, Ray, wait a minute. If he really wants to marry her, why doesn't he just let her dog beat his? And let her be one up on him right from the start? Never. No, boy, he'd never live it down. You don't know these people. Well, this is about the craziest thing I ever heard of. To you and me, sure, but to them it's deadly serious. Are they in love with each other or with their dogs? Well, it's not just love where the dogs are concerned, but pride, which is just about all a lot of these old lonely millionaires have to think about, to live for. Yea, sometimes even unto the fifth and sixth generation. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll take your word for it. But now she said something about her dog being doped at the show last year. Oh, yes, John. You see, it was just a couple of days. Right, just before the finals. It was an attempt to murder the dog with poison. But emergency care both times pulled Lair Douglas through. She told me it was only some kind of a dope that oh, was used. Oh, sure, sure. We kept the truth from her. You don't realize it, boy, but if that dog were to die, she would. Fact. Oh, now, Ray. Oh, yes, John. And the insurance company must keep that dog alive in order to obviate having to pay off her... Right. Yeah. After all, her policies amount to a right. right. It may sound absurd to you, Johnny, but it's no joke. As I said, you don't know these people. But look, it still doesn't make any sense. You just have to take my word for it, and it's happened right here in Philadelphia. Yes, John, and we held the policy. It was an old lady. Right, named... so there you have it. <sighs> okay, okay, I'll, I'll believe you. And so the finger points at Harrison R. Kenworth. Well, she might like to think that, uh, especially since she doesn't know that poison was used both times. But I don't. What's more, the police feel the same. Oh, now, if you say police dogs, I'll slug you. John, there are times when the sense of right, humor of Harry, yours... dead right, and I do mean dead. No, in all seriousness, Johnny, if I were you, I'd duck out of this assignment. Now, don't say that, Ray, unless John... No, 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 go, go ahead and say it. Something ought to start to make sense around here. All right, listen. The reason I'm sure Harrison R. Kenworthy had nothing to do with the attempted poisonings, the reason the police were called in, the reason I think you ought well, to you get, get out to of the this... point, Ray? On each occasion, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten had a bodyguard attending Laird Douglas, in addition to the dog's governess and medicos and so get on. Get to the point. Each time, in order for the poisoner to get to that dog... Ray, please. Each time, the bodyguard was murdered. Still want this case, Johnny? <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, the joke's no longer a joke. Especially when a killer trains his sights on me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Steve Howard, homicide. I found word to call you there at your hotel. Right. I'm an insurance investigator, Lieutenant, and... Yeah, I've heard of you. 
Uh, can I help you? Well, I understand you're the man who handled a murder case at the Bala Kinwood dog show last year. That's right. Uh, we're still working on it. Oh, fine. Like to look over the setup for an attempted murder? Oh? Uh-huh. Who? Uh-huh. Me. Stay right there, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter. And at this point, that name is no joke. Expense account item three, 70 cents, cab fare, from the office of Harry Branson to my hotel. It was at Harry's office that I got the craziest assignment I'd ever taken. Bodyguard to Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote, who turned out to be a dog. And I mean that literally. A purebred Scottish terrier who rated high enough and dogged him for somebody to make a couple of attempts on his life. Right now, it looked like somebody wanted me to be next. Uh, What's all this talk about an attempt on your life? Here, Lieutenant. Take a look at this handbag of mine. Huh? Wait, don't touch it. Huh? I left it here on this little luggage stand about an hour ago, right after I checked in. Only before I left it, I opened it and took out my gun. So? So when I got back just before I called you, I found the bag as you see it now, locked again. Oh, now, look here, Mr. Yeah, I know, I know. But if a chambermaid had been in here, there would have been other signs. You know, bed turned down, fresh towels in the bath, things like that. Boy, you're a suspicious man. You sure you didn't lock it yourself after taking your gun I'm sure. Anyhow, instead of opening it, I started to pick it up to put it on the bed to unpack. Here, now, you lift it. Why? Because it weighs close to 25 pounds, and that's too much for nothing but an extra suit, a few shirts and shorts, some handkerchiefs and the like. You check with the desk? No callers that they know about. Well, let me see. Yeah, that is pretty heavy. And it doesn't tick. Now, look here. Yeah? Do you see where somebody on the fire escape used a pry bar to shove this window open? Oh, well, yeah. And those marks are fresh. Very fresh. Operator, get me central police. Expense account item four. Check for twenty nine fifty to the nearest Bond clothing store for one pair of trousers to replace those torn by Laird Douglas Douglas of what's his name when I'd first met him in Harry's office. Item five. Phone call to Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Well, don't you worry, Mr. Dollar. If you're delayed, you're delayed, and we'll just expect you here at the Maples when you get here. Your suite is all ready and waiting for you. I'll be there as soon as I can. Oh, I do hope you've had a suit made to replace those trousers little Laird Douglas tore. Why don't you have a couple of suits made and just charge them to me? Thanks. Maybe I'll get around to that. Goodbye, Mrs. Van Pyten. First of all, I had to know what Lieutenant Howard found out about the suitcase he'd had his lab crew pick up. I took a taxi to headquarters. That's item eight, 65 cents. Well, I'm glad to see you, Dollar. Sit down. Well, what'd you find out? Dollar, that bag of yours had enough soup in it to blow out half the side of your hotel. Oh, and I was right. Yeah, professional job, too. Straight wire rig that would have gone off when you opened the bag. Brother, I guess my lucky star is in the ascendant. What made you suspect the booby trap, Dollar? Last year and a few days ago, somebody tried to poison a dog. Well do I know. They're Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat, Blue Ribbon Scotty, belonging to Mrs. Peter Malcolm, Malcolm Kelly. Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten, yeah. Right. Apparently, the whole reason for it was to keep the pooch from winning the best of show at the annual dog festival, or whatever you want to call it, out at Bala Kinwood. So I've heard. I think it was more than that. Oh, wait a minute. Now, don't tell me you subscribe to the idea that if the dog were to die, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten would probably kick off, too. No question about it. <sighs> okay. Well, you don't know her yet, or you wouldn't be so skeptical. Her whole life revolves about that dog. And her money, of course. Now, from what I've seen, she just throws that away. Of course she does. At least in small quantities. You know, a thousand or two here or there, even a hundred thousand to some school or library or something where it'll show. But even that's only a drop in the bucket to her. Lieutenant, I don't quite see what you're driving at. Well, she is one of the remnants of a class in this country, fast dying out, thank goodness. 
that for generations has been cultured and conditioned into thinking that money is everything, that their whole destiny is to control vast industries, lands, railroads, oil, shipping, and people. People, Dollar, by means of their sheer financial prowess. But I thought our present tax Yeah, situation... sure, their day is almost done, but the few who are still around, like Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, are hanging on for dear life, trying to add to their power. <laughs> Hey, Steve, you make a sweet, gabby, eccentric old lady sound like an ogre. She is, no question. I'm sure she doesn't realize it. Simply because this whole attitude has been so thoroughly ingrained into her all her life? That's right. Oh, well, we'll see. Yeah, you'll see. Well, look, let's get to the point. Who do you think might be trying to get rid of the old lady? I haven't the least idea. Well, uh, no family, relatives? Only living relative is her nephew, Warren Staley. Ah. Nothing. You sure? I haven't been able to pin a thing on him. Where can I find this Warren Staley? At the Maples. He lives there with her, huh? Yep. And you're sure he would be her only beneficiary? Yep. Uh-huh. Uh-uh. Good luck, Dollar. Lieutenant Howard seemed to know what he was talking about. Nonetheless, I decided that the nephew, Warren Staley, would at least be a start. And the sooner I could move in at the Maples, the better. Item 9, 780, cab fares, back to my hotel and out to the Maples in the suburb of Germantown. When I first saw the place, I could hardly believe my eyes. It looked like a regular castle perched atop a small hill. Even the gatehouse, nearly half a mile from the mansion, was big enough to house several families. But the mansion itself, wow. A rather stuffy-looking butler, after practically climbing up my family tree, escorted me to the reading room. Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten and guess who? Whoops! Oh, easy now, Doug. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad you're here. And look, he remembers you. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that sweet? Yeah, it is. Yeah, a boy, Doug. Easy oh, now. and please call him Douglas. Huh? After all, the name Doug sounds so common, doesn't it? Oh, you really think he cares, Mrs. Van Pyten? Uh, oh, you're joking, aren't you? Yeah. Mr. Branson said you had quite a sense of humor. Yeah, now, did Hastings show you to your suite? The butler? No, but he took my things. Then I'll show you. I'm sure you'll love it and be quite comfortable. This way, please. Yes. Uh, you coming, Doug? Uh, Douglas? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Attaboy. Attaboy. <laughs> Do you see how happy he is having you here? I am too, Mr. Dollar. Now we just... Oh, Warren, darling. Huh? Hello, Santa. Mr. Dollar, this is my little nephew, Warren Staley. Warren was 25 or so, bright, good-looking, and well, but comfortably dressed. And at Mrs. Van Pyten's orders, he took me up to my suite. Living room, study, breakfast room, bath, and bedroom. And it still occupied only a small part of the second floor. Now, here next to you are Dougie's rooms. One wow. for sleeping and one for eating. Can you tie that? The dining room for a dog. And uh, through that door is Mademoiselle Poirot, his uh, governess. She feeds and bathes them. And that's a full-time job? Oh, sure. Most pampered dog in the country. Brother, I'll go with you on that. No doubt, Tonto will ask you to keep this connecting door open at night. Hey, sit down a minute, Warren. I'd like to talk to you. Sure. I hope you're impressed by all this. Are you kidding? <laughs> Tonto will love you dearly. Say, would you like a drink? There's a cellarette here for your convenience. Holy. Sure, scotch and soda. Good. Rather foolish, though, isn't it? All of it? What do you mean? Oh, it's such nonsense to keep up in a state like this just to keep face, so to speak. Well, she can afford it, can't she? Are you kidding? You sound as though you don't enjoy this life of luxury. Yeah, here's your drink. Enforced luxury to keep up the honor of the family. And I resent it. Oh, Without ever having to lift a finger, do an honest day's work. When she's gone, I'll be one of the wealthiest men in the country. That's bad, huh? Do you think it's strange that a fellow would like to stand on his own feet for a change, make something of himself, buy himself? Well, why not just pack up and leave? <laughs> you don't know Tata. No, I guess I don't. No, oh, it's really more than that. I'm the only member of this family left, aside from Tata. So I understand. I'm the only one left to carry on the Van Pyten Empire. They drink up. Wait a minute. Branson used that term, too. Yes, empire. Not only enough security to sink a battleship, but controlling rights in steel, utilities, and most important of all, East Moreland oil. I see. And what's most important about that is that I'll survive to keep control of East Moreland from Kenworthy. Harris and R. Kenworthy. Yeah? There's been a battle over East Moreland oil for, for generations between the Van Pytons and the Kenworthys. So tell me, does Kenworthy have any heirs? One. His son, Ronald. I see. What sort of a fellow was he? Good friend of mine. We waste a lot of our time together. Oh, uh, drink up, Mr. Dollar. 
I'm ready for another. You haven't even touched yours. Yeah, well, listen. I'm going to lay some cards on the table. Shoot. Somebody's been trying to get at Laird Douglas, the dog. Presumably as a way of getting at your aunt. It's true. If anything would have happened to little Dougie... Okay, okay. I'll take your word for it. Now, because of the intense rivalry between your aunt and Kenworthy, or rather between Laird Douglas and his pup, Lady Odidi's Mimi, or whatever her name is, anyway, Kenworthy should be number one suspect. When you know him, you'll cross him off your list. So Lieutenant Howard has told me. But, uh, go on. All right, all right. As sole beneficiary of the Van Pyten Empire, as you call it, you come in as fast number two on the list. I can understand that. But unless everything you've told me is a fancy fairy tale to throw me off, then... Every... Everything I've told you is... is true, Mr. Dollar. Hey, what's the matter with you? <sighs> Nothing. Go on. Okay. And mind you, Warren, I'm not forgetting for a minute that there's been a couple of murders involved in this whole screwy business. Plus an attempt on my own life. Attempt on... on your... Dollar? Hey, hey, what gives you... <laughs> Are you plastered on a little over one drink? No, no, listen to me. I know. Now I know, and I can tell you, Dollar. Tell me what? The answer, the, the whole thing. Dollar! Warren, what's the matter with you? I can't... I can't breathe. Hey, you... Warren! The, the drink meant for you. Don't touch... He died without another sound. I carefully sniffed the drink that had been poured for me, gingerly tasted it. Nothing. Nothing that I could spot. Yeah, poor Warren had probably been right. Whatever it was had no doubt been meant for me. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, things and people finally begin to line up on the case. Just well enough for it to blow sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Howard, homicide. Oh, hi, Steve. Hi. As you know, I've given orders for you to be confined to your suite out there at the Maples until I can get some of the lab crew out there. You don't think I murdered Warren Staley? Apparently, you were the only one who was with him when he died. Now, look here. I'm the one who's kept even the family out of here. What's more important, you're the only one on the whole estate who might be trusted to keep things intact. Any possible evidence. So please, don't leave your room. Okay, diplomat, I'll sit tight. (laughs) 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account, or rather report, submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in connection with my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter. No need to itemize expenses at this point, because there are none. The magnificent suite in which I'm parked out at the sumptuous mansion of Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten is fine. Except for the body of young Warren Staley, Mrs. Van Pyten's nephew, draped over the arm of the easy chair in which he died a few minutes ago. I'd called Lieutenant Howard at Homicide on the phone in my room immediately, and within minutes the nearest patrolman was stationed outside my door, refusing admittance even to the lady of the house. After all, this was the third murder that tied up with the Scottish Terrier who started all this, Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote. While waiting for Lieutenant Howard and his crew, I shaved, showered, and changed my clothes. Then, about ten minutes later... Well, Dollar. Yeah, Lieutenant. Uh, see what you mean. Yeah. He seemed like a nice kid, too. He's all yours, Doctor. Go right ahead. Very well, Lieutenant. Here, Paul, just sit my kid. Okay, for pictures, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, go right ahead, Sergeant. Okay, excuse me, Doc. Hey, before you get started... Okay, Dollar, let's have it. What happened? Well, Warren brought me up here himself, and I sat him down to ask him some questions. You suspected him, didn't you? In spite of what I told you. Sure. A sole beneficiary of the Van Pyten estate. Empire, as he called it. Yeah, well, what do you think now? That you were right. That he was clean. Anyhow... My boy, my poor darling Warren. Where is he? No, take your hands off me. My boy Just a minute, Mrs. Van Pyten. You... No, you can't keep me out. This is well, my own house, and this is my own yes, nephew, I, I'm my sorry, boy. but you'll have to wait until we can get oh, everything clear. Oh, this clear. terrible, I'll terrible thing. Mrs. Van Pyten, if you just wait until we finish... Just this, a minute, then. Lieutenant. Hey, whoa, young fella. Hold on a minute. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, who are you? Ronald Kenworthy, his best friend. What happened to him? He was Poisoned? Poisoned? And where were you? How could a thing like this happen if Whoa, you were doing what... Oh, Ronnie, just calm down a minute. How long have you been here in the house? Why, half, three quarters of an hour, something like that. But I don't where? see... Where? Where were you? Well, I was down in the reading room with Mrs. Van Pyten. All the time? Glenn, out in the garden. Alone? Yes, except for a few minutes while I talked to Hastings, the butler out there. What were you doing in the garden? I was on my way up here by the back way to see Warren. I've always used the back staircase from the garden, ever since we were kids together. This suite of rooms used to be our playroom, ever since I can remember. All right, all right. Go on with what you were saying. Well, then about that time, or a few minutes later, I don't know exactly, I heard the police car come screaming up the driveway. That was the first that any of us, Mrs. Van Pyten or Hastings or I, that any of us knew that something was wrong, that something had happened to Warren. But now look here, Mr. Dollar, right, I don't... with you two. What? You'll have to leave with Mrs. Van Pyten until we're through in here. Oh, please, Ronald, help me. Help well, me. but I... Go ahead, Ronnie, go ahead. Oh. All right. Oh, come on, you poor old... Ah, poor old dame. Sorry for her. You finding anything, Doc? Yes, I think so. I certainly think so. Be with you in a minute. All right. You better go on with what you were saying, Dollar. Well, not much more to say, Lieutenant. Warren felt the same way you do, that Branson at the insurance company does. If anything happened to the dog, Laird Douglas, it'd be the end of Mrs. Van Pyten. That the murders of the dog's handlers, caretakers, were purely incidental to attempts on the dog's life. But... But what? Well, he apparently was as concerned over this whole thing as we've been. Said he had a very strong theory about who might be back of all this. Who, did he tell you? He was about to, and this, whatever it was, hit him. Well, I'll tell you what it was, Lieutenant. Yeah, Doc? Oh, uh, this is Mr. Dollar. Oh, oh yeah, Mr. Doc. Dollar. Norfolk acid. Same thing that killed the two dog handlers and was used on the dog itself. I can tell without further examination... Wait a minute, Doc, wait a minute. If the dog got the same thing that killed a couple of grown men... A dog with a much more sensitive stomach, unused to all the strong food and drinks the human stomach is constantly abused with, a dog would immediately regurgitate and retain only a minute amount of the panorphic acid. I see. In the case of Warren Staley here, it was added to the scotch whiskey he drank. Traces of it in his glass and in a full glass beside your chair. Well, Doc, have you checked those bottles in the cellar, right? Uh, just about to. Uh, uh, which uh, bottle did he pour that out of, Dollar? The one right next to that bottle of VO there. He... Wait a minute. This isn't the same bottle. What? Well, the one he poured from was half empty. This is nearly full. Hey, now, what's the matter with you boys? Uh, well, what's up? You let somebody switch bottles a minute ago? Oh, there's nobody such a thing 
Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Nobody else came in here besides Mrs. Van Peyton and young Kenworthy? Hastings, the butler, but he just stood in the doorway. That's right, Lieutenant. Yet somehow, between the time Warren Staley poured those drinks and now, somebody switched bottles. Unless you're wrong about this, Dollar. No sign of the poison in this one, Lieutenant. It's the only scotch bottle. You've been here in the room all this time, Dollar? Yeah, sure. And in the bath, I shaved and showered and dressed while waiting for you to get here. But only after one of your men came and parked outside the door. Well, where does this door lead to? Well, it's the dog's quarters. Two rooms. Oh, I see. Come on, Dollar. You might wait for us. Yeah, right. What about that door beyond? Oh, that. Mademoiselle Poirot, the dog's governess. Well, where was she? How should I know? I didn't even meet her. I... Oh, oh. Hey, hey. Ah, the funniest monsieur. Yeah, I, I guess I should have knocked. Who are you? Why are you come in this way when I'm dressed myself? Uh, 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 sorry, mademoiselle. We're the police. Police? What have I done that you should see me this way? Well, nothing, ma'am. Nothing. But, but how long have you been there in your room? Only two minutes. I came in the back way to change my clothes. Yeah, that was obvious. It's my day off. I have big date. Well, not now you haven't. Get dressed and I'll send an officer in to escort you downstairs. Come on, darling. No, you cannot do this to me. I've done nothing wrong. You cannot make me stay here. Say, Pete, send somebody around the back way to cover the governess and take her downstairs for questioning. Yes, sir. Hey, Yo. And Johnny, looks like you goofed. Hmm? While you were showering, somebody came in through her room through the dog's quarters, and did the bottle switch on us. Oh, well, then we're even. Yeah, we're... What? You have very carefully mussed up any fingerprints that might have been on those doorknobs. Oh. Uh, Jerry, see if you can get any prints off those doorknobs back there. All right. If I haven't wrecked them. But, Johnny, if I didn't know about you and your reputation, I'd peg this on you so fast, you'd... You haven't been holding out on me, have you? I assured him that I hadn't, then went downstairs to the monstrous living room and sat in while we went through a routine questioning of everyone in the household. I even went through the motions of bodyguarding the dog that had started all this and tried to console Mrs. Van Pyten. Results of the questioning? Nothing, Dollar, nothing. No leads. Yeah, so I noticed. The two previous murders of the dog's caretakers or bodyguards, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, well, same poison was used then. In their food as well as the dog's. But why? Why, Steve? Why? Why they? To keep them from helping Laird Douglas when it hit him? Well, more likely because those handlers had got wind of the attempt to poison the dog and suspected who was trying to do it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So there's one thing you're overlooking, darling. What's that? The intended victim of this last poisoning was not Warren Staley. But you. Oh, brother, I'm not overlooking that for one second. Yeah, and that's why I asked you if you were holding out anything on me. Because it would indicate that you have a lead. Or at least suspicion about someone. Sure, sure, I got a lot of suspicions. Ronald Kenworthy, his old man, the butler, heaven help us. Even Mrs. Van Pyten. <laughs> Maybe even you, Steve. But when it comes to evidence. Huh? Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, I've got work to do. Looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack was nothing compared to hunting for the poison bottle of scotch that was no doubt stashed away somewhere. Far, far into the night, a regular army of policemen probed and dug and poked around. They opened drawers and closets and cabinets, pounded on walls, looking for sliding panels and secret compartments, went through the trash, sifted a trash heap, dug up any freshly turned earth they could find on the grounds, even climb trees. Yeah, they prowled through attics and basements looked everywhere. Result? Nothing. Meanwhile, I stayed close to Mrs. Van Pyten. And I'll say this for her. In spite of her almost silly infatuation with that dog, she showed real strength of character. We sat alone together in the reading room. I know, Mr. Dollar, there's nothing I can do to bring Warren back. Therefore, there's no point in simply sitting here weeping over him. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But it isn't easy because it meant more. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, um, I want to ask you some things, Mrs. Van Pyten. I suppose this is the wrong <coughs> time, but I... No, ask me, Mr. Dollar. I think I know what you want to ask. And now, now that this last terrible thing has happened, I hope, I, I pray that I can help you. Well, I had quite a talk with Warren before he died. Oh, oh, I, I'm glad. 
Warren would have been the sole heir to the Van Pyten estate. Yes. He alone would have carried the honor, the prestige of the family after my passing. Oh, no. Surely you didn't think that he could have been behind those other terrible murders. Quite frankly, at first I did. But he told me something else, and it's bothered me. About Mr. Kenworthy and his son. Ronald? No, Mr. Dollar. He was supposed to be Warren's best friend. You said supposed to be. Well, I... I Warren made it very clear that if the Kenworthys could somehow acquire the Van Pyten holdings, either by Mr. Kenworthy marrying you... I have told Harrison R. Kenworthy... Yes, I know. If Laird Douglas wins the show from his Kerry Blue Terrier, you'll marry him. Yes. And I still think it's a screwy idea. But the fact remains, it's fairly true. It's quite true. Neither you nor Mr. Kenworthy has too many years ahead, if you'll forgive me. Mr. Dollar, what... So there's now only one person left to benefit by the death of Laird Douglas, of Warren, of you, and ultimately of Mr. Kenworthy. Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. That's right. Ronald Kenworthy. Well? I know. I know it. I think you've said enough, Mr. Dollar. Ronald. Yes, I heard it all. Mr. Dollar, I think you said too much for, shall we say, your health. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, all cards are laid on the table. And believe me, the deck proves to have been stacked right from the beginning. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ronald Kenworthy, Mr. Dollar. Good. I want to talk to you. Are you at your home? I am. And after the Okay, then stay right there and I'll be over to see you. Why don't you send the police instead? What's that supposed to mean? A few minutes ago in Mrs. Van Pyten's library, before you kicked me out, you practically accused me of the murder of her nephew. Did I? Well, didn't you? Didn't you? All right, Ronnie. Just calm down and stay put until I can get over there. (laughs) You mean you aren't afraid I might try to take a powder, as you high-handed detectives like to put it? You mean you aren't worried that... Uh. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is the final report in my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heather's Scope matter. The whole case started out almost as a lark when I discovered that I'd come to Philadelphia to act as bodyguard to Laird Douglas Douglas and for a fat fee and virtually unlimited expense accounts. Me, bodyguard to a dog. But it ceased to be funny when I learned that the dog's two previous caretakers had been murdered. And when, only a few hours ago, an attempt was made on my life that ended with the death of young Warren Staley. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I see. I guess I was so upset by the death of my nephew that I... I didn't realize the attempt was really made on your life. The second attempt, Mrs. Van Pyten. What? Shortly after I arrived in Philadelphia, somebody planted a booby trap in my suitcase in my hotel room. Good heavens, no. And you think that Ronald Kenworthy did that, too? Well, what do you think? Well, yes. Now that poor dear Warren is gone... There's nothing to prevent the Kenworthy estate from achieving control of the Van Pyten holdings. That is, if I were to die. Go on. Upon the death of Harrison Kenworthy, the whole financial empire would be inherited by his son, Ronald. So I understand. Ronald. And he would be the wealthiest, the most powerful man financially in the United States. Ronald, who pretended to be Warren's best friend. Who pretended to love me. It's a terrible thought, isn't it? Apparently adds up, though, doesn't it? There is no question of it. But what evidence have you? None yet. Well, then I'll help you get it. And I can do it, Mr. Dollar. I may appear to be only a wealthy, foolish old woman who dotes on her pet, Laird Douglas. But I'm not. I'm astute, shrewd, and clever. Since Peter, my husband, died, I alone have managed this estate, this financial empire. I use the word again. With my money, with my... Oh, yes, I can do it, Mr. Dollar, and Ronald will be made to pay for these terrible things that he's done. I, uh, I admire your confidence. Nothing. No one can stand in my way. You see, I'm only sorry that a few minutes ago you didn't keep him here, make him face it. I'm going to see him now. Oh, where? At his home. I understand the estate adjoins this one. Yes. But please, look out for him. Shoot first, Mr. Dollar. What? Because now, he may act like the cornered rat that he is. I decided to walk across to the Kenworthy estate in the hope the fresh air would help clear my thoughts. Logical as it all seemed, I didn't like what I just heard. Then luck, pure, unadulterated luck. As I walked across the broad lawn between the main house and the gatehouse, I passed the garage building with its Rolls Royce, two Cadillacs, and a station wagon. And then I saw him. Andy LaFord, alias Andrew Fortune, alias Andrew Ford, one of the cleverest second-story men in the country, with a record on the West Coast as long as your arm. A man who would do anything for money. He was idly going through the motion of dusting off a car. I walked past quickly, not sure whether he'd notice me or not. I hope not. For it was one of his ilk who'd had to plant the booby trap in my hotel room, who could have slipped the poison into the liquor that killed Warren Staley. I turned in at the gatekeeper's house. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I saw you at the question. I want to telephone quick. Uh, well, you're uh, right here, sir. It's something Thanks. Wrong. Operator, get me central police emergency. Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. Something the man there in the garage polishing cars. Uh, Andy? How long has he been here? Oh, a year more, ever since the dog show at Valley Kinney. Oh, what does he do? Year. Oh, the driving for Mrs. Van Payton, but there's something gone... Hello? To... Give me Lieutenant Howard, homicide. <laughs> After warning the old gatekeeper that I'd have his head if he said anything to anyone about my phone call, I left by the back door and went over to the Kenworthy mansion where young Ronald was waiting for me. I must say, before we go any further, that I resent the way you ordered me out of the Van Pyten house a few minutes ago. Yeah? Well, I'm sorry. Whether you suspect me or expect me to help you in this case, it was like... Lonnie, you knew Warren Staley. Very well. We were the closest of friends. Confident. All right. Just how much did he really care about the Van Pyten estate? Fortune, whatever you want to call it. To put it bluntly, he wanted none of it. And I'm afraid his aunt rather resented it. Why do you say that? Because her whole life she's been obsessed by an almost overwhelming lust for power. When Warren finally rebelled against this, she tried not to show it, but she hated him for it. Unlike my father. Oh? I feel as Warren felt. 
and my father and I together have been laying the groundwork for dissipating the Kenworthy estate into corporate setups that will benefit many instead of just us. Does that sound strange to you? Well, it sounds like true philanthropy, if you mean it. You must believe me, it is, and I do mean it. Oh, I won't suffer, of course. I'll still retain some control here and there, but I'll have to work at it instead of just carrying on the tradition of the idle rich. I'll be a man. I hope you're telling me the truth, Ronnie. I believe you are, and I'd like to meet your father. You will. Needless to say, it was much harder for him to break from this tradition of financial power than for me. So perhaps you can see why I admire him above all other men. Anything else? I'll see you later. I was worried about you, Mr. Dollar, going over there to see Ronald Kenworthy alone after all that has happened. Yes, you should have been, Mrs. Van Pyten. Especially if you noticed that I passed by the garage on the way. What? I happened to notice someone there, and I think it answered a lot of questions for me. It was Andy LaForte. Andrew? My private chauffeur? Is that all he is? Oh, do you know him, Mr. Dollar? Look, I took on this case, Mrs. Van Pyten, because you offered me a fee too good to be turned down and an almost unlimited expense account. You haven't answered me. I should have got wise then and there. But I thought your great passion for your dog was just an amusing foible of an immensely wealthy, kind of foolish old lady. Oh, Laird Douglas is a dear one, isn't he? Why, Mr. Dollar... Let me add things up. A few minutes ago, you told me that thanks to your wealth and a very sharp, clever mind, you'd let nothing stand in the way of anything you chose to do. Please, Mr. Dollar, I don't think I understand. All right. You made a contract with Harrison Kenworthy that you'd marry him when and if Laird Douglas beat that puff of his at the dog show... An apparently silly sort of thing, yet everybody believed it. But the real reason for marriage to him was solely to acquire control of his holdings, increase this financial empire of yours. Very subtle. Kept you looking like a cute, whimsical old lady. Why, this is the most absurd thing I ever heard of. So I thought at first, but let me go on. Oh, please do. When you realized that Laird Douglas wasn't ready to beat that dog of his, rather than admit defeat, rather than lose the chance to make this marriage, you ordered the murder of the dog's handlers. <sighs> then the contract was still in force, just delayed. I won't listen to such terrible things. You'll listen whether you like it or not. You learned that Kenworthy and his son were planning to dissipate their fortune and thereby put it beyond your reach. Mr. On Dollar... On top of this, your own nephew, Warren, wanted to do the same with your estate. This was too much. What you have said is too much. Then, by the time I arrive, you learned from an expert, Ray Rowland, that your dog would never stand a chance against Kenworthy's. So you wouldn't dare let him compete, at least until you'd hooked Kenworthy some other way. And part of your whole scheme was to build up evidence of attempts against you, through the dog, of course, though I'll bet you actually hate the mutt. No, that's not true. Anyhow, from the moment I talked to Ray Rowland, I was only in the way. So you tried to get rid of me. Had somebody booby-trap my luggage. Oh, you have no proof. Andy LaForte, this so-called chauffeur of yours, would do anything for money. And I fully intend to break him down and make him admit you hired him as a killer. Listen. Listen to me. On the second try, the poison liquor, your nephew Warren got it instead of me. Fine, fine. Another obstacle out of your way. After all, he had opposed you. Mr. Dollar, how much do you want? I can make you financially independent. Then you the set your sights on Ronald Kenworthy, who was trying to break up the other empire you wanted to get your hands on. You even hoped that somehow I might help you. Shoot first, you said. You don't understand. I was Just only... what plans you had for his old man and that warped, twisted brain of yours, I don't know. But I'm sure you had plans. Oh, well, lady, now it's too late. No, Mr. Dollar. No, it isn't too late. Stay away from that drawer. You'd even shoot somebody down with your own hand if you thought it necessary, wouldn't you? But it isn't necessary, Mr. Dollar. Huh? Are you sure it wouldn't be easier if I were just to give you... Say, a hundred thousand dollars and two hundred thousand. All right, Andrew. Right here, Mrs. Van Pike. Well, well. Hello, Andy. Got a license for that thing? Shut up. Want me to do it now, Mrs. Van? Yes, Andrew. Uh, what if the servants hit a shot? Hold it, Donna. Don't worry, Andrew. I'll take care of things. Haven't I always for you? Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. She'll take care of things. While you're pulling that trigger, she'll blast you down so fast you won't know what hit you. Make it look like we killed each other and leave her in the clear. Quiet. She's got a gun in that drawer beside her and she'll use it. You hear me, Eddie? I said quiet. What you don't know is that she can't do without me. <laughs> but we can do without you. All right, Andy, wait now. Listen, will now, you? Now, Mrs. Van. All right, Andrew. 
now. Thanks, Lieutenant. Oh, Lieutenant. Then you saw he was going to shoot down Mr. Dollar. Yes, I oh, heard, yes. too, Mrs. Van Pyten. Plenty. Oh, no, you, you don't understand. Mr. Dollar had come up here to talk to me. I wanted to offer him a great deal more money for his work for me. I guess he I almost didn't Dollar. make it. More Glad you keep talking to him so then long. This Got a cough drop. A Is this body the handle of fortune? Oh, oh, shut up. What was that? You heard him. I beg your pardon. Clever, shrewd, astute. You're just off your rocker. You'd have to be, I guess, to start a thing like this in the first place. Well, I guess by the time the estate and inheritance laws get properly applied, the Van Pyten Empire will be spread around the way Warren wanted it. Expense account item 10, $28.90. Fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Total, including fees, $1,113.40. Remarks? I'm glad I'm poor. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, an insurance swindle that really backfired. The only trouble was it caught me right in the line of fire. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in our cast were Jeanette Nolan, Harry Bartell, Byron Kane, Jack Crucian, Bill James, James McCallion, Ken Christie, Dick Ryan, Bert Holland, Jack Edwards, and Hi Everback. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Providence, Rhode Island calling. Mr. Dollar? Yes. One moment, please. Go ahead. Hello? Hello, Mr. Dollar? Yes? This is Dick Porter. I'd like to hire you. Porter? Uh, Dick Porter. I'm an insurance broker here. Bert Masterson at United Adjustment Bureau suggested I contact you. Oh, what's the trouble, Mr. Porter? <laughs> uh, darned if I know exactly... I just have a client who's taking out all the insurance he can get. I may be wrong, but it looks to me like he's getting ready to die. Oh. Can you help me out? I can try, Mr. Porter. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Expense account item one, $15. Airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Providence. 
I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and was in my hotel room by 3.15. At 5 o'clock, I was having a quiet drink with Porter, who turned out to be a 24-year man in the insurance brokerage business and seemed to know what he was about. I've never had anything like this happen to me, and I didn't quite know what to do about it. I'm glad I can get some expert advice from you. Well, I don't know how expert the advice will be, but I'll do what I can for you, Mr. Porter. Uh, Want another one of these? No, I'm fine for now, thank you. I'll try to explain this matter as far as I know. Two days ago, Dr. Shepard called me up and inquired about rates on straight life insurance. Mm -hmm. He's carried about $20,000 worth of policies, so ten years or better. Um, I have the figures in my office. Mm -hmm. I gave him the prices for coverage, and he said he'd take $80,000, which would bring him up to an even $100,000. Now, Shepard's a single man. The beneficiary on his other policies is his mother, Claire Shepard. She lives over in Pawtucket. He's only dependent. He wants to name her beneficiary again. I see. Now, where do matters stand with Dr. Shepard right now? I told him it'd take a few days to draw the policies up. He sent me a check for the first payment and told me to do what had to be done. I don't want to act on his application until I know it's okay. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, what can you tell me about Dr. Shepard? Very little. He seems to have a good practice here in town and does his share of charity work and so on. As far as I know, he's above question. Would have to be, of course, to practice medicine here. He has an apartment above his offices, owns the building, all of his equipment. Know anything about his friends? No. Now, let me understand this about Dr. Shepard. He called you. You didn't call him. He wanted to buy the insurance. Uh, You didn't try to sell it. That's about it, yes. And that's why I'm worried. Give me a hundred people and I'll show you 99 out of that hundred who will never, never call up an insurance broker and say, I want to buy some life insurance. People have to be sold life insurance. They'll go out and shop around for fire, theft coverage, automobile insurance, health, almost any kind. But straight life insurance, that has to be sold. On the other hand, suppose Shepard is that one in a hundred. Yeah, yeah, it may be a perfectly legitimate situation. Yeah, Shepard may have looked into his mirror one night and said to himself, i got to have $100,000 worth of insurance or I won't sleep a wink. Oh, yeah, it could have happened that way, Mr. Porter. But uh, I have to think of those 99 people in that 100. Sure. Sure, so do I. Well, here's to caution. Cheers. Expense account item two, $25, deposit on a rented car, which I use the following day, driving from place to place, collecting data on Dr. Charles Shepard, M.D. At his bank, I was able to learn that he enjoyed what might be called a lucrative practice, and that, like most people, he spent slightly more than he made. He belonged to a golf club where he was seldom seen. He belonged to a tennis club, which he managed to make three or four times a week. Questioning the pharmacist who had the prescription counter a half block from Dr. Shepard's building and the manager of a cafeteria across the street from same, I was unable to learn who Dr. Shepard's steady companions were or gain any information that would justify his puzzling application for life insurance. Hello? Good morning. Oh, good morning. I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, please. Do you have an appointment? No, I don't. Well, may I have your name, please? Johnny Dollar. 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 Are you a regular patient of Dr. Shepard's, Mr. Dollar? No, no, I'm not. I didn't think I recalled your name. I've been with Dr. Shepard almost five years. Uh, Who recommended Dr. Shepard? No one. Well, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid doctor's out now and won't be back until... Late this afternoon. Well, now, that's funny. I was standing out in front of here three minutes ago, and I thought I saw Dr. Shepard walk in. Please, Mr. Dollar, he is not in to anyone. What's your name? Why, I mistreat her. Mistreat her? Well, yes, but I... I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, mistreat her. Here. Oh. Insurance investigator? Yes. Will you tell the doctor that? Please? Why, yes, I... I'm sorry, I had to tell your doctor was out. He asked me to say that to everyone who came in. I'm afraid the doctor's been acting strangely all day. I'm very much concerned over him. Excuse me. The tall, pale, brunette girl in the crisply starched uniform was certainly concerned about something. She bit her lip, forced on a wan, unprofessional smile, and looked like she wanted to cry just before she disappeared beyond the reception room to seek out Dr. Shepard. I pretended not to notice that part. One minute passed, two minutes, three minutes. No one reappeared. 
So I pushed the door open and I looked down the corridor leading to the examination rooms and laboratory. I had to notice Dr. Charles Shepard standing at the end of the corridor. Most of his costume was medically correct. White coat, stethoscope in one hand. But in the other hand, he brandished a thirty-two automatic. And the safety was off. Stay where you are, mister, and get your hands up. What pocket do you keep your credentials in? Left inside. I'll get them. Insurance investigator. For whom? At the moment, for Mr. Porter. Dick? Yeah. Well, here, I... I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I... I guess I'm very nervous these days. Oh, uh, my... Mr. Dollar, I'd like to get your address and phone number before uh, you... That's all right, Doreen. Uh, don't you think this might be a good time to go out and get a bite? Well, it's a little early, Doctor. I have some lab tests. Go ahead, Corinne, like a good girl, and uh, lock up, huh? Yes. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Ah, uh, yeah, goodbye. Very fine girl, Corinne. She's been with me... Five so... years, she told me. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to explain meeting you in the hallway with this in my hand... Uh, yes. Well, uh, before you try, suppose you snap the safety on. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I look somewhat foolish, I guess. Do uh, you want to come in my office? Sure. You say Mr. Porter sent Mr. You... Porter told me you made an application for $80,000 worth of life insurance. We, uh, we look into things like that, Doctor. Investigate me because I want to buy life insurance? Yeah, yeah. You're a single man with few responsibilities? Well, I don't know whether to be irritated or not. Am I, am I going to get my insurance? I wouldn't be irritated, Doctor. Put yourself in the insurance company's position. They're just not used to this kind of application. Oh, you you may get it, I don't know. But obviously you're in some kind of trouble, gun and all. Well, I... You know, the whole thing is a ridiculous mess. Mr. Dollar, my life has been threatened by a man who has definite homicidal tendencies... I suppose I've been acting very strangely lately. I, I don't know whether to leave town or give up my practice. All you have to do is pick up that telephone and call the police and tell them about it. A threat in your life comes under police business, Doctor. I know that, and I would go to the police, only... Well, it's a very delicate matter. I have a patient's welfare to think of. You can't very well treat any patient if you're dead. I suppose you sit down and tell me all about it. All right. Several months ago, I treated a woman named Forbes... A thorough examination and consultation disclosed that her poor physical condition was not based on any organic disorder, but rather upon her own emotional instability. Not an uncommon diagnosis this hectic day and age. You've heard of things like this, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I've heard of semantics and neurotics and psychotics, but I'm not a doctor. Well, let me tell you the psychotherapeutic side of medicine is by far the most challenging, and one in which I've had considerable experience. Consequently, I undertook to treat Mrs. Forbes, hoping to effect a cure... Are you a psychiatrist, Doctor? No, I am not. Don't misunderstand me, Mr. Dollar. In the process of treating Mrs. Forbes' physical ailments, I urged her to recount a variety of experiences, talk to her from day to day, probing all the while for the source of her trouble. It has been my intention from the first to place her in the hands of a competent neurologist. I suspected her trouble early in the treatment. She's married to an erratic, ruthless, ill-tempered man, Paul Forbes. Oh. I made a... Grave error when Mrs. Forbes pressed me last week to... Well, I could only tell her to move out and divorce him immediately. That's pretty extreme advice, Doctor. I know, but I also know the advice was right. Oh, you aren't in sympathy with me, I can see, but let me tell you that any competent psychiatrist would have advised her the same. I approached her husband on the matter a few days ago. What? I explained to him that Mrs. Forbes' health, her very life, is in jeopardy, that more is involved here than just keeping intact a union which has nothing but... Legality is a binding force. And Mr. Forbes doesn't care for semantics. He doesn't care for Mrs. Forbes, Mr. Dollar. He ranted and raved and accused me of trying to break up his home. And finally, he attacked me. I managed to get away. Did he threaten you then? Yes, he said he'd kill me. Who else was there? What do you mean? Who heard him say these things? Why, Mrs. Forbes was there and a servant in their home. Yes, a servant. Upton's his name, I believe. He should have called the police. I should have done a lot of things differently in my lifetime, but I didn't call the police. My primary concern is for Mrs. Forbes. Further shock and guilt complex could be totally disastrous to her. So are you going to creep around here with a gun in your hand? 
I don't know whether I'd even know how to use it. I... I... I now, why the application for all the insurance? Well, I, I wondered if Forbes might get me. I wanted to be sure my mother was taken care of. I... I don't know whether anyone's ever threatened your life, and you knew for certain he'd try to carry out the threat, but that is the position I am in. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'll think of something. But what about my insurance? That's up to Mr. Porter. If what you say is true, I wouldn't insure you. What do you mean, if it's true? Of course it's true. Doctor, I don't believe it. I left him standing there in the corridor, staring after me. A lonely man. Somehow not as frightened a man as he tried to let me believe. I wondered about that. I was still wondering about it when I went to sleep that night. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... The Shepherd matter becomes a matter even the police can't handle. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dick Porter, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Did you check on Dr. Shepard? Yeah. Uh, do I write up his policies? Well, that's up to you, Mr. Porter. Dr. Shepard's life has been threatened. What? That's according to him. And the man who threatened his life has definite homicidal tendencies, also according to Dr. Shepard. Well, I... I... Well, what do you think? Porter, I think Dr. Shepard's a liar. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. More expenses, item three, 26 cents, one bottle of aspirin for Mr. Porter. I felt he was going to need it. I hope you aren't trying to be funny, Mr. Dollar. I'm not, Mr. Porter. I think you've got a tough decision to make. I, uh, I know that the commission on $80,000 worth of insurance would be high. Uh, uh, sit down. Oh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Porter, Dr. Shepard told me he bought or tried to buy all that insurance because he thought a man named Forbes was going to kill him. He bought it, he said, to make certain his mother is well provided for. He was carrying a thirty-two Colt. Hmm. 
Now, he spoke of treating Forbes' wife and of advising her that divorce would settle her health problem. Mr. Forbes didn't like that and accused Shepard of trying to wreck his home, and, well, that's about it. Now, what have we got? <laughs> well, your Dr. Shepard is either nuts or an idiot or the cleverest man alive. I don't know. I do know I believed about one half of what he told me, maybe less. Well, what reason would he have to lie? Beats me. If someone threatened your life or mine, we'd turn to the police for help. Now, Shepard won't do that. Insists that it would probably be hazardous in the case of his patient, Mrs. Forbes. Well, I don't want to write up this policy if what he says is true. But I, I don't want to pass up the commission if it isn't true. Can you stick around town for another day or two and find out about it? I'll do what I can, Mr. Porter. Go ahead. Have an aspirin. He had an aspirin and I had a car ride. Once again, out to the offices of Dr. Shepard. The same things were more or less going on in the same way. His nurse, Miss Streeter, appeared as distraught as ever when she recognized me. There was a quick dabbing at the eyes, a straightening of the hair before she spoke. I... Good morning, Mr. Dollar. Hello. I'd like to see the doctor again. He was calling Mr. Porter's office trying to locate you. I'll buzz him. Mr. Dollar, do you have anything to do with why doctor's been carrying a gun? No. That's his business. In other words, I should mind my business. Well, I'm being honest. I've advised him what to do on the matter. What matter? He'll have to explain that to you, Miss Streeter. It doesn't make much sense to me. You can go back now. Okay, thanks. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Doctor. You were pretty insulting yesterday. I'm sorry about that, but we both have a problem to solve. And I get paid sometimes for deliberately insulting people. <laughs> You're a stranger. Do you want to change your story about all this? I wish I could change it. It's still a mess, a bad mess. I thought it all out last night, and I still must hold to my original thinking. I have to place my concern for my patient, Mrs. Forbes, before anything else. In other words, you won't call the police and tell them your life's been threatened. No, and you're very stubborn about that part. I don't think you comprehend the situation at all. Look, wait a minute. Let's understand each other, Doctor. If this man Forbes is all you say he is, and you say you're the expert on homicidal tendencies, then the best thing for you to do is to prefer charges against him for threatening your life and have him locked up. Now, you could do that, according to what you've told me about Mrs. Forbes and a servant in their home witnessing his threats. I will try to explain again. I can't do that for Mrs. Forbes' sake. I just can't. She's been through a shattering ordeal. I must attempt to resolve this quietly. Now, true, I can generally anticipate a man's actions inside my office under clinical conditions, but I... Well, Forbes is different. That's why I tried to contact you today. Someone like you could approach Forbes and possibly persuade him to discard his ideas of violence. Probably do it in a quiet way, too. What does Mr. Porter pay you? Well, what's that got to do with it? I'm willing to pay you. I mean, you and I don't seem to get along very well, but I phone Porter and he tells me you're one of the best men in your line of business. I'll pay you to go to Paul Forbes and talk to him as I've described. <laughs> I can't figure you, Doctor. Now, let you and I not get into any personality arguments. Will you do this for me for your regular fee? I was going to do it anyhow. For Mr. Porter and the fee, he pays me. I just wanted to check you first. I'll do it. But I still think it's a matter for the police. All right, let's leave it this way. You go talk to Forbes. If you think he means to kill me, then I'll call the police and prefer charges against him. Patient or no patient. How's that? That sounds a little more sensible, Doctor. I took down the home address of Paul Forbes and climbed to my rented car and drove over to his home in the gilded edge of the city. A story and a half colonial with all the trimmings. Lawns, trees, Plymouth convertible, a push-button station wagon in the garage. It was a nice warm spring day and some flowers were blooming and smelling up the area in a very nice way. Flies buzzed, bees droned, birds sang. And I went up and pressed the doorbell. I should have gone butterfly catching or taken a plane to Spokane. Yeah? I'm looking for Paul Forbes. Does he live here? Yeah, he sure does. I'm Forbes. Mr. Forbes, my name is Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Yeah, and I came over to talk to you... You get out of my way! You get The front of his gun slapped against the side of my head, and I went down to my knees. A door slammed somewhere, and someone ran away. I twisted around, trying to see what it was all about. And then I managed to get to my feet, in time to see Paul Forbes plunging the Plymouth out the driveway and heading I don't know where. Oh, oh. Goodness, my goodness. What happened here? Uh, Where's Mr. Forbes? You hurt? Yeah, I'll be... Oh, Miss Forbes! Miss Forbes! 
Oh, let me help you, sir. Yeah, give me your arm. Yeah. We better sit you down over here. Okay, thanks. Oh, my thanks. goodness, my goodness gracious, sir. How did this happen? Mr. Forbes swung a gun at me. Oh, no, sir, no, sir. Oh, no, sir. No, easy, sir. Easy, easy. Nice, you know, nice. Let's sit down here. Oh. Oh. What happened here? I'm afraid Mr. Forbes attacked this gentleman, Miss Forbes. Call the doctor up and... Then go to my medicine chest and get some swabs and a pan of cold oh, water. Right away, man. Wait, uh, the doctor isn't necessary. He just made me dizzy. You're cut. It might be deep. Well, get the first aid things and some brandy, Upton. Right away, man. This is unforgivable, just unforgivable conduct. Please, I don't know who you are. Are you a friend of Paul's? No, I'm Johnny Dollar. I, I wanted to discuss with your husband something. I, I take it you're Mrs. Forbes. Yes. Oh, Upton, uh, set them right here. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. You feeling a little better, sir? I, I don't know yet. Hey, let me try some of that. Yeah, certainly, sir, certainly. Here we go, sir. Easy now. Easy. <laughs> Thanks. How does it look to you, Upton? Well, I believe it's not too deep, Mrs. Forbes. How's it feel, Mr. Dollar? No, I, I don't think it's very deep. I'll be all right in a minute. Upton, go telephone Dr. Shepard and tell him to come over here immediately. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Dollar, I can't tell you how sorry I am for this. You, you can bring suit against us. You can do anything you want to, Mr. Dollar. Paul's temper is just ungovernable these days. He could have killed you. He took the car and ran. Yeah. I don't know what's gotten into him. Two nights ago, he attacked my personal physician, threatened to kill him. And now he's attacked you for no reason at all. Any idea where he might have gone? Heaven only knows. Mad. That's what he is, Mr. Dollar. He's mad. Pauline Forbes had a right to be scared from what I'd seen of her and from what I'd seen of her husband. He was an angry man with a gun in his hand, slugging at anyone in sight. She was a distraught woman with a darkening spot underneath her right eye, and it wasn't mascara. I began to wonder who needed more looking after, Dr. Shepard, Mrs. Forbes, or Johnny Dollar. You just lie still now, sir. Huh? Why? I guess you kind of fainted a little bit. Is there anything I can get you, sir? No. No. Uh, just tell me about Mr. Forbes. I beg your pardon, sir? Look, I'm an insurance investigator. I came here today to talk to Mr. Forbes about threatening Dr. Shepard's life. Oh, uh, well, I I wouldn't want to talk out of turn, sir. You you better discuss that with Ms. Forbes. Now, just one question. Did Mr. Forbes threaten Dr. Shepard's life? Yes, sir. You heard him? I did, sir. He attacked Dr. Shepard here two nights ago. Did he also attack Mrs. Forbes? Mr. Dollar, this is an unhappy house. Things have gone all wrong here these last few months. Mr. Forbes changed. Mr. Forbes, uh, well, I don't know. I, but please don't ask me to speak up against anyone. I'm just trying to find out the best thing to do for everybody concerned. What can you do, sir? Well, I didn't think anything like this had happened. It's terrible, Doc. Terrible. This about settles it. Now, I want you to go up to your room and lie down. There's no sense in your getting any more excited. I want to see about Mr. Dollar first. Oh, good morning, Doctor. Hello, Upton. Uh, let's have a look at this, Dollar. Uh, get that light. Yes, sir. Hmm. How is it? Well, I don't think it's anything worse than a cut. How do you feel, Dollar? Oh, an aspirin might straighten me out. I hope so. Upton? Uh, yes, I'll get some, sir. <laughs> Dollar, I should have taken your advice yesterday. I'm going to take it now. I'm going to call the police and have this man arrested. He might kill somebody next time. Yeah, am I all right? Sit up. Dizzy? Yeah, a little. That'll wear off. What will they do to Paul? Well, they'll take him into custody and probably talk some sense to him. Oh, this, this is awful. You go up to your room now, Mrs. Forbes. We'll handle this. Oh, Upton, uh, take Mrs. Forbes upstairs. Yes, sir. You just come along, Mrs. Forbes. Thank you. She is not a well woman. She looks all right to me. I wish she were. Uh, I'm going to get an x-ray on that head. Can you come by the office this afternoon? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, give me the police. I doubt if it's concussion or anything like that, but it's best to play safe. You're a safe player all the time, aren't you, doctor? What does that mean? I don't know. Now, look here. I'm not... Good. Hello? Uh, yes. I want to talk to somebody about a threat on my life. I... My name is Shepard, Dr. Charles Shepard. When I left him, he was reporting Paul Forbes to the police. 
He gave them Forbes' description and the license number of the Plymouth Forbes was driving. I didn't stay beyond that. Maybe I should have. Maybe I should never have left that house. I'm not sure, but if I hadn't left, I might have saved a life. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, the big lie is as true as little green apples. Join us, won't you, when I bite into one and spit out a bullet. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Miss Streeter at Dr. Shepard's office. Yes? Dr. Shepard gave me your hotel number. He said you were to come in for a head x-ray. Let me talk to the doctor about that. Well, he's out on house calls right now, Mr. Dollar. He'll be back late this afternoon. He seemed very concerned over... He ought to be. A friend of his banged me on the head with a gun this morning. That's why the x-ray. Well, could you possibly come in and have it made? Doctor was most insistent. All right, Miss Streeter, I'll be right over. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Expense account item four, one dollar, cab fare from my hotel to Richard Porter's office. Porter was sympathetic. You know, I feel very responsible for this, Mr. Dollar. I hired you to look into all oh, this. Oh, it'll go away, it'll go away. I've been hit on the head before. Hey, do you have anything to drink in here? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you never can tell when a snake will come up and bite you. Yeah, yeah here you are. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I suppose you came in to give me your expense sheet now that it's all settled. Not exactly, Mr. Porter. It isn't settled for me. Well, certainly you know I'll assume any medical expenses involved here. That no, I'm not talking in. about that, Mr. Porter. Sit down. <clears throat> now, look, there's something going on here, and we might as well have it out. You hired me to investigate a client who wanted to buy $80,000 worth of straight life insurance, right? Yes. Now, that client explained why he called for that insurance. 
Not to my satisfaction, but he explained it. He said a man named Paul Forbes had threatened his life. Threatened it because Dr. Shepard had advised Forbes' wife to get a divorce. I know you didn't believe this, but the facts now seem to bear it I out. went over to see Forbes this morning to talk to him about his threats. I managed to get my name out and Forbes attacked me, so I got this. Then Forbes ran out. Mrs. Forbes and a servant in the house gave me first aid. All the time they were doing it, they were apologizing for Forbes and his violence. Finally, Dr. Shepard came in, called the police, and told them to pick up Forbes. And the police will pick him up if they haven't already, and Dr. Shepard will prefer charges... And that that won't be that, Mr. Porter. Not as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Shepard's story is still leaky. I'm sorry, but I think it has more credence than ever in view of what's happened. You told me yourself his wife and the servant admitted Forbes had threatened Dr. Shepard's life. Oh, I believe that part. But Shepard lies so much you can get to believing him. What lies, for heaven's sake? Oh, for one thing, his reason for not calling the police right away. I mean, about how delicate Mrs. Forbes' condition was. She looked pretty healthy to me this morning. Another thing, he described Forbes as a man with homicidal tendencies. Now, Dr. Shepard's supposed to be an expert on behavior. And he thought that if I talked to Forbes, I might settle the matter peaceably. But Forbes attacked me as soon as I told him my name. I didn't get a chance to talk. Well, Dr. Shepard has no control He over felt what... pretty sure I could talk to Forbes. If you don't like that, let me go on. What reason did Forbes have to hit me? He didn't know me from a load of coal. Somebody put him up to it. Who? Oh, who do you think? Shepard, for some reason? Shepard was the only one who knew I was going right over there. But why? I don't know. What would he gain? Uh, my business for an x-ray. Uh, uh, you're joking now. I suppose I am, but I got a headache. I feel off. Mm-hmm. Oh, here. Uh, how about Mrs. Forbes? Oh, here. Thanks. Oh, she seemed like a genuine enough person. Not sick the way I expected her to be. Someone slugged her recently. There was a bruise under one eye. Mm, Shepard said her husband was an erratic, ruthless, violent man. Well, look, I'm stubborn, Mr. Porter. I still think Shepard's been lying to me. If for no other reason, then I think I know the breed. What's all this got to do with the insurance application? Well, that's another thing I don't know. Expense account item five, three dollars, cab fare. To Dr. Shepard's one-story building to have my head x-rayed. Shepard was still out, but Miss Streeter did the honors. Almost in silence. Outside of sit still and hold it, nothing much was said. Well, the picture's okay, Mr. Dollar. I looked at it. I didn't see anything wrong. Of course, the doctor will call you when he's had a chance to see it. Swell. You must have got quite a blow. That's a nasty bruise you have. Oh, it's pretty good, all right. He swung his gun hard. Well, the doctor will be back about mid-afternoon. He can call you at your hotel? Yes. Well, thank you for coming in. I want to ask you a question, Miss Streeter. Yes? Are you in love with him? What? Are you in love with Dr. Shepard? Well, that's rather my own business, isn't it? Unless, of course, in your investigation of whatever you're investigating, for some reason I'm under your scrutiny. Well, I suppose it is, and I suppose I can take that to say yes. I've become rather angry with you, Mr. Dollar, but frankly, you seem rather ridiculous. I suppose so. He's a liar, isn't he? I mean, Shepard. One more question. I told you on the phone, a friend of Dr. Shepard's did this to my head. Now, did you ever ask me who that friend was? Well, I think you'd be curious about a thing like that, Miss Streeter. I think I have a great deal of work to do, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item six, another three bucks, some more cab fare. This time, back to my hotel, where I picked up my rented car, filled it with gasoline, item seven, five dollars and thirty cents, and drove out to Pawtucket. At the home of Mrs. Clara Shepard, I explained my name and business to an elderly man who answered the door. He asked me to wait a moment, then returned and said Mrs. Shepard would see me. She was a bright-looking, gray-haired woman in her mid-sixties, elegantly groomed and obviously well cared for. We went through the politenesses, then got down to business. My son applied for $80,000 worth of life insurance and named me beneficiary. That's about it. (laughs) I wonder what he's up to. So do we. You mean, so do I. You don't trust anyone, do you, Mr. Dollar? He said his life had been threatened. He told me he wanted to make certain you were well taken care of in case anything happened to him. (laughs) He was lying, wasn't he? I haven't seen him, talked to him. Even had a Christmas card from him in three years. Maybe he does worry about his poor old mother now and then. I'm flattered. What you're saying about him isn't very flattering. Oh, I don't think Charles ever thought much of me as a mother. Still doesn't, I'm sorry to admit. But 
then I don't think too much of him as a son. So there we are. Is it too early for a cocktail, Mr. Dollar? How do you explain him already having a $20,000 policy on himself and wanting to kick it up to a hundred? You the beneficiary. No explanation. That's why I suggested a cocktail. To my friends here, Charles is a successful doctor in Providence who calls me faithfully every day, sends me gifts, and is always assured that I am well and happy and occupied in my old age. I guess I like you, Mr. Dollar, perhaps because, with all your gruffness, you might be nice to your mother. No, Charles and I aren't close. Never have been. I can tell you this. I don't need his closeness, at least not in a financial way. If Charles were to die and I received a hundred thousand dollars, it would mean a rather difficult Tuck's problem. If he were to die, part of me would die too. I'd like you to have just one martini with me. And then you may go, Mr. Dollar. I had the one martini with the tall, stately woman who struggled against tears. It was an old struggle with her, increasingly difficult, I guess, as the years kept on. We talked no more of his son or the insurance or the threat on his life. I left there about four o'clock in the afternoon. I drove back over to Providence and got to Dr. Shepard's office about a quarter to six. A broad-shouldered man in a tweed suit was in the reception room. He got to his feet when I walked in. Dr. Shepard? No. Don't I know you? Yeah, I was thinking the same. Wait a minute. Yeah, your name is uh, Dollar, your insurance investigator. Yeah, uh, you're <laughs> Phil Phil Crosby, yeah. Providence Police. <laughs> well, I met oh, you in New Hartford once. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you were down here. Hey, you must be the one. This Dr. Shepard called downtown about a threat in his life and said an insurance investigator had been slugged trying to help him out of it. Yeah, that's right. Well, where is he? I don't know. I rang that buzzer there. There's no one around at all. What's this all about? Well, a man named Paul Forbes threatened the doctor's life. He slugged me. You got a pickup out on him yet? No, not yet. I'm trying to pin the doctor down all day long. Been out on house calls, emergencies, everything else. We have to get his signature on a complaint. Mm, I thought that was all taken care of by now. Uh, well, hello. Oh, hello. Well, hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Miss Streeter. This is Phil Crosby from the police department. Police? I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, miss. Is anything the matter? Just want to see him. Oh, well, goodness, he was here ten minutes ago. He sent me over to the pharmacy to pick up these things. Oh. What? We had an emergency. 1213 Putnam Street. Got a note from him? Yes. Massey, please. There's no name on this, Miss Streeter. You recognize the address at all? Uh, no, I don't. Doctor wouldn't take a random emergency unless it were very unusual. This might be unusual, Phil. This is down by the water. How bad off do you think Forbes is? Mad. Had a gun. Plenty rough. I rode down in the police car with Phil Crosby. I had a feeling about the acuteness of that emergency. As a matter of fact, I had a feeling about the acuteness of everything that had happened that day from the time a half-crazed man had slugged me with a gun. The feeling was heavier than ever when we hit the neighborhood. Come on. All right. Wait. How oh, uh, 1213 Putnam Street. That'd have to be that vacant lot over there. This is 1240 here. The rest belongs to the warehouse. Yeah. Phil. Huh? That car empty on the plates. Yeah. Yeah, that's Dr. Shepard's car. Motor's still warm. Must be around here somewhere looking for the address. That's a dead end there. I better call in for some help. Fog's coming in if he's wandering around here. Yeah. Phil Crosby went off to find a telephone and request help. I stood by Dr. Shepard's car, waiting and listening and smoking. Nothing happened. No one cried out. No guns went off. Then Crosby drove up in the police car. Come on, report's in. A report was in, all right. We drove two blocks down the street where a small, curious crowd of people had already gathered in the cheerless fog. A uniformed man from the Harbor Division was standing over what appeared to be a bundle of clothes lying in a heap. We bent over it, and Phil looked up at me with a question mark. That Shepard, Johnny? Yeah. That's him. Yep. 
I'd say he's been dead less than half an hour. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a liar's still lying, even though he's dead. Join us, won't you, and I'll tell you all about it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bill Crosby, Dollar. Were you in bed? No. Nope. Good. Put on your coat and come on downtown. Can't it wait till morning? Nope. Want me to send somebody out to pick you up? Are you talking about an arrest? I might be, Dollar. Whatever I have to do to keep you around. I'll make it under my own steam, pal. Fifteen minutes. Room 203 City Hall, okay? I may take 16 minutes if I feel like it. And maybe you'll need longer. I want a real good story about Paul Forbes. A better one than you've told so far. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Swindle sheet item 7, 10 cents, one newspaper. It carried the story of Dr. Shepherd's murder and told how his life had been threatened by Paul Forbes earlier in the week. Obviously, Dr. Charles Shepherd had been lured to his death by Forbes who had telephoned him, pretended to need a physician, waited until the victim appeared, and then shot him down. The police had an APB out for Paul Forbes. All parties concerned were notified. The deceased was survived by his mother, Mrs. Clara Shepherd of Pawtucket. Amen. Come right in, Dollar. Sit down. There were about six people in Crosby's office, among them Richard Porter, who had hired me to investigate Shepard because of a suspicious insurance application. A uniform officer from the Harbor Patrol who had discovered Shepard's body, and two other men from Crosby's staff. I told them how I had been hired, that I didn't believe all of Shepard's story about the threat on his life. I told them about Forbes slugging me for no apparent reason, 
I also mentioned the insurance matter had never been satisfactorily explained. Well, it's never going to be explained as far as I can see, Dollar. Oh, I'll find an explanation, Phil. You solve your murder and I'll do what I have We've to do. We've got it solved. All you have to do is pick up Forbes. You know that. I don't know anything. You get huffy with me on the phone and you start talking about arrest and I don't know anything. You said that when you went to see Shepard yesterday morning, he waved a gun at you, a thirty two. That's right. It wasn't on his body. He knew Forbes hadn't been picked up. His life was in as much danger as ever. Why didn't he carry the gun? You know, that's a pretty good question, Phil. Yeah. What else? He allegedly went out on an emergency call tonight. No little black bag in his car. No little black bag by his body. What doctor goes out on any call without his bag? Oh, I wouldn't let that worry me so much. I'd find out if it was an emergency. Or he knew who was going to meet him when he went out. I thought you might have some ideas. Have you talked to Mrs. Forbes? Of course I've talked to her. She hasn't any idea where her husband might be hiding. She's sure he killed Dr. Shepard. That servant in the house is sure. He told me about Shepard being threatened by Forbes. Shepard told you about being threatened. Forbes slugged you, slugged Mrs. Forbes. Been running around town like a madman all day. But everything you say and every way you say it, it comes out Shepard was lying. I did it on purpose. I wanted to worry you to death. Uh, Well, every officer in this town has Forbes' description and the license of his car. We ought to get him before the night's out. He's the boy. Good luck, Phil. He was a good policeman with a lot of doubts. And he was mad about them. And that's what it generally takes to get matters straightened out. I found Kareem Streeter at the morgue, standing beside the marble slab on which a late employer had been laid. She looked pale and wan in her stiff white uniform and blue nurse's cape. Her eyes were red with tears, but no sound escaped her. Then she looked up at me once, sighed, and started out of the place. Wait. Oh, no. Well, I'd... I'd like to help you. I... Can you help him? No. No, you can't. No one can. I tried. Who did it? Well, the the police say Paul Forbes shot him. It looks that way from all they can get. Over Mrs. Forbes? Yes. They're looking for him, I suppose? Yes. Well, there's something of a policeman, Mr. Dollar. Why aren't you out helping them or something? Please, Miss Streeter, I know we've had words. I'll answer that question you asked me earlier today. What? You asked me if I loved Dr. Shepard. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I loved him. I loved him more than my whole life. (laughs) When she said that, and for some reason I don't know, I had a feeling that I was hearing the first bit of unembroidered truth I'd heard in two days. It didn't make me feel any better, but it did clear up something that had been in the back of my mind working its way to the front. Expense account item eight, six dollars and seventy cents. A steak, three martinis, and an order of sliced tomatoes. I finished eating at 2.30 in the morning. I really didn't want it, but I did want to sit down and do some thinking. After that, I climbed into my rented car and drove out to Dr. Shepard's office building. Expense account item nine, five dollars even. Bribe for watchman. I shouldn't be doing this, you know. Might lose my job over it. But since you're from the insurance company, I guess you're all right. I sure appreciate it. Eh, too bad about Dr. Shepard. Nice fella. Yeah, very nice. What is it you think you'll find? Police been here almost an hour ago, poking around. You know if they found anything? Oh, sure. Doctor's emergency kit. Heard him say he didn't take it with him when he went out in that last emergency. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I won't be long. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to come right in and watch you. Shepard had been a thorough man, and from all evidence, he and Miss Streeter kept and operated an efficient file system in the office. However, he had kept no medical history of his prime patient, Pauline Forbes. As a matter of fact, in checking over both the patient's files and the card files, there was no evidence to indicate that Mrs. Forbes had ever been a patient of Shepard's, which seemed strange in view of the fact that he told me he treated her for 14 months or better, and ended the treatment by advising her to divorce her husband. What's more, he had never mentioned that Paul Forbes had been one of his patients. But an entry dated some two years before disclosed the fact that Dr. Shepard had examined, treated, and discharged Paul Forbes as a patient. These two developments supplied me with all of the curiosity I'd need for a while. Nurse Corrine Streeter's home address was duly noted on Dr. Shepard's phone book. Oakdale House, surprisingly enough, on Oakdale Street. Special rates for nurses. Room 205. Yes? Oh, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? Not too good, Mr. Dollar. I only got home about 15 minutes ago. They kept me down there pretty long. Then Dr. Shepard's mother came. Do you want to come in? 
Yeah, thanks. It isn't much of a place, is it? I mean, I haven't street. Well, things, things like tonight aren't easy, I know, but... Look, Miss Streeter, I wish you'd help me and tell me who Dr. Shepard was intending to marry. Marry? Oh, I had no idea. I was in the office a half an hour ago. He'd already made arrangements for a honeymoon, reservations on the Ile de France for next June. Any ideas? Please go. I can't. Look, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help. I mean, was it Mrs. Forbes? What? Look, Miss Streeter, things are all wrong about your doctor's death, about what happened before it. It'll all come out sooner or later. Oh, I suppose it will. It's awful to say this, Mr. Dollar. But Mrs. Forbes was the only person doctors saw socially this last year. And she, of course, is married. How'd they meet? When her husband was Dr. Shepard's patient? Yes, that's right. They became quite friendly. Mrs. Forbes was never a patient, but Mr. Forbes was. Now, what can you tell me about Mr. Forbes? Well, he came to see Dr. Shepard a year or two ago and stopped coming in. I believe he requested a copy of his medical history to be sent to another doctor in Baltimore, I think it was. Uh Uh-huh. But Dr. Shepard kept right on seeing Mrs. Forbes. Yes. All right. Do you have any idea why I was called in by the insurance broker? At first, I didn't. But I I don't understand what you're trying to do. The police want Mr. Forbes. What does it all mean? (sighs) It'll sicken you, Mr. Well, tell me if you know. Tell me, please. It means the wrong man was killed tonight. I was pretty sure of what I meant when I said that. And I was also pretty sure that Phil Crosby and the police department had recognized the setup. It so happened I had a head start in the way of information. And though it was six o'clock in the morning by that time, I decided to use it. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Forbes. I'd like to come in. What is it? I should have tumbled to it right away, but your husband fit the part too well. Look here. I've been through quite enough today with the police and all out looking for Paul and Dr. Shepard being killed. Stop looking pained and tired. I'm the guy that's tired. I'm the one who was going to be the star witness when the state tried Shepard for killing your husband. What? Why not get a star witness for free? Why not make a suspicious insurance move so an investigator would be called in? An investigator who'll back up a self-defense plea for your doctor and get him off on justifiable homicide. Get out of here. Get out of here. I'll call the police. And you and the doctor sail to France in June and live happily ever after? What's the matter? Wouldn't your husband give you a divorce? Go ahead. If you say it's that way, Mr. Dollar, and you know everything, then it must have been that way. Only it got fouled up. Your husband did shoot your boyfriend after all, just as he threatened to. Get out of here! You can't prove any of it, not one word of it! Oh, you're right about that, Mrs. Forbes. I can't prove anything, not a thing. Shepard's dead, and they want your husband for it. He threatened Shepard, and they'll get him for it, and that's that. But you have something to live with for the rest of your life. Your doctor's gone, he'll never come back. Or maybe you can just have a cup of coffee and forget all about it. Get out! Get out! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! What? Yeah, that's it, Phil. That's what was supposed to happen. Shepard had it planted all over town how Forbes had threatened his life. He had witnesses. He had me, even. All he had to do was go out and shoot Forbes any place, any time. But Forbes got him first. Can people get by with this kind of thing in our courts of law? If and when you get your hands on Paul Forbes, will he have any kind of defense? Oh, he'll get him, Dollar. The other I can't answer. What you just told me can't be proven. I don't see how a lawyer can do much for a guy who threatens another man's life and then finally guns him down, do you? But it was Forbes who was the marked man all this time. He was supposed to die. If it could be proved that Forbes was a patsy, that the doctor intended to gun him down... The judge and jury, Johnny. When we get Forbes, he'll be arraigned and indicted for first-degree murder. Don't worry about that part. The rest is up to the court, out of our hands. After all, we're pretty sure Forbes shot and killed Dr. Shepard. Hang up that phone, Dollar. You still on the wire, Johnny? Hang it up or I'll blow your head off. Paul Forbes looked the part of a fugitive. His coat was ripped in several places. The knuckles on his left hand were torn and raw. There was mud on his shoes and pant legs. His eyes told the rest of the story. He was blazing mad. He had a gun. And he wasn't afraid to use it. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow I find out how hard it is to kill a lie. Sometimes you have to kill it twice. 
Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the hotel operator, Mr. Dollar. Will you cut off? I, uh... Tell him not to let any more calls in here. Go on! I was cut off, but I'd rather get some sleep now. Anybody phones, just take a message. All right, Mr. Dollar. Over there. Sit down. Put your hands on your knees. Now, just so as you and I understand each other, you make one move. Wiggle a finger, I'll empty this gun right in your stomach. You understand me? I understand you, Forbes. You're crazy. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. I was pretty sick of it and with it when I had Paul Forbes visit me in my hotel room about 7 o'clock in the morning. He'd used a gun in front of me once before to crack my skull. I decided I'd try to avoid that again. So I sat down and I played good. It didn't seem to please him a bit. You were out to my house about an hour ago, weren't you? Yeah, I went out to talk to your wife. Yeah, I saw you. I was across the street watching. I followed you here. Fixing up another deal, huh? I don't know what you're talking about, Forbes. I followed you here so we could have a little talk. And we're going to have it, you and I. You ought to put that gun away and let them take you, Forbes. Where do you live? In Hartford, Connecticut. I mean, where do you live in town here in Providence? I don't. I live in Hartford. Where do you practice? Practice what? Are you trying to get funny with me? I don't practice anything here in Providence. I don't live here. I'm just here for a few days. Doing what? Working on an insurance matter. Insurance matter? You're licensed to practice law in Rhode Island? Oh, you've got something all wrong, Forbes. I don't practice law. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an insurance investigator. I tried to tell you that yesterday morning when you cracked me with that gun. I was called in by Dr. Shepard. He said you threatened his life. You're lying to me. 
Shepard called me yesterday morning, said a lawyer named Dollar was on his way over to talk to me about getting Pauline a divorce. You're a lawyer. I'm what I say I am. If you hadn't started swinging that gun butt around, I'd have told you why I was there yesterday. You got a billfold or something? My coat pocket inside on the back of that chair there. I think I know why Shepard called you and told you I was a lawyer. I think he wanted you to attack me and make me... Shut up! You and Shepard are trying to pull something to take my wife away from me. I know that much. And now you're trying to pull something to get out of this jam. You're wrong, Forbes. I don't know anything about trying to take your wife away from you. You know I didn't kill Shepard. How do I know you didn't kill him? You threatened him. Half a dozen people have attested to that. I know you had a reason to kill him. I know every time I've seen you, you've had a gun in your hands and you've been swinging it at somebody, particularly me. You know who did it. You're in on it somewhere. You know who killed Shepard and you're going to clear me. You're going to tell me, Dollar. I'm going to whip it out of you. You're going to crazy. Go! All right. Get on your feet. He sat in the chair just the way I propped him there. His eyes looked dull and lifeless, as though he were already dead. I couldn't think of anything brilliant to say or do, so I rummaged around my suitcase and pulled out a bottle. Then I found a pair of glasses in the bathroom and poured a couple of drinks. When I came on out, he hadn't moved from the chair. He looked crumpled like a worn-out suit of clothes. He made no effort to look at me when I tucked the glass in his hand. Here, try this. Go on, go on, drink it. Why don't you call the police? Now, you say you followed me here to have a talk and find out what's what. Now's the time to talk, pal. This thing isn't the best conversation piece in the world. Leave me alone. Call him in. You have something going for you here. This gun hasn't been fired. Do you have another one? No. No, Dollar, I didn't kill Dr. Shepard. I wanted to more than anything in the world. But I didn't kill him. Now, look, I want some facts. So let's start with last night. Where were you when Shepard was shot? How do I know where I was? I uh, I don't even know what time he was shot. All right, let's start with yesterday morning. You slugged me, ran out of the house, jumped in the car, and what happened? Go on, take it from there. I drove over to Dr. Shepard's office. I was going to have it out with him. He was breaking up my home. Well, go on. Did you see him? No. I parked down the street from his office... And then I saw him jump in his car, and I followed him. He came back over here. I knew my wife must have called him to take care of you. What happened then? I went over to the park and... sat and tried to figure things out. You don't know what I've been through this past year. All right, go on, go on. Then I went to a bar. I was hungry. I hadn't eaten all day. I got a couple of sandwiches, and then I had some drinks. I don't know how many... Anyhow, the the more I drank, the more hopeless everything looked. Did you call Shepard? Yeah. Yeah, I I called him from the bar. Any idea what time it was? Must have been around five or six. What difference does it all make? I'm cooked and you know it. Go on, will you? You call Shepard, then what did you do? I told him I wanted to talk to him about everything that had happened. I told him where to meet me. You mean you wanted Dr. Shepard to come down and meet you so you could kill him? Maybe I did have that in my mind. I don't know. On the phone, he sounded so calm and said we could talk it out and straighten it out like gentlemen. Did you talk to him? No. I didn't see him at all. I waited an hour and he never showed up. I called his office back and the answering service said everyone had gone out for the day and I I didn't know what to do. I got back in my car and turned on the radio, and that's where I heard I was wanted for murder. Dollar, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. I had reason enough, but I didn't. I knew all about the others, but this was serious. Wait a minute. What others? Pauline's always had other friends. (laughs) Friends. I I guess... I I I don't guess I love her anymore. I don't know. I don't think she ever loved me. But I needed her. I needed her more than anything this last year or so. And at times I I did love her the way it once was. And I found out what was going on between her and Shepard. 
She wanted a divorce. I wouldn't give her a divorce. If I had let her and Shepard get away with it, it would have been too much to take, to ask. Oh, this doesn't make sense. Even though you didn't love her and she didn't love you, you wouldn't stand still for a divorce action? It sounds stupid. I just told you. I needed her so much this last year or so. So much. Still doesn't make any sense, Forbes. Why didn't you let her go? She knew she didn't have to divorce me. She knew it wouldn't be too long. What? Shepard gave me a year. Another doctor in Baltimore, 18 months. Leukemia. Don't you see? She would have been free. They could have waited until I was dead at least. Just that, until I was dead. Couldn't they? Well, couldn't they? Expense account item 10, $2, sleeping pills. I fed them to him along with a cup of hot chocolate. He looked pretty worn out, and within 15 minutes, he was sound asleep in my bed. Item 11, $4.16, one long-distance phone call to a Baltimore clinic where I spoke with a Dr. Franz Mueller. Dr. Mueller confirmed what Forbes had said. Forbes was doomed with an incurable ailment. Item 12, 20 cents, another phone call, this one from the hotel lobby to the coroner's office. I learned that Shepard had been killed by 32 caliber slugs. Forbes' gun, a 32, had not been fired or hastily cleaned. His story was checking out. That left just one small item to be cleared up. Expense account item 13, $4. Taxi fare from my hotel back to the Oakdale home. Special rates for nurses. Hello. I thought you'd be back to see me. Somehow I'm glad it's you, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead. That's an old story. Terribly old and corny. I applied for a job as Dr. Shepard's nurse five years ago, and I fell in love with him that very day. I've loved him every day from that time on. Five years. Go on. I don't know when it was when he started up with Mrs. Forbes. I knew she was trying to get a divorce. I knew Mr. Forbes wouldn't stand for it. Then one day... Last week, I guess it was. I heard Doctor talking to her on the phone. He said, there's a way to get rid of him. I knew he was talking about getting rid of Mr. Forbes. Did they discuss the part about Shepard getting Forbes to threaten his life in front of witnesses so he could shoot him down when the time came? No, I didn't know that until yesterday morning. So long ago, it seems. You came to see Doctor, and then you left. I overheard him on the phone again. He called up Mr. Forbes and said Mr. Dollar was coming over to talk about the divorce action. And he knew Forbes would be upset enough to attack me. Doctor was very good about anticipating what people would do in given situations. <laughs> Even me. I was in the office when Mr. Forbes called last night. I saw a doctor put the gun in his coat. I knew he was going down to meet Mr. Forbes and shoot him. So I followed him. He was walking around in the dark looking for Mr. Forbes with a gun in his hand. I ran up to him and pleaded with him not to be crazy, that Mrs. Forbes wasn't worth it. Then he said he was going to kill me, too. We struggled. The gun went off. I don't know how many times. I can help you, Corinne. You didn't mean to kill him. He meant to shoot you. When all these other details come out, the most they can charge you with is second-degree justifiable or manslaughter. No. You're nice. But I can't get off. Huh? I guess the police haven't found her yet. I went over and killed Mrs. Forbes an hour ago. Expense account item 14, same as item 1. Transportation back to Hartford. The next time you have a doubtful insurance application, Mr. Porter, settle it yourself or call someone else. Don't call me. As far as I can add up, and I'm not going to recheck the figures, expense account total is $485. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the case of a lonely heart that found plenty of company in the nearest morgue. Join us, won't you? 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Bates, Virginia Gregg, Russell Thorson, Parley Bear, Herb Ellis, Barney Phillips, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic and the new Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo present The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh, Sam. I'm glad you're back in town. So am I, Effie. So am I. Confidentially, I didn't think I'd make it. Uh, confidentially, that is. Was it dangerous, Sam? I should say it was. Why, for the past 24 hours, I've been at it hammer and tongs over hill and dale, through shot and shell. It was enough to turn any ordinary man's blood to ice and his hair pure white. Oh, that sounds terrifying, Sam. I wish it had been only terrifying, Effie. It was blood-curdling, spine-chilling, hair-raising. I was bored. It was also rural and countryfied. Well, what happened, Sam? Tell me. You've heard of the Martins and the Coys? No. And the Boston Massacre? No. Custer's Last Stand? No. Well, put them all together and they spell uh, what I'll shortly be in to dictate, a report which I call in a burst of clever literary plagiarism, the Farmer's Daughter Caper. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, starring Howard Duff. Produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. To look your holiday best, friends, be sure to use Wild Root Cream Oil, America's favorite hair tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. What's more, it's non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Get Wild Root Cream Oil in the big family size bottle or handy tube. Ask for it at your drug or toilet goods counter very first chance you get. For the holiday and all year round, use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. I'm right here, Sam. Pull up all the shades. Uh, all right, Sam. Now, turn on every light in the place. But it's daylight. Do what I say. All right, Sam. Now, uh, check the closets. But what for? For snipers. What do you think? All right, Sam. Nobody here. Okay. I guess it's safe to come all the way in. Oh. What's the 
is all about, Sam? I don't understand. Effie, it's just that I don't ever want to be caught in the dark again, especially when people are shooting at me. I want to see every nook and cranny of every square foot of land that surrounds me. Sam, who was shooting at you? Where? (sighs) They were shooting from the left, from the right, from up above, down below, everywhere. (gasps) Death was winging in on every breeze that blew, and they all blew my way. Oh, Sam, now stop this. I'm just dying of curiosity. (sighs) When my time comes, I hope that's all I ever die of. Ready? Yeah. Uh, date this week to Mr. Elliot Parson, Parson Drive Yourself Garage, 1618 St. Charles Street, San Francisco, 13, California. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the farmer's daughter caper. Dear Mr. Parson, I fear you have an explanation coming, one that you can pass along to your insurance company as to why the car I rented from you last week appeared as late as it did and in the condition it did. As you know, I rented said vehicle to drive to Middletown to bail a client out of the drunk tank. On the way back, a native showed me a shortcut, and I'll get him if it's the last thing I do. Dusk was falling, and so were my eyelids, when I saw a sign that said, Tourists Invited. Behind it stood a ramshackle farmhouse in a surly woodland setting. I should never have knocked on that farmhouse door, but then I wouldn't have had any story to tell, would I? Good evening, young man. Uh, Good evening, madam. I'm afraid I need a room for the night. Well, of course you do. Land sakes, you're tired, I can tell by your eyes. Been on the road long? Too long. Land sakes, of course you have. Come in, please. Thank you, ma'am. You'll find this is the homiest tourist home in California. Really like mothers, eh? Like your grandmothers. No electricity, no phones, just quiet. I see. Now, I have two rooms, a $3 one and a $5 one. Which one do you think you'd like? Uh, What's the difference? One less blanket, one squeaky spring, and with the $3 one, you might have to take a walk. I'll take the $5 one, thank you. I'm Mrs. Elkins, Mrs. Burt Elkins. Who might you be? Uh, Sam Spade. Spade? Land sakes, that's a very unusual name. Mm-hmm. And who are you traveling with, Mr. Spade? Uh, I'm alone. Oh, I mean what company? We only accept traveling salesmen. You realize that? Oh, uh, yes. Well, I'm, uh, I'm uh, traveling for the makers of Mouton Mustache Wax. Oh, oh. Use it all the time. You are well-groomed, madam. But <laughs> you will go far, young man. <laughs> yeah, but before that, I'd like to go to bed. Well... <laughs> Come on, this way. She led me upstairs to my $5 room and left me. As lumpy as it was, the bed invited me, but I decided to shave first and thus facilitate an early start in the morning. I poured myself a drink out of my traveling bar kit and then stepped in to shave. It wasn't easy because all I had for light in there was an oil lamp. When I came back to the bedroom with a lamp in one hand, I stopped short in utter surprise. I'd heard about these things in traveling salesman stories, but I never expected to see it. She was sitting in an armchair, smoking a cigarette. High heels, silk stockings, light rayon dress, and a face right off the cover of Cosmopolitan. Hello, Sam. Hello. uh, uh... Mary Smith. Huh? Hope you don't mind me just barging in. Well, no, no. Well, no, that is... uh... Afraid I'll bite you? It never entered my mind. Well, I might. I'm so tired of talking to myself, I need someone like you. You know, you're not bad to look at. Who, me? Where do you live? What do you do for a living? Well, I guess you'd call me independently wealthy. I wish someone would. How nice. San Francisco? There must be some fog on my lapel. Look, Sam, I'll give it to you straight. I want to get out of here, go to San Francisco. Could you take a passenger tomorrow? Well, uh, what would your mother say? She's my aunt. What do I care what she says? I I don't belong on a farm. Out in a west wet pasture ruins my nylons. I'm a city girl, Philadelphia. Why did you leave? My parents died. Look, Sam, I won't be a burden to you. I just want to get to San Francisco. After that, I'm on my own. Sam, take me with you. Please take me with you. You won't regret it. Uh, What am I going to do with this lamp? Who cares? Oh, Sam... <clears throat> well, oh, I thought I'd find something like this going on in here. And what I, I get out of here, go back to your room, young lady. Go on. Now, Mr. Spade. <laughs> it does look bad, doesn't it? Oh, I'm not blaming you, Mr. Spade. Nan's sakes, it's her. 
She ain't responsible for what she does. She's like this all the time. Oh, I see. Now, when I go out, you just lock your door. Just keep it locked. But, ma'am, this is a $5 room. A sleepless hour later, I heard something slide under my door. I looked and found it was a note that read, Mr. Spade, Sam, please unlock your door, and when the house is quiet, I'll come and see you. I'm desperate, terribly, terribly desperate. Don't leave me. Give me a chance to tell you what it's all about, please. Stupid me, I unlocked my door, dressed again, and waited. An hour and a half later, I heard my doorknob turning in the dark. The door opened quietly and quickly. Sam... The things that go on in this house, they're insane. Oh. I've been here three months. When my father died, I had no money, and because Aunt Maud was my only relative, I came here. And ever since I came, they never let me out of the house for more than an hour. They never let me see anyone or do anything. Why? I wish I knew. Five days ago, Uncle Bert left early one morning. He hasn't come back since. Aunt Maud says he's away on business. He doesn't have any business. Well, even so, that doesn't seem strange to me. Then there's my dog. What about it? It... It disappeared the same night Bert did. He told me it ran away. I know it didn't. I've had it for three years. It never ran away. Well, what do you think? Well, I, I was sure I could hear it howling somewhere for two or three nights. Then the howling stopped. I think I know where it is, but I don't know why. It scares me. Well, where do you think it is? Sam, you're going to think I'm crazy right out of my mind, but... Well, about 150 yards behind the house, there's a hillside with an old cave in it. Oh, an old cave. I don't know what it's used for, but yesterday I saw the whole front end of it closed. Closed with dirt. Sam... They buried that dog alive in that cave. I know it. Oh, wait a minute now. Uh, did you ask Mrs. Elkins? Yes. All she said was the dog ran away and mind your own business. She told me to leave the cave alone. Sam, let's go out there and look. Please. Well, uh... So big, brave, stupid Sam, idiot boy, allowed her to show me the back way out of the house and we sneaked to the barn together. She found a shovel and we walked to the cave. When my eyes got accustomed to the dark, I saw the entrance had been covered with dirt and recently. I took the shovel while she stood watching. I cleared half of the dirt away and worked as quietly as I could, but apparently not quietly enough. A flashlight suddenly hit both of us in the face and a shotgun barrel flashed in the beam. Get away from there before I shoot your head off. Uh, point that thing someplace else, please, ma'am. Just what do you think you're doing, mister? Uh, digging. Mary, you get back to the house. No. Aunt Maud, I won't. Get back to the house before I count three or I'll put a load of buckshot right through you now. One. Aunt Maud, my dog is in there. Two. All right. Now, Mrs. Elkins, suppose you put that gun down and tell me what this is all about. I huh? got one thing to say to you, mister. Get in your car and get out of here and don't waste any time doing it. But, madam, Your suitcase I... is in the car and your five dollars is with it. Yeah, but... Now get, or I should choose a trespasser. And I could do it, mister. Land sakes, I could do it. Now get. So I got under guard to my car. I got in and drove off. And this is in the driveway with a shotgun still pointed at me until I was out of sight. I turned left at the first crossroad, parked the car, and cut through the woods back to the farm. I could see a light in the living room. Nobody was in or near the barn. And when I got to the cave, there wasn't a sound anywhere. I picked up the shovel I dropped and started digging again. Thirty minutes later, the shovel broke a small hole through into that cave, and a stifling blast of fetid air rushed out, and something leaped out at me in the dark. And it wasn't the dog. It was a human hand on a human arm. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of America's favorite private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen... Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who actually purchased Wild Root Cream Oil were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil. 
America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Farmer's Daughter Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. In a night already full of surprises, I should have been ready for the next one, but I wasn't. The loose earth, which had blocked the entrance to the cave, suddenly fell away, and I fell with it. Then I heard something like nothing on earth. Nails dragged across my face, taking skin and flesh with them. I twisted and went down, and something went down with me. The snarl became a voice. Bury me alive! Bury me alive! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! And he did his best, which was pretty good. Finally, I got a good hold on him and sat on his chest. After that, I lit a match and looked at a tall, thin man in his middle 40s. He was caked with mud from head to foot. His hands were impossibly torn and bleeding. I could guess why. Judging from the stubble on his face, he'd been bottled up in that cave at least five days. How he was still alive, I didn't know. He acted like a madman, and he had every right to. But surprise, when his eyelids fluttered open again, he read a very sane line. I'm all done in. You got a drink, friend? Not on me. They hit me on the head and left me there. They thought I'd stay in there forever. Forever. Who put you there? Who did it? <laughs> but they couldn't keep me there. I dug my way out tonight. Tonight. I dug my way out. Tonight. <laughs> the force of the bullets knocked them halfway back down the incline to the cave. All I could do was hit the dirt. Finally, when it seemed safe, I broke cover and ran smack into somebody carrying two bags. Please, please. Let's have a look at you. Sam. Sam, it's me. Sam, I knew you wouldn't go away without me. I knew it. I couldn't stay in that awful house any longer. None of that now. Who was that shooting at? I don't know. Where's your aunt? In the house, I suppose. I slipped out the back way. Any visitors tonight? No. What is it? What is it? I think I find your Uncle Bert. Come on. I led her back to the cave entrance and showed her the body of the man I dragged out. I watched her face a long time as she looked at him very carefully. That's not Uncle Bert, Sam. Really? No. That's Mr. Linden, a jewelry salesman who came to the place a few nights ago. Five nights ago? Yes. Yes, come to think of it. The same night your uncle disappeared. Tell me, did you ask Mr. Linden to take you back to San Francisco the same way you asked me? I... I... Did you? Yes. He said he would. He got up early and left without me. He didn't get far. What kind of car was he driving? I don't know. I don't remember. Do you drive a car? Yes, but Here, I'm... mine's down the road about 500 yards. Go to the nearest phone and call the highway patrol, a sheriff, anybody who represents law. Got that? Yes, yes, I know exactly what to do. To make sure we were both thinking of the same thing to do, I followed her in the dark, watched her get into the car I rented from you, and drive off. Then I turned around, put a new clip in my gun, and walked back to the old homestead. It was still very homey. By the light of an oil lamp, Mrs. Elkins was peacefully knitting what looked like a shroud. Why, Mr. Spade? Why, Mrs. Elkins? Land sakes. Land sakes. Now that we got that out of the way, let's get down to business. If you're here to make trouble, young man, believe me, I can handle trouble. My kind of stock know about trouble. Well, uh, suppose you tell me about the trouble I just had, or haven't you heard all the shots that were fired around here tonight? Shots? My, my. My, my. Seems I would have heard gunshots. Seems you would. Look, uh... I've got a sheriff on the way. Have you, Mr. Spade? Why? I suppose you didn't hear the shooting. Oh, yes, yes, I'd forgotten. Was anyone hurt? A man named Linden. He's dead. Linden. Linden. Now, that sounds familiar. It should. He stayed here five nights ago. He was a jewelry salesman. Yes, yes, now I remember. You say he's dead? Somebody tried to bury him alive in your little cave. How awful. I do declare. I thought you would. Well? You must be joshing, Mr. Spade. I'm not joshing at all, Mrs. Elkins. Well, well. Buried alive, you say. Look, uh, let's talk just like plain folks. Where's your husband? Where's the jewelry samples you probably stole from Linden? Is there anything else you want to say? Gunshots, eh? Well, well. <laughs> I 
left the sweet old thing knitting and rocking and made my way through the house looking for guns, jewelry, and killers. I got downstairs in time to see Mrs. Elkins disappear out the front door. When I tried to follow, I stumbled over the rocking chair, which was indeed a lucky thing for me. After a few minutes of silence, bravely crawling on my stomach, I followed the shadows of the house until they blended into the shadows of a large, hulking building, which happened to be the barn. Inside, I bumped my head on the radiator of a car. Naturally, I didn't find any keys in it, but I did find a familiar jewelry salesman-type mud-soaked corpse. When I was trying to remember how to cross ignition wires, I heard the hum of a motor and saw two headlight beams swinging up the driveway. They lasted as long as any other lights. The car came to a lurching stop, and a thick-set figure in a Stetson hat stumbled towards me, tugging at a gun. That burned gold flame cuff thing, I... Undo the flap. Oh, thanks. Hey, put your hands up, whoever you, you are. You be the sheriff? You're dead blame right on the sheriff. You're dead blame right on the sheriff. Who are you? What's the idea of shooting the lights out in my car? My car. Oh, you Slade? Spade. Well, I'm Homer Pickett, sheriff of this county. Homer? The girl come, woke me up, said all sorts of funny things going on around here. Said there'd been a murder. Now, who's killed? What's going on, Stan? Sam. Well, uh, for one thing, somebody's been trying all sorts of ammunition on me for size. You don't say. I do say, Mr. Sheriff. <sighs> Why? Because I found a man in a cave who'd been left there to die. Want to look at the corpse? You can look at him right here. He's sitting in this car. So he yeah. is. How'd he get here? Uh, somebody moved him here. Shorten a move a corpse till the police examine it. I didn't move it. Huh? Now listen closely. Listening? Huh? I found the man. He was still alive. Then somebody shot him. Shorten a moved him. Then they tried to kill me because I found him. When they didn't kill me, they decided to hide his body. Illegal. They probably intended to drive away and dispose of it so there'd be no evidence when an efficient, smart, alert, courageous police officer like yourself came around to ask questions. Hey, hey. Well, that sounds reasonable. Who's behind all this? Well, uh, Mrs. Elkins threatened me once and tried to kill me once. More! Well, land sake. Well, that's her, yes. I want to talk to her. Where's she? Roaming the countryside with a gun, no doubt. Well, we'll have to clear all this up. See what it's all about. Now, who's this fellow in the car? His name's James Linden. Got a pencil? Better write that down. Tilden, huh? Linden. Well. Uh, by any strange coincidence, Sheriff, you happen to know a man named Dundee, San Francisco homicide? Lieutenant Dundee, old Tom. Old Tom, yes. Shucks, I learned everything I know about police work from him. Yeah, well, that's fair. And law's law. Dundee always said... Yeah, I've heard him turn... say it, Sheriff, but... And I am to enforce it around here. One side, Mr. Slade. Spade. Uh, hey, uh, uh, you'll be sorry. Well. Uh, now, look here, all you Elkins. This is Homer Pickett talking... And I ain't no small town constable. I'm the sheriff of this county. You'll get a square deal from me, but first I order you in the name of the law to throw down your guns. Well? Oh, oh, oh my, my. Oh. You all right? Nothing but my feelings hurt. Oh, I warned you. I, I, I thought that'd do some good. Well, now you know. Hey, look, maybe it did do some good. I came across the farmyard as the first light was showing in the eastern sky. Her hands were above her head. One held a shotgun. Mark, get back where you belong, Mark. We could hear, but we couldn't see him. Maud stopped, hesitated for a moment, and then began running towards us. She almost made it. No! I ran out to drag her back, expecting any second to be the target for the night. There was a sudden and curious silence as I pulled her into the barn. She was still alive. Thanks, that man's been missing everybody all night. Never thought he'd be able to hit me. Easy. I come from good stock. I'm no criminal, Mr. Spade. Sheriff, you know that. Yeah, I know, Maud. I know. Let me take a look at you. You'll be okay. No blame Bert too much. He wanted to have money once in his life. So when this man came along with all the jewelry, Bert went out of his mind, I guess. He put the man in the cave. And the dog, too. So the dog wouldn't call attention to him. And then he took the man's car, went into San Francisco to try to sell the jewels and the underwear. No luck, huh? Bert says they laughed at him. The jewels were just paste. Stampos. 
And he came back and found me at the cave, and he figured he had to knock us both off. I just stuck by him all the way. Now he's like a tiger that smelled blood. No telling what he'll do. You will have to get help, Spade. Roadblocks, bloodhound. No. No, this is his land. He won't run. He'll hide here. Where? Why, in the cave. Well, I uh, reasoned one that no matter how much a man loved his land, he was not going to let himself be trapped in a cave with only one exit. And two, it followed, therefore, that if he did hide in the cave, there was more than one way out, which the late Lyndon hadn't found. Sheriff Pickett volunteered to watch the front of the cave while I looked around for a rear exit. After a 20-minute search, which netted me nothing, I remembered the car parked inside the barn and how quickly Elkins had carried Lyndon's body to it. I went back there and took a look around. In a corner of the barn, I found a trail of dirt leading to a bale of hay. When I moved the, hay, the bale, I found, you guessed it, a trap door. I pulled it open, caught a familiar whiff of used-up air, and lowered myself into a black hole that turned out to be a passageway. I cautiously made my way forward in the darkness for a few yards. Who is it? Who is it? I pressed back against the dirt wall, listening to him approach. When I figured he was close enough, I threw a cloud of dirt toward him across the passageway. His gun flashed and lit up the whole place for a second, and I fired three times at the silhouette. I waited, then I went towards him. He was lying on his back. I kicked his gun away, and when I bent over him to feel his pulse, he suddenly came to life. Something crashed against the side of my head, and everything became darker than the inside of a cave. The next thing I knew, I was looking at a pair of red-rimmed eyes. Several minutes had gone by. Thought you was a goner for sure. <clears throat> you ain't used to this country fighting, are you? Yeah, is this country lucky, Sheriff? Uh, yeah. Give me. Here. <coughs> yeah, country liquor. Tell me, Sheriff, did you by any chance... Well, sure, of course I did. I got him, Slate. <laughs> Report. Sam, hmm? do you mean to tell me you let a little country sheriff outdo you? Well, Effie, Homer Pickett's coming up for re-election next fall, and besides, you might think I was egotistical if I told you how it really ended. But your reputation! You're the greatest private detective of them all! And so I can afford to be generous. Now, not another word. Scoot, type that up. Oh. If your supply of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic is getting low, better make a note to get some more tonight or first thing tomorrow. Remember, Wild Root Cream Oil is the famous hair tonic that grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. Always keep a big bottle or tube on hand. And ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Let me see. Let me see here. F, you rewrote the ending. I had to, Sam. You're much too modest. And Sam Spade, with a knot of cold fury in the pit of his stomach, a vindictive fire in his eyes, stepped wearily over the loose rocks on the cave floor to do battle with the thing that loomed up in the darkness ahead. Mm -hmm. The thing's roar filled the night with terror. But Sam Spade, dauntless and knowing not fear... Stepped up to the monster, laughed in its hairy face, and with one quick convulsion of his powerful shoulder muscles, dropped the thing in its tracks. I see. Well, is that the way you think it ended, Effie? Oh, Sam, I guess I was being a little foolish. I'll change it. No. No, as long as you've done it this way, we'll leave it this way. Can't waste paper. No, no, I'll change it, Sam. Leave it! Oh! Sam. Yeah? I copied that ending out of an old black mask magazine. You what? Yes, sir. Don't be mad. Come here. Come here. Oh, I copied that of an old whiz bang. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Good night. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The 
The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade was written for radio by John Michael Hayes and E. Jack Newman. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Pierre and Rene Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when producer William Spear presents another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy speaking. Here's an exciting new shampoo that's grand for all the family. And here's our own squeaky to tell you about it. Look at your hair. Is it stringy and dull? Does it only cover your skull? The Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo is just the thing for girls like you. Gleams your hair, know what I mean, and leaves your hair squeaky clean. Squeaky clean? Squeaky clean. Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo. Stay tuned for The Summer Symphony with Katherine Grayson on NBC.